This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. <laughs> story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. <laughs> Today's baffling case, The Mystery of Hangman's Wood. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter discovered what caused the ghostly shadow of a long dead pirate to appear at full moon upon the side of a deserted barn and why, and what he did about it after he found out. You know, Mom is a person who's entitled to real consideration, not only on Mother's Day, but the whole year round. She deserves the most attractive home, the greatest convenience, the utmost leisure modern living can provide. And now American science has given her the modern shortcuts to happy homemaking. For example, the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux Clear Gloss, which works such magic in the care of furniture, woodwork, and floors. Linux Self-Polishing Wax, the amazing new wax product, beautifies floors with a satiny yet tough anti-skid finish. Linux Cream Polish for fine furniture cleans as it polishes, leaving no surface oil to attract dust. And Linux Clear Gloss, which is brushed on, dries to an elastic, transparent surface that protects all wood and linoleum in your home. Give your home a new, easy beauty treatment now with the three great Linux home brighteners. You'll find them all at your hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. As we join Nick Carter and his secretary, Patsy Bowen, this week, we don't find them in the old house in the corner of 5th and 4th. Instead, they're watching the sunset on the terrace of a little inn overlooking the placid waters of the Potomac. But it's only a busman's holiday. They've come in answer to a frantic telegram sent by Professor Markert. That famous archaeologist is explaining his problem to them in cultured but slightly agitated tone. You know, it's extraordinary, Mr. Carter. I might even say fantastic. Never have I come across a more curious manifestation of local superstition. As you know, I've been investigating the so-called pirate caves of the Potomac. Doesn't sound like a very cheerful thought, does it, Nick? Well, there have been many conjectures as to the origin of these holes, Patsy, but the most logical explanation is that they served as hiding places for pirates in the times when they preyed on Virginia shipping. As we believe, they were also used as hiding places in which to store their loot. But you didn't send for us to discuss these pirate caves, did you, Professor? Oh, good grief, no. I... Mr. Carter, I want to see if you can solve the mystery of the specter of Hangman's Wood. Specter? Well, that sounds promising, Professor. I hope you're right, Patsy. Now, Professor, you say it all started night before last. You and your assistant, uh, what's his name, had been working later than usual. Yes, Mr. Carter. Harvey and I had become so absorbed in our search that we pursued our digging until long past supper time. In fact, the moon was just rising above Hangman's Wood when we emerged into the open air. Look, Professor, the moon's rising above the treetops. Oh, yes, yes. I had no idea we'd work so late. Oh, I had, Professor. I'm starving hungry. <laughs> you know, so am I now that you mention it. Well, let's pick up the shovels. We'll be getting back to the inn. Yes. Ah, oh, the moonlight is beautiful, isn't it? Turns the trees to silver with long, mysterious shadows stretching out below. Oh, it's eerie, if you ask me, sir. I wonder why they call this place Hangman's Wood. Because it was here that they hanged many of the pirates and robbers who waylaid ships coming up the river. That great gnarled and leafless oak that stands over there, Harvey, between us and the deserted barn, that's supposed to have held as many as seven bodies 
suspended from its branches at one time. No wonder it died off. Out of sheer horror, I'd say. Oh, good Lord, what's that? Oh, just an owl of some kind. Well, as I was saying, Harvey, during the full moon, the spirits of those hardy buccaneers who were hanged there on the gallows tree are supposed to return. Professor! Professor, look! Huh? Over there. Where? Where the shadow of the tree is thrown against the side of that barn. There's a shadow of something hanging from one of the limbs. It, it looks like the body of a man. Yes. Yes, Harvey, it certainly resembles the shadow of a body hanging from a rope with its head bent sharply to one side as if the neck were broken. The interesting thing about it is that there isn't a body hanging from the limb of the tree to cast that shadow. Uncanny. The shadow of a man who'd been hanged, but no body to cast the shadow. You investigated, Professor? Well, <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, Mr. Carter, Harvey was rather upset by the whole thing and... Well, I'll admit he didn't have to argue too hard to persuade me to leave the vicinity. You say that local superstition says these uh, manifestations occur when the moon is full. That's right. But you saw that shadow two nights ago. Wasn't that a bit previous? The moon isn't full until tonight. Exactly. That's why I wired you that it was imperative for you to come this evening. I propose to return to Hangman's Wood and see if the phenomenon will repeat itself. All right. How about you, Patsy? Want to come along? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. I'd love to. Well, here we are, Mr. Carter. Now, this is the gallows tree, and there is the old barn on which the shadow appeared. Everything is just as it was the other night. Don't see a blessed thing, do you, Nick? Wait till the moon rises above the treetops. That should be any moment now. Yes. Yes, here it comes. The shadow of the tree begins to form on the side of the barn. I don't see any hanging body, Nick. Hmm. There's a breeze rising. Yes, it often comes up with the moon, they tell me, Mr. Carter. Ah, yes. The full moon rides clear of the top branches of the old oak tree. The wind freshens, the branches murmur. <coughs> oh, goodness, Nick, did you hear that? Yes, Patsy. The screech owl. Oh. And a screech owl in this vicinity, Mr. Carter, is supposed to be a harbinger of ill fortune. I rather suspect that particular screech owl, Professor, is even more ominous than that. What? Huh? There. Look at that shadowy shape. Slowly materializing in the moonlight on the barn door. Nick, it's just as the professor said. The shadow of a man hanging by his neck. Yes. And as you can see, there's nothing hanging from the tree which would cause that shadow. Nothing at all. Well, that's not too significant, Pat, Professor. The interesting feature of that shadow is that it doesn't sway in the breeze. What's that? Yes, this breeze is strong enough to move any object hanging from the limbs of that tree. Provided it were hanging. <coughs> oh. I do wish that bird would go away. He's probably got a nest somewhere in that old barn. I think we'd better investigate that barn, Professor. Particularly that door that frames the hanging shadow. Oh, Patsy, while we investigate the barn it rests on, you wouldn't care to climb the gallows tree and see if you can discover the origin of the shadow. I would not. Not that I think there isn't a perfectly normal explanation of some sort for that, that apparition, mind you. Well, then. But nobody in his right mind has any business to go climbing trees in the dark. <laughs> okay, Patsy, we'll come back tomorrow in the daylight for the tree. But the barn door, I think we'd better investigate that right now. Very well, Mr. Carter, if you think it best. Let's see. Ah, you know, this barn door is interesting. Very interesting. This old lock is rusted with age. And unbroken cobwebs cover all the hinges and lintels. Well, that means no one's been inside the old relic for a dog day. On the contrary, Patsy. Someone has been inside. And very recently. What? He was driving a horse and wagon. Look here. The ruts in the soft earth. Oh. The ones going into the barn are rather light. But here. Look at these that are superimposed on the first one. Yes. Notice how much deeper they cut. How the horse coming away from the barn dug his hoops in as though pulling a heavy load? Oh, good heavens, Mr. Carter. You don't mean there's another mystery besides the shadow of the hanging man? Oh, dear. 
Now we have a horse and wagon that can drive through a barn door that's been locked for years. Maybe the driver just said open sesame and the door disappeared into thin air. No, the trick is slightly more obvious, Patsy. I'd like to have a look a little higher up. Professor. Yes? Bend over so I can climb up your back. I want to stand on your shoulders. <clears throat> like this? Yes, that's it. All right, now steady. All right. I've got you. All right. Yes. Yes, I was right. There's a long crack running parallel with the ground. That means the hinges are on the inside. The whole wall swings inward. All right, steady, Professor. I'm coming down. Right, you are. <coughs> now, let's see what happens if we push the bottom of the wall right about here. All right, all together now. <coughs> oh, Nick is swinging out the golfing. Say, hey, that's neat. I must work on a system of pulleys and counterweights. Oh, gosh, Nick, it's dark in there. Well, it's not too dark when you get used to it. I've got an idea there may be something interesting hidden in here. Something that someone has gone to great pains to keep secret. The hidden door, the body of the shadow are all part of the plot to keep interlopers from... Oh, Nick. Nick, something swished at me. Calm yourself, Patsy. It's only a bat. The old oh. barns are usually full of them. Yes, there's another. I definitely don't like that. They get in your hair. Oh, nothing here. Nothing but a bit of old hay in this corner. Oh, there's nothing in it. Nothing. Now, wait a minute. Hold on. Huh? What is it, Nick? There's a hole under the hay. A hole leading down. Give me the flashlight, Betsy. Yeah. Thanks. <gasps> Great Scott, look there. It's the entrance to another pirate hole with a ladder leading down into it. That looks like one of the deeper ones. Oh, Nick, you don't expect us to crawl down there. No, Patsy. Whatever was hidden down there was removed in the heavily laden cart whose tracks we saw outside the barn. See? Here's the imprint of cake that had been rolled across the soft ground. And here one was stood on end. Yes. And look. Here one of them sprung a leak. There's a small trail of blackish powder. Well, what do you make of that, Patsy? No sort of acid, Nick, like gunpowder. Right. Oh, good grief, Professor. Put out your pipe. Yeah, what's all? Oh, it's dangerous to smoke a pipe in a place that's bulging with gunpowder. Well, oh, it's not bulging with it, Patsy. There isn't enough left here to fill a firecracker. Someone's got wind of the fact that Professor Mackert called us in, and the whole lot's been removed. Yes, but where, Mr. Carter? For what purpose? I wish to heaven I knew. The amount of explosive that was carried away in that heavily laden cart can do a great deal of rather serious damage. Nick, what do you suppose they're planning to blow up? I don't know yet, but I hope to find out shortly. First, we send off two telegrams. Okay. One to the FBI asking for any information they may have regarding Dynamite Joe Porter and his gang. Dynamite Joe? Yes, I've heard of him. He's the notorious English criminal who specializes in blowing up banks. And also wrecks railroad trains. If he thinks they're carrying anything that might interest him... Where's the second telegram going? To Annapolis. Well, why Annapolis? Because Annapolis, which is a bare five miles up the river, is the site of a government powder magazine. I want to know if they've missed any of their stores lately. Yes, and I think I may even send another telegram to the Port Authority at Norfolk. Come on. We better hurry back to the telegraph office before it closes. There are a great many things to do, and too little time to do them. Well, Nick must suspect that big things are afoot from his reaction to what he found in the old barn. Will he be able to find what these things actually are and put a stop to them before any damage has been done? We'll see in just a moment. If you want new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for all your floors and linoleum, it's high time you use the new Linex self-polishing wax. Until you do, you don't know how different, how perfect a quick-drying wax can be. For the formula of Linex self-polishing wax is completely new, the result of extensive research by leading chemists. It contains the greatest possible amount of genuine carnauba wax to lend satiny appearance, lasting protection, Real anti-skid finish to every floor surface in your home. Yes, the underwriters' laboratories have proved that linoleum, hardwood, and rubber tile actually are less slippery after the application of Linex self-polishing wax. You can feel the difference when you walk on a floor to which it's been applied. And Linex self-polishing wax takes only a jiffy to wipe on, drying quickly to a handsome luster without tiresome rubbing. So choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax. 
the finest product of its kind. And when you want the modern finish that's brushed on for even longer-lasting protection, get Linex Clear Gloss, which dries overnight to a beautiful gloss finish that protects your floors and linoleum for months. Whether you choose Linex Self-Polishing Wax or Linex Clear Gloss, ask for it by name, Linex, and get the finest. You'll find all three great Linex Home Brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that dries in one hour at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And now, back to our story. As we rejoin Nick Carter and his assistant, secretary, and right-hand man, or should we say woman, we find them at breakfast the following morning. They're at a little hotel near the site of Hangman's Wood, and it's somewhat later than their customary hour for breakfast, as Nick well knows. Well, I knew I should have ordered another poached egg. I'm hungry as a bear this morning. Must have been the night air, Patsy. Mm. Nick, I hmm? wonder what caused that shadow of the hanging man we saw last night. This neat little device I have here. What in heaven's name is that? A little tube I found fastened in one of the lower branches of that dead tree. I took a stroll out to Hangman's Wood before you were up this morning. Oh, I'm certainly glad you didn't wake me. I hate early morning walks. Precisely why I didn't wake you. This gadget I found out there is an ingenious telescope-like lens with a small black silhouette inserted somewhere in the middle. When the light of the moon shone through at a certain angle, of course... A silhouette was projected and made a shadow on the barn door. Well, how could you know what to look for? It had to be something like this, Patsy. Anything hanging from the trees would have moved in last night's breeze. The moment I saw the shadow was stationary, I knew the answer. I'll pass them up. Uh-huh. Good morning, Professor. Oh, good morning. Now, the innkeeper gave me these telegrams for you, Mr. Carter. They just arrived. Oh, thanks, thanks. Oh, yeah. Dynamite Joe Porter, released from Sing Sing Prison beginning of last month, believed to have left the country. What makes you think that Dynamite Joe is in back of his neck? Oh, I just have a hunch that this is one of his jobs. Well, now let's see what Annapolis has to offer. 24 kegs, latest super gunpowder, missing since Friday week. Have you located it? Well, I wish to heaven I had. But what is there in this neighborhood that would interest Dynamite Joe? Well, it has to be something big to tempt that hyena. Well, I know Banks worth his trouble. And he can't be planning to blow up a train. One keg of gunpowder would be more than sufficient for that job. Now, what in this neighborhood would take 24 kegs of it deadly stuff? Maybe he's going to blow up an apple. No, no. In that case, he'd have finished the job when he stole the kegs. Great Scott. Maybe he's going to blow up the capital. No, Washington is upstream. He would, wouldn't have hidden the dynamite five miles downstream if that was what he had in mind. Oh, well, of course. Besides, neither of those blastings would interest Joe. He only dynamites for personal profit. Now, what could that be between here and Annapolis? Well, there's nothing between here and Annapolis, Mr. Carter, but the Smithfield marshes. About the dreariest stretch in the whole Potomac Valley. As you know, the ocean's tides are still in evidence in this district, and from here to Fort Whitney, the flats or marshes behind the river wall are well below the level of the river at high tide. You know, the last time the river wall broke, the water level of the river dropped so fast that several boats were left stranded on the shoals. That's it. Of course, the river wall. Eh? Oh, what a fool I was not to have thought of it before. There must be some boat coming up the river with a cargo valuable enough to attract Joe's attention. But Nick... How... Professor, get your hat. Yes, Patsy. Tell the innkeeper to provide us with a small boat suitable for rowing. We'll need two pairs of oars, one for you and one for the professor. What are you going to be doing while we row? I'll be doing the investigating. Now, come on. Oh, if only we had a reply to the wire I sent to Norfolk, we might have the answer. But in any case, there's no time to lose. We must keep Joe from blowing up that river wall. Faster, you two. Faster. I'm pulling as fast as I can. You wouldn't insist on hugging this river wall. There's a nice breeze out in the middle of the stream. No signs of the dynamite yet. You've got to find it. 
sent for the river patrol to help us, but it'll probably take hours before their speedboat can get here. Oh, Oh, Nick, I just remembered something. What? Another telegram. Came for you while you were seeing about the boat. Must be from Norfolk. Oh, let me have it, please. Well, I'm sorry, Nick, but you rushed us off in such a flurry. It went right out of my mind. Here you are. Thanks. The Nancy Conliffe carrying cargo of captured German gold found in salt mines due to reach due to the point at 10.30 this a.m. What? So that's what Dynamite Joe is after. Quickly, both of you. Back to your oars. Right. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here's something. Something in a cylindrical tin container tucked into the side of the wall just above the waterline. And here's a wire connecting it to another. And another. Yeah. Professor, this whole section of the wall is mine. If you want to set it off by an electrical charge running along this wire. Well, what time is it now? 10.21. If that boat is due at 10.30, the explosion is due any minute. Then let's get out of here. Uh, no, Patsy, we've got to go on. Right, slowly. Slowly. There's something I've got to do. I've got to find out where this wire leads. Where he's hidden the machinery with which to set off this explosive. It seems to lead to that little shack half overhanging the water, doesn't it? The, the one over here at the end of the river wall. Yes. Yes, this is the place. All right, stop it. Okay. Car's passed, so we won't drift away. No granny knots, please. You can depend on me, Nick. I used to be a Girl Scout. Now, let's see. Now, there's a little trap door on the floor of the shack where it hangs over the river. I hope it's not locked. Ah, open. I'm going to take a look inside. If I stand up, I should just about be able to see. Yes. Yes, this is the place. Oh, Nick, you're rocking the boat. I'm going to pull myself up. You too can follow suit. Steady. You're next, Professor. Uh, you'll just give me a hand, Mr. Collar. I, 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 I'm not as agile as you are. Uh, oh, thanks. All right, come on, Patsy. I think we can pull you through between us. I can make it myself, thanks. Maybe, but I'll give you a hand anyway. Now, up you come. Uh, there. Oh, well, you didn't have to be so rough about it. I'd have made it. Right, now. Now, you know, here. Get your hands up in the air. Nick, look. Yes. This, unless I'm mistaken, would be Dynamite Joe Porter. Stick him up, as you say, on your side of the ocean. Seems to be determined. All right, Joe. They're up. That's better. Well, give two blokes. I've been waiting for you all morning. I hoped you wasn't going to be late for the big event. I want you to show this Mr. Nick Carter how it's done on our side of the big pond. Well, now, that's right neighborly, Joe. But aren't you going to search us first to see if we're armed? Not me. In the first place, I ain't giving nobody a chance to do me dirt whilst I'm busy with another chap. Besides, weapons will do you no good. But don't take your hands down. Because one false move and you're a goner. What are you going to do with us, Mr. Dynamite, Joe? I got that all planned out, sister. There's a little steamer coming up the river in a few minutes. The Nancy Cunliffe. Not much to look at, but she's got a cargo of gold bars in her hold that'll make me as rich as Mr. Rockefeller. Delightful. You and me and Mr. Carter here are going to wait right here until this here Nancy Cunliffe runs round the bend. You keep your hands in plain sight all the time and we don't have no trouble, see? When the boat shows up, I blows up the river wall, the water rushes out across the lowlands... And the boat finds she ain't got water enough to sail in and runs aground. Then my lads have a launch, all ready and waiting. They knows what to do. They takes over while I finishes off you nosy snoopers so you won't never bother no one again. You understand what I'm getting at? I'm afraid I do, but I don't quite like it. Or well, maybe something will happen to prevent him from carrying out his unpleasant little scheme. Don't get discouraged yet, Patrick. Spoken like a man, Carter. You don't disappoint me, you don't. I've heard you was a gayman. Thank you. How much longer do we have to wait for the Nancy Connor to appear? Only a few minutes more, matey. Just make yourself comfortable while you're waiting. I won't finish you off now, but the boat might even inside in the middle of the execution. And I can't let nothing interfere with that part of the plan. First the boat, then you blokes. That's the way I planned it, and that's the way it goes. <laughs> Yes, I heard it. I heard it too, mates. And the time's come. When she gets a little further upstream, I'm going to press this here lever in this box. And when I do, it'll be the biggest racket you ever heard. All right.
right now. Here she goes. And I can't tell you how happy I am to have you here as audience. Now then, one, two, three. What that? Something gone wrong, Joe? What could go wrong? I'll fix this up myself. It's got to be right. What the... All right, Joe, get your hands in the air. Fast. Oh, you get him up by some way out. That's better. I'll keep him that way. Oh, good for you, Nick. Oh, that was excellent, Mr. Carter. I feel much relieved. Oh, so do I. Now, Professor, get that rope over in the corner and tie up this big shot from overseas. I think the authorities would like to take care of him for the rest of his life. <laughs> In just a moment, Nick will return to tell us about the clues which enabled him to solve the mystery of the hangman's wood. A lovely home adds to the joy of living, and the three great Linux home brighteners add to the ease of keeping your home lovely. Linux cream polish, for example, renews the original gleaming beauty of your fine furniture, the handsome appearance of the wood grain itself, in one quick, easy application. For Linux cream polish actually cleans as it polishes, to save you one whole step in your cleaning day routine. Yes, that cloudy look left by dust and previous polish is erased in one quick process that also removes blurry fingerprints and helps conceal scratches. And what's more, Linux cream polish leaves no surface oil for dust to cling to. So do as many wise modern homemakers do. Take the streamlined way to furniture care. Linux cream polish, which cleans as it polishes. Ask for all three great Linux home brighteners, Linux cream polish, Linux self-polishing wax, and Linux clear gloss at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. Your headquarters also for Chemtone, the modern wall finish that beautifully decorates the average room for only $2.98. Tomorrow marks the beginning of the mighty 7th wall owned Drive. And the most important thing you can do to support our fighting forces is to invest in war bonds. An investment in final victory, an investment in peace, an investment in America's future, and yours. Eighty-five million Americans hold war bonds, and eighty-five million Americans can't be wrong. Get your extra bond now. Now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Well, Nick, that was a pretty close call you and Patsy had. Well, not as close as you might think, Ken. No? Why, if something hadn't gone wrong with Joe's apparatus, the gunpowder would have gone off, and you wouldn't have had as good a chance to capture him the way you did. But I knew the gunpowder wouldn't go off. But how could you possibly know that, Nick? Well, it was this way. As we rode along the sea wall, I punched a hole in each can of powder with my knife. And as the tide came in, the water flooded the cans and soaked the powder so it wouldn't explode. Oh, Nick, you're wonderful. I'll say, but suppose the tide had been going out instead of coming in. Wouldn't have made any difference, Ken. Because just to be sure, after I punched holes in the cans, I also cut the wires. You always think of everything, Nick. (laughs) Thanks for the word of confidence, (laughs) Betsy. Nick, tell me, when did you first suspect that it was the work of an English gangster? When we heard the voice of that screech owl which was the way that Joe's gang warned each other. You see, our screech owls are quite a different species from those in Great Britain. Oh? When I heard that peculiar, eerie call, I realized it was an imitation of the British screech owl, which is a bird definitely not found in the woods of Virginia. Well, well, live and learn, I always say. And now, how about a hint or so about next week's story? I don't see why not, Ken. It's a story about one of New England's most famous possessions. The rocking chair. Rocking chair has a good homing sound, hasn't it? But this rocking chair only rocked at certain times, certain very definite times, just before some member of the family was to die. Has a nice homey sound, doesn't it? Well, there was nothing homey about the deaths. They happened in all sorts of ways. Until Nick took over the case. Then both the rocking and the death stopped, suddenly and for good. And what do you call this exciting story, Nick? I call it The Haunted Rocking Chair. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written by Edith Miser, and any resemblance therein to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. 
The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America. And saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Man Who Lived Too Long. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated the strange mystery of a dead man who lived eight days in a week. When you keep up with the times, you not only know what's new, but lots of times you find new ways to help yourself. Take, for example, the modern way to save household drudgery. The three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax. Those efficient new shortcuts to the care of woodwork, furniture, and floors. Linux Clear Gloss, which is brushed on, brings lustrous, longer-lasting protection to every wood and linoleum surface in your home. Linux Cream Polish, which cleans as it polishes, renews the sleek, gleaming beauty of your fine furniture. And Linux Self-Polishing Wax, the amazing new wax finish... Lends rich, satiny loveliness to all your floors, wood, linoleum, or tile. What's more, all three great Linux home brighteners do the job in record time. So start now to enjoy leisure. Ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linux home brighteners. The modern shortcuts to new home beauty. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. It's quiet in the old Victorian mansion on the corner of 5th and 4th. Nick Carter is working on some intricate anal and dye tests. Patsy is transcribing notes. A long, calm afternoon of intensive work is ahead. Suddenly, the telephone rings. Nick Carter's office. Patsy, is Nick there? Oh, hello, Lieutenant Riley. Ray, you sound excited. Anything wrong? Plenty's wrong. Let me talk to Nick. Uh, hold it a second. Well, what's bothering Riley today, Patsy? He won't tell me. Here. Thanks. Hello, Riley. What's on hey, your mind? You've got to hustle down to my office at once. Why? I got a case that'll blow the top off the city if it breaks. See, it's got to be checked. Well, what's behind it? Ever hear of world research? Well, who hasn't, Riley? They're the biggest industrial chemists and research labs in the country. Well, there's a guy down here named Baker. He's accusing them of murder. Who's murder? You'll find out when you get here. Come on. Who's murder, Riley? His own murder. This guy Baker here is claiming he's dead already. <laughs> This here is Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker, Nick Carter. I want him to hear your story. Go ahead, Mr. Baker. How has world research murdered you already? As I stand before you now, Mr. Carter, I'm a dead man. Shall be buried in a very few days. Go on. I'm an inventor, Mr. Carter. Not by profession, but by hobby. 
During the day, I'm a broker. Evenings, I work in my laboratory. I've been doing research with a friend of mine named John Dre. You can check that. Get on with your story, man. I want you to check it to prove I'm not crazy. Well, Dre and I have perfected a new radio development that will revolutionize the industry. It's been patented. You can check that, too. We'll decide what to check, Mr. Baker. Go ahead. World Research has been after us for weeks to sell out to them. We refused. Apparently, they were desperate. Today, I found this piece of apparatus connected inside one of my experimental machines. A look at it. Oh, what a mess of wires and tubes that is. It was brought into my laboratory by World Research. It's a gamma ray projector of tremendous power. All the while my experimental radio has been operating, this little horror has been projecting gamma rays until my body is saturated with them. I can't live, gentlemen. World Research has murdered me. What do you want us to do? Check my story from beginning to end. Then let me come down here and begin action against World Research. If I'm going to die, Mr. Carter, I, I want my revenge before I'm in the grave. Look, Mr. Baker, you're talking like an idiot now. Easy, How Riley, we... easy. Mr. Baker, Lieutenant Riley and I'll give this case our most careful attention. You ask for vengeance. I promise you this. You will get it, if you deserve it. Well, Ned? I'm finished, Patsy. Is this apparatus Baker brought in really deadly? No. You mean he lied? I'm not sure. All I do know is that this so-called gamma ray projector is just a mess of tubes and wires. It doesn't make sense. Then the whole case doesn't make sense. And why did Baker come in with that tall story? Yes. Possible world research may be trying to buy him out. But why claim murder? It's such an odd, impossible murder. Maybe he's wacky, Nick. I hear most inventors are. Maybe. Well, there's one way to find out. Get the car, Patsy. We're going to visit Mr. Baker in his laboratory. Oh, Nick, I'm out of breath. How much higher? One flight. The janitor said Baker's lab's on the top floor. I hope I can make it. Now take my arm. Oh, Nick. Are you sure Baker's in? Yes, the janitor said so. Well, then maybe he... Hold it, here we are. Sounds pretty quiet in there. Maybe he went out. Maybe. Wait a minute. Funny. Door's open. Well, let's go in. Gosh, what a mess this place is. I thought all labs were neat, like yours, Nick. Not at all. Only the really efficient ones. Doesn't seem to be anybody here. Can't understand it. Lights on, door unlocked. Nick, Nick. What is it, Betsy? Behind that table on the floor. Look. Uh oh. Baker, all right. He he's dead, isn't he? Yes. Then he was right about those gamma rays and things. No, Betsy. This time no one bothered with science. Someone simply brought a revolver, aimed it at Mr. Baker, and shot him to death. I got over here as fast as I could, Nick. If this ain't the screwiest case I ever came across... You look the body over, Riley. Uh, I've already made a preliminary inspection. He was shot at close range with a twenty-five caliber gun. Colt automatic. One of those lady-sized pocketbook automatics, eh? Yes. How come you're so sure, Nick? Because I found the ejected shell right here. Oh. See? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, what is it, Nick? Well, something I hadn't noticed before. Look there, under the body. You can just see the edge of the handle. Oh, glory be, it's the gun itself. Watch out for prints on it. Oh, Nick, I know better than that. Uh, right as usual, Mr. Carter, it's a twenty-five automatic. Let's have a look at it, Riley. Nick, yeah. maybe Mr. Baker shot himself. Maybe he was so desperate about those gamma rays and stuff. Patsy, he... he didn't commit suicide. He was murdered. How come you're so sure, Nick? Patsy could be right, you know. Look the gun over by reflected light. Not a print on it. How could a man kill himself and then wipe his prints off the gun? Mm. Obviously, someone held this gun with a handkerchief or glove, killed Baker, dropped the gun, and left. But who, Nick? It's question number one. 
I'd also like to know how valuable his invention really is and who profits by his death. Where are you going to start to get the answers? We'll try John Dre, Baker's partner, first. Maybe Mr. Dre's an authority on murder. It's true, Mr. Carter. How radio development is potentially worth a fortune. It's new and tremendously important. Look over the patent yourself. We uh, registered it jointly. Mr. Dre, if you were partners, how is it you and Baker worked in separate labs? Research was only a hobby with Baker. He had a regular brokerage business outside. He wanted a place where he could work now and then, three, four hours a day. Exactly how much did World Research offer you to sell out? quarter of a million. And you refused, Mr. Dre? Uh, not exactly. We made a counteroffer. And now that Baker's dead and the patent's all yours, you're waiting for the answer, huh? Uh, certainly not. I told you we registered the patent jointly. I can't touch Baker's share. Can you tell me who does inherit Baker's share? His sister, I believe, Julia Baker. She lives with him over at the... I know the address. Thanks a lot, Mr. Dre. Oh, uh, by the way... Eh? Yeah? Would it be possible to develop an electrical gamma ray projector? What? Nonsense. I, I, I thought you were a scientist, Mr. Carter. You know gamma rays can only be produced by radioactive elements? Yes, I know it. I'm just wondering if Baker knew I'd know it. Come on, Patsy. Let's pay a visit to Baker's heir. <laughs> I suppose it's true I inherit Ben's share in the invention, Mr. Carter. I I never thought about it much. Miss Baker, tell me, do you know if there's a copy of the patent here? I don't know. I think it's with Ben's attorney. That's Roland York at Maiden Lane. Was your brother working on it very long? For years, it seems. I don't know where he found the time. I hardly ever saw him outside of Sundays. He spent Sunday with me. He worked very hard at the brokerage. Ten hours a day. What did he do? He was the statistical expert. No time off? Hardly any. Must have been pretty lonesome here for you. It was. Even at night when he came home from work, he couldn't spend much time with me. He was so tired. He'd just have dinner and then go to bed. What were his hours at the brokerage office, Miss Barr? He worked from nine in the morning and till nine at night, usually. Mm, pretty stiff hours. And what time did you have dinner at home? Around 9.30. And then your brother went to bed? Yes, around 11. Mm, I see. I... I can't understand who'd want to murder my brother, Mr. Carter. He was a good man, was friendly, was interested in everybody. He... Oh, for heaven's sakes, Mr. Carter, who killed him? I don't know yet, Miss Baker. Frankly, at the moment, I'm much more interested in another problem. Oh, I... I don't understand, Mr. Carter. Come along, Patsy. I want to have a talk with the janitor of the building where Baker's lab is located. Nick, does this fantastic problem that's bothering you have anything to do with Baker's murder? Maybe the crux of the murder... You mean the answer to why Baker lied about that gamma ray projector? No. Well, then I don't Wait get it. Here's the building. All right. Come on. Okay. Here's the janitor's door. Yes. You remember me? Nick Carter? Working on the Baker case. Oh, sure. Come on in, Mr. Carter. It's awful hot here out on the sidewalk. No, I've only come to ask you one question. Oh, here, go ahead. When did Mr. Baker usually work in his laboratory? Why, every day. You're sure? Aye, sure. He worked here every day, Monday through Saturday. He come morning sometime, sometime afternoon, sometimes evenings. But I see him come in here every day except Sunday. He always make it a point to say hello to me when he comes in or goes out. How long did he usually work? 
in four hour stretches. That's what I was afraid of. Four hours a day, six days a week. That makes 24 hours, one whole day. Where in blazes did he get that extra day? Nick, what on earth are you talking about? Don't you see, Patsy? Ben Baker... Got... Uh, Stop, Patsy. Somebody shot at us from across the street. That's all the flashes. I, I... Oh, Nick, the janitor. He's been shot. Help me get him inside, Patsy. Quick. All right. Is he hurt badly? Patsy, this man is dead. <laughs> What is this mysterious question that's bewildering Nick? Why was the janitor in Ben Baker's lab building murdered? We'll see in just a moment. All of us learn best by doing. That's why American homemakers who have used Linux self-polishing wax have learned so quickly how different, how perfect a quick-drying wax can be. For one practical test is all you need to prove to yourself that this new wax preparation is the key to perfect floor care for wood and linoleum alike. The formula for Linex self-polishing wax, developed by leading research chemists, is completely new, giving new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance to all your floors. And Linex self-polishing wax contains the greatest possible amount of genuine carnauba wax for that handsome, satiny look only real wax can give. What's more, the underwriters' laboratories have proved by test that any linoleum, hardwood, or rubber tile floor is actually less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied, as you'll prove for yourself the moment you step on it. And, of course, Linex self-polishing wax takes only a jiffy to use, or you simply wipe it on without tiresome rubbing, and it dries quickly to a beautiful luster that's a joy to behold. So choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax, the finest product of its kind. Ask your dealer now for all three great Linex home brighteners, to give your home new beauty the easy way. And now, back to our story. The strange murder of Ben Baker, broker and amateur inventor, has faced Nick Carter with many peculiar problems. Why did Baker lie about his impending death? How important was his invention? Who would profit by his death? As Nick uncovers an even more fantastic problem, Baker's janitor is shot to death. Now we find Nick, Patsy, and Lieutenant Riley at the scene of the second murder. Nick, I'm really lost. I can't make head or tail of this mess. Can't you give us any idea of what's going on, Nick? Why was Baker's janitor killed? Probably because he knew some vital clue to the identity of the murderer. Nick, what's this big question you say is bothering you? Riley, how can a man live eight days in one week? Oh, not... That's silly, Nick. There's only seven days in anybody's week. Well, nevertheless, Ben Baker lived eight days in a week. I don't understand, Nick. Well, listen. He worked 12 hours a day in the brokerage house, including an hour off for lunch. Uh-huh. He left his house at 8 in the morning for work. He returned at 9.45 or so for dinner. After dinner, he went to bed. I've checked all those times, and they're all verified. Which accounts for 24 hours. But according to the janitor's testimony, he worked at least four hours a day, six days a week in his lab. Mm. That's an extra 24 hours, an extra day. Now, where did Baker get that eighth day in his week? Gosh, it don't make sense. You're telling me. Nick, what in the jumping blue blazes is going on around here? A guy comes around and says he's been murdered, and he ain't. When you check his story, you find all of a sudden he is. Then the killer knocks off a janitor after he's already given his evidence. And then we find the only one who profits by Baker's death is his sister, who's a frightened girl who looks as though she wouldn't hurt a fly. Wait a minute. Baker was knocked off with a twenty-five automatic. It's a woman's gun. But Baker accused World Research. What have we got to do about it? Get a search warrant, Riley. Huh? Meet us down at the office of Baker's attorney, Roland York. I want to get a look at that patent. <laughs> through the files, and here's everything there is on that invention. Oh, gosh, what a mess of documents. Mm. Looks as though it's as much trouble patenting an invention as it is making one. Yes. Mm. Well, Nick, anything phony about this stuff? Strangely enough, no. Mm. Apparently, Baker and Dre have worked out quite a brilliant improvement on radio television transmission. It's not 
effort making, but it's the sort of thing that can cut costs of transmission 50%. Hmm. Patent seems to be legitimate. Made out by Baker and Dre jointly. That's what Dre said. Here's something. Hmm? Baker's share goes to his sister when he dies. That's what she said. Ah, but here's something no one mentioned. Mm -hmm. What's that? If Baker and Dre both die before commercial exploitation of the idea begins, Roland York, the attorney, acquires all commercial rights subject to the obligation to pay both heirs their fair share. Yeah. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, Patsy? I know what you're both thinking. That maybe John Dre is the next man scheduled to die. That may be true, so let's get busy. All right. What do we do? We're up against a shrewd killer. And we don't know exactly what he's after. Although I have a hunch, if we knew where Ben Baker got his extra day, we'd be a lot closer to the solution. Mm. Riley, get hold of Roland York. Yeah. Hold him for questioning. As tactfully as you can. Right, Nick. Patsy, you and I are going places. Where, Nick? To John Dre's laboratory. To protect him? Maybe. Also, maybe, to find Ben Baker's extra day. <laughs> lights on, Nick. Gosh, maybe Dre's been killed already. You're remembering the way we found Baker, huh? All right, let's go in. Oh, who's that? Oh, sorry, Mr. Dre, you startled me. But we are... All right, Betty. Who are you? Oh, let me introduce myself, Mr. Dre. My name is Kent. I'm from World Research. What are you doing here? Why, I... Well... I was sent over to express our deep sympathy for your recent bereavement. So? And also, <laughs> you understand how embarrassing it is to talk business at such a time. Go on. Well, and also to say that your counterproposal is really much too high. You think so, huh? You must reconsider, Mr. Dre. Now that Baker is dead, huh? I... I don't understand. Baker was the one who was holding out for the high price, wasn't he? Well, Mr. Dre. Now that Baker's out of the way, you brazenly come here hoping you can persuade me to accept a smaller figure. I assure you. Nick. Yes, Bessie. I just realized maybe it isn't Roland York. Maybe Baker told the truth about world research. Maybe the patent does threaten their business. Why, maybe they... Did I hear you call this man Nick? Well, I... I, I had assumed I was speaking to Mr. John Dre. Do you mean to tell me that I... What's the meaning of this... What are you people doing in my lab? Investigating murder, Mr. Dre. So I was right. You are an imposter. This is outrageous. How Mr. dare you... Mr. Carter, will you have the goodness to explain what's going on here? Oh, it's really quite simple, Mr. Dre. We came here to throw a little light on the murder mystery That's and... What... Yes, Nick? Say that again. Say what? Really, Carter? This is ridiculous. Quiet, please. Have... Repeat what you said, Patsy. Well, I said we came to Mr. Dre's laboratory to throw a little light on the murder. That's it. Light. Light in the laboratory. And that's the explanation. The explanation of what? Ben Baker's extra day. I think I know where he got it. Come on. Well, where to? Let's go have a look at Baker's electric meter. What's an electric meter got to do with an extra day? It'll show where it went. Here, through this door. Down to the cellar. Watch your step. It's pretty dark. I've got a flash. Gosh, the cellars in these old loft buildings are creepy. Like catacombs. Yes. It's so deep, these stairs go down forever. We won't be long. Flash your light around, will you, Nick? Afraid? Uh, only of mice. Careful, here's the bottom. Don't trip. The right. floor's pretty broken up. Now, where are the meters? Well, there they are, Nick. Over there against the far wall, behind that pile of barrels. All right, come on. Who's the killer, Nick? Do you know? Not for sure yet. But I've got a pretty good idea. Maybe Julia Baker isn't as weak and helpless as she seems. Maybe. Maybe I was right about world research. Maybe. Maybe Roland York got ambitious. Maybe. Can't you say anything but maybe? Uh, here's the meters. Let's see. First, second. Oh, there. Top floor officers. Baker's was 6R. There it is, on the right. Yes, and there, I hope, is the solution to the case. Where? On the dials. 
Read off the kilowatt hours. But why, Nick? Because when we compare the meter reading now with the reading a month ago, we'll find that very little electricity has been used. Nick, I can't follow you. What is that? Now, Patsy, behind these barrels. It's the killer. Nick, we're trapped. No, Patsy, not quite. Let him come a little closer. When I give the word, help me push these barrels over. All right, now, Patsy. All right, we can come out now. Our friend's been knocked cold. We'll find him under a couple of crates. But who is it, Nick? Put your light on quickly. In a second. I'll be happy to illuminate the very unattractive face of your murderer. And there you are. Gee, Nick, that's... Yes, Mr. John Drake. In just a moment, Nick will return to give you the final details of today's story and explain why John Dre killed the man who lived too long. The best way to keep up the appearance of the things you own is to protect them. And the finest protective finish you can find for dozens of household uses is Linex Clear Gloss, the modern brush-on finish for linoleum and wood surfaces. Here's the self-leveling gloss finish which flows on easily and dries to a lasting finish that protects for months. Protects not only against wear, against dirt, against spotting, but actually protects against hot grease, boiling water, fruit acids, even alcohol. Yes, for any surface you want to save, it pays to use Linex Clear Gloss. And Linex Clear Gloss lends sparkling beauty as well, requiring only the whisk of a damp cloth to wipe away surface smudges. Give your floors and woodwork the gleaming luster, the sturdy protection of Linex Clear Gloss, the finest in household finishes. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners, Linex Clear Gloss, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Cream Polish for fine furniture at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that goes on like magic. Its beautiful colors will lighten and brighten your home at an average cost of just $2.98 a room. Ask for Chemtone, which covers in one coat, dries in one hour. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, where did Baker get that extra day? He didn't, Ken. That's the point of the whole case. Baker never spent any time at all in that lab. If he had worked there experimenting, his meter would have registered many hours of electricity. But as it was, the meter showed almost no electricity used at all. But, Nick, the janitor said he was there. Which is why the janitor was killed. John Dre rented the lab in Baker's name. Then he killed the janitor to keep him from telling me that the man found dead in the lab, Baker wasn't the man who said hello to him as he went in and out. But why was that necessary, Nick? Baker and Dre made the mistake of patenting their invention jointly. Now, the patent law is very strict on one point. It provides that only the actual inventor is permitted to take out the patent. If any other name appears on the patent, it's thereby automatically void. Oh, I see. So World Research could have broken the patent if they found out that Baker was not an inventor, but merely Dre's financial backer. Right, Patsy. And rather than take that chance, Dre tried to set up a false identity for Baker. He told Baker to go to the police with his story about being murdered, hoping that when the police checked up on him, they'd believe that Baker actually was a practicing scientist. Well, then why did he kill Baker after all? Dre was afraid someone might cross-examine Baker and get the truth. We killed Baker to keep the secret secure. Well, Nick, how about a little preview of next week's story? Well, next weekend, Patsy and I are called to the home of the foremost amateur art collector in the country to find out why one of his portraits has suddenly started squinting. Did you say squinting? He did. And he wouldn't have been able to break the case if he hadn't taken the fingerprints of a man who died 200 years ago. Fingerprints? 200 years old? And squinting portraits? For the love of Pete, Nick, what do you call this case? I call it the case of the nearsighted picture. Today is the second anniversary of the United States Cadet Nurse Corps. And today, America has urgent need of 60,000 cadet nurses. 
Every cadet nurse is a girl with a future. The United States Cadet Nurse Corps offers all expense scholarships, plus monthly allowances and uniforms to high school graduates under 35 who are in good health. And candidates joining 90 days prior to the war's end will be allowed to finish their training. Don't overlook this opportunity to serve. Inquire at your local hospital now. Join the United States Cadet Nurse Corps and do your part. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Helen Choate as Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linex home brighteners. Linex self-polishing wax, Linex cream polish, and Linex clear gloss, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linex dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. <laughs> Yes, it's the case of the make-believe robbery. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. So I says to the director, well, how about putting me in this picture, too? Why should I pay you ten bucks to see? You ain't no cop. Oh, ain't I, I says to him. I'm Waldo McGlynn, that's who I am. I don't wear no uniform, but I'm the best doggone detective in this town. Well, when he hears that, he says, Okay, give the other cops a hand holding back the crowd there. Well, why don't you... Quiet, quiet, everybody, quiet. Let me have your attention, please. We're ready to start shooting. Each one of you pull his pinot to the job ready to do. Okay, now here's the layout. The bandit car drives up, the two cooks get out of the car, walk into Ryan Gold's jewelry store, and go straight through the store to the offices in the back. The camera will follow them as they go. Without taking any sound now, that'll be dubbed in later. Then, as the crooks come out of the store again, they'll get in the car and drive up the street. The sound truck and camera will follow them for some other shots later. Is that clear? Now, you know, you know what he means? Yeah, I know. All right, stand by. Everybody in the scene, act natural, please, and don't look at the camera. Here comes the bandit car. On your boat, huh? All right, you two crooks. Look around. Now walk into the store. Don't hurry. Now, straight down the main aisle to the rear. That's it. Now go into the office. You know what to do there. All right, now stand back. Don't shout. Take it easy, will you? Gee, McGlynn, this is exciting being part of a real moving picture. Oh, I don't know. It's all right if you ain't never done it before. Have you ever been in a picture before? Have I been in a picture? Have I been in a picture? That's what I said, have you? Um, you? You know, this ain't a bad way to make ten bucks, just standing around watching some other guys work. Yeah, I bet you've never been in a picture. Hey, those were pistol shots. Come on. Hold it, you dope. Those were part of the moving picture, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to find out what you'd do if... Oh, I... you kid. Uh, look, when I was out in Hollywood, I used Why to... Why, the, the two uh, are coming back now. All right, you two, now just take it easy. Nobody's going to stop you. That's it. Now get into your car and drive off down the street. We'll follow you for the other seats. Now get going. We'll be right behind you. 
You policemen hold back the crowd until we get well down the street, and then you can let them go. You'll get your checks at headquarters tonight. Thanks, and so long. Well, that's that. Yeah, I sure wish I could make ten bucks. Hey, what is it, lady? The cashier's been murdered. They shot him down. It's cold blood. Take it easy, lady. He ain't dead. This was just... He is dead, I tell you. Shot for the head. He's really dead. (laughs) Mr. Carter, you got to do something. I'm worried. That's why I'm here, Mr. Rangold. Mary, I'm amazed that at least one of your cops wasn't bright enough to have seen through this phony moving picture business. Oh, don't rub it in, Nick, please. Was headquarters ever approached at all? Never. The individual cops were the only ones they contacted. One million dollars away, the beautiful stones they took right out of the main safe and killed my cashier. Well, don't you carry insurance on your jewels, Mr. Rangold? Oh, sure, I carry insurance, but I lose all my stock stones. Ah. Well, did you know about this moving picture business in advance? Oh, sure I did. About 11 o'clock this morning, a guy who said he was Fred Harlan, a director for Colossal Pictures, come in and asked me, could they use my store for making a movie? Said they wanted a one-story building like mine, not too big, but important. I said, would the sign over the store show in the picture? And he said, yes. So I told him, okay. Did this man who said he was Harlan have any credentials? Oh, sure. Sure, his papers was good. Colossal Pictures, it said. Who was here with you at the time? Uh, there was me, my nephew, Lester Green, and my cashier. What did this Harlan look like? Well, a little bigger than me. Blonde hair, good looking, about 45 maybe. He was wearing sunglasses, the Hollywood kind. Mm-hmm. You keep the safe open or closed during the day? Always. It's closed. So much jewels it contains. When we want something, we unlock it. Take out what we want and then quick close it and lock it again. Who had the combination? Well, me, my nephew Lester, and my cashier, nobody else. Keep the burglar alarm on or off during the day? Always, it's on. Uh, we have a button to turn it off when we want to get in. See right here. The... Look, the alarm is still on. Why didn't it go off when the safe was open? If the alarm wasn't turned off. We can be sure the cashier didn't open the safe for them. Let's see. Huh. Here's why the alarm didn't work. What you got, Nick? The alarm wire's been cut. Piece taken out of it to make sure it was stay cut. Uh, hey, Nick. Since the safe wasn't forced open and the cashier didn't open it, that means the crooks had the combination. Mr. Rheingold, you say only the three of you knew the combination? Yeah, that's right. And one of you three helped in this robbery, and the cashier is dead, which lets him out, I should say. Well, then you think me or Lester, we should rob ourselves? It's been done before. Oh, come in, come in. I got here as quick as I could, Mr. Rheingold. Who are you? Well, I'm Mickey Armbruster, the store detective. What were you doing while they pulled off this fast job? Well, I'm off on Monday, Sergeant. I work Sundays as watchman, and Lester takes over for me on Monday. Ah. Oh. Mr. Rheingold called me, so I came right down to see if there was anything I could do. I don't think so, thanks. By the way, where is Lester? Since the robbery, I ain't seen him to no good. Well, let me know when he comes back, will you? I'd like to talk to him. Oh, sure, sure. Right away, I'll tell you. Waldo, was the sound truck... A colossal truck? Well, no, Nick. I noticed it came from the Kramer Sound Equipment Company. Why? That's strange. Should think that if Colossal was doing the job, they'd furnish their own truck. Colossal had nothing to do with it, Nick. We checked. That part was as phony as the rest of it. Uh, maybe there ain't no Fred Harlan either, Nick. That's the odd thing about this, Waldo. There is a Fred Harlan. Huh? Well, there was, years ago. He used to be top director in the Colossal lot. Maybe this wasn't that Harlan, Nick. That thought occurred to me, too, Matty. Well, we've done all we can here. You said there were no fingerprints? My men couldn't find one anywhere. Oh, it was a slick job. And let's go. See you later, Mr. Rangold. Yes, sure, sure. Matty, I suggest you have some of your men check up on this Rangold and this nephew of his, Lester Green. Yeah. Also, check the Kramer Sound Equipment people and see if they can help us. Waldo and I are going to drop in on Scubby and see what he can dig up for us and Fred Harlan. Right, Nick. Be seeing you. <laughs> Mr. Kramer ain't here now. When will he be back? I don't know. Look, have you seen a fellow with blonde, wavy hair around here in the last couple of days? Blonde, wavy hair? Yeah. Wish my hair was wavy. I tried my sister's hair crown stuff, but it didn't do no good. Did you see that guy around? Maybe I should have wore a hairnet like she does. Look, Dimwit, can you answer me a plain, simple question? Sure, well, go ahead. Ask me a question. Ask me a question. Look, has a guy with blonde, wavy hair been around here lately? The fellow directed the movie this noon had wavy hair. That's the one I mean. Have you seen him? Yeah, he was directing the crooks. 
and they shot off guns, and a woman came rushing out and yelled, murder, but she didn't fool me. I'm too smart. Yeah, yeah, I'll see you. She said somebody had been killed, but I knew better. A man was killed. That's why I... Well, you, huh? Well, maybe you've never been to the movies. They shoot a guy, and blood runs all down his face, and he falls down. Oh. That's only ketchup. I read about it in the book. Why, you dumb half-witted dope. You ought to what be... What are you doing here, Lenny? Uh, oh, I was just hanging around. Well, why don't you go home? I told you not to hang around the office. Oh, I won't Hey, you Ted Kramer? Yes, here I am. What can I do for you? I'm Mathis. I'm homicide. Oh. You seen a man with blonde wavy hair around here recently? Well, you must mean Fred Holland, the movie director. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, sure. He was in here yesterday. Hired my sound truck. Did he uh, tell you anything about himself? Well, he said he was an old-time director. He showed me his credentials. Said yeah. he was doing a job for a Colossal, but they weren't finishing the truck because the job was too small. He had to finish the cameraman, too. Know who he was? Yeah, he's a friend of mine. I recommended him, and Holland hired him. Darn good man, too. Does a lot of picture work. Uh, what does this Holland look like? Oh, God. Five ten, good looking man of about forty five, I'd say. Yes. Uh, wore big Hollywood sunglasses. But it was raining yesterday. Yeah, yeah, I know. But you know these Hollywood nuts. All right. Did he tell you anything about the job he was going to do? Yeah, he did. He, he was all excited about it. Said he was just shooting a few scenes, but it would give him a chance to show that he was still a good director. Mm -hmm. He's trying to make a comeback. He said. Your truck's not back yet, huh? No, no. He, he said he'd probably keep it all day. Well, okay. Thanks. Uh, see you later. Come on. <laughs> Well, here you are, Nick. This is everything I can find in the files about Fred Harlan. Thanks, Cubby. Hey, look at the bunch of stuff he's got there. That Harlan must have been quite a guy. Well, he sure was. Here, Waldo, you take these clippings. Okay. Cubby, you take these. Yep. I'll go through these others. Okay. Oh, here's a picture of the guy, Nick. Oh, let me see. Uh, that's the guy, Nick. That's the lad who directed the movie this morning. Sure as you're a foot high. Yes? The date of this. Oh, taken 15 years ago. No change in his looks in 15 years? I wish I could do that. Nobody can do that, Scubby. That's what interests me. And he had his horoscope told, too. <laughs> oh, anything for publicity, Walter. Yeah, I see. Yeah, and here's an article about him and his fingerprints, too. Hmm? He didn't miss a trick. Let me have that, Waldo. Yeah, sure. Oh, here are the last ones, Nick. Reports of his accident and the follow-up stories. Accident, huh? Serious? Almost fatal. Doctor said he suddenly cracked up while he was driving. Went over an embankment and was badly broken up. Well, let me see those, will you? Oh, well, sure. Here you are. Thanks. Hmm. Ribs broken, arm broken two places, leg cracked, bad cuts on head, long jagged cut under right ear. Cut under right ear. Yes. I seem to remember seeing a scar like that very recently. You mean Harlan still has it, Nick? I've never seen Harlan, Scully. But I've seen that scar somewhere today. Where, Nick? I'm not sure. Spent months in the California Medical Hospital under the care of Dr. Edward Wilson. That all, Scully? Yeah, that's all. He dropped out of sight after that. All right, thanks. That helps a lot. Now I'll call the office and see what's happened there. Then we'll look up Harlan himself if we can find his address. And if there is such a person... <laughs> Not much, Patsy. The boys are... Oh, one moment, Sergeant. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Patsy, Nick. Have you heard anything from Eddie yet? Oh, he's right here. You want to talk to him? Yes, put him on. Nick wants to talk to you, Sergeant. Oh, thanks, Patsy. Hello, Nick. Mary, anything new? Well, the boys just found the sedan the crooks used about six miles out of town near the river. The sound truck is in the river. They're hauling out soon as the crane gets there. Any reports on Ryan Gold or Lester Green yet? Yeah, we've been working fast. Nothing much on Rheingold, except that he had his stuff completely insured, so he won't lose a nickel. But this nephew of his, this Lester, seems to have been quite a lad in days past. That's so. Yeah. Has a long record with the Hollywood police. Oh, nothing serious, just some studio brawls and several arrests for reckless driving. Lost his job at the studio because he was so wild. You mean he worked in the studio? Yeah, he was a bit actor for a while. And he'd know the movie technique, wouldn't he? What? My golly, Nick. He sure would. Has he turned up yet? No, he hasn't. But we got the boys watching for him. Good. Going out to have a look at the truck when they get it out of the river? I'm on my way there now, yeah. I'll take Patsy with you, will you? Why, sure. What do you want her to do? Put her on. I'll tell her. Okay. Here, Patsy. Nick wants you. Thanks. Yes, Nick? Patsy, listen. I want you to go with Maddie. 
Get the license number of the crook's car so we can trace it. Uh-huh. Get copies of any fingerprints Matty finds and any other dope you can get. Bring them back to the office. All right, Nick. Uh, call Dr. Wilson at... Carter here. I want to see Carter. Oh, hold it, Nick. I'm sorry, but Mr. Carter's not in just now. Who are you, please? I'm Lester Green. Lester Green. Just the boy I want to see. Well, who are you? Sergeant Matheson, Homicide Bureau. Oh, so you're the guy. What the devil do you mean by telegraphing Hollywood? Checking up on me. We wanted to find out what kind of a guy you are. And we did. Oh. So I get into a couple of jams out there. What's that to you? Plenty. Right now? Well, I was just a kid when I was in Hollywood six years ago. I'm different now. Says you. You got into jams out there. Now you're in a jam here. Who says I'm in a jam? I do. You want a poke in the nose? Just one little poke, mister, and you'll find yourself behind bars. Okay, Nick, I'll take care of it. Now then, what do you know about the robbery of your uncle's store? The store? Yeah. Oh, Rob? Yeah. Oh, when? Oh, I suppose you don't know nothing about it. Well, no, I don't. Huh? <laughs> well, then you won't mind answering a few questions for me, will you? Oh, gosh, no. Well, that's better. Now, I gotta go out to have a look at that truck, so suppose you come along with me. On the way, you can tell me everything you've done since you got up this morning. <coughs> Sticks by now. Are you sure we're going right? That's what the cop said. Straight ahead to the next gas station and turn right. Yeah, maybe this address we're going to is a phony, Nick. Just because Harlan gave it to the man he rented the sedan from, don't, don't prove he really lives there. It doesn't prove he doesn't, do you? Yeah. Oh, look, there's a gas station up ahead, Nick. One of them little one-pump places. Good. That must be it. I hope he's got something to eat there. I'm starved. How many you want, please? Fill it up. Should take about five gallons. Okay. By the way, do you happen to know of a man by the name of Fred Harlan lives around here? Harlan, sure thing. Lives about half a mile up this road. Seen him lots of times. Good looking fellow. Blonde, wavy hair, about my height. Wears big sunglasses. Yup, that's the fellow. Does he always wear those sunglasses? Oh, sure, all the time. Oh, once he took them off to wipe them, I seen he had the bad cock in his left eye. Guess he don't want nobody to see his bum eye. Anybody live up there with him? Oh, never see anybody. Always alone when he come in here. You want anything else? Oh, you better look at the oil. Okay. Do you know anything about his business? Oh, yeah, he was here a couple of days ago. Told me he was movie director. Said he was going to have a chance to make a picture and get his yacht back again. It's the same guy, all right, Nick. And it is Harlan. Maybe. Have you seen him in the last few hours? No. He went out of here this morning early. I ain't seen him since. Well, his dog is still there, though. I hear him barking a while back. The mean creature of that dog. Harlan told me once I'd better keep away from his place if I didn't want to get that up. I see. Well, how much do I owe you? Well, six gallons cash is a dollar twenty. Uh, your oil's all right. Here you are. Uh, you got anything to eat here? I uh, got some hot dogs and some candy bars. Uh, hot dogs. Them's for me. Uh, give me two. Uh, you want mustard or cold slaw on them? Yeah, put them both on. I ain't fussy. And a pickle, too. Give me two hot dogs. No mustard or anything. Not even a roll. Just the plain franks. Two? Uh, without no rolls. No nothing. Hey, uh, yes, plain. That's right. Well, it seems to me you've been crazy, but it's your business. I thought you never ate them things, Nick. I don't. I'm buying them for a friend. I hope he likes them. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, Nick, it's almost dark here under these trees. Yes. Oh, oh. Isn't a very attractive place, Harlan is in. That must be the dog you told us about. Yeah, the, the, the dog. I, I hope he don't decide to take a bite out of my leg. Well, if my plan goes right, Walter, this dog won't take a bite out of either of us. Well, now, let's see if Harlan is home. Seems to be no one here but the dog. Well, let's see if we can get this door open. This is easy. Now what? Now I open the door just a crack like this. And give Mr. Fred Harlan's dog the little beanies I bought for him. Nice doggy. Bet you're hungry. Here, see how these taste. You think you're going to be his pal for life because you bring him a little hot dog? You're crazy, Nick. Perhaps, and perhaps not. And feeling tired, doggy? Well, lie down, take a little nap. That's the way. 
Now close your eyes. Hey, what are you doing, Nick? Hypnotizing him? Yeah, now we can open the door all the way and walk in. Well, well holy mackerel. That hound is dead to the world. Well, what did you do to him, Nick? Just fed him the two hot dogs he bought at the gas station, that's all. You mean them two weenies did that to him? Those two weenies, Waldo, had a couple of knockout drops in them. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. Now, let's see what we can find here. Well, this room hasn't been used recently. Try the next one. No, no, this one ain't either. Dust is thicker than the rug. That's just the kitchen. Yeah. Can you use this room, all right? What a mess. If you start hunting for clues in this place, you got yourself an all-night job. And I can't spend that much time on it. Well, let's have a look upstairs. Yeah. You, you know, the, the guy at the gas station said he never spent much time here. Well, maybe he just lived in one room in the kitchen. I think you're right, Waldo. Yes. And this is undoubtedly the room he used when he was here. Nick, do you suppose the crooks talked Harlan into a deal and then, then bumped him off when they were through with him? Well, though, the fact that the man who ran this show looked like the Harlan of 15 years ago leads me to believe that there's been an impersonation. Yeah? But, but who impersonated who? That's what I'm trying to find out. Now, first, let's pick out some good fingerprints. Should be plenty of them in this dressing table. Yeah, yeah. And here. Lift them off for the files. You mean, you mean the way you showed me the other night, huh? Yes, use the clear scotch tape. Okay, Nick. Hey, did you notice all the makeup he's got here? Yes, and there's several pictures here that look like those taken 15 years ago. You notice? Yeah. Looks as if they've been used as models for making up. And here, what's this? Huh. Hair. Blonde, wavy hair. Hey, that's what we're looking for, ain't it? Yes. Uh-huh. Now we're getting somewhere. Well, no, these hairs didn't come out of a head. They came off a wig. Off in a wig? How do you know? I have no roots on them. Made up in a wig, yeah? Now, I know that was an impersonation. Oh, Nick, Nick. Just happen to see this here in the, in the wastebasket. What is it? It's a piece of wrapping paper from Rheingold's jewelry store. And do you see what it says on it here? To be called for. Yes. And look at the name of the one who was to do the calling. Yeah. Well, well, what's the connection between him and Harlan, Nick? A very strong one, I believe. You got any ideas? I have. Right now, we're going back to the office to gather up lo what loose ends we can. And you're going to bring Harlan's dog along with you. Bring the dog? Are you crazy, Nick? Maybe I am. I bring him along just the same. <laughs> truck up out of the river, they found this megaphone in it. And it has fingerprints on it. You mean the water didn't wash them off? Water doesn't hurt prints, Waldo. Patsy, did you get a picture of them? Uh-huh. Sergeant Madison gave me one. Here. Now, where did I put that news picture? Ah, oh, yes. Here it is. Now, let's see. Ah. The prints on the megaphone match the picture of Harlan's prints exactly. Then, by golly, Nick, it was the original Harlan who did the job. Is that good or bad, Nick? Anything that helps solve the case is good, Patsy. And if Harlan himself did it, it's certainly one step near the end. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Oh, yes, just a moment, please. I'll put Mr. Carter on. And Nick is Dr. Wilson of the California Hospital. He's the one who treated Harlan after his accident. Oh, yes. Hello, Dr. Wilson. Yes. Uh-huh. I see. Wouldn't have recognized him, huh? Yes, of course. Well, Doctor, do you know where he went after he left the hospital? Oh, he did? I see. Well, thanks very much, Doctor, for taking the time to call me like this. I really appreciate it. Goodbye. Well, Nick? Just as we suspected. When Harlan left the hospital, it would have been difficult for even his old friends to have recognized him. He was badly mm -hmm. cut about the head and had lost over 50 pounds. Dr. Wilson said he was in pretty bad shape. And he came back here to live. Nick, Nick, I'm getting all balled up here. If Harlan actually is Harlan, he couldn't look the way he did 15 years ago before the accident. But if he does look the way he did then, it can't really be Harlan, which it is. Oh, boy, you are tangled up, aren't you? Patsy, call Maddie and tell him to meet us at Rangel's store. Waldo, how's the dog? You're still sleeping, Glory B. He's a mean son of a gun, that one. Okay, put him under your arm and let's go. Put him under your arm and let's go, he's... It's all I can do to lift a brute off the floor. No, don't cry, Waldo. Just be glad it isn't a great day. A great... Oh, nuts. Come on, you. Hi, 
morning, Matty. Hello, Nick. Ah, so you brought Lester, too, huh? Excellent. Yep, I thought we might as well all be here for the fireworks. Oh, Mr. Carter, you got news for us yet? I have, Mr. Rangold. I have news, the solution of the case in the name of the murderer. Hey, you hear that, Mickey? That's the kind of a detective you should be. The way you should catch more people stealing in my store, maybe. Well, how'd you do it, Mr. Carter? I don't mind learning something when I can. I studied the facts and found out more facts. I discovered that this robbery today was the result of years, probably, of careful planning. Of leading a double life. Of the killer being himself half the time and somebody else the rest. I learned that a man was so badly broken down through a nervous collapse in an automobile wreck that his own friends wouldn't have known him. And he traded on that fact, got himself a job of trust and confidence. In fact, he became an employee of a jewelry store. He was a store detective. Well, what do you know about Carter? Are you insinuating I'm insinuating nothing. I'm giving facts. You got yourself this job here, watched and schemed and planned, and when you were ready, pulled this phony movie set up and robbed the safe. Well, that's hard to believe, Nick. Have you got proof? Waldo, let the dog in. Okay, Nick. I'm glad I am to do it. Hey, hey, what's all this, Nick? Why the dog act? That dog belongs to Harlan. He also belongs to Mickey, as you can see by the way he greets him. For a while, I thought somebody impersonating Harlan had done this robbery, but I finally realized that the man who impersonated Harlan was Harlan himself, now known as Mickey Armbruster. Well, man, Mick sucks. <laughs> you got more proof than a dog, Mr. Carter? I have. When Maddie takes Mickey's fingerprints, you'll find that they match these prints of Harlan's I found in a newspaper. And they'll match the prints found in the megaphone the phony movie director used. And you'll find Mickey knew the combination of the safe also. It took time to get it, but he was in no hurry. When he was here in the store Sunday watching, he cut the burglar alarm wires as a safety precaution. And he wore the dark glasses while he was playing Harlan to conceal the cast in his eye, which, as Mickey, is so plainly evident. Well, Mickey, am I right? Yes, Carter, you're right. I thought my plan was foolproof, that by impersonating myself as I looked 15 years ago, I'd throw you all off the track. My jewels, Mickey, you bum, they're my jewels. Why, you'll never see them. My pals will take care of me when the time comes. Who will work with you, Mickey? You don't really expect me to tell you that, do you? They're friends of mine. I'm going to need friends before this is over. You don't have to tell us who they are, Mickey. We'll find them without your help. As a movie director, you should know better than to take moving pictures of your pals and then not destroy the film. That's the best evidence in the world. The camera was on the sound truck when we drove it into the river. It was, but it just happens that the camera was watertight and the film is still good. It's being developed right now. And when we get a look at it, we'll be able to pick up your pals and recover all of Ryan Gold's jewelry. The movie you were making may have been a phony, but the film you took was real. And your conviction... And your conviction is going to be real, too. You can depend on that. Well, Nick, before you give us a peek into your story for next week, I want to talk for a moment to the young men of America. You know, it is no longer true, if it ever was, that men join the Army only if they can't get jobs anywhere else, or if they're not fitted for some other job, or if they're too lazy to look for one. The new American Army of today is a compact, carefully chosen group of skilled technicians with brains and ability. Young men seeking to enter the Army today must be able to understand and profit by technical training that is second to none. The skills that the men in the new American Army acquire, no matter what branch of the service they may be in, equals and often exceeds that demanded by many of the best-paid civilian trades. You can do no better for yourself and your country than to join the new American Army and become an informed technician in at least one of the many specialized fields offered. Excellent advice, Ken. Well, Lake, uh, what about your story next week? Well, next week, Ken, I'm going to tell you about an adventure I had recently when an explosion of unknown origin burned down a warehouse. An alarm clock missing from an ex-soldier's trailer proved that the fire was incendiary. And a bit of green paint on a crowbar led us directly to the firebug himself. Who wasn't a firebug at all, but a crook who wanted to get rid of some very incriminating evidence. What do you call this story, Nick? I call it the case of the missing alarm clock. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In the broadcast of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Ron Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, Waldo by Humphrey Davis, and Scubby by John Kane. Nick Carter, Master Detective, 
is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at the same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Unwritten Letter. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated the strange murder of a man who died with a blank letter in his hand and captured a killer through an interview with a corpse. All work and no play makes Jill a tired housekeeper, but any homemaker can have enjoyable leisure time to spend as she likes when she depends on the three great Linux home brighteners, those efficient new shortcuts to the care of woodwork, furniture, and floors. Linux clear gloss, the modern brush-on finish, Linux cream polish for fine furniture, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. Yes, the three great Linux home brighteners are the modern way to save household drudgery. They'll do your work in record time and do it with spick and span thoroughness. So start now to enjoy new leisure. Ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linux home brighteners, the efficient shortcuts to new home beauty. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. Breakfast is over in the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th. And Patsy and Nick are on their way into the master detective study to begin the morning's work. When suddenly... Oh, bother. I might have known there wouldn't be any peace today. Just when we need it. Nick Carter's office. Uh, Miss Bowen. Sergeant Matheson. I hope this is a social call, Sergeant. We've got a whole morning's work ahead of us. Yeah, Ask Nick if he'd like to be interrupted. Nick, Sergeant Matheson wants to know if he'd like to have your work interrupted. Ask him for what? For what, Sergeant? I don't think Nick will settle for anything less than murder. Ask him how he'd like to be haunted this morning. Haunted? Yeah. That sounds interesting. Let's have the phone, Patsy. Hello, Matty. Aha. Uh-huh. Gotcha, hey, Nick? What's all this about haunts? Uh, some dame called up this morning from an old loft building down in the village. 23 Blaine Street. She claims she's being haunted. Not at night, mind you, but during the day. Uh-huh, daytime goes. That's a new one. Yeah, she claims they rumble at her all day long. I'm just on my way down there. You want to come along? For spooks that rumble by day, you bet. Meet you in front of the building in 20 minutes. Right. Bye. Get your hat, Patsy, and put in a call for the car. You and I have a date with a ghost. This is it, Patsy. 23 Blaine. Golly, what an ancient building this is. Looks as if Peter Stuyvesant built it. There's Matty coming down the street. Oh, good morning, Nick. Morning, Matty. Good morning, Miss Bowen. Hi. So Nick wouldn't settle for anything less than murder, eh? I notice you beat me here. I take it all back, Sergeant. Let's go in and meet the ghost. Who was it called you, Matty? Oh, some dame named Madame Sear. Uh, that's her name there on the letterbox. Madame Sear. Medium. Well, if that isn't the payoff. A medium afraid of ghosts. And in the daytime. Door's locked. Must be a bell button under Madame Sears' nameplate. Ring it, Bessie. Okay, I will. Oh, Nick! It's a little up a piece. Better get in there fast, Matty. Get your shoulder against the door. Uh, go shooting guns uh, together, Nick. <laughs> All right, again. <laughs> what more should you do? <laughs> Careful. Watch out for the debris, Patsy. Right. Come on, Matty. Uh, this isn't tall enough to be the scullery. What is it, Nick? Hold it. 
Said I wouldn't settle for anything less than a murder, Patsy, huh? Well, you were right. There's a man on these steps. And he's been shot to death. All right, quiet, everybody, please. Quiet. Quiet. Matty, I'm not ready to examine the people in this building yet. I want them to be taken to a room and kept there. Right. York. Get them out of here. Yes, sir. All right, all of you, get going. Yes, sir. Come on, over here. Just follow the detective there. Go on, follow him. Okay, Nick. Now, what's the score? I've searched this man's pockets. His name's Joe Kane. Address and business unspecified. Uh-huh. We shot through the chest twice with a forty-five caliber slug. Died instantly. Yeah? What do those bruises and scratches on the face mean, Nick? Kane was killed somewhere on the stairs. He dropped and rolled partway down. Anything else? Two clues. One fairly unpromising. The other... Very odd. Ah, go ahead. He's got a racing sheet in his pocket. A schedule of some small racetrack in a town upstate. Uh, I've never heard of the place, or the horses listed. But then again, Nick, we don't know too much about horse racing. And uh, the odd clue. In Kane's hand was clutched a large blue envelope, right here. Uh-huh. Apparently, the reflex of death made him hold tight. Well, what's odd about that? One thing. There's no address, stamp, or mark on the envelope. There's a sheet of paper inside. With nothing written on it. Well, for the love of Pete. An envelope without an address. A letter with nothing written on it. But what does that mean? I wish I knew. But I've got a hunch if we could answer that question, we'd know who killed Joe Kane and why. Well, we know one thing, Nick. It's got to be one of the people in this building. We covered the front door. No one came out while we were going in. That's right. We've already checked the roof. It's sealed shut. No one went out that way. And the back door is bolted on the inside. The windows? All barred with heavy grates. The killer's got to be one of the people inside. Good work, Matty. Now, what about him? Well, there are three floors in this building. Each one is occupied. The first floor, Madame Sear, the ghost fear and medium. The one who called you. Yeah. The second floor, a guy named Charles Dower. Business as yet unspecified. The top floor is Hal Trask. He's a printer. Madame Sear, Charles Dower, Hal Trask. Right. That makes three. Uh, plus the janitor, a guy named Olson, who was... Sweeping around the upper stairs. I see. All right. Let's go in and have a talk with him. Uh, York's got him in Madame Sears' studio. You going to question him separately, Nick? No. All together. Right. Sometimes when four witnesses gel in a community story, it's easier to break them down later individually. All right, all right. Now, quiet, folks. Quiet, please. Now, uh, this is Nick Carter. He wants to ask you a few questions. We've all seen the dead man. Has any of you ever seen him before? Seen him alive? Well, Either you're afraid to answer, or none of you has ever seen him. Now, which is it? You. You, Mr. Olson, aren't you? Yes, sir. Ever seen the dead man before? Uh, no, sir. I, I don't see much of anybody in this building, sir. I... That is right, Mr. Carter. We are all quiet. We all value our privacy. Hmm. None of us pry into the secrets of strangers. We do not peek at those who walk the stairs. We keep to ourselves. Madam Sear. You telephoned to complain about ghosts this morning? It was a revelation from the other world. I am ashamed of my first fear. I no longer complain. And Mr. Trask? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Printer, sir. Glow press up on the top floor. I never seen the dead man before, Mr. Carter. I see. Mr. Dower? Yes, sir. Hello. Aren't you bad luck, Charlie Dower? Served two terms in Atlanta, specialist in card marking and tin horn gambling rackets. Oh, Mr. Carter, no wonder I... his business was unspecified, Matty. Hey, what a memory you got, Nick. I'd forgotten Dower. He's been out of circulation five years. So here we are. Unknown, Mr. Kane murdered on the steps of this building by one of you four. All of you claim you never saw the man before. And I have the problem of finding which one of you is lying. Well, not me. All right, quiet, quiet. Well, what's the program, Nick? All these people should stay inside the building. I want to search for the murder weapon. Although I doubt if you'll find it in an old rat trap like this. It could stay here, hidden for a hundred years. Yeah, we'll try. I want the squad to check the history of the building and every person in here. We'll do it. Patsy and I are going to take the car and run up to Taunton. We'll be back in a few hours. But right. Why go to Taunton? Because it's the home of the Taunton racetrack. Joe Kane's tip sheet was the schedule of today's races. Maybe we can find out something about murder up there. <laughs> Another few minutes, Nick. That sign said Taunton half a mile. Right. Why, have you been so glum all the way up here, Nick? 
I've been mulling over the case, Patsy. I don't like it. What don't you like about it? The whole thing is a phony ring about it. Three crooks, or semi-crooks, all operating in that building. All probably lying as hard as they can. Yes? How did Kane get into the building? The door was locked when we tried it. Either he rang one of the bells, which means the tenants were lying, or he had a key, which means Olson, the janitor, was lying. That's true. In the second place, what about that blue envelope containing an unwritten letter? Why was Kane carrying it? But invisible ink, maybe. Secret message? Carried so that we jumped to that obvious conclusion? No, no, no. I doubt it, Patsy. Uh Uh-oh, slow down. Here's Taunton. We'll go through it before we see it. Seems pretty quiet. We're a racetrack town. Uh Uh-huh. I haven't seen anything faintly resembling a track. We better ask that youngster over there. Hi, Sonny. Oh, hi there. Yes, you, son. Come over here a minute, will you? Yes, sir, mister. What's on your mind? Which way to the racetrack? Uh, The which? The racetrack. The Taunton racetrack. I don't know what you're talking about, lady. You live here long? All my life. Here. Take a look at this. Horton Racetrack. Handicap race. Hey, mister, this is some kind of a gag. There ain't no track in Taunton. We never had a race in this town. You're being taken for an awful ride by someone. You're telling us. Nick, this is weird. Thanks, son. Let's get back to the city, Patsy. True enough, we've been taken for a ride. And believe me, it's carried us miles closer to the solution of this case. Nick, I wish you'd explain. Don't act so mysterious. I'll explain soon, Patsy. But I want to hear now. You will, just as soon as I've spoken to Maddie. And ask the janitor a few questions. Ah, here we are, 23 Blaine. I hope Maddie's inside. Oh, Nick. Sometimes you can be so aggravating. Patience, Patsy. Uh. Come on inside. Nick. Oh, for Pete's sake. Am I glad you're back. You got a fresh lead, Matty? Fresh lead? Fresh trouble? That's what I got. Well, I'll iron it out as soon as I've spoken to Olson, the janitor. Olson's my trouble, Nick. He's just committed suicide. An unwritten letter, a non-existent horse race, and now the suicide of a key witness. How will Nick straighten out this tangle of events? We'll see in just a moment. The up-to-date way of doing a thing is usually the best way, and you certainly find that's the case when you beautify your floors and linoleum with Linex self-polishing wax, the modern way to perfect floor care. One practical test is all you need to know that here is a quick-drying wax which is really different. Linex self-polishing wax, made from a new formula, was developed by leading research chemists to give new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance to all your floors. And Linex self-polishing wax contains the greatest possible amount of real carnauba wax for that handsome satiny finish only real wax can give. What's more, the underwriters' laboratories have proved by test that any linoleum, hardwood, or rubber tile floor is actually less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied. Best of all, Linex self-polishing wax takes only a jiffy to use, for you simply wipe it on without tiresome rubbing, and it dries quickly to a beautiful luster that's a joy to behold. So choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax, one of the finest products of its kind. Ask your dealer now for all three great Linex home brighteners to give your home new beauty the easy Linex way. And now, back to our story. A complaint about a haunted loft building brought Nick Carter, Patsy, and Sergeant Matheson down to an ancient office building in time to hear, but not witness, the murder of Joe Kane. Curious clue to the murder was an unwritten letter in the dead man's hand and the racetrack program for a non-existent race. Then the janitor of the building, Sergeant Matheson announces, suddenly has committed suicide. Now Nick, Patsy, and the sergeant examine the dead body. Pretty careless of you, Matty. Oh, honest, Nick, how was I to know? I was down in the cellar with the squad looking for the murder gun when all of a sudden we hear the shot. We never thought that... You'll find the weapon in Olsen's hand. Yes, I understand. 
Well, five will get you ten. This is the gun that killed Kane. But why should Olsen kill himself? Yeah, probably thought we were hot on his trail. Maybe, but I'm not so sure Olsen did kill himself. What? Why not? Too pat, too convenient. I've worked on thousands of cases, Matty. I never yet had a killer give up so easily. But it looks legit, Nick. Bullet wound in the right temple, gun in the right hand. I happen to know Olsen was right-hander because I saw him sweep it. There are powder burns around the wound. The gun was fired at close range. Why, the body looks as though it had fallen naturally. Maybe, but I doubt it. I'm going to take the gun back to my lab for a quick check. Mm. Have a man send over the fingerprints for the entire crowd here, Matty. Right. Oh, uh, any of those reports come in yet about the building and the people? I expect them any minute now. Wait here for me when you get them. That's it. I'll be back in half an hour. All right. Oh, and by the way, Matty. Yes, Nick. How much would you like to bet that Olsen never was janitor of this building? Oh, no. Betsy, there you are. Every print on this gun, dusted and brought up. And all of them sharp and clear as crystal. Now what? Now we compare. Let's have that sheet Maddie sent over. Uh, here you are. Thanks. What are you looking for, Nick? Oh, I found it already. Just checking to make sure. Found what? Oh, don't be so mysterious, Nick. Look for yourself, Betsy. Every print on this gun belongs to Wilson. You can't miss it. Yes, I see, Nick. Well... Doesn't that prove suicide? Think hard, Betsy. What happens when you shoot a forty-five automatic? Why, uh, but... Uh, it fires a bullet. And then what happens to the gun? Um, it... stays in your hand, I guess. Gently, quietly, without a fuss? Oh, no, no, it, it kicks. Exactly. And would you explain why Olsen's prints on the gun are sharp and clear as crystal? Oh. Obviously, if he'd held the gun and shot himself, his prints would have been smudged and smeared by the recoil. But they are. Nick. Uh-huh. You get it now, huh? Olsen was murdered by the same person who killed Joe Kane. Then the gun was wiped clean and carefully placed in Olsen's hand. That's why the prints are so clear. Oh, that just mixes the case up more than ever. Oh, no, Patsy. It's becoming clearer than ever. Let's hustle back to Maddie. I only hope there haven't been any more murders while we were gone. Hey, Nick, you're fantastic. How did you know, man? How did you know? About the murder? No, 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 about Olsen. Reports just come in. You were right. He was lying. He wasn't the janitor of this building. Golly. The janitor of this place is a guy up on the corner. He takes care of this whole row of buildings. And everybody in here was lying when they accepted him as the janitor. I don't think so. This is a dark little place. And the real janitor probably doesn't spend more than a few minutes a week here. Yeah, just about. They're all pretty careless. A few times he was seen wasn't enough to make an impression. So when Olsen said he was a janitor, he was accepted. But the killer? The killer was lying, naturally. Oh. Hey, wait a minute, Nick. How did Olsen get in here? Oh, Joe Kane let him in. Joe Kane? The dead man? Yes. When? Probably a few seconds before we arrived. Olsen followed Kane into the building. Uh-huh. How did Kane get in? Pretty sure Kane let himself in. How? With a key. Nick, you sound as though you got the whole business washed up and finished. Think I'm pretty close to it. You know why Kane carried that blank letter? I do. And about the non-existent horse race? Yes. And why Olsen killed himself? He was murdered. And I think I know why. Well, then will you please talk? One more little test, Maddie. And the murderer will talk in person. What? What's the test? We've got three people left. Madam Sear, Trask the printer, and Dower the gambler. Yeah. All of them claim they don't know Joe Kane. Well, one of them's lying. And I want to find out which. How? I'm going to make some arrangements with Patsy. And then we're going to meet around Madame Sears' crystal globe, all of us. Holy smoke. More ghost stuff, so to speak. The body of Joe Kane is going to walk into the room, and we'll see who recognizes it. Oh, but that's silly, Nick. They all saw Kane's body. There's a tremendous difference between recognizing a living man and a dead body, Patsy. Totally dissimilar people look identical when they're dead. We've had hundreds of cases of husbands identifying dead strangers as their wives in the morgue. Mm-hmm, and vice versa. It's, it's true, Patsy. I see Nick's point. Well, those suspects who really don't know Kane will not recognize a living imitation after having seen the body only once. But those who knew him... I get it. I get it. Now, let's get moving. We'll meet the dead body at seven tonight. Get 
gather together in Madame Sears' studio for a last attempt to solve this murder. You do well to trust the world of the medium, Mr. Carter. It is capable of miracles far beyond your mere earthly effort. Uh, quite. I've requested Sergeant Matheson to have present the only surviving occupants of this building. Mr. Trask, Mr. Dower, and Madame Sear, of course. Miss Bowen, my secretary, will act as witness. Sergeant Matheson will preside. <coughs> and I'll ask the question. Will you all be seated, please? Everybody down, folks. Come on. I presume you work best with the crystal in the dark, Madam Sue. Oh, that is correct. Lights out, please, Maddie. Right. Thank you. And now, Madam Sue, with your help, we will try to recreate the murder scene in the magic crystal. First, there must be silence. And silence you shall have. The crystal is cloudy tonight. There is much antagonism in this room. The veil can be parted only with difficulty. Ah, now the clouds begin to vanish from the glass. I see faint lights, faint forms swirling in the blackness. I see a figure. It is a man. It is the dead one. He walks through night followed by shadows. There is one shadow I see with a gun. <gasps> Sergeant Madison, I, 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 I hear it again. The, the spirit's talking. Oh, for the love of Pete. Do you hear it? All right, the groaning and the rumbling of the dead. And this is what made you telephone this morning? In heaven's name, protect me. You hear it, don't you? You hear it? Wait, listen. Someone's coming to the door. Which is the other world coming to us. In the name of heaven, do not let that thing in here. It's Joe Kane. The dead man. Yes, Joe Kane, all right. I thought he was killed. And that, ladies and gentlemen, winds up the seance in our case. Lights, please, Maddie. Right. Oh, oh, but you... No excitement, please. Quiet. The show's over. But I was... Sit down, Madam Sear, please be calm. Uh, it's not Joe Kane. Merely an actor appropriately costumed and made up. Nick, they both recognized him. They were both lying. Madam Sear and Mr. Dower. Trask never batted an eyelash. He told the truth. Yes, Patsy. And I might add. It's because Mr. Hal Trask told the truth about not knowing Joe Kane that he'll be executed for his murder. You'll never prove it, Maddie. Oh, no, you don't, brother. It's a very it clever crime, Mr. Trask, and for an unusual racket. Yes, Patsy, you were right. Trask told the truth. He did not know Crane. Dower and Madam Sear lied. They knew him. They'd seen him in the building frequently. But they didn't know he ran the Globe Prince shop upstairs. Yeah, we, we figured it'd be better to say we never saw him before. Naturally. Both of you are afraid of the police. Try to keep clear of murder by lying. You didn't know that Joe Kane's racket was printing phony programs of non-existent horse races and that he used these to induce innocent victims to book bets with him, bets which he pocketed and disappeared with. You're right, Connor. Kane had a hot racket. We heard about the dough he was making. It was a good thing. So good that you and Olsen decided to come up and acquire a piece of his money. A big piece. Only Olsen acquired nothing but death. And you've acquired a one-way trip to the chair. <laughs> In just a few minutes, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and tell you why the murdered man carried an unwritten letter. Dust, finger marks, and accumulated polish all are likely to make furniture look dull and cloudy. So naturally, the first step in furniture care is to remove that cloudiness and then give your furniture a beauty treatment with the finest polish you can find. Well, Linex Cream Polish for Fine Furniture does the whole job at once. Yes, that's right. Linex Cream Polish cleans as it polishes. That means you cut the job in two. Save half the time, half the work. That's why so many thousands of modern American women are swinging to Linex Cream Polish, which cares for household things the easy way. See that your fine furniture keeps its good looks with Linex Cream Polish, which restores its original gleaming beauty in one simple process. Because Linex Cream Polish dries hard, it even cuts down future work or it leaves no oil on the surface to attract more dust. So make it a point to use Linex Cream Polish, which cleans as it polishes. You'll find all three great Linex Home Brighteners, Linex Cream Polish, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Clear Gloss, the longer-lasting brush-on finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that brings quick new sparkle to walls and ceilings. Chemtone covers in one coat 
dries in one hour. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, I understand the motive for Joe Kane's murder, but what about that unwritten letter? Well, get the picture, Ken. Trask and Olson decided to rob Joe Kane. They'd heard he was making a fortune out of his racetrack fraud, and they wanted a piece of it. But neither of them knew him. So? Obviously, they couldn't take a chance of Kane arriving in his office while they were rifling the place. So Olson remained downstairs to watch, while Trask went up to rob. But how could Olson watch for Kane if he didn't know him? By a simple thug's trick. He placed a large blue envelope in the Globe Print Shop letterbox. All he had to do was watch that. He knew whoever took the blue envelope out of the letterbox would be Joe Kane. Well, that's oh. clever enough. So when Kane arrived and picked up his letter, Olson quickly followed him into the building, first signaling upstairs in the buzzer to Trask. Olson followed in case Trask couldn't get away in time. And evidently he couldn't. Right. Kane saw Trask leaving his office. He pulled a gun, the forty-five automatic. Olson closed in from behind... Kane was killed and rolled down the steps. I doubt if Trask ever got a really good look at Kane. Then, as we pounded on the door below, they thought quickly. Trask pretended to be the proprietor of the print shop. Olson grabbed a broom and played janitor. Golly! But later, Trask realized Olson's pose would be uncovered. So the first chance he had, he murdered his partner to keep him quiet. He tried to get rid of the gun by planning it as a suicide weapon. But uh, how about the ghost that Madame Sear thought she heard? We heard them, too. When you kidded her into staging a seance. Well, that's the strangest thing about the case. If it hadn't been for Madame Sears' ghost, we'd never have entered the case. And never have broken it. And if it hadn't been for the ghost, there wouldn't have been a case in the first place. Why not? Because Madame Sears' ghost was the distant rumble of a new printing machine Joe Kane had just had installed. So he could print more of his phony race sheets. I had an officer turn it on to haunt the seance. Well, Nick, I hope you have as exciting a story for us next week. What's it going to be? Well, Ken, next week we're going to meet the champion apple pie maker of the East, who, fortunately for me, also happens to be an old friend of mine. He came to complain that her landlord papered her walls without her permission. Unfortunately, when we arrived, we discovered that the paper hanger had not only hung the wallpaper, he'd hung himself. Sounds like a strange story. What do you call it, Nick? The case of the hanging paper hanger. <laughs> And now an important message from Nick Carter. Remember what happened after World War I? Inflation and a boom period, then the crash, and the worst depression America has ever known. Now let's not permit that to happen again. Let's resolve to buy only what we need, paying ration points in full, paying no more than ceiling price. Let's resolve not to profiteer on our own services or produce. And let's buy and keep war bonds to protect America's future and our own. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux Home Brightness Linux Self Polishing Wax, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Clear Gloss, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints.
This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case... The Hanging Paper Hanger. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated the strange case of a landlord who decorated an old lady's apartment against her will, and how a broken perfume bottle caught a murderer. August means dog days, and dog days mean heat. But you can have plenty of time for a cool, leisurely relaxation when you do your homemaking the easy Linux way. Just follow the example of wise American homemakers everywhere who have learned the magic shortcut to household care. Those three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, the modern brush-on finish. Linux cream polish for fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. Start now to enjoy extra relaxation every day. Enjoy that added leisure in a home that's sparkling with bright new beauty. Just ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linux home brighteners. And save time the easy Linux way. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. It's been a busy day in the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th, and Nick and Patsy are deep in consultation on a new method of blood classification when there's an urgent ring on the doorbell. Patsy answers it and ushers in a little gray lady, very nervous and very frightened. Look, Nick, we have a guest for lunch, Nick. This lady says she's an old friend of yours. Well, I, I don't know whether you recollect me, Mr. Carter. Now, you're a great and famous Remember man. Remember you? Why, of course I do. How are you, Mrs. Nelson? It's been ages oh, since we've seen you. Well, now you do remember. It's been ten years since I cooked for you, ma'am. Now, this is my secretary, <laughs> Patsy Bowles. How do you do? Mrs. Oh. Nelson's the greatest apple pie baker in the East. Oh, mm. Thank you kindly, Mr. Carter. Well, what can I do for you, Mrs. Nelson? Oh, well, sir, I... Oh, it's a funny thing. Uh, I've got a job now over at the Maxwell Manufacturing Plant. I clean up nights. Uh -huh. So I live near as I can to the plant to save traveling time, you see. And, oh, it's a very nice little boarding house, and a very nice man runs it, Mr. Harrow. Now, I didn't have any complaints until now. Well, what's happened, Mrs. Nelson? Well, you see, it's like this, uh, I like a bit of color in my room, so I pasted things on the wall. All kinds of bright ribbon, bright labels, and colored pictures. It makes a kind of patchwork quilt, you see. It must be very pleasant. Oh, it was, Mr. Carter, until yesterday. Mr. Harrow, my landlord, is a paper hanger by profession. And yesterday I come home from work to find that he'd papered the whole room with new wallpaper. He, he just covered over everything. And... You didn't know he was going to do it? Oh, no, sir. It come as an awful shock. I says to him, I says, Mr. Harrow, you take that paper off. I want my own decorations back. And he says, Mrs. Nelson, you got wallpaper free, gratis, and for nothing. And you just be grateful. He didn't paper any other room in the house? Oh, no, sir, no. About how big a room do you have? Oh, a middling-sized room, sir. So you're upset because you've lost your own decorations, and you want to know why a landlord should paper your wall without you even asking for oh, it. Oh, it's worse than that, sir. Oh? I know why he won't take that paper off. There's code on it, that's what. And he's a spy, that's what he is, Mr. Carter, and that's why I've come to you. Ah, I see. Well, Mrs. Nelson, we can't let an old friend down. We'll go right out with you and investigate this coated wallpaper. Oh, thank you, sir. And even if there are no spies involved, we'll see if we can't get your old decorations back. Nothing's too good for the champion apple pie baker of the East. So this is a free, gratis, and for nothing wallpaper, huh? Oh, it's very nice, Mrs. Nelson. No, oh, I'm not denying that, Miss. All I'm saying is I don't want it here. Well, now, let's see that coat you spoke about. Uh, right on the border, sir. You see, there's a squiggly line with dots and dashes around it, and I thought oh, that... Oh, yes, yes, I see. Well, I that's see. just a conventional design, Nick. It's repeated over and over. It couldn't be cold. Yes, I'm afraid Patsy's right. Our angle is out, Mrs. Nelson. Oh. And the other question isn't answered. 
Why did a landlord suddenly give you new wallpaper for no apparent reason? Well, I don't know, sir. Maybe there was something valuable on the wall that he wanted. Perhaps. Exactly what did you use to decorate your walls with, Mrs. Nelson? Well, like I said, sir, old calendars and labels and ribbons. Any old shares of stock? Oh, now, what would I be doing with stock shares, miss? Here, here, I've got some stuff saved up that I was going to use. I'll show it to you. It's right in my closet. You can see for yourself. It wasn't anything... Oh, oh, Mr. Carter, sir. Oh, get him out of here. Get him away right, from right. here. Hey, Mrs. Oh, no. Tell me, who is it? Who is it? It's Mr. Harrow, my landlord. He's telling himself in the closet hook. Yes, and he's unquestionably dead. <laughs> It's me, Nick. I've got Mrs. Nelson down in the sitting room. She's feeling a little better. Golly, what a mess. Yes. She begged me not to send for the police. She's afraid if she gets mixed up in a police case, she'll never get another job. But you've got to call the police in on a suicide, don't you? We're not going to call in the police. And this wasn't suicide. Me? Look here, Patsy. Harold apparently hung himself from this hook high up at the closet wall, right? Yes. How did he get there? Well, um... He stood on that clothes hamper under his feet, tied the knot around his neck into the hook, and then hung himself. And how do you account for the fact that the clothes hamper is 15 inches under his dangling feet? Oh. What did he do? Jump up? Pull himself up? Impossible. And it's murder. With a capital M. Oh, Nick, we'd better call in the police. And just about ruin everything for Mrs. Nelson? <laughs> what did an officer of Sergeant Matheson's caliber say when he found a man murdered in Mrs. Nelson's room after they'd had a fight about wallpaper? Oh, yes. And he'd have no choice but to lock her up and... Hold her on suspicion of murder. Exactly. I said I'd do Mrs. Nelson a favor, and I will. I'll crack this case with a minimum of trouble for her. I don't like it, Nick, but well, what do we do? Well, look here, Patsy. You can't miss the connection. The murder's tied up with the wallpaper. Well, that's right. The only trouble is, what's the wallpaper tied up with? Something on the wall. Okay. Run your fingers along the wall. Mm-hmm. Feel the lumpy pattern of Mrs. Nelson's decorations under the paper. Mm-hmm. Mr. Harrow did not put up that paper to steal anything from underneath. Then why did he? The obvious answer, to conceal something. Conceal what? That's what I'd like to find out. Come on down to Harrow's rooms. Mrs. Nelson said it was in the back of the house. Probably find his paper hanging equipment there. And then what? Then we're going to rip this paper off the wall. <laughs> Looking bedroom. Patsy. Yes, Nick. Look here. Top of the bureau. Golly. What kind of a guy was Harold anyway? Six bottles of perfume. All brand new. And expensive. You don't buy any one of them for less than sixty dollars. Hmm. Over three hundred dollars worth of perfume in the room of a boarding house landlord. Yeah. This is beginning to get curiouser and curiouser as Alice and Wallace. Stop behind the bed. He shut up the light. Quiet, quiet. It was the killer, and he came after the perfume bottle. Come on. Where? Out the front door. Mm. Okay. All right, wise guy. All right. You want to... Ah. Well, well. Mr. Nick Carter and company. Sergeant Matheson. Hi, Matty. Just in time. Did you see a man come out before us? Quick. Just in Where time you... for what? The murder? Oh, you know about that. Know about it? What do you think I'm not doing out here? Listen, Matty, we got to work fast. The killer is... Never the mind the fast talk, Nick. I want a couple of quiet words with you. You know why I came out here? I'm listening impatiently. I get a call ten minutes ago. A guy by the name of Harrow just bumped off. That's right. And the call said he was bumped off by none other than Nick Carter himself. Oh, hold on. Oh, that's absurd, Sergeant. You can't think that Nick... Now, ever... listen, Patsy. I'm not saying I believe Nick killed anybody. But you'd better explain how he neglected to notify homicide as soon as he found the body. That's a criminal offense in this city. I'll explain in a few minutes, Matty. Come on in the sitting room. Oh, more tricks, huh? You pulled some fast ones on me in your time, Nick. Now, listen, this is Gospel. There's a little old lady in there, a friend of mine, named Mrs. Nelson. Yeah? She'll explain how Patsy and I came into this case. Okay, okay. Mrs. Nelson, we're sorry to bother you, but... Nick. Well, the place is empty. Where's the old lady you're going to produce? Mrs. Nelson! Mrs. Nelson! Never mind Mrs. shouting, Patsy. I'm afraid Mrs. Nelson's gone. And from the look in Maddie's eyes, I'm afraid we're in a jam. <laughs> Oh, 
A murder committed because of wallpaper. A killer who steals perfume bottles. And a disappearing witness. How is Nick going to straighten us out with Sergeant Matheson barking over his shoulder? We'll see in just a moment. There's an old saying that if you want something done well, it's best to do it yourself. But nowadays, the truth is this. When you want your floors and linoleum to have perfect care, let Linux self-polishing wax do the job. You see, Linux self-polishing wax is completely new, developed by leading research chemists to give you the finest, as you'll prove for yourself in one quick home test. Apply Linux self-polishing wax to any hardwood, linoleum, or rubber tile floor. It takes just a jiffy to wipe on and dries without tiresome rubbing to a handsome luster that lasts and lasts. First, you'll notice the satiny beauty that only real wax can give. Second, when you step on that floor, you'll learn why Linux self-polishing wax is called the anti-skid finish, for your floor is less slippery than it was to begin with. This fact has been proved by the underwriter's laboratories. And third, you'll be delighted with the way the finish lasts, for Linux self-polishing wax has the highest possible content of genuine carnauba wax. There's no doubt about it. Linux self-polishing wax is well worth trying. Once you've tried it, you'll follow the example of all the wise American homemakers who use it regularly. Ask your dealer now for Linux self-polishing wax for all three great Linux home brightness, the modern shortcuts to household care. And now back to our story. Investigating the strange complaint of Mrs. Nelson that her landlord has papered the walls of her room against her wishes, Nick discovers the landlord murdered. In the dead man's bedroom, Nick finds six bottles of expensive perfume, which are stolen by the killer in a daring attack. Nick's pursuit of the killer is stopped by Sergeant Matheson, who arrives after an anonymous call told him of the murder and accused Nick. But when Nick tried to produce Mrs. Nelson to prove his story, she vanished. Now Nick, Patsy, and Matty meet in the front hall after searching the house. Ah, that's no use, Nick. We've been through the house from top to bottom. It's empty. Which means I'm accused of the murder and kidnapping, huh? Now, I won't say that. I know you're no crook. But I wouldn't put it past you to hijack a witness if you thought it would help you to solve the case. Not this time, Eddie. Well, where in places is she? Probably in the hands of the killer. Probably grabbed her after we ducked into Harold's bedroom under our noses and grabbed the perfume. Hey, what's all this about perfume and wallpaper? What's the connection, Nick? You're the policeman, Matty. I'm just an ordinary citizen. Now, now, now. Don't take it that way, Nick. I never said you weren't useful. Now and then, I just... All right, Matty. Just my little joke. Now, here's the setup. A murderer killed Harrow and tried to frame the death as a suicide in Mrs. Nelson's room. Right. Evidently, the killer wanted to silence Harrow. About what? About why Harrow papered Mrs. Nelson's wall. So there is something hidden on the wall. There is. Something tied up with the bottles of perfume stolen from Harrow's room. Killer probably ducked out the back way with the bottles of Mrs. Nelson. We better get up to Mrs. Nelson's room and get that wallpaper down. Right. Yeah, yeah, hold it. Someone at the front door. Looks like a man. Stand by. Hiya, brother. Uh, hey, what are you... Mr. Spieler Wilson, isn't it? The best pitch man in the city. Sidewalk spiels and sales a specialty. What are you doing here, Spieler? Oh, gee, Sergeant, you give me a scare for a minute. I ain't doing nothing here I oughtn't. I live here. You live here? How interesting. Matty. Yeah. Suppose you have somebody get that wallpaper off Mrs. Nelson's walls. Right. Just put on so recently that you should get it off without disturbing what's underneath it. Okay, Nick. And Spieler, suppose we go up to your room. I want to talk to you about a murder. We've been pals over a year. I got her a job. Over at the Maxwell plant? Yeah. That doesn't make sense, Peter. Mrs. Nelson said she moved in here to be near a job to save traveling time. I was sure it makes sense. I didn't say I didn't know her before she moved in. I got her a job and got her to live here. You know anything more about her? How she spent her time? Eh, not much. She cleaned up in the plant from six to midnight, come home around one, didn't usually get up till ten. Used to hang around the house mostly. Hey, Dick. Come on in. We got most of the paper on. Coming, Matty. One last question, Spieler. What did you have in that satchel you were carrying when you came in? Mind if I have a look? Uh, no, Mr. Connor, but well, it wouldn't interest you. It, it's just the stuff I've been pitching on the streets these days. Ah, wouldn't interest me, would it? Look here, Patsy. Golly. Bottles and bottles of perfume. <laughs> Well, 
I got most of the paper off, Nick. Oh, what a job that was. Uh, incidentally, uh, what did you get out of Spieler? A few interesting facts. Most interesting is the fact that he's pitching perfume these days. Well, for the lover... What, didn't the killer steal perfume from Harrah's room? Yes. Then what are we waiting for? Some real evidence. Funny enough, Mary. Uh -huh. Coincidence. Have one of your men tail, Wilson. Yes, now. but Nick... Listen, Mary, you don't seem to understand. I want to break this case, and I want to do it before Mrs. Nelson's hurt. He's been taken by the killer. That means he isn't ready to kill her yet, but he may make up his mind soon. We've got to get it before that. Yeah, how? Now, well, let's look at these walls. It's obvious. Some proof here that points to the killer. He's got to find it. Okay. Plenty of calendar scenes. Lots of colored paper. <laughs> Mrs. Nelson had rather gaudy taste. Mm, call it bright. Hello. Here are labels. These look like hat box designs. Some over here look like drug labels. Drugs? Narcotics? Maybe. Only here's something that's a lot more interesting. Patsy. Mm hmm. Remember the name of the perfume stolen from Harrow's room? Yes, it was Paris's Danger. And the name of the perfume Spieler is selling? Paris's Exotic. And here are labels all from the Paris firm. Exotic, Danger, Nuance, and so on. So, so what? what? Why did Mrs. Nelson get hold of them? Well, she she bought them, or she picked them up somewhere, or she, she didn't could... buy them. You can't buy exclusive firm labels. And she didn't pick this many up just somewhere. Where would you find 50 perfume labels all at once? Well, uh, maybe she got them off old perfume bottles. Best suggestion so far. Only one hit, Patsy. And the material Mrs. Nelson had in her closet for decorating her walls are ten more perfume labels. And they're all brand new. The mucilage on the backs is fresh and untouched. Well, for the love of Pete, Nick, what's it mean? It means Patsy and I are going down to the Paris company and find out where their labels are made. There's got to be a tie-in between them and murder. <laughs> It is announced you wish to speak with me on a matter of business. Uh, yes, I am at your service. Very kind of you, Madame Paris. You are, Madame Paris. If we? Let me introduce myself. I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Miss Patsy Bowen. Oh, it is a great pleasure to meet you, Monsieur Carter. I... Did you say Nick Carter? The Nick Carter? That's right. Careful, Madame Paris. Your accent is showing. Oh, never mind the phony accent. That's for the customers. What's on your mind, Mr. Carter? It's a case of murder. And I think you may be able to tell me something that'll help. Anything. Anything you say. Paris Incorporated is a pretty big outfit. One of the biggest cosmetic manufacturers in the world. Do you manufacture all your products yourself? We do. How about the containers? Oh, we make those too. Who does the packing and handling? We do. Print your own labels? We design and print them ourselves. But uh, I don't see what this has got to do with murder. A murder has been committed. And I think it centers around some of your products. Will you tell me where this particular perfume label is designed and printed? Let's see. Exotic. Oh, that's a funny thing, Mr. Carter. What's funny? We gave up that line more than a year ago. I'd say we haven't manufactured any of these labels in over a year. Very interesting. Would there be any stock on hand? Any place in the city where they could be obtained? Oh, Mr. Carter, exclusive labels are like money. You keep them in a safe. There aren't any of these in stock. And if there were, they wouldn't be where anyone could get hold of them. For Pete's sake, Nick, will you explain where right, Mrs. All right, thanks a lot, Madame Paris. We won't trouble you anymore. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, bonsoir, Monsieur Carter, uh, Mademoiselle Bourne. It has been a pleasure. Let me know if you apprehend this murderer. I will name the perfume after the case. Killer by Barry. <laughs> This is awful. Looks like we aren't going to get anywhere with this case. You're wrong, Patsy. Mm -hmm. Get into the car. You mean you found something? Even though Madame Paris... Madame said... Paris said plenty. Get in. Oh, he's For the love of Pete, again. They caught it, just drove off. I know, get in quick. Mm -hmm. Keep your eye on him. Is the killer after us? Yes. Can you still see the car? Yes, it's up ahead. Turning into that side street. What's the license number? Get it down. Oh, I can't see it. He spattered it with mud. Hold on, we're making the turn after him. Okay. See him? I think so. He's turning again up ahead. We'll get him. Nick? Oh, correction. He oh. got us. 
That's like me blowing a front tire. Seems like I ran through a mess of broken glass. A little too coincidental to be real. Come on, Betsy. Right. Let's have a look at that glass. Seems to me Mr. Killer's a very smart person. A mess of broken glass thrown out behind his car would be just the thing to slow up any pursuers. Here we are. Nick, they're, they're perfume bottles. They must be the ones stolen from Harold's room. Thrown overboard to save the killer's skin. I'm afraid it didn't work this time. You want to know why, Betsy? Why? Because this is a side street, and all I can smell is uncollected garbage. Why, Nick, I... Are you crazy? Don't get it yet, huh? All right, wait till I call Maddie and get a police car. And we'll call on the killer and let him explain himself. <laughs> What in blazes is this place? We're coming in the back door of a war plant. This is the department that prints labels and things. What you hear, the press is working. Me? You mean Madame Paris was lying when she said that... Quiet, Betty, quiet. We're going into this office here. I want you all to follow my lead, right? Yeah, but Nick, I... Ah, here we go. Yes, what is it? Mr. Maxwell? Yes, who are you? I believe you've seen me before. I'm Nick Carter. What do you want, Mr. Carter? A confession. Confession? Of what? Of the murder of Mr. Harrow, the kidnapping of Mrs. Nelson, and of the smartest racket ever worked in this city. Counterfeiting valuable labels. You're out of your mind, Carter. Out of my mind, am I? Patsy, bring in Mrs. Nelson. Let's see what Mr. Maxwell says when she confronts him. Uh, okay. <laughs> so you've got Mrs. Nelson outside, huh? You fool, you think that bluff will work on me? You haven't got... We have a thought, Mr. Maxwell. Go ahead. Nothing. You're going to say we haven't got Mrs. Nelson, huh? Well, only one person could know that, Mr. Maxwell, and that's the killer. The only way you could know whether or not Mrs. Nelson has been rescued is because you yourself are the killer. <laughs> Just a moment, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and explain how he knew Maxwell murdered the hanging paper hanger. Fine furniture is a proud possession for any family, but furniture doesn't keep its good looks without help. Keep your household things beautiful with Linex Cream Polish, the modern shortcut to furniture care. Linex Cream Polish renews the original appearance of your furniture in one easy process. For it actually cleans as it polishes, removing dust, polish accumulation, and finger marks in one quick application. Yes, Linex Cream Polish cuts your job in two. Saves one whole step in your cleaning day routine. It even acts as insurance against future work. For Linex Cream Polish dries hard, leaving no oily film to attract more dust. So begin now. Get Linex Cream Polish, which cleans as it polishes. It's the up-to-date way to care for your fine furniture. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners, Linex cream polish, Linex self-polishing wax, and Linex clear gloss for longer-lasting brush-on finish at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that lightens and brightens your home at an average cost of just $2.98 a room. Chemtone covers in one coat, dries in one hour. <laughs> And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. You know, Nick, I was surprised when we found Mrs. Nelson hidden away in Maxwell's plant as we did. Well, as I deduced earlier, Patsy, Maxwell wasn't ready to kill her until he found out exactly how much she'd told us about his racket. He suspected her because she brought me into the case. But she really knew nothing. Well, that's the point, Patsy. On the side, Maxwell counterfeited rare and expensive labels. Mrs. Nelson used to pick some up while she was cleaning around the plant. She brought them home to decorate her walls. But she never realized anything shady was going on. No, of course not. Now, Spieler Wilson bought his phony labels from Maxwell for the phony perfume he sold. Uh -huh. And when he saw some of those labels on Mrs. Nelson's walls, he warned Maxwell that someone else might see them and get wise to their racket. Oh. So to cover up quietly, Maxwell had Harrow paper over the walls. Unfortunately, Harrow probably got wise when he found the fresh labels on Mrs. Nelson's closet, the one she was saving to put on the walls, he mm -hmm. took some down with him and prepared phony bottles of perfume, tasted the labels on, and had plenty of evidence to blackmail Maxwell. So Maxwell killed him. 
and then came back for the bottles when we were there. Right. All of Maxwell's efforts centered around covering up a million-dollar racket. He killed Harold for this. He trailed me, and when it seemed I was finding out his secret at Madame Paris, tried to kill me. Nick, that brings us to your crack about smelling garbage after he stopped us by throwing those perfume bottles in front of our car. Well, that was obvious, Fancy. If there'd been real perfume in those bottles, we'd have smelled nothing but perfume. As we didn't, it showed the bottles contained doped-up water, proving definitely that bottles, perfume, and labels were all phony. Oh. Well, Nick, what story have you got for next week? Well, back to next week, we have a very strange case. I received a letter from a housemaid in a wealthy home on Park Avenue. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. <laughs> story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Sixth Statue. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated a strange plague called bronze disease that murdered two people and almost killed a third. Now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. The regular morning work in the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th begins with Nick's voluminous correspondence. Scores of letters arrive every day, official, semi-official, friendly, threatening. But every once in a while, a strange note arrives, like the one Patsy is reading to Nick now. Dear Mr. Nick Carter, you are a famous detective and would not know me as I am only a housemaid. Oh, this writing is terrible. But I have heard you will always help people if they are in trouble, so I am taking the liberty to ask you, would you help me? Mr. Carter, there is bad trouble in the house where I work, Mr. Horace Allen's house on Park Avenue. There is, is plague in the house. A bad sickness, and I think we will all die. The statues got sick first, and I know we will get it next. Please come and tell me what I should do. In clothes, please find muddy order to pay for your trouble. Yours truly, Maisie Leeds. For the love of peace. Oh, I really think this is touching, Nick. Look, here's the money order. Five whole dollars. Generous fee, considering Miss Leeds probably earns only 20 a week. Wish you hadn't sent it. Let's see that letter, Betsy. Here. Horace Allen. What? That's the famous X Me Packer, isn't it? 1270 Park. <laughs> Very rich. Yes. Hmm. Letter mail last night. Written in a great deal of hurry. Notice the ink blots? Mm hmm. Miss Leeds seems rather frightened. Well, what's all this about play? Now, here's the key line Statues got sick first. And I know we will get it next. Statues got sick. But what's that mean? I think we better drive to 1270 Park and find out. Right now? Oh, can't it wait a few minutes, Nick? We've got so much work to do here, and, well, Miss Maisie Leeds' trouble is probably a very vivid imagination. You've forgotten. I've been paid a retainer, Pessy. I'm now devoted to the interest of my client. Let's go see Maisie, even if we have to go in through the servant's entrance. <laughs> Pretty swank mansion for an ex meat packer, Nick. Yes. Heard Mr. Allen's turn to art in his retirement. He collects. Oh, I wish you'd go back to meat packing for the duration. You can't eat statues and packers. Very funny. No one home. Should be servants in the house. You don't seem to be. Oh, Nick, you're you're not going. Don't to... have to. The door's been left ajar. Come on. Oh, Nick, 
this isn't right. I've got a treat her on, Patsy. Come on in. Besides, it's rather unusual for a collector of art to leave the house door open when there's no one home. Well, there's the library. Let's go in. Oh, golly. Plenty of stuff here. Paintings, statues. Nick, look at those statues. The bronze ones. Yes. That pillow, greenish and crusted. Like they've got some kind of skin disease. And those bronze spears, too. And this bronze chest. I wonder how it looks inside. Maybe this... Nick. Yes. Looks as if the plague has killed our client. As I'm very much mistaken, this body in the chest is that of Maisie Leeds. I've been through most of the house, Nick. There isn't a soul around. What's happened anyway? Don't know yet. Learn anything from the body? Maisie Leeds, all right. Dead about ten hours. She must have been strangled and placed in this chest just after she mailed that letter to me. Oh. Patsy, there's an odd thing about this murder. It looks as if the killer had silver polish in his hands. Silver polish? Yes, there's a kind of white powder on Maisie's neck around the strangulation prints. Smells like silver polish. And, Nicky, you'd better notify the police. No. Why not? Listen, Patsy. Maisie Leeds paid me five dollars to take on her case. I didn't get her soon enough to save her life, but I am going to get a killer. This is a point of honor. Something Sergeant Matheson wouldn't understand. Well, what are you two doing uh, Nick. here? Don't move, either of you. I'd suggest you put that gun away. You might hurt someone. Answer my question. What are you doing in here? Who are you? I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bowen. Nick Carter? Yes. Well, I'm Peter Craig, Horace Allen's nephew. I was up on the top floor, heard someone calling down here. That was me. So I came down. What's the matter, Mr. Carter? Look in the bronze chest. Good grief, Maisie. All right, Craig, I want some quick answers from you. Why was the house empty when we arrived? Where's your uncle? Where are the servants? Well, there aren't any servants. They all quit yesterday, except Maisie here. Uncle Horace rushed down to the employment agency this morning. That's that's why I'm alone in the house. I see. But you didn't see Maisie Leeds this morning? No, I... Well, I generally stay in my rooms on the top floor. Uncle Horace just yelled up that he was going to the agency. What agency? The Sun Agency on Vanderbilt Street. One more question, Craig. You know anything about bronze statues? No. Who sold these to your uncle? St. Gennaro Field, English dealer at the plaza. All right. You stay here. Try and locate your uncle on the phone and get him home. We're hustling over to see Aerofield. I want to find out what six statues have got to do with murder. <laughs> Mr. Carter, that man Ellen is an idiot, a fool, an artistic criminal. I should never have sold rare pieces to an ex-meat packer. Go on. Antique bronzes are as delicate as tropical fruits. Unless they're cared for with delicacy and understanding, they sicken. You mean statues can really become sick? Yes, and I. Bronze disease is a corrosion that eats away the metal, rots it until it crumbles. No one knows how it starts. No one knows how to stop it. Once it attacks a collection, the infected pieces must be removed or the entire collection will die. Golly. And Brown's disease has attacked Alan's collection? You saw it, didn't you? The green crumbling crust on the surface of the bronze. And unless he removed the infected pieces, his collection is doomed. But why did you call him an artistic criminal? He has a half a million dollars worth of items there. All the money in the world can't replace one of those pieces once it's lost. Don't you understand? There's nothing more valuable than a work of art. Oh, yes, there is, Mr. Arrowfield. A human life. Ah, here we are, Betsy. The Sun Employment Agency. Hmm. Doesn't look very busy. Sorry, nothing available. We're looking for Mr. Horace Allen. Yeah, not here. He was here this morning? Here and gone. Can't supply him with anything. Why not? Sleeping quarters are impossible. The nephew's a chemist or something. Did you say the nephew's a chemist? Yes, has a laboratory alongside the servants' quarters. Terrible smells all day and all night. Well, chemists ought to know more about bronze disease than Craig seemed to. Patsy, let's have a talk with that young man right now. 
somebody to answer the door. At least Craig ought to answer. Probably back upstairs in his laboratory. Well? Nick. Just my little pick lock, Patsy. Can't wait here all day. One second. There we are. Hello? Anybody home? Buddy, you told Craig to stay here. Well, let's run up to the top floor. We'll find him there. Walk? Right. Haven't you noticed? Alan has a neat little private elevator installed. Oh, step in. Call your floor, please. First floor, dining room, smoking room, lounge room. Second floor, bedrooms, bedrooms, and more bedrooms. Third floor, hot houses, bedrooms, and more bedrooms. Fourth and top floor, servants' quarters, and... Ah! <gasps> look, on the floor, it's, it's crazy. Yes. Fourth and top floor, murder. First a murdered housemaid, then a murdered chemist. How will Nick explain them and solve the mystery of the six statues? We'll see in just a moment. And now back to our story. Investigating a strange complaint about six statues, Nick and Patsy entered the empty home of Horace Allen to discover Alan's housemaid, Maisie Leeds, murdered. Nick finds that Alan's artworks are suffering from a rare disease known as bronze disease, and also that Alan's nephew, Peter Craig, is an amateur chemist with a laboratory on the top floor of the house. When Nick and Patsy return to the house to question Craig, they find him murdered, too. Now they're in the murdered man's laboratory examining his body. Well, Nick? That's with a chest with a bronze spear, Patsy. Evidently, one of the spears from Alan's collection. Golly. It's a powerful thrust. You see the tip protruding from Craig's back. You can also see it's tainted with the same bronze disease that's hit some of the statues. Ah, hello. Well, what is it? Craig didn't die at once. What do you mean? Look, here on the floor. Oh. Craig must have tried to write something in blood as he was dying. Yes. It says N H. L. NHL, what's that? Didn't tell you. Yet. Nick, I got it. Initials. The initials. Him murdered. The killer. Maybe. Uh, it, was, it couldn't be Allen or, or, or Arrowfield or the Sun Agency. Maybe it was one of the old servants. Hey, what's going on in this house? Where is everybody? What goes here? Nick, I think I hear. You uh, don't think you do hear. Our old friend, Sergeant Matheson. Hey, is anybody home? Chris. Allen. Hey, Mr. Allen, I... Oh, glory be unseen, Phil. Oh, we're real, Sergeant. Good afternoon, Matty. Nick Carter and company, I might have known. What are you two? Hey, who's that on the floor? Peter Craig. Murdered. Craig, too? He's the guy that called me. First the girl downstairs, now him upstairs. What is this, a massacre? I'll give you the facts, Matty. No, 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 no. Explanations first, if you please, Mr. Oh, Carter. Here we go. Now, look, I warned you a thousand times when you get mixed up in murder cases to notify homicide. There's a law in this city. Don't you ever do anything but break the law? Yes, I solve murders. You ought to know. Yeah, 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 I know, but Nick, please. We've got laws to enforce. Make it as easy as you can for us to enforce them. Matty, I'm going to help you enforce one law today. The law against first-degree murder. Come on down to Alan's laboratory. So that's exactly where we stand in the case, Matty. The murders are tied up some way. We... Yeah, this a matter. I have an idea how, but I'm not... Sure, yes. Well, look, uh, what about the insurance angle? Maybe Alan's trying to ruin his own statues to collect the dough. Oh, no, Matt. He could get more by selling them. Well, maybe Craig ruined the statues and Alan killed him for revenge. Maybe, but I doubt it. Besides, that leaves out Maisie Lee. Oh, forget her. She's just an accident in this case. She's not an accident in this case, and she's not to be forgotten. 
Matter, you won't understand this, but in this case, I'm working for Maisie Leeds. I'm not working for you or the police. What's it? I'm working for justice. Justice for Maisie Leeds. I think you're crazy. Huh? I see, Patsy, I told you. Well, well, well. well. Huh? I'm pleased to see you all here. And a fine lot of people you seem to be. I'm Mr. Allen. Oh, yeah? Yes, indeed. Very easy man to work for. Just myself, my nephew in the house. Big house, few people, not too difficult, eh? I suppose the agency explains. Mr. Allen. You're the housemaid, eh? Very pretty, my dear. Very pretty. Mr. Allen, your housemaid is Miss Patsy Bowen, my assistant. Who was? I am Nick Carter. But Nick Carter? But I, I'm, I'm going to be blunt, Mr. Allen. No sense beating around the bush. Your maid, Maisie Lee, was strangled to death. Your nephew, Peter Craig, was stabbed to death. What? Oh. oh, oh. Well, help me in the chair, Matty. Yeah. Right, Nick. Easy. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'll be all right. I didn't spare you because we're pressed for time, Mr. Allen. The killer may strike again. We've got to work fast. Now, where were you all day? At the employment agency, trying to hire servants. A likely story. Yeah, it's true. I had to have them in the house today. I have a very important guest coming, arriving on the 6.30 train from Washington. Says you. You can get the list of agencies of Mr. Allen to check the story later, Matty. Yeah, okay. Mr. Allen, I want to take one of your statues home with me. One of the diseased ones. I, uh... I'm sorry, I can't permit that, Mr. Carter. My guest coming to my... But you ought to remove the six statues anyway, Mr. Allen. Mr. Allenfield said so. Why, they'll infect everything. I know, I know, but I can't. My guest is a famous collector and wants to buy some of my pieces. I've got to show him all of them. I see. Well, in that case, we've got to work without your help. Come on, Patsy. You'll be in my lab if anything breaks, Matty. Right. Oh, by the way, Mr. Allen, what's the name of this famous collector who is visiting you tonight? Norman Lane. Uh, Norman Hadley Lane. Oh, Patsy, turn off the Bunsen burner, will you? Of course. Nick, I just realized what Alan said. What's that, Patsy? The man coming up on the 6.30 train from Washington. Norman Hadley Lane. N-H-L. Mm-hmm. Found it a couple of museums. Get a trial on them. But, but the letters N H L. That's his initials. Mm-hmm. Oh, Nick, you're not listening. Just finishing this analysis, Patsy. Here, see this precipitate? Yes. That's the silver polish from Maisie Lee's throat. Is it silver polish? No, something that came from Peter Craig's lab. I'll hand me that package I brought from Alan's house. Mm. Here. Thanks. I'll this. Nick, you don't seem to care about the initials. I'll bet Lane's the killer. I bet he isn't even on the train. He's probably here already. Huh. Well. Yeah. Nick, that's the spear that killed Craig. Right. But that's stealing police evidence. Oh, golly, Sergeant Matheson's going to be sore. Alan would let me have a sample of the diseased bronze for her to steal it. I must cut a sliver of bronze off the tip of the spear. I'm going to take a look at it under the microscope. Now, you're destroying everything. Oh, Nick, Nick, I don't like it. Not destroying. I'm just taking off a shaving. There. Now, now let's see. Well? Ah. Well, what do you see, germs? Yeah. Well, I do have a look. You see? This is a slice across the tip of the spear. Now, you see the outer portion? Those crystals all around the edges? Yes. The malachite crystals. Shows the presence of the brown disease. Now, what do you see inside? Toward the core of the section. Uh, just reddish metal. Exactly. Amorphous bronze metal. Just pure, uncrystallized bronze. And that, Miss Bone, breaks the case wide open. Why, what do you mean, Nick? I mean... Th- oh, I'll get it. Hello? Nick Carter. Speaking, who's this? Here's a tip for you, Mr. Nick Carter. If you want to find who killed Peter Craig, watch the clerk from the Sun Employment Agency. Quick, Patsy, get a line on this call, Tracy. Right. I'm afraid I don't follow you. The clerk from the Sun Employment Agency. You'll find him at the Hotel Brighton. Now, he'll tell you who killed Craig. Uh, just let me get that down, will you? Hotel Brighton. Uh, wh- whereabouts is that? I talk long enough. You know what to do. Goodbye. Well, it's no use, Patsy. I couldn't hold him long enough. Did you get any kind of a trace? No. Sorry. Well, it doesn't matter. Get Maddie on the phone. 
Tell him we're picking him up and take him for a ride. To the Hotel Brighton? Just tell him the killer will be at the other end of the ride. <laughs> Never mind the Mysterioso stuff. Where are we going? Thought Patsy told you, Matty, to meet a murderer. Where? Didn't Patsy tell you that? The Hotel Brighton. Then we're going the wrong way. The Brighton's downtown in the village. You're driving uptown. That's right. Well, Nick, the man on the phone said that... The man on the phone was wrong, Patsy. Here we are. This is where we're going. Where? Huh? What time is it? 6.25. Oh, just in time. Come on. Oh, this is Pennsylvania Station. Right. And we're going to meet the Washington train. Do you mean to tell me the killer is this Lane guy? Norman Hadley Lane? That's who we're going to meet. We'll have to move quickly. We haven't much time. Oh, but maybe... We'll talk later, Patsy. I'm afraid to cut it rather fine. We've got to get to the lower level and be on the platform when the train pulls in. This way. If this is a wild goose chase, Nick... Well, I think you're wrong. You can say that, Matty. Not until then. Down this ramp. Right. Now, that's the Washington train. Quick. Never get into the crowd. We've got to. Here. There are pictures of Lane. Yeah, take them. Can't miss him. He's a big man, quite stout. Heavy gray his beard. Looks uh-huh. like Edward the Seventh. Look sharp. Now we mustn't miss him. Now listen, Nick. This is no time for arguments, Matty. We'd better locate Lane as soon as he gets off that train. Now stand by. Right. I'll take the center. You watch right. Matty, you take the left. Okay. Fat man, Edward the Seventh beard. Oh, what a crowd. I think. Oh, the only one which car and bullet. There he is, car in front of us. Quick, Matty, pull it. Wait. It's a lane. It's a Norman Lane. Norman Hadley Lane. Get down. Get down. Nick, what are you doing? He's tackling him. Matty, got him? Yes, I got him, Nick. All right, hold on to him. All right. Let's take him to the station master's office. We can call the wagon from there. Why didn't you warn me it was going to be an assassination? Didn't know when it was going to happen. Oh, what about know. Mr. Lane? Oh, I just put him in a cab. He's all right. Oh, He's pretty well shaken up, and I knocked him out of the way of the bullets. But that's a lot better than a shot through the heart. Huh, Mr. Arrowfield? Oh, you dirty gums, you snooper. I'd like to... Hold on, old man. He's a dangerous little man and a very clever actor. <coughs> phony Englishman, phony dealer in art objects, including phony bronzes. Phony bronzes? Certainly, Patsy. That was the whole motivation. When Mr. Allen took up collecting objects of art, Arrowfield got hold of them and sold him a lot of supposedly antique bronze masterpieces. But in reality, they were completely phony, being merely modern copies of those masterpieces. And unless I'm wrong, Mr. Norman Lane owned many of the originals from which Allen's bronzes were copied. Well, Nick, uh, what about that bronze disease? When Arrowfield learned that Lane was coming to see Allen's collection, he knew Lane would recognize many of Allen's bronzes as copies of items in his own collection. Yeah. So Airfield, in order to force Allen to remove those phony pieces from his collection, he deliberately infected them with a bronze disease. What do you know? Allen refused to remove them in spite of the disease, so Airfield had to do the next best thing, kill Lane. Otherwise, he faced exposure as a dealer in fakes and phony pieces. The murder of Lane, fortunately, didn't succeed. The others did. And I am going to see that you pay for them, Airfield. I want to be sure that Maisie leads wherever she is now. That's her full five dollars worth. In just a moment, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and tell you how he knew Arrowfield was the poisoner of the sick statue. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, I don't see why Arrowfield killed Maisie Lee. Because when Maisie returned from mailing her letter to me, she saw Arrowfield in the collection room deliberately infecting the false antique bronze statues with the bronze disease. She was killed to silence her. But how could Arrowfield poison the statues? Well, Patsy, as Alan's guide and mentor in the new business of collecting, Arrowfield had easy access to the house. He was able to steal in and infect those statues with chemicals he took from Craig's laboratory. To be precise, with ammonium chloride. That's the corrosive agent that causes bronze disease. Oh. And was that the powder you found on Maisie's neck? Right. Some of it was on Arrowfield's hands when he strangled her. Evidently, Craig remembered seeing Arrowfield in his lab taking the chemical. So, Arrowfield killed him. But those initials Craig wrote. Oh, they weren't initials, Patsy. Craig tried to write the chemical symbol for ammonium chloride. NH4CL. Mm-hmm. He wrote the N and the H and got as far as the first elbow stroke of four and then died. 
we thought he'd written NHL, which, purely by coincidence, happened to be Lane's initials. Oh, I see. Well, Nick, you said Arafield's blinders were four. How could you tell that? I bet you remember this afternoon in my lab, you looked through the microscope at a piece of that spear that killed Craig? Yes. Well, really ancient bronzes become heavily crystallized through the years. But the piece we examined was crystallized only around the outer surface, showing that it was cast quite recently. So that's it. Well, was so Alice was trying to sidetrack you with that phone call so he could get it lame when he arrived in town? Yes. Oh. Lucky you weren't fooled. Well, you know, it's a funny thing, Patsy. I've met thousands of crooks in my time, each one more clever than the next. And believe it or not, the only ones they fooled in the end were themselves. Well, Nick, what story are you going to tell next week? Remember the time we drove south to investigate the mystery of a legendary giant called Erdman, the Earthshaker, whose footsteps apparently frightened the man to death? Oh, yes. The clues to the case were green rice grains on the dead man's hand and a drop of blood on a bird feather. Right. What are you going to call the story? The Case of the Bleeding Bobolink. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Long Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Patsy. Script is by Alfred Bester. And any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux clear gloss. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Vanishing Postman. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated a baffling seven-year-old crime and solved a murder through the eyes of a blind man. There's no time of year when a busy homemaker needs cool, leisurely relaxation more than during the summer months. And you can have that kind of relaxation when you do your homemaking the easy Linux way. Just follow the example of wise American homemakers everywhere who have learned the magic shortcut to household care. Those three great Linux home brighteners. Linex Clear Gloss, the modern brush-on finish, Linex Cream Polish for fine furniture, and Linex Self-Polishing Wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. Start now to enjoy extra relaxation every day. Enjoy that added leisure in a home that's sparkling with bright new beauty. Just ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linex home brighteners and save time the easy Linex way. <laughs> And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. Rain has rolled in across the great city again today. The black skies thunder and crackle with lightning. The streets are glossy and slippery as glass. As Nick and Patsy drive homeward in the detective's powerful car, a torrent of rain beats against the windshield when suddenly... Nick, look out! That car! Oh, oh Nick! 
Oh. You all right, Patsy? Uh, I... Oh. I guess so. Oh, golly, I was scared. Lucky we went into this alley when we skidded off the street. Yes, and lucky that pile of rubbish cushioned the crash. Might have had a bad crack up. Oh. Hey, wait a minute. What is it? When we smacked into that rubbish pile, we uncovered an old leather pouch lying underneath. You see? Hey, you'll get soaked, Nick. It's an old postman's bag, Patsy. Falling to pieces. Must have been here for ages. Oh, Nick, come on back. Well, there's mail in this bag. Letters. Hello. That's a name printed on the strap. R. Dr. Draper. Oh, well, it's probably the name of the postman. And look at these letters, Patsy. The postmark, August 1938. 1938? Then this bag's been lying here seven years. Hey, look here, Patsy. What, Nick? The buckle from the strap has fallen into the pouch. There's a bit of metal wedged in the buckle. Looks like a lump of lead. Well, it should. It happens to be a bullet. (gasps) Well, let's get over to the post office at once. I'm afraid the explanation of this undelivered mail may be murder. Patsy, mystery. I found that postman Robert Draper vanished seven years ago, and that the police and postal authorities believe him to be guilty of theft because a registered parcel containing $10,000 in securities also vanished at the same time. Oh, Nick, he stole them? Theft can't account for that bullet we found wedged in the buckle in the pouch, Patsy. Oh, no, no, I suppose not. For seven years, Robert Draper stood convicted of theft. Well, I'm going to find out whether he's guilty. But how are you going to dig up evidence on a case that happened seven years ago? I'm going to get special permission from the postmaster to deliver this mail that should have been delivered seven years ago. Well, we've learned nothing so far in the first 47 letters we've delivered. Perhaps you'll have better luck here with the 48th. Yes? Are you Betty Barnes? Yes. I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bowen. Nick Carter? Oh, please, come in, Mr. Carter. Thank you. I have a letter here for you, Miss Barnes. Mrs. Barnes. Oh, sorry. I have a letter that should have been delivered seven years ago. Seven years ago? I'd better explain. You see, seven years ago, the postman who served this district disappeared. His name was Robert Draper. What's He's going the... on here, Betty? Dan, it's about Pop. What? Well, he... Great they... Scott. Uh... Don't tell me that Draper was your father. Now, yes. now, look here. We fought that case seven years ago. There's no sense raking it up again and making out Betty's dad was a crook. Pop never stole. Why should he? He'd saved $12,000. He had plenty of insurance, $20,000 worth. Mrs. Barnes, please. I'm not trying to convict your father all over again. I'm trying to find out what really happened. But you'll have to help me. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter. Now tell me, what happened on that last day? Well, Pop left in the morning. You see, he lived with us. and He always used to drop in at home for lunch. The day he disappeared, he just never showed up for lunch. When Dan came home that night, I sent him out yes, to... Yes, I, uh, I went out to check up Mr. Carter. They said he never returned to the post office, and that's all we know. We never saw Dad again. I see. Mrs. Barnes, you have a picture of your father I might have. Uh, I'll, I'll get him one, honey. You know, Mr. Carter, it was on my birthday that Pop disappeared. Oh, how awful, Mrs. Barnes. Well, here's one, Mr. Carter. He's not in uniform, but it's the best we've got. Taken a week before he disappeared. Thank you. I'll let you know how we make out. Oh, yes. Here's your seven-year delayed letter, Mrs. Barnes. What? Oh. Oh, Dan, look. It, it's a birthday card from Pop. It says, Happy birthday, daughter dear. Best wishes on this day. My heart would always find you near. So I were miles away. Oh, Pop. But, Nick, we've delivered 17 letters since we left Mrs. Barnes, and not one of them knew a thing. It's all right, Patsy. We're not doing badly at all. We've got a picture of Draper, and we know we had no motive for stealing those securities. Somebody else in this trail of letters will help us along further. Well, this one's for Ben Kramer, care of Kramer's Garage, 118 Land Street. Well, this is it. Let's go in. Mm-hmm. Mr. Kramer doesn't seem to be around. Now, wait a minute. Now, I hear voices back there. Come on. You already got back double what you owe me. Now, now, just give me a break, Shelley, please. Oh, That's all I ask. Begging, Kramer, will you? I collect what's coming to me. But, but I can't keep on paying. It's breaking my back. I'll break your back if you try to welch, Kramer. 
I give you the price before you took my dough. One for ten a week. I, I can't do it, Shelley. I don't like I, I to just... intrude, gentlemen, but I'd like some information. Who are you, wise guy? Nick Carter's the name. Nick Carter. Hey, Kramer. Did no, you... no, 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 honest. Honest, Shelley. Oh, Nick, what's going on? Nothing, lady, nothing. I'll be going, Kramer. I'll see you later. Nick, what's going on here? It's obvious Mr. Kramer's been caught in a loan shark racket. Something pretty well known to the police. But something that can't be stopped until the victims are willing to give evidence. What was that one for ten they were talking about? Mr. Kramer pays a dollar a week for every ten he borrowed. Right, Mr. Kramer? I... I don't want to talk about it, Mr. Carter. It, it, it ain't safe. If, if I could only just lay my hands on $1,500 and, and, and get out from under... Mr. Kramer, yeah. we, we've got a letter for you. Huh? It's seven years old. Seven years... That don't make no sense. Well, this letter was mailed to you, but never delivered, because something happened to the postman, Robert Draper. Remember him? Draper? Oh, yes, yes, of course. A, a friendly little fella. Blue eyes he had. Bald. Wore a handlebar mustache. A handlebar mustache? Yeah, yeah. I, I even remember the day he strammed. Hacky, who used to keep his cab in my garage, he saw Draper. He drove him and another guy someplace. Yes, go on. Where was he driven? Who was the man? Now, 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 leave me think, Mr. Carter. It was such a long time ago, I, I can't even Kramer, think... I want the name and address of that cab driver. Well, let me... I, I, I remember now. It was... Hey, someone's five car garage door. Yes, dog. Kramer's been hit. Oh, but Nick, the killer. You've got to get Kramer's evidence. The killer can wait. Patsy, get to a phone. Call an ambulance quick. Right. Get me bad. Kramer, listen. Can you hear me? Who drove with Draper in the cab? Oh, no. Where'd they drive? Shelley's bowling alley. The thug we just met, huh? Good. Carter, do me a favor. Anything you say, Kramer. That, that seven-year-old letter. Read it to me. Certainly. I... Mr. Ben Kramer, dear sir... We are happy to inform you that your contribution has won second prize in our slogan contest. And close, please find money orders totaling $1,500. $1,500? Why, that's just what Mr. Kramer needs to pay off. Mr. Kramer doesn't need any money anymore, does he? Oh. He's dead. Birthday greetings, seven years old, and now murder from a delayed mail delivery. What new and strange developments will arise from Nick's odd mission? We'll see in just a moment. The wisest worker is the one who saves as much work as possible, yet gets the job done. That's efficiency. And the efficient way to take perfect care of your floors and linoleum is to depend upon Linux self-polishing wax. Try it just once and prove to your complete satisfaction that here is the ideal way to new beauty for your floors. It takes only a jiffy to wipe Linux self-polishing wax on any hardwood, linoleum, or rubber tile floor, and it dries without tiresome rubbing to a handsome luster. You'll notice that Linux self-polishing wax gives that satiny beauty only real wax can give. You'll find, when you step on that floor, that Linux self-polishing wax is the anti-skid finish, for your floor will be less slippery than it was to start with. This fact has been proved by the underwriter's laboratories. And you'll be delighted with the way the finish lasts, for Linux self-polishing wax has the highest possible content of genuine Carnauba wax. Yes, this new formula, developed by leading research chemists to give you the finest, is well worth trying. And once you've tried it, you'll follow the example of all those wise American women who use it regularly. So ask your dealer now for Linux self-polishing wax for all three great Linux home brighteners, the modern shortcuts to household beauty. And now back to our story. Investigating the strange disappearance of Robert Draper, postman, accused of absconding with registered securities he was carrying... Nick and Patsy pick up the trail of the old mystery by delivering mail found in the postman's abandoned pouch. Now we find them in the street after the sudden murder of one of their witnesses. Well, what do we do now, Nick? Wait for the homicide squad to arrive? Oh, no. Sergeant Matheson will only hold us up, call us material witnesses and all that. Now I want to get on with the case. At the Shelley bowling alley? No, not yet, Patsy. We haven't enough evidence for a direct frontal attack on Mr. Shelley. Oh. Let's get on to the mail delivery. There are more clues waiting for us to pick them up. Who's next? A uh, postcard addressed to Mr. Parker Flint, Homewood House. Homewood House, huh? Mm -hmm. That's the exclusive apartment house in the corner facing the river. Uh-huh. Come on. 
Let's see what Mr. Flint can tell us. Good afternoon, Mr. Flint. Your butler said we'd find you here in your aviary. Oh, uh, uh, good afternoon. You've got a charming place here, Mr. Flint. Yes, I, I'd like it. I suppose I look silly pottered around a glass house filled with a lot of birds, but, well, I, I like it. Uh, uh, let's step into my living room. We can talk better there. We won't keep you from your hobby long, Mr. Flint. Let me introduce myself. I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bourne. Get out of here. I beg your pardon? Get out of my house. Uh, Mr. Flint, now, you... let's get this straight. I hate police. I'll have nothing to do with police anywhere, anytime. Now get out. Nick, what, what on earth is... Wait, Patsy. Parker Flint. Thought that name sounded familiar. Eh? Yes, I remember. Parker Flint, third. Tried and convicted of second-degree murder seven years ago. Oh, you remember, eh? You also happen to remember that Parker Flint the third, my grandson, is serving a life sentence in state prison right now? I do. And will your capable memory recollect that he was innocent? That he was convicted on clumsy circumstantial evidence that would have made an idiot laugh? Well, what do you mean? Young Flint claimed he was on a walking tour across the country. The murder of an enemy of Parker's was committed August 30th, 1938, in this city. And on that day, he was 50 miles outside town in a village named Samson. The defense couldn't prove it, Mr. Flint. So they convicted him. Not because he was guilty, but because they hadn't anyone else. Make an example, they screamed. Show there's some the same justice for rich and poor alike. <laughs> Yeah, they made an example, all right. And then you'll be interested in the case I'm working on, Mr. Flint. Eh? Another man runs the risk of unjust conviction. I'll have nothing to do with the police. Go on, get out. But Nick's not a police. Mr. Flint, justice sometimes miscarries. Men are wrongfully convicted and sentenced. It's huh? a human factor in law that can't be avoided. I made it my job to prevent that factor of human error as far as possible. Now, I'll help you with your case, Mr. Flint, but you've got to help me with mine. Eh? Well, what, what is your case? It's your old postman, Robert Draper. Draper, oh, I remember him well. Knew him well, in fact. Supposed to have disappeared about seven years ago. Supposed? Yes, he did disappear, though. I saw him around this neighborhood seven weeks afterwards. Uh, act as suspicious. Uh, though he was hiding, had his head wrapped up in a turban. A turban? Golly. Yeah, what's more, he seemed to be afraid of someone called Gray. Seemed to see this Gray everywhere. Gray, huh? That's interesting. Very interesting. Anything else that might help? No, 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 that's all. And now, Mr. Carter, about about my case. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I lost my temper, but you understand, don't you? D do you think you could offer any any hope or anything? Yes, Mr. Flint. I can give you more than hope. I'll give you back your grandson. Oh. In the form of this postcard that should have been delivered seven years ago. A postcard? From your grandson. Sent from the village of Sampson, New York, postmarked August 30th, 1938. Oh, which proves thanks. he was where he claimed he was. Heaven. Congratulations, thanks. Mr. Flint. This is the one piece of evidence that'll free him. Yes. Well, Nick, how do we stand? Any closer to the vanishing postman? Yes, indeed, Patsy. Mr. Flint brought us a good deal closer. How so? That turban, for one thing, is very significant. And Draper's fear of someone called Gray, even more so. But we haven't come across anyone named Gray so far. Now hold everything, Patsy. Here's our next stop. Residence of Miss Jennifer West. Miss West's got a seven-year-old package coming to her. Well, let's hope we can trade it for information. Information, Mr. Carter? About our missing postman? Yes, Miss West. Well, I really don't know it. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, hello, darling. No, no, you're wrong. It's the orphan's benefit. No, no, the 18th. I put you down for a box. No, certainly you can't get out of it, dear. It's a worthy cause. Yes, yes, all right, bye. Now, let's see, uh, where were we? You were going to tell us what you remember about Mr. Draper's disappearance. Oh, but I don't know anything. I don't even remember him. Well, here's a photograph of him. Hmm, no, no, I'm sorry. It isn't a bit familiar. But I have such a miserable memory for faces. And in my work these days, I see so many. Day in and day out. Child Welfare Association, the canteen, the city hospital. City hospital. Oh, 
I met the most interesting man there yesterday. He was in the psychiatric wing, room 325. Oh, but, Miss West, and we... And this strange um... disease. Monochromatism, they call it. And he's so cheerful about it. Monochromatism? Oh, it's a technical name for blindness of some kind. Such a nice man. His name was, his name was, uh, was Gray. Gray? Mm. Oh, Nick. I heard, Patsy. Thanks a million for your help, Miss West. Mm. And here's your reward. This long overdue package. Seven years overdue. Why? Why, that's Gary Horton's handwriting. Oh. Once upon a time, Miss Byrne, I, I thought Gary and I might... Oh, well, you understand. Yes, Miss West. But he's so very shy, and I... Oh. Oh, look, my dear. It, it's flowers. Artificial flowers. No, they're not artificial. That's a bouquet of live forever flowers, and they're from Gary. Oh, here's a card. Dearest Jen, I've been wanting to ask you this for a long time. Never had the courage. Now I have. Will you... Oh, Miss West, it's a proposal. Seven years ago. And he never knew I hadn't received. He thought my silence meant... Oh, oh, excuse me, please. Uh, let's get out of here, Betsy. I have an idea that for the first time today, Miss West's phone is going to hear her say yes. So now we're headed for Shelley's bowling alley. Huh, Nick? Right. But why now? Why don't we hustle up and see that man Gray? The one Draper was afraid of. You'll see. Hmm? Here's where we stop. Let's go. Nick, what happened to the postman? Was he murdered by Shelley? Did Shelley murder Kramer, too? Come on, come on, come on. Oh, golly, what a busy place. And there's our old friend, Mr. Shelley. Mm-hmm. Hello, Shelley. Mind if we have a chat? Now, look, don't come pussyfooting around my place. You got nothing on me, Carter. Oh, that's what you think. Bluffin' ain't gonna do no good. Don't try and tell me Kramer talked. He knows better. Kramer can't talk. He was murdered. He... He was what? Murdered. Shot to death. You're lying. He was murdered in an attempt to keep me from uncovering the secret of Robert Draper's disappearance. Draper, the postman? This is a frame of Still Carter. innocent, eh, Shelley? I suppose you come over to the city hospital with us. Oh, city hospital, eh? Now I know it's a frame. I heard one of your plain clothes men calling city hospital this afternoon, finding out the visiting hours, getting a beautiful frame up all worked out, and from my own joint, too. What's that? I ain't taking cards on this deal, Carter. I'm getting out of here. Nicky, he's running out. Aren't you going to go after him? That's it. What time is it? Uh, 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 five of eight. And we've got five minutes. Visiting hours starts at eight at the hospital. Nick, what are you talking about? I never thought he'd go that far, Patsy. Come on. We've got to stop a visitor at the hospital tonight. Who? His name is Death. <laughs> Fast, Nick. You can stop and rest. I've got to keep going. Well, I'll stick it out. Where are we headed? To the east wing of the hospital. Psychiatry. What time is it? Uh, two minutes after eight. We may have enough time then. Hey, we're going to see that man Gray, aren't we? Yes. Miss West said he was in room 325. Well, this is 315. 317. 319. Here we are, 325. Uh, yes, it says on the card, monochromatic blindness. You can read Shock the card and... later, Patsy. Inside, mm -hmm. hurry. Hey, it's dark in here. Careful, Patsy. Oh, 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 I just bumped into one of those rolling tables. Where's the light, Nick? Get out, Patsy. The killer. Get out of the way. Where's that rolling table? Here it goes, Patsy. Oh, you got it, Nick. I heard the gun drop. It's only the beginning, Patsy. But the beginning of the end for a... Ah, I found oh. you, huh? Oh, Nick, oh, careful. Oh, no, no, don't miss it. Oh, no. At least not without a gun. Oh, no. There. Now, I don't lie still. Patsy. Yes, Nick. Try and find the light. Probably alongside the door. Well, yeah. I've got it. Nick, you're sitting on Dan Barnes. Right, Patsy. Dan Barnes, Robert Draper's son-in-law. Barnes is a thief who robbed Robert Draper's mailbag of $10,000 worth of security seven years ago. It was Barnes who took for himself the $12,000 which Draper had saved up before he disappeared. And it was Barnes who hoped to collect 20000 more in life insurance if Draper stayed lost seven full years so he could be declared legally dead. But... But that man in the bed, that's not the same man as in our picture. Well, nevertheless, Patsy, that unconscious gentleman, a near victim of suffocation at the hands of Dan Barnes, is our long-lost postman, 
Mr. Robert Draper. In just a moment, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and tell you how he was able to locate the vanishing postman. You know, fine furniture doesn't keep its good looks without help. Not when dust and finger marks and polish accumulation combine to lessen its beauty. But Linex Cream Polish disposes of all those bugbears in short order. For Linex Cream Polish actually cleans as it polishes, renewing your furniture's original handsome appearance in one quick process. Yes, Linex Cream Polish cuts your job in two, saves one whole step in your cleaning day routine. It even acts as insurance against future work, for Linex Cream Polish dries hard, leaving no oily film to attract more dust. So begin now. Get Linex Cream Polish and learn for yourself the modern way to caring for fine furniture. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners, Linex Cream Polish, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Clear Gloss, the longer-lasting brush-on finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that lightens and brightens your home at an average cost of just two ninety eight a room. Chemtone covers in one coat, dries in one hour. <laughs> And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, I still don't understand. What happened to Draper seven years ago? As I see it, here's the story, Bessie. Seven years ago, Draper met his son-in-law, Barnes, as usual, to go home and have lunch with him. Uh -huh. He probably confided in Barnes that he was carrying valuable securities and a registered letter. Barnes is the only man Draper would have told, since a postman's job is highly confidential. Well, that's right. They don't go around telling strangers what they carry. All right. Well, on some pretext or other, Barnes lured Draper to the alley behind Shelley's place and shot him. Then he took the securities from the bag and left. He thought he'd kill Draper, but the bullet only creased Draper's head, rendering him unconscious. Oh, uh, then what happened? Draper recovered consciousness, but he was badly wounded. Mm -hmm. The shock of the wound produced amnesia, and the wound itself produced a brain condition called monochromatism. That's day blindness. The victim can only see at night. By day, he's practically blind and can only see vague shades of gray. So that's what Mr. Flint meant. That's it, and that's what the turban meant. Oh. It was Draper's bewildered attempt to bandage his head. For a few days, he wandered about days without memory, mumbling that he could only see gray. Finally, he was picked up and taken to the hospital. Barnes, who must have seen him wandering around in a dazed condition, realized he was safe so long as Draper's mind was gone and Draper was lost to the public. So he decided to let matters ride and wait. And then we came into the case. Only, I can't understand one thing. Why didn't anybody identify the picture of Draper when you showed it to them? Because it wasn't Draper's picture. What? I realized that when Kramer told me Draper had a mustache, remember? Mm hmm Barnes was alarmed when he learned we were on the trail and cleverly handed us a photo of another person, hoping it would throw us off the scent. Oh. Then he followed us as we delivered the mail, waiting to see what would happen. And it was he who shot Kramer just as Kramer was about to give us the information we wanted. And when it became evident we were tracking Draper down, his hand was forced. And then he went to the hospital to try to murder him a second time. Right, Patsy. Unfortunately, Barnes didn't realize that murder is bad medicine. It never cures anything. Not when you're around, Nick. Well, Nick, what's the story for next week? You remember the case of the frightened social director, Patsy? The mm -hmm. man who scattered torn newspaper in preparation for a paper chase and found... Oh, a... yes, I remember. The next morning when the paper chase started, they found that one of the trails was made of torn $10 bills. What are you going to call the case, Nick? The Factory of Death. And now a final word from Nick Carter. And a very important word, too, Ken. Friends, right now, there is no better thing you can do for the protection of America's future and your own than to buy United States victory bonds. And by all means, hold your United States war bonds. Help to keep America secure. Help to prevent inflation. Help in the transition from wartime to peacetime by buying and keeping your war bonds until they mature. And by buying those all-important victory bonds now. <laughs> Nick 
Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Alfred Bester, and any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linex home brighteners. Linex self-polishing wax, Linex cream polish, and Linex clear gloss, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linex dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case... The Talking Tree, another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated the murder of a beggar with a fortune in his pocket and found the solution to the strange case of a talking tree. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. Today is file index day at the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th. The giant study is filled with piles of neatly typed cards, as Nick and Patsy keep regular tabs on the thousands of criminals the famous detective has encountered in his long career. Charlie Buzz Burns, tried and convicted for forgery July 1941, sentenced August 1941 to seven-year term in Eaton Penitentiary. Check. Well, that finishes the bees. Start the season. Okay, Nick, but it feels like it's going to be a long, hard day. Hmm. Albert Cabal. Tried and convicted of first-degree assault, April 1931. Hold it. Hmm? Cabal's on a parole. Put his card in the active file with a note. Last seen in St. Louis, July of this year. Right. Johnny Cabin. Tried and convicted... Oh, goody the door. That means a five-minute vacation. Well, whoever it is, send him away. We've got to finish this job. I will, but my heart won't be in it, Nick. Johnny Cabin. Tried and convicted of second-degree murder. Life term at Eastern State. Yes, I remember, Johnny. He was the one who swore no private detective would ever dare to take him. And he was wrong, like the rest of them. No more work for today, Nick. We've got a customer. Oh, perhaps This is an old friend of mine, Nick, Mr. Peter Simpson. He takes me riding twice a day. Takes you riding twice... Oh, I see. Streetcar conductor. Yes, sir, Mr. Carter. Miss Bowen takes my car every morning and every night. It's across town. Passes right behind his house. Mr. Simpson's got a problem. One of his customers won't get off the trolley. How's that? Well, it's the end of my run behind your house, sir. I left the trolley there and run up to see you. I remembered Miss Bowen talking about how you help folks out when they get in a jam. I'm in a bad one, sir. What's the trouble? Well, like Miss Bowen said, one of my customers won't get off the car. Why not? Because, Mr. Carter, he's been murdered. trolley car here, Mr. Carter. I closed the doors and left everything. Wait a minute. I'll open the door for you. Ah. Come up, sir. Hey, uh, he's in the back of the car. You can see him. He was the last one. And I said to him, last stop, all out. He don't move. I thought he was asleep. All right, Harry... Simpson, I understand. Yeah, fine. I thought you would. Oh, Nicky. He's been stabbed. There's a knife sticking in his side. Yes, wait. Well? Not dead yet. But he will be in a minute. 
Bleeding for half an hour. Mostly internal. Can't be moved or saved. No hope for him. Oh, Nick. Oh. Here, wait. He's trying to talk. <laughs> Listen. Where were you? Can you tell us who did this? Stone Valley. What? That Stone Valley. What? Talking tree. What was that? Talking tree. Killed by talking tree. Million dollars. <laughs> He's dead. Oh, it's not this awful, Mr. Carter. I can't have no murdered guys on my car. You're all right, Jensen. Just go out and call Sergeant Matheson and his homicide department. All right. Now, let's get to work, Patsy. Empty his pockets. Golly, Nick, what do you mean? Killed by a talking tree and been babbling about a million dollars. I don't know. Dying men usually speak the truth. I'd like to know what the truth is about that talking tree. <laughs> Nothing worthwhile in any of his pockets, Patsy. A torn and empty. No handkerchief, no wallet. 27 cents in change, total asset. Oh, so where do we stand? Exactly nowhere. What do you mean? No identification of any kind in this man, Patsy. Nothing to tell us who he is or why he was killed. Well, what about the murder weapon? That knife? Just an ordinary kitchen knife. No prints on the handle. Golly. Killer probably sat beside him, drove the knife into his side, got up and left the trolley. That's all. Look at him. Clothes, shabby and torn. Very obviously a tramp. But who'd want to kill a tramp? And for what? I don't know yet. Perhaps... Wait a minute. Hmm? Ah, here's something I overlooked. Seems to be a hard lump in the front corner of the jacket. Probably slipped down from the torn pocket. Here, wait a minute. What is it, Nick? Answer to your question. Look. It's... It looks like a big lump of crystal. Happens to be an opal. Opal? You mean that rough piece of peculiar-looking stone is a jewel opal? Uncut and unpolished. Must weigh about 30 carats. Worth quite a bit of money. Let's see, this may be the answer to why our victim was killed. Still, it doesn't answer the question of how it came into his possession. Or explain his dying speech about talking trees. What do we do now? Leave the body for Sergeant Matheson and our friends of the homicide department. We're hustling down to the jewel center where there's opals. Tampering with evidence again, Nick? Well, maybe that's what the police would call it, but I call it solving a murder. <laughs> Patsy, I'm going to give you a lesson in the art of jewels. Hmm? The average person doesn't realize that jewelers keep track of gems as closely as the police watch ex convicts. Every stone of any real value, cut or uncut, can be checked and traced. Here's our place. International Appraising Company. Well, there are dozens of appraising offices down here. Yes, anyone will do. Come on. Right. First class. Customers. I'm just going out to lunch. Better to go to World Appraising across the street. Well, I won't keep you a minute. Come on out. I'm Nick Carter. Listen, I got bad digestion. Not good for me to miss my lunch hour. What's in your mind, Mr. Carter? Trouble? Plenty. Case of murder. This happens to be one of the clues, Mr. Foreman. Let's see. Ah, a case of opal, huh? Right. I'd like to trace it. Know which stock this comes from? General source and so on? Who sells this variety? I can do better than that. I put a price on this stone an hour ago. You what? You heard me, lady. This stone was brought into me an hour ago for appraisal. I gave him the price and they left. Hey, How many? Two men. Little guy, looked like a tramp. And the other? Nice looking. Kind of professional looking. Doctor, maybe. Looked like the tramp was trying to sell the stone to the other. Called him Professor. Professor Stevens. Professor Stevens, huh? Good enough for me. Thanks a lot, Bowman. What's your fee? I've been paid once for appraising this stone. That's enough. Now, go away. I got my digestion to worry about. Thanks. Come on, Patsy. Let's find a university catalog. Maybe we can locate this Professor Stevens and find out about the talking tree. Okay, Patsy, get going. Uptown. Right, Nick. Any luck? All the luck in the world. Professor W.A. Stevens, Chair of Mineralogy at the University. Office 227, Geology Hall. Mineralogy? Well, that could tie in with Opal, can not it? It'd also tie in with a million dollars in the murder. Wish our dead friend had been with a botanist that would have explained the talking tree. Well, maybe we'll find a Stephen's doubles in botany or... Careful, Patsy, you're being cut off. Oh. Watch out. I think he's coming right over to the curb. Steady. Let me handle it. 
That wasn't an accident. Stay right where you are, Carter. You too, lady. I got a rod and a license to carry it. Well, hello, Coffin. Patsy, meet Dubsy Coffin. When we get back to our file cards, you'll meet him in the sea. Can the double talk routine, Carter? Now, look, I don't want no trouble from you. Keep the opal if you want. Just give me the map. What map? This is a friendly talk, see? I ain't getting rough because I always like to speak my piece first. We're listening very carefully, Dubsy. Sammy the bum with my towel. So he gets knocked off and the trolley cars are okay. You want to catch the killer? Good luck. But being Sammy with my pal, I'm his inheritor. Get it? I want the map, Carter. The map you took off Sammy. We didn't. Hold it, Betty. How much is the map worth to you, Dubsy? You ought to know. If you don't, it won't do you no good. We don't know. Now, we can guess. A million dollars? Not that much. But it's worth a big piece of change. To me, not to you. So, all right. Do I get it? Not even if we had it. So, okay. You speak your piece, I speak mine. I'll be seeing you again, Carter. And I'll let something else talk you into handing over the map. That carpet. So long, Dubsy. Remember what I tell you. To the university, Patsy. Maybe Professor Stevens can tell us what's going on. mixed up in this case, Nick. Well, it isn't simple. The man we found in the trolley was Sammy the Bum? That's what Dubsy Coffin indicated. Right in here. Mm-hmm. Well, from the way Coffin talked, it didn't sound as though he killed him. But simply be talk. Well, I suppose it could. But he mentioned the map. Do you think Sammy was killed for that? Very possible. Up the stairs. Uh-huh. Well, evidently, there's a map tied up with the opal Sammy was carrying. Yes, but it's my belief the opal's just a side issue. Coffin didn't seem to care about that. And Sammy tried to send it to Professor Stevens. Then what? what? Hmm? Professor Stevens' office. Oh. Hmm. Maybe he's got a class. Could be. Let's go in and wait. Nick! <gasps> Had to wait a long time to speak to Professor Stevens, Patsy. He's been murdered. <laughs> Murders for an opal, a missing map, and a mysterious talking tree. How can Nick tie these strange events together? We'll see in just a moment. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. And now back to our story. The dying words of a murdered tramp mentioned a talking tree to Nick Cotter. Investigation of the murder and the odd statement led the master detective to the office of Professor Stevens at the university. When Nick and Patsy entered the office, they discovered Stevens murdered. Stevens was shot at close range with a thought-off shotgun bat, a typical gangster's weapon. Head practically torn to pieces. Oh, it's awful, Nick. Nothing in his pockets to help us either. Nothing. So where does that leave us? About one jump ahead of the homicide squad. They won't be pleased with the way I've handled this case. Sergeant Matheson would call it mishandling. And he won't be far from wrong. I'm not happy myself. Well, let's get on the ball, Patsy. Let's do some thinking. Oh, that's your department, Nick. I'm just the audience. Sammy got hold of an opal and a map. We know he showed the opal to Stevens. Mm-hmm. We don't know about the map. Hmm. Stevens and Sammy were killed. The map disappeared. Now, what's so valuable about that map? It showed the mine where the opal came from. But Patsy opals don't come from mines. They could... Aha! What is it, Nick? Suddenly, my brain started to work. Suddenly, I'm getting a glimmer. Patsy, I think I know what this talking tree business is. What, Nick? Look here. On Stephen's desk. There's an atlas open to this state. Mm-hmm. Now, look across the page where the light hits it. Yeah. You can only see what I want to show you by reflected light. Are you seeing anything unusual? Mm, wait a minute. My eyes aren't as sharp as yours. Yes. I, I, I see a faint pencil mark. As though a pencil point had tapped the map lightly. A small town. The town of Dead Tree. Remember that, Betsy. Dead Tree? But that isn't Talking Tree. True enough. And I think that at Dead Tree, we might find a Talking Tree. Hmm? 
And Patsy, it's going to speak a language that'll astonish you. Oh, don't be so mysterious, Nick. All right, here's another clue. Opals don't grow in mines. They grow on trees. Tre- oh, you're crazy. Oh, you think so, huh? Come on. <laughs> Golly, I'm getting inferiority complex. Going through life three laps behind you the way I do. The only trouble in this case is that I happen to be three steps behind a killer. Well, that puts me out of the running all the Back to three round the corner. Oh, Nick. Just my luck. Haven't got a gun on me. Down the hall, run. It's the killer. This is a well-wisher. Oh, this hole is a dead end. We're trapped. Here. Oh. Through this door, Pat. Quick. Oh. Oh, that was close. That's too close. Lucky for us, that door wasn't locked. Did, did, did you see who was doing the shooting? No, and the trouble is, he saw where we went. What are we going to do? See what we can find to repel the attack. Oh, it's a small lab of some sort. If I can only find... Hurry up, Nick. I can hear steps. Oh, got it, Patsy. Get out the matches, quick. Matches? You heard me. What are you going to do with matches in that bottle? You're going to light a whole pack of matches and throw it out into the hall. This bottle is ether. I'll break it near the burning matches. All right, light the matches, quick. They're burning, Nick. All right, now throw them out as soon as I open the door. Uh-huh. And I'll throw out the bottle. All right, now. All right, quick, Patsy. Uh-huh. Patsy, all clear now. You can come out. Is he still here? Yes, knocked out and burned by the explosion. He'll live and regret it. Well, who is it, Nick? One of Dudley Coffin's gunmen. Hophead kid named Byrne. Well, I guess Coffin wasn't kidding about letting something else talk for him. But he forgot that some people talk back. Now listen, Patsy. In about 20 seconds, this place is going to be like a beehive. I can hear people coming now. If it wasn't Saturday afternoon, the place would be crowded already. Now we've got to get out of here. Well, then let's go. Not together. If hmm? picked up, they see us running. We'll separate and meet at the car. Okay. Try to stop at a drugstore and pick up some sandwiches. We've got a long drive ahead of us. Where to? Dead Tree? Right. We're going to Dead Tree to find the talking tree. too many already. And I'm supposed to be on a diet. Well, they weren't the best sandwiches I ever had either. I feel as if I were getting Bowman's indigestion. <laughs> oh. How much further is it, Nick? It's getting dark. It should be in Dead Tree any minute. We've passed six signs in the last six miles. Each one said Dead Tree half a mile. Well, at least we're holding our own. They should have added a prox. I think we're a prox there now. <laughs> Looks like a town. What there is of it. Well, give me a second to get used to it. Yes, it's a town, all right. And a three-point landing in front of our objective. The sheriff's office? Right. Come on. Oh, we're not going to get in trouble again, are we? I've got visions of Sergeant Matheson waiting for us back in town. He agreed us with comparatively open arms if we bring him home a solution. All right, let's go in. Okay. Yes? Is this the sheriff, uh... Jensen. Yes? Well, my name's Nick Carter. Yes? Jeff Denson, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Yes. I assume that means go ahead and ask. Yes. Well, do you keep any kind of a check on vagrants passing through Dead Tree? Yes. Well, do you recall whether a tramp answering to the name of Sammy the Bum passed through here last week? Yes. How long was he in this section? Don't know. Maybe a couple of days. Golly! He can say something else, can't he? Please, Patsy. Mm-hmm. I can talk, young lady, when there's something worth wasting breath over. Well, why is this town called Dead Tree? On kind of a section of sandy waste up in the hills. You mean desert? Yeah, kind of like the desert up in Maine. Windswept section, about ten miles square. Nothing but sand and rocks, all eroded. I thought so. Probably petrified trees up there, too, huh? Well, that's what gives the town's name. How'd you know, Nick? Couldn't be any other answer, Betty. Two more questions, Sheriff. That desert area is constantly enlarging and changing as the wind sweeps it, huh? Yeah. Will you show us how to drive there, close as possible? Yeah. Sheriff, are you 170 years old? No. Nope. Patsy, for the love of Pete. I'm sorry. I just wanted to hear him say no. And I did. I'm afraid we can't drive any further, Patsy. We'll have to hoof it through the desert. Golly. It looks just like the real thing, doesn't it? Sand and rock? And petrified trees. Come on. Mm-hmm. We'll have to keep pretty quiet now. This sand will deaden our footsteps, fortunately. 
but there's a strong chance the killer may be up here ahead of us. Oh. Do you know where to look for him, Nick? I do. We'll find him under the talking tree. Oh, Nick. I'm not fooling you. Well, all right, if you say so. But where will we find the talking tree? I'm not sure. We'll have to listen for it. Listen through ten square miles? We won't have to cover that much. See, if Simon located it, it couldn't be very far off the road. Probably he turned off the road we drove down to sleep in the warm sand at night. So the tree can't be far from here. Golly, I'm listening for it like mad. I don't hear anything yet. Keep trying. It's awfully dark, Nick. Can't we use the light? Hey, for not to. Keep your ears open. Okay. Golly, those twisty black tree stumps, they look so spooky. As petrified trees, Betsy. Dead thousands of years, they can't hurt you. Well, I wish they'd talk to me and get this over. Maybe they will. Keep listening. Nick? Yes? I, I think I hear a funny noise. Like water running. Not here in this desert. No, not water. It sounds like... Like music. Hmm? Listen. Yes. I hear it, Patsy. That's what we've been searching for. The talking tree? That's the way those trees talk. Oh, Coming from around that small hummock. Oh, come on, let's go interview it. Mm. Careful now. Very careful now. I think I hear someone digging or something. The killer. Here? Told you we'd find him under the talking tree. Quiet. And watch. What's he digging up petrified tree for? Let's go down and ask him. Oh, Nick, be careful. You haven't got a gun. I've got something. I'll take it, please. Good evening. Can I help you? Carl. What? It's the man from the appraisers. Bowman. Don't me, Carl. Don't move. You're coming. I am I. Such rough talk must be difficult for a man of your culture, Mr. Bowman. Or should I call you by your real name, Professor Stevens? Me. Yes. All right, Carl. You're asking for this. Hey, look out, Nick. Here you are, Bowman. Oh. 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 Professor is a rank amateur when it comes to handling a gun. Oh, nice going, Nick. How'd you do it? Merely threw a handful of sand in his eyes. And when he was blinded, hit him. That's all. That's all? Well, that's enough. Now you have his gun and he's out cold. And he's also on his way to the electric chair. Nick, do you mean to tell me Professor Stevens murdered Sammy the Bum? Yes, Patsy. And then pretended he was killed himself. Uh, and he did all that for the sake of a dead tree? Well, take my flashlight, Patsy, and look at that dead tree. It's all crystal and glittery and... Oh, it's like a tree of jewels. Pure opal, Patsy. An opal tree worth a fortune. Too bad we don't hang killers in this state. It'd be an excellent place to hang Professor Stevens. We'll return to Nick Carter in just a moment to hear the final details of The Talking Tree. Happy birthday, W.O.R., from Poinitowski Brothers of Flemington, New Jersey. Poinitowski Brothers. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, you'd better start at the beginning and explain everything. I'm entirely at sea now. All right, Patsy. The story started millions of years ago when the trees of Dead Tree Valley died. Started petrifying. Uh-huh. After untold centuries, deep under the ground, they turned to stone. And then began to crystallize into opal. Oh. Today, as the wind slowly ate away the sand and earth covering them, they were brought to the surface. And when Sammy went out to sleep in the desert, he slept under this opal tree that had been uncovered by the wind? Right. The talking oh. part was the tinkle of the crystalline branches swaying in the wind. Oh. Sammy broke off a piece of the tree and took it into town. He went to Stevens for advice, since he didn't know the value of that opal. Well, then what? Stevens saw the maps Sammy had made and, of course, the jewels. He went with Sammy to have it appraised, just to make sure it was valuable enough to pay him to commit murder. When he found it was, he killed Sammy for the map. But he staged his own murder, too. Why? Sammy talked too much. Stevens didn't know Sammy had told his old pal, Dubsy Coffin. But he did know Sammy told the real Bowman, the appraiser. So, to protect the secret, he killed Bowman, probably only a few minutes before we entered the store. You remember he stalled before coming out to talk to us? Oh, that's right. I remember he talked about his indigestion. He pretended to be Bowman. Then rushed the body to his own office at the university, perhaps in a laundry basket or a bag. And there, staged his own death. Well, he didn't know it, Nick, but that was just a preview of what's really going to happen to him. It doesn't pay to play act with Nick Carter. Well, that was an unusual tale, Nick. Now, how about a preview of next week's story? What's it going to be? Well, next week, Ken, I'm going to tell you about the case of an 80-year-old man. Feeble, sick, 
harmless who suddenly began driving down the highways like a savage, injuring people, wrecking cars, and generally behaving like a maniac. Oh, I remember. It was all because of a beautiful Egyptian queen who died 3,000 years ago. Breaking traffic laws because of a dead queen. Sounds good. What do you call the case? The case of the queen's eyebrows. Show starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Howling Horse, in which Nick Carter goes hunting in a forest of death and tracks down a fabulous four-legged killer. enjoyable living, for real contentment, it is necessary that we have time to relax. Time to do the things we like, as well as to do the necessary things. And these days, American homemakers everywhere are learning that one important way to enjoy leisure time is to depend on the three great Linux home brighteners. Those magic new shortcuts to beauty for woodwork, furniture, and floors. You, too, can save drudgery each day with those three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, the modern brush-on finish. Linux cream polish for fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. Try these fine modern products designed to help you do your work in record time. You'll find that they're a really efficient way to leisure your time for you. Ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linux home brighteners, the modern shortcuts to new home beauty. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. The lights are out in the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th. In the darkened laboratory, the strange whine of electricity sounds. And under the pale, purple aura of ultraviolet light, Nick Carter and Patsy play a strange jigsaw puzzle game with crime. Wait a minute, Patsy. Mm-hmm. This letter A matches the A and bequeath. Just a moment. Yes, an exact duplicate. Make a note of that. Right. Well, I'm right in progress. A word here. And this slip. Mm-hmm. Exactly duplicates the here and hereby bequeath. You got that? I've got it. Better and better. Ah. See that word will in last will and testament? Uh-huh. A precise duplicate of the written will from this thank you note. Who's that? Hiya, folks. It's the demon reporter himself in person. Why, it's Scubby. Oh, hello, Scubby. Pardon the interruption, masterminds. The housekeeper let me in. Well, what's cooking, good looking? Nick's testing the validity of a will, Scubby. We're matching samples of the dead man's writing with the writing in the will. Oh, very interesting. Do they match? Precisely. Well, then the will is genuine, eh? On the contrary, the will's a forgery. Huh? Now turn off the ultraviolet, Patsy. Put on right. the lights. Hey, I don't get it, Nick. If the writing in the will dovetails with other letters, doesn't that prove the same guy wrote both? No, Scubby. The fact that words and in individual letters from old correspondence match words and letters in the will proves someone forged the will by tracing the dead man's handwriting. Very clever. Very clever indeed. It'll make a nice feature article when I finish with my story on the howling horse. It... Did you say howling horse, Scubby? Yes, beautiful. I'm on my way upstate to cover one of the craziest stories that ever hit the desk. I thought Nick might be interested. What is it, Scubby? Well, it seems there's a guy upstate named Lucas who has... A.B. B. Lucas? Three degrees in medicine, archaeology, and natural philosophy. Explored the Gobi Desert in 36. Yeah, the very same. Oh, this Lucas must be pretty wealthy. He's got a big estate, about 700 acres of forest and lake. But what about that howling horse you mentioned? Well, there's a story that Lucas brought back a couple of horses with him from one of his explorations, and they howl. Nonsense. (laughs) They also kill cattle. Ridiculous. These horses of Dr. Lucas also have murdered a man. Oh, no. Well, that's the story I'm going to check. Are you interested, Nick? In horses that murder men? Certainly am. 
I'll use my car. We should reach the Lucas estate by nightfall. Let's go. <laughs> Mr. Carter. Ma'am. Thank you. The other gent, too. Thanks. I'm mighty happy to have you with us in the burning. Thank you very much, Sheriff Crane. Yes, uh, the case too tough for you to handle, eh, Sheriff? Well, uh, you betcha. It'd be too tough for anybody except Mr. Carter here. I reckon I'd have caught you in anyway. You better explain, sir. Well, it's like this. Lucas ain't an amiable man. Not by a long shot. Keeps himself locked up in that estate. Nobody can get him. Nobody sees him. He kind of acts like he's scared of something, hiding. But he's a mighty powerful man in this county. Got influential friends. My hands are tied. I can't buck him. But you can, Mr. Carter. I hear you're a fighter that don't care a hoot where the punches land. Well, I try to live up to that reputation, Sheriff Crane. Now, tell me about Lucas's horses. Don't know a thing. He brought them back with him about six months ago. Moved them in in horse vans. Nobody's seen them. Well, pretty soon people start talking about them horses howling. They're sure about them howling? Yep. Then, one or two folks seen one of them running around Lucas's estate. A big black critter. Seen him at night. Mean and ornery. Hmm. Well, pretty soon they started killing cattle. Rip them apart with their teeth. Folks shoot Lucas. He just laughed. Told them they was crazy. Swore he didn't own no horses. I see. Last week, Jed Storm was killed. On the road that passes Lucas's estate. Head was near torn off. Body all ripped to pieces. I figured maybe the law better step in. I had to pull every string I could to even get into Lucas's estate. Search the place from top to bottom, house, barns, everything. Well, sir, Lucas was telling the truth. There ain't no horses there. You're sure, Sheriff? Ma'am, I'm a farmer before I'm a sheriff. You can't fool a farmer on things like that. All right, Sheriff. We'll start tonight and see what we can find. Uh, just one warning, Mr. Carter. Maybe I sound kind of fantastic-like, but believe me, I ain't been stretching the truth. You go slow, and you go careful. That Lucas is mean. Them horses is deadly. Thanks for the warning, Sheriff, but I've met deadly killers before. And Nick is still here, which is more than you can say for most of the killers he's met. Oh. are right, this must be the road that skirts Lucas's estate. Keep your eyes on the left. We ought to sight the house any minute now. It's dark, Nick. Watch for lights. Oh, what's the program, Nick? You going to bust right in? Going to try. I don't know how tough Lucas really is. Maybe he's just bluffing Sheriff Crane. Nick, I can see lights off to the left. Yeah? Where are we, Skipper? Deep in the woods there. See? Yeah. The lady's right, Nick. I see them. That must be Lucas's house, all right. Yes. There's a gravel drive turning off the road. Here goes. I'll be more than interested to meet Lucas again. Oh, you know him, Nick? Casually. I had a rather distasteful job of checking his credentials for the government some years ago. Intelligence work. Believe me, it was a nasty interview. Nick! Hey, oh, Robert, Robert, Pete, Nick. Someone's bombarding us. Oh, stop the car, Nick. We'll be blown up. Stop anyway. There's a roadblock ahead. Oh. Hey, this doesn't look like a bluff to me. Lucas is playing for Keats. This is private property. You are a trespasser on private property. I shall give you five minutes to get out of here. Where's that voice coming from? He's using a public address speaker out on the grounds. He's probably got the microphone in the house. This is your last warning, whoever you are. You have five minutes to get out of my ground. Apparently, we haven't much choice. Was that Chinese? It was, and raises a very curious question in a fantastic case. Let's back out to the road and start finding the answer to it. All right. This is far enough. Let's get out. Okay. Well, where are we now, Nick? About half a mile past Lucas's house. We're going to cut into the woods from here, then circle around to the house. Well, I got my flashlight. Lead on, Nick. No, no, Scotty. No flashlight. We do this in the dark. Oh, Patsy, you can wait in the car if you want to. Oh, who, me? Wait, you talk as though you think I'm scared. 
Well, aren't you? Yes, but I won't admit it. All right. I'll hold your hand, beautiful. Uh, I'm not that scared. Now, listen, we've got to be as quiet as possible. Hey, do you think that we're going to meet any wild horses, Nick? I don't know, Scubby. Nick, you haven't explained yet about Lucas talking in Chinese. Not sure I understand yet myself. Oh, I sure wish I'd covered the beauty contest instead of this guy. Hold everything. What is it? Quiet. Listen. Hear that? She did I? It sounds like howling. There it is again. Howling horses, I said. Nonsense, Nick Carter said. Well, is it nonsense now, Nick? A howling horse. Say, it's coming closer. Are we just going to stand here and wait, Nick? We are not. Gunshot, Mom. Hurry. Someone's being chased by Scubby's howling horse. Someone is using a gun to protect themselves with a lover. Careful now, whatever you do. Hold your head. Nick, yes. straight ahead in that clearing. Yeah, I see. Oh, I can see the silhouette. Yes, chasing a man. Almost got him, too. Quick now. Oh, Nick. Oh. Keep moving forward. Oh, I think we're too late, Nick. I know where you are. Get your flashlight out, Scubby, and flash us straight ahead. Quick. I want to get a look at that horse if he's still there. Right. Here you are. There's nothing. There's nothing at all. Nothing but a body of a man sprawled there in the grass. <gasps> a body without a head. Grimly, Nick paces the last few steps forward to examine the victim of a murder he could not prevent. Who is the dead man? How did Lucas' fantastic creatures track and kill him? Why did Lucas cry a warning in Chinese? Can Nick answer these questions in time? We'll see in just a moment. Modern science is constantly achieving miracles, constantly finding new ways, better ways, to do the things which must be done. And science has done its share of service for our American homemakers. Take, for example, the three great Linux home brighteners, which are proving such an aid to women everywhere. There's Linux self-polishing wax, for example, created by leading research chemists to give you the finest. Made from a brand new formula, Linex self-polishing wax offers new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for every floor surface in your home. And Linex self-polishing wax contains the greatest possible amount of real carnauba wax for that handsome, satiny finish only real wax can give. What's more, the underwriter's laboratories have proved by test that any linoleum, hardwood, or rubber tile floor is actually less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied. And, of course, Linex self-polishing wax saves time two ways, for it takes only a jiffy to apply and dries quickly. And then its beautiful protective surface saves you future work because it's so easy to keep clean. Choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax and know what it is to use the finest. Ask your dealer now for all three great Linex home brighteners. Give your home new beauty the easy Linex way. And now back to our story. The strange story of savage howling horses that hunt and kill men brought Nick, Patsy, and Scubby to the small upstate town of Avernum. When Nick drives out to the estate of C.B. Lucas, famous explorer who has brought the animals to America, he is warned off by Lucas, who shouts at the master detective in Chinese. When Nick, Patsy, and Scubby attempt to steal into the estate on foot, they witness the tracking down and killing of a man by one of Lucas' savage creatures. Now, in the blackness of a forest clearing, they examine the dead body. Oh, what a mess this fellow is. Yes, head torn off completely. Apparently, Dr. Lucas's man-eating horse took it away with him. And did you hear the way it howled? It was like a lion or, or something. Oh, that wasn't any lion or anything else that I ever heard of. You're right, Scully. Wait a minute. Well, this is odd. What, Nick? Look at the gun this fellow was carrying. Huh? It's lying beside his right hand. For the love of Pete, what is it? Happens to be a Patterson Colt. Model of 1848. 1848? You mean a hundred years old? It's about... This is one of the original Colt models, fired with percussion caps. Oh, but that doesn't make sense, Nick. Why would a man defend himself with an antique like that? Well, if you remember, Scabby, that when Lucas warned us off, he talked in Chinese, it does make sense. Well, not to me, it doesn't. We'll in a very few minutes. Come on, get up to Lucas's house. Well, aren't you going to search that body for identification or something? No, we won't find any. How do you know? Let's concentrate on being quiet, shall we? Okay. Put that flash out, Scabby. Sure. Now stay on your toes. 
Dr. Lucas coming. Catch me be closer than you think. Ned. Yes? I, I can see the house lights from here straight ahead. Yes. All right, quick now. Oh. Oh, I sure wish there was a moon. You're not getting romantic, are you, Scuffy? Heck no. I'm just scared of the dark. Wait a minute. Listen. It's a funny sound. It's like machinery or something. It's not machinery. Hurry, let's get to the house. Take this path here. Take that sound. It's awfully familiar. I just can't place it. Familiar to you, Scuffy? Oh, yeah. It's coming over the PA. Lucas has on the ground. Over the PA? Right. Right, quick. Into the house. Those French windows at the side look open. Open? They're smashed. Like a truck went through them. So they are. Careful of broken glass. Oh, Nick, look at this room. Yeah, looks as if the truck drove through here, too. Yeah. Where is Dr. Lucas? I have a hunch that something's happened to Dr. Lucas, Patsy. Something that accounts for the funny noise you hear over the PA. Come on. Uh, I don't like this. The train's advising. Oh, for the love. Yes, I rather expected this. It... It's a body. Scrolled alongside that phonograph. And it's a needle running in the last groove in the record that's making that strange sound, Patsy. I'm afraid Dr. Lucas has played this phonograph for the last time. Better take the playing arm off the record, Scotty. Yeah, right, Nick. Now, let's have a look at this body. Oh, lots of blood. Body quite warm, killed very recently. Mm-hmm. The same way our friend back in the woods was killed. Head torn off. Only this time, the head was left with the body. But this isn't Dr. Lucas. Nick, look at the head. He's Chinese. Glory be, you're right, Patsy. Then this explains why we heard a warning in Chinese over the PA when we first drove up to the house. Right, Nick? Scubby, start that record again. This man couldn't talk English, so he had an English-speaking record made to, to warn people off the ground. Play it, right? Scubby. Play it quick. Okay. Turn off the PA first. We'll hear it direct. Right, Nick. This is private property. You are trespassing on private property. I will give you five minutes to get out of here. What did I tell you, Nick? That's the voice we heard. This is your last warning, whoever you are. Five minutes to get off my ground. Please, turn off my seat. Nick. Please, turn off my seat. For the love of... A couple of hatchet men. Please, so now move. A socket and self highly expert in use of lethal firearms. Kindly raise arms to extreme vertical positions. Remain with backs against wall. Thank you. Oh, now listen, wise guy. Please to remain silent. So, oh, we have made long journey for most prosperous meeting, Mr. Lucas. Lucas? Well, this Quiet, is... was extremely injudicious to take away Go Chi Chang, Mr. Lucas. Rash action put miserable selves to extreme expense of body and purse for long journey. Yes. Now necessary to locate Go Chi Chang at once. If ever that number two associate as yet unsuccessful in task, remains for self and miserable number one associate. Hey, what in blazes is it? Mr. Lucas, you will please inform this person of locality of Koshi Chang. May miserable Sang Pai remind honorable Mr. Lucas, this person highly prosperic species, lack refining benefits of civilized education. Much prepared to obtain required information with cruel methods of contemptible savage. Golly, Nick. Oh, who is this Goshi Jung character you birds are after? He's the guy I think you mean. He's dead. Be quiet, Scubby. Ah, this news highly interesting. It's true, Mr. Lucas, that Goshi Jung departed to join all of our ancestors. Whatever it is. Then the uh, task of this person reaches to minimum. Only necessary to ensure demise of you and friends and then return to home. Our demise? But we... Yeah. Can... This is how you're mentioning to the now. This is the payoff. Look out now, Scubby. You're going to photograph. Oh, 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 oh. This way, Patsy. Scubby. Get moving. Oh, all right. All right. Through this door. Move fast. Okay. Oh, you blocked them off with that photograph like a fool. You can't block bullets as easily. Oh, they'll be recovering up any minute now to start shooting. This must be the kitchen. Straight ahead and out the back door. You think we can shake the neck? We move fast enough we can. All right, I'll get the door. Go, Patsy, quick. Come on, Scubby. Right with you. Oh. Now what? Quiet and keep running. Come on. We'll stand a 50-50 chance of shaking them in the dark out here. Why didn't you tell them you weren't looking? You think they'd believe me? Hey, this looks like a garage ahead. In there, hurry. Careful. 
There's a car here. Don't bang into it. All right, now what, Nick? Oh, we can just hold out long enough. Sheriff Crane will rescue us. Huh? What do you mean, Patsy? Well, when you were examining the body, I called the sheriff and notified him about the two deaths. What? He said he was coming right up as soon as he could get his posse together. Oh, good work, Patsy. That's for a little darling every time. That's about the worst news I've ever had. But, Nick, I... I understand, Patsy. It's too late to explain now. All right, here's what we do. Yeah, we're listening, Nick. We'll get into this car. Drive out of the garage like six again. Get past those two killers. Uh-huh. Get okay. okay. I'll take the wheel. You two hold on now. Yeah. All right. Here goes. <laughs> I'm cutting straight across the lawns and fields. Let's hope the tires hold. Holy God! They don't get us now. We're safe. I think we, I think we made it. You all right back there? I guess so. Watch out! Yeah. We're going straight through the fields to that patch of woods where we found the first victim of Goshi Jones. Oh, for Pete's sake, why? I'm going to perform the nastiest piece of business I've ever been forced to do. I'm going to run a human drag line. <laughs> Scotty, this is what we do. We're going to take the body of this unfortunate fellow and drag it. Oh, holy smokes, where? Get across Lucas's land, away from the house. Quick, give me a hand with the body. Okay, Nick. Why, Nick? Set a drag line or don't go, she jump. I'm going to start moving, shall we? Okay, Nick. Nick, what's the drag line? Folks use it down south for fox hunting, Patsy. Especially when there aren't any foxes in the neighborhood. It's an artificial trail. Well, I understand, but why do why we... For the we sake have... of Sheriff Crane and any men he may bring with him. Don't forget, Dosey Jung is around the house and grounds. And the killer. We've got to turn ourselves into bait to save their lives. Good old howling horse. Why didn't Lucas leave him where he found him? Nick, did Lucas discover Dosey Jung? No, Ben. A gentleman by the name of Marco Polo discovered him. Marco Polo? Yes. I'm just the other side of that tree, Scubby. All right, Nick. Okay. Dosey Jung was discovered many centuries ago. But he's unknown in the Western world. He was, that is, until Lucas brought him here. I warn you. Sooner or later, he'll pick up the scent of this trail we're making and come after us. And believe me, it'll be a tremendous shock. Oh, nothing could shock me anymore. Well, you've never seen anything like go see junk, Scully. Valley, got the queen. Fortunately, there's a brisk wind blowing. If he doesn't pick up this blood trail, maybe he'll pick up ours. Any? He... Wait, wait. Yeah. You hear that? Yeah, I hear it. Hard luck. We must send it. Keep moving, Scubby. Here at the top of that little hill. All right. He's got us closer. He's as fast as a racehorse. Yeah, and he howls like a pack of... Nick, I just got it. Good. No time to talk about it. All right. This is far enough. Put the body down, Scubby. Okay. Get your flashlight ready. Pass it. Yes, Nick. I want you to stand to my left. Here's an extra magazine for my automatic. Hold it. When I yell for it, slap it into my wrapped hand. Okay. Oh, what a monster. Stand by. Oh, it sounds awful close. He should be in sight any second now. Right, Scubby, straight ahead. Right. Oh, Nick, for the love of me. It is a horse. A stallion. No. No, it's a dog. A giant dog. And a killer. Look out. Oh. You can't stop him. Oh, Nick. Magazine, Patsy, quick. Oh, the giant. For Pete's sake, Nick, get that gun loaded. All right, here we are. It's all right. We've stopped him. Steady. Steady. Oh, golly, Nick. Oh, golly. It was so big. Fantastic. Looming up and just got his flashlight. It's all right. It's all right. Nick. <laughs> Nick, do you mean to say that the class thing was a dog? I do. That was Goshi Jung. The fabulous, almost mythical Tibetan master. This is the first and probably the last time we'll ever see this breed. And in killing it, we've destroyed the monster that murdered Dr. C.B. Lucas. <laughs> In just a few minutes, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and describe the strange creature thought to be the howling horse. When your furniture was new, of course you were proud of its handsome, gleaming appearance. Since then, it may be that finger marks, dust smudges, the cloudy look of inferior polish have made your furniture look dull and unattractive. But with Linex Cream Polish to help you out, you can restore its appearance in double quick time. For Linex Cream Polish cleans as it polishes cutting the job in half. Yes, one quick application of Linex Cream Polish removes all the cloudy dullness from your furniture, leaves it gleaming and beautiful. And because it dries hard, leaving no oily film on the surface to attract more dust, it saves you future work as well. 
No wonder so many thousands of modern American women are coming to depend on Linex Cream Polish, the up-to-date beauty treatment for fine furniture. Get Linex Cream Polish now. You'll find all three great Linex Home Brighteners, Linex Cream Polish, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Clear Gloss, the longer-lasting brush-on finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that brings quick new sparkle to walls and ceilings. Chemtone covers in one coat, dries in one hour. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. I had heard of the Tibetan Mastiff before, Pazzi. Hmm? You'll find an interesting chapter on that strange animal in a pamphlet on Chinese dogs published by the Quan Quan Company in Los Angeles in 1944. It's one of the oldest defense breeds in the world, and it's so revered in Tibet that none has ever been allowed out of that country. Go Si Jung means dog of Tibet. Oh. Well, aren't there any pictures, Nick? No, the Tibetans do not permit pictures to be taken, Patrick. Oh. All we have are the descriptions of various explorers from Marco Polo down. All describe the giant dog as being the size of a horse. Well, it sure was, Nick. There have been attempts to steal one of the mastiffs and bring them out of the country, but in each case, the dog has either been stolen back or killed. So Dr. Lucas managed to steal Goshi Chang. Right. He brought it to his estate and then lived in constant fear, knowing the Tibetans would never let him keep the dog. He knew that sooner or later they'd send men to kill it. And they did. And that's why he kept himself locked up? Precisely. Lucas made that recorded warning to play over his PA system whenever strangers drove up. It was undoubtedly worn by some sort of mechanical device that was set off by our entrance to the ground. He also repeated it in Chinese to warn off any Chinese gunmen who might have trailed him here. Mm, then it really was Lucas we heard. Yes. You see, Patsy, the dog apparently turned savage and broke loose from the chains with which it was confined. Lucas could not recapture it. So it roamed the estate, killing everything it met. Oh. In fact, right before our eyes, we saw it kill a man. And that was Mr. Fang's number two assistant, prowling around the grounds. The mastiff ran off with a dead man's head in his jaws, crashed into Lucas's house, and attacked Lucas himself. Then it dropped the head of the Chinese and tore off Lucas's head and rushed off with it. Exactly. Oh. That's why you and Scubby leaped to the conclusion that the head we found alongside Lucas's body actually belonged to that body. Well, when did you first begin to understand what was happening, Nick? When I saw that the first victim had been carrying an old Patterson coat. Hmm? There's only one section of the world that continues to use antique firearms, Patsy, and that's the mountain regions of China. In Tibet, you'll still find soldiers equipped with flintlock rifles and old Civil War weapons. Golly. Well... What about those killers from Tibet that came after the dog, Nick? The men who thought you were Lucas. Probably slipped off and started back for home. We'll never see them again, and there's no need to, really. They haven't been guilty of any crime. All the guilty parties in question have already paid in full. Well, Nick, that was certainly an unusual tale. What's next week's story going to be about? Next week, Ken, we're going to meet a strange young man who, as far as anyone knew, never touched alcohol at all, yet apparently came home intoxicated night after night. Then one evening, he was murdered. And that was the evening he carried home with him a can opener seven feet long. And the murder was revealed by a silkworm. A giant can opener and telltale silkworms. Sounds like a swell story. What's its title, Nick? A Case of the Worried Worm. Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Long Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Alfred Bester. The programs are fictional, and any resemblance therein to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. <laughs> Master Detective is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linex Home Brighteners, Linex Clear Gloss, Linex Cream Polish, and Linex Self-Polishing Wax. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linex dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This 
is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, Shakespeare's Ghost in which Nick Carter tracks a disappearing corpse and a ghost is accused of murder. Nick Carter is brought to you each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux cream polish, Linux clear gloss, and Linux self-polishing wax. You know there's no time like New Year's for making good resolutions. And ladies... One of the best resolutions you can make for 1946 is that you'll keep your floors sparkling bright and beautiful with Linux self-polishing wax, the anti-skid wax finish that beautifies your floors without making them slippery. Your folks are sure to appreciate the added skid resistance Linux self-polishing wax gives and how proud you'll be of the satiny, lustrous appearance it lends all your floors and linoleum. Depend on Linux self-polishing wax, the modern way to new floor beauty. Ask your dealer for it by name. Linux self-polishing wax, the anti-skid floor finish that wipes on in a jiffy, dries without tiresome rubbing. You'll find Linux self-polishing wax at your nearest hardware, paint, or department store. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. As we look in on the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 4th and 5th, Nick is clearing up the files on his desk as Patsy answers the door. Let's see. Left Clanton, convicted of arson, 15 years. Mary yes. North. Hmm? Well, come in, Mr. Yu. Uh, Mr. Carter, my name is J.T. Reed. But I don't suppose that means anything to you. Not unless you're the J.T. Reed who bought the original letters of John Keats, the poet, at the Gibson Auction Galleries on March 15th, 1920. Why, that's amazing. Absolutely right, even to the day of the month. How in the world did you know that, Mr. Carter? Oh, I've always been interested in literary memorabilia. And an important sale like that stuck in my mind, that's all. I see. Well, as you may surmise, I have quite a collection of rare books and manuscripts. Now, last week... A Mr. Rodney Stone called at my country home. He was a fully accredited representative of Latchworth and Blake. The English firm of rare book dealers? Uh, correct. And as their American representative, he offered to sell me a copy of the Gutenberg Bible. Mm-hmm. But as all my capital is invested in books, I told Mr. Stone that at present I was more interested in selling some books than in buying. And he offered to sell some for you? Yes. His credentials were so good, I gave him my first folio Shakespeare and a few other items. Mm. He signed a receipt for them and took them to his hotel here in town. Well, Mr. Reed, you wouldn't be here unless something had gone wrong. What is it? Well, uh, uh, just to make sure, I checked Stone's hotel and he was registered there. But then I sent a cable to his London office to confirm the details. And this, Mr. Carter, is the answer I just received. Mm-hmm. We have no American representative named Rodney Stone. His credentials obviously forged. I suggest you contact Nick Carter immediately to investigate this fraud. That's Ford and Blake, London. Hmm? I took their advice, Mr. Carter, and came here at once. Yes, I've handled two or three cases for them. Have you been to Stone's Hotel? Well, I thought I'd better see you first. I phoned, however. He's still registered there. Well, it's probably a fairly amateurish swindle case, but I don't like to disappoint people who cable a recommendation 3,000 miles. Uh, then you'll go with me to see Stone? Yes, and there's another reason, too, Mr. Reed. I've always had a soft spot for Shakespeare. Come on. Let's go rescue old Master Will from the clutches of a rather clumsy con man. You say it was the first complete edition of Shakespeare's plays, Mr. Reed? Why, 
It must be 300 years old. 322, to be exact, Patsy. Wow. All yours were printed in 1623. And my copy is of special interest. The flyleaf is signed by Ben Johnson, Shakespeare's friend and fellow poet. A Johnson copy? Well. Wow. Yes. Oh, there's a legend about that copy. <laughs> Very foolish, I suppose, but... Yes, uh... I know the legend. Well, what is it, Nick? For three times in three centuries, that copy has been stolen. And each time, the thief has been found later with his head cut off. Oh, slightly grisly, what? The legend is that Shakespeare's ghost comes back and slays the thief for meddling with his friend Johnson's copy. And that's the copy that this man Stone has stolen? Uh, yes, Miss Bowen. And if this legend is true, then he... his head... Oh, nonsense. Just a silly story, Bessie. Yes? Well, if you think it's a silly story, why have you stepped on the gas? <laughs> Still no answer. Uh, I'll try it. Never mind. I'll open the door. Uh, but how? I always carry skeleton keys. There. Let's go in. Nick. Great heavens. Inside, quickly. Both of you. Shut the door. That man on the floor. His head. Just like the legend. I suppose that's Rodney Stone, Mr. Reed? <laughs> it was. Oh, poor chap. Oh, just look at this room. There must have been a terrific struggle. Yes. Furniture overturned, blood all over, clothes almost ripped from the body. Oh, what a battle he must have put up to save himself. Well, one thing's certain. Our simple case of fraud has certainly become a lot more serious. Uh, the bedroom door's open. I'll go in and see whether there's anything in there. Are you going to examine the body, Nick? In a moment, Betsy. First, I want to get an old, an old over picture of the room from here. Uh-huh. I often tell a lot just from standing in one spot, getting kind of a perspective on the crime. For instance, the position of the body... Location of the bloodstains and the way the clothes are ripped. Yes. It looks as if the ghost of Shakespeare is struck again. Mr. Carter, Mr. Carter, come in here, quick. Right with you. Uh, look what I found on the windowsill here, Mr. Carter. Don't touch it. Let me see. A sword. A bloodstained sword. Yes. A 16th century claymore. A 16th century sword? The thief's head cut off? Why, it all fits. Well, Mr. Carter... What do you think of the legend of Shakespeare's ghost now? Find any clues, Nick? No. Bring me a pillowcase from that bed, will you, Betsy? I want to wrap up this sword. Yes, Nick. Uh, how do you explain it, Mr. Carter? I don't yet. This is the 23rd floor. That door was locked from the inside. There's no fire escape or balcony outside these windows. Here's a pillowcase, Nick. Thanks. Now, Jim, there. That's it. Well, it's, it's a good thing we're all intelligent adults because it certainly looks like the work of a ghost. That's one of the things that bothers me, Mr. Reed. It looks too much like ghosts. I think I'll go back and give the body a closer examination for it. To... What? What is it, Nick? What's wrong? Look, Patsy. <gasps> Where the body? It's disappeared. Vanished. <laughs> Hand me that microscope slide, Bessie. Here you are. Nick, why didn't you investigate the other rooms on the 23rd floor of that hotel when we found no one had been seen leaving the floor since we came up? You can't search people's rooms without their permission or a warrant. Besides, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And catch a murderer? Right. Now, I just want to check the blood cell structure from the stains on the sword. Well, how can you tell whether it was Stone's blood? I can't, but I can be sure it's human blood. Evidence can be framed, you know. Uh-huh. Well, how about it? Yeah, human blood, all right. Hmm. Been on that sword about seven hours, which means about six hours before we found it. What does that prove? Could prove or disprove a great deal. Pass me that steel punch, will you? Sure. I just want to take a small chip off this sword. <coughs> ah. Obviously, hand forged. Now I'll smelt down this little piece over a high heat flame. Here's a crucible. Thanks. Now, Patsy, while you're waiting for that steel chip to melt, we should look up J.T. Reed in our file. All right, Nick. You sure we've got him listed? He ought to be there. Uh-huh. Here's his card. Joseph T. Reed. Chief interest books, manuscripts, and curios, and... Mm-hmm. 
Oh, quite a patriotic citizen, too. Did a lot of volunteer war work. He did, huh? Uh-huh. Very interesting. Let me see that. Oh, there's a signal on the heat gauge, Nick. The steel's melted. Better tend to that first. Mm-hmm. Just, I'll just add this catalyst. Ah, uh-huh. Just as I thought. What's the matter, Nick? Was the sword a modern fake? On the contrary, Patsy, the chemicals used in its manufacture prove almost conclusively that it's authentic Elizabethan. Now let me see Reed's file card. Here you are. Nick, why were you so anxious to prove the sword is genuine? Because it shows someone is trying to throw suspicion. Great Scott. What is it, Nick? What do you see on the card? Patsy, send a wire to J.T. Reed. Tell him we're coming out to report to him tonight. Well, that's more like it. A little action. If Reed can tell us what we need to know, we may crack this case tonight. Oh. Tell me what's on your mind, Nick, please. I can tell you two things, Patsy. First, there was more than one criminal involved. There was? And second, they're among the most cunning and cold-blooded men I've ever met. You haven't met them yet. Well, we may tonight. And we my cold automatic. And then we're on our way. <laughs> A swindler murdered like other men before him who stole the same rare book. The legend of Shakespeare's ghost brought to life as a genuine Elizabethan sword is found in the room. Then the body disappears. Where will this mysterious trail of bloodshed and theft lead Nick? We'll see in just a moment. What happened last time you waxed your floor? Did hubby grumble because the floors were slippery? Did the youngsters use that fresh new wax job for a skating rink? Not if you used Linex Self-Polishing Wax. For Linex Self-Polishing Wax cuts down the slipperiness of your floors and at the same time gives that satiny beauty only real wax can give. Yes, it's true. The underwriters' laboratories have proved by test that hardwood, linoleum, and rubber tile all are less slippery after Linex Self-Polishing Wax has been applied. Yet your floors and linoleum will look more beautiful than ever before when you use Linex self-polishing wax. And you'll find it easier to keep them clean, too, for Linex self-polishing wax gives a finish that lasts longer so that you just whisk a damp cloth over the surface to keep them spick and span. What's more, Linex self-polishing wax wipes on in a jiffy and dries quickly without tiresome rubbing. So in every way, it's the wise choice for wise homemakers. Get Linex self-polishing wax now. It's the modern anti-skid floor finish. Get all the great Linux home brighteners for new home beauty the whole year round. And now back to our story. Nick and Patsy are investigating a strange murder, a vanishing corpse, and the disappearance of a copy of a first folio Shakespeare. The entire crime seems to be linked to a legend about Shakespeare's ghost. They are now in a small suburban railway station waiting for their client, J.T. Reed. Nick, what do you suppose is keeping Mr. Reed? Oh, station master. Yes? Are you sure Mr. Reed got the wire we sent this afternoon? Of course I'm sure. This here before the telegraph office, too. Got your wife saying you was arriving on the 712 and sent it right up to Mr. Reed. Can't imagine why he isn't here. It's almost... 7.30. 7.30. Well, anyway, Nick, we had a cozy place to wait during the shower. It was short, but awfully wet. I'm not interested in waiting anywhere cozily. I want to get going. Well, if he's supposed to be here, he will be. Real fine men, Mr. Reed. Humble spirited. Works on bond drive. He even served as a volunteer up to the county hospital. Well, here's a car now. It's Mr. Reed, Nick. Let's go, then. Thanks for your hospitality, Station Master. You're welcome. Oh, Miss Bohr, Mr. Carter. I'm dreadfully sorry I'm late. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Reed. Those are why I surprised you. No, no, it wasn't that. I had trouble starting my car. Couldn't even get it out of the garage till ten minutes ago. Oh, no? Uh, right this way. No. Uh, my butler Evans insisted on helping me. Every time I thought the motor was ready to run, he'd reach in under the hood to adjust something and bang, it would stall again. Well, let's hope it won't stall on the way back. I'm rather anxious to see your place and your butler. Uh, Mr. Carter, 
I do hope you can get my beautiful books back for me. I'll do my best, Mr. Reed. Oh, by the way, were they insured? Oh, yes, yes, thank heaven. But I want my books back. Uh, Mr. Carter, shouldn't we notify the police? No, Mr. Reed. You can't make a murder charge stick without a corpse. But I saw it. I could testify that I... No corpse, no case. Oh, well. Uh, Just around the next turn and we're home. Ah, there it is. Oh, what a lovely place. Isn't it, Nick? Yes, indeed. Charming place. The whole scene is so nice. Smoke curling from the chimney. Oh, that's funny. Uh, What is, Miss Bowen? Smoke curling from the chimney on a warm summer night. Oh, that. That's the hot water heater. Really? An awful lot of smoke for one of those things, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes. It's a nuisance. We have to burn soft coal all we can get right now. Who tends the boiler, Mr. Reed? Why, Evans the butler. Even though he considers it a little beneath his dignity. Uh, why do you ask? Oh, no particular reason. Just curious. Well, I'll leave the car here in case we want it later. Well, let me help you, Betsy. Thanks. Good evening. Oh, uh, good evening, Evans. Uh, come on in, both of you. Uh-huh. Thank you. Evans, uh, this is Miss Bowen and Mr. Carter. They'll be staying the night. Very good, sir. Uh, Mr. Carter, the detective, may I ask? Yes, why? Uh, nothing, sir. Nothing at all. Uh, would you care to wash up, either of you? Oh, no, thanks. I freshened up on the train. I'd like to wash, please. Oh, but Nick, you... I know, Patsy. Uh, I'll take you upstairs. Thank you. Uh, meanwhile, Evans, will you show Miss Bowen into the library? The, the library, sir? Yes, the library. Uh, perhaps Miss Bowen would like to see the garden. The hollyhocks are quite lovely now, and there's still enough light... I'll look at the garden in the morning, if I may. Oh, certainly. Show Miss Bowen to the library, Evans. Yes, sir. Very well, sir. Library. This way, please. Oh. Oh, gee, well, I guess what a collection of books. First edition, Paradise Lost. David Copperfield in the original part. Big pardon, <gasps> Miss. Oh. Oh, Evans, you surprised me. I didn't hear you come in. Sorry to startle you, miss. Thought you might like some tea. Thank you. And, Evans, could we have a little more light in here? Uh, Why? You've only this one lamp on. The whole other half of the room is dark. (laughs) Makes it gloomy. Oh, I don't think it's gloomy, miss. I do. May we have a little more light, please? Very good, miss. Look at that other wall. Yes, miss. It's covered with armor. Swords and things. Yes, yes. Uh, mm, very interesting. If you need anything, you will please ring this. Thank you. Hmm. Let's see. I think I'll take a look. This suit of armor, time of Henry the Second. Well, in target, fourteenth century. Crossbows? Quiet, Patsy. Oh, Nick, it's you. I thought... Well, never mind. Come along. We've got work to do. Oh, but Nick, look. Look here at the collection of armor and swords. So I see. What a good collection of British battle swords, too. Mm -hmm. Look here, Nick. See this? Oh, yes. One sword missing. And the label says it was a 16th century claymore. True enough, Patsy. Good for you. Nick, that butt left. Save it for now, Patsy. Come on. We've got work to do. Where are we going? Out through the French windows into the garden. Whatever for? To see the hollyhocks and other things. Come on. The hollyhocks are beautiful, Nick. But what do we want with flowers at a time like this? You'll see in a minute. You know, Nick, I just realized why you were so excited when you saw Mr. Reed's file card. You knew that curios meant swords and armor, didn't you? Oh, did I? Oh, I knew there was some reason why that butler was so anxious to keep me out of the library. He didn't want us to notice that that sword was missing. Maybe so. We ought to nab him quickly, Nick. He'll make a getaway. Not just yet, he won't. Ah, over here, Patsy. Hmm? I found what I came out for. A a door. A door to the house. Oh, but why come out here to find a door going back into the house? Unless I'm much mistaken, this is a door to the cellar. Oh, the cellar. Locked, of course. Well, a curious keyhole. Now, my pick lock was made for just such unusual locks. So let's see. Well, what do we want in the cellar, Nick? 
Patsy, when we arrived, you noticed smoke pouring from the chimney. Mm-hmm. Reed said it was the hot water heater. Yes. Well, I made a point of going up to wash my hands. The water in the hot faucet was only lukewarm. With all the smoke we saw, that water should have been boiling hot. I see. That means... That it's not the hot water boiler that's burning. Something else is burning in the cellar. Oh. Or being burned. There. Thought that would do it. Now. Wait till I turn on my flashlight. Uh-huh. All right. Down those steps. Easy. Right. down here. Yes. And a big fire going in that furnace. You can see it's still glowing over there. Nick, that... that smell. It's like... You're right, Patsy. I'm afraid that's just what it is. Wait. Take this slice bar and open the furnace door. Oh, Nick. Just as I thought. Look. There's a toe of a shoe left. Yes. Unquestionably, one of the shoes we saw on the body of Rodney Stone. Oh, Nick, shut the door, please. All right. It, it all fits together, Nick. That butler, he probably overheard everything about Stone in the first folio of Shakespeare, then stole the sword, then followed Stone to the hotel and killed him. Mm. And Nick, remember? When Reed came to the station, he said he was delayed because Evans kept stalling the car. Yeah. And Evans has charge of this cellar, and he thought he'd have time to burn the body, but our wire surprised him. He kept delaying reads that we wouldn't get here too soon. Certainly hmm. hangs together, Patsy, but you... Oh, someone's coming. Wait, Patsy, can I just be in a hurry? Nick Evans. Quiet. Well, Evans? Look. Just keeping the home fires burning? Mr. Cutter. Drop that poker, Evans. But, Mr. Cutter... Drop I... it, I said. All right. Have a... Oh, Blooded fiendish killers. I got you dead in the right, Sevens. Now you're going to tell us where you've hidden those books. Uh, no, no, I have... Here where you are. I've got a gun. So have I. Mr. Reed. I've got the drop on you, Carter. Let go of your pistol. Very well. Now, uh, kick it over here. Uh, good. I congratulate you, Carter. You're cleverer than I thought. Hmm. But from now on, things will go my way. And what way is that? I'll turn Miss Bowen over to my associates, whom you haven't met. They'll take excellent care of her. And then tomorrow, you and I will visit the police and the insurance company. And if you don't testify as I wish, Miss Bowen will... Oh, Nick. You see, I don't want the books back. I want the insurance. It's a great deal more than the present market value of those books. And you're too clever. You really might find those books. You're darned right he would. Nick Carter can find... Look, on the wall behind you. The shadow of a bearded man. Shakespeare's ghost. Yeah, what? Why, why, why? Look, Patsy. Right. Oh. Oh. Now, Mr. Reed, I have the drop on you. Well, You smart boys are always fooled by the simplest tricks. The furnace door was open. And by manipulating my fingers behind my back, I cast a shadow of a bearded man on that wall behind you. Oh, thank you, Nick. I wouldn't have liked to meet Shakespeare's ghost. I... I think I'm much more attractive with my head on. Now, Reed, I'm sure you won't be too reluctant about naming your accomplice because you won't want to go to jail for both of you. Then we'll turn over to the police two of the most cold-blooded thieves I've ever met. Thieves? You mean murderers. No, Patsy, they aren't guilty of that. They couldn't have murdered Rodney Stone because Rodney Stone never lived. In just a moment, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's adventure and tell you how he followed the mysterious trail of Shakespeare's ghost. Fingerprints and dust smudges can spoil the appearance of the finest furniture, as every housewife knows. Help your fine furniture to look its best always with Linex Cream Polish, the polish which dries hard with no oily surface film to attract those ugly smudges and finger marks. You'll find Linex Cream Polish... All the great Linux home brighteners at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that has brought sparkling new beauty to 20 million rooms in American homes. Chemtone covers in one coat, dries in one hour. (laughs) 
And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. You see, Patchy, there never was such a man as Rodney Stone. It was all a scheme that Reed and his accomplice cooked up to collect the insurance on those books. You see, Reed's file card told me he'd been a volunteer worker at the county hospital. That's what excited me. Because that meant he had access to the hospital morgue and the blood bank. You mean they... they stole a corpse? Right. Some poor, nameless pauper, probably. Oh. And they also took a couple of pints of blood from the blood bank. <laughs> His accomplice took the body and the blood to the hotel in a trunk, hired two suites, and set the scene we saw in one of them. Meanwhile, Reed had sent his cable to London, knowing full answer, full well the answer he'd get. Well, why did he want you in on it? He needed a reputable witness to the murder and the theft. And then as soon as I had seen it, they had to get rid of the body at once to avoid a checkup. Oh, but how did the body disappear? Well, the accomplice was hiding in a closet. When Reed called us into the bedroom to see the sword he'd planted there, his pal slipped out and took the body into the suite next door. Oh. He put it in a trunk, and as soon as we left, brought it back to Reed's house so Reed could burn it up. I thought Evans was the guilty one. No, Patsy, I was convinced Reed was lying when he met us at the station. He said he'd started only ten minutes before, yet his car was wet. I remember the sudden summer shower. Right, the rain had stopped 15 minutes before, which meant that Reed himself had delayed along the road in the shower so that cremation would be over before we got back to the house. Yeah, but, but Nick, when we were in the cellar, it was Evans who came down to see if the body were consumed. Patsy, Evans told me that he knew nothing of the swindled Reed had planned until he accidentally found him putting the body in the furnace. And then, having been with Reed's family for years, he loyally did what he could to help him out. Oh. Nick, why didn't you try to trace the body when it disappeared? Because I had a strong hunch that there was something phony about the murder. And I felt sure I could catch the crooks another way. <laughs> Looked awfully real to me with all that blood around. That was one reason why I suspected his genuineness. If the man had been killed as we were led to believe he had, he would have dropped on the spot. And there'd have been no blood in the far corners of the room. Oh, Patsy, there was too much blood in too many places. Why, of course. What's more, the body was too dramatically arranged. Murdered people usually sprawl in almost ludicrous and unbelievable positions. But the clincher, Patsy, was the corpse's elbow. Uh, oh. oh, Nick. What could you tell from an elbow? Patsy, you recall that the blood analysis showed the blood was at least six hours old? Uh-huh. Well, when a body lies as long as six hours in one position, immediately after death, gravity causes the blood to settle into the parts of the body touching what it, whatever it's resting upon. As a result, the skin becomes purplish at that point. Well, the corpse's bare elbow was touching the floor, yet there was no sign of any purple color, which meant something was not as it should be. Well, well. Work for Nick Carter and learn why you earn, I always say. And so do I. What's next week's adventure going to be, Nick? Well, Ken, next week I have a rather unusual story for you. A man came to my office and told me he had just killed a man. Well, that's odd. I suppose he came to give himself up. Oh, no. He came to ask Nick to find the body of the man he just killed. Well, we found it all right. But it took a black mirror and a pinched bar to find the killer. Well, I thought you said he confessed. He did. And that's what makes the story. I give up. What do you call the story? I call it The Case of the Wandering Corpse. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Charlotte Manson as Patsy. Script is by Stanley Kaufman. Original music is played by George Wright. The programs are fictional, and any resemblance therein to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss, Linux Cream Polish, and Linex self-polishing wax. Now the makers of the great Linex home brighteners take this opportunity to send you their most cordial good wishes for a bright new year filled with contentment, prosperity, and the realization of every personal ambition. May 1946 be the best year you've ever known. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linex dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Nick Carter, Master Detective.
This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, Nick search for the murderer who placed Adolf Hitler's brand on the jaw of a dead man. The body in the ice. There are many strange customs throughout the world, but perhaps the strangest is that of the Arctic Club. You've seen the Arctic Club in action in movies, newspapers, and magazines. In the dead of winter, the members don bathing suits and go for a swim. This morning, with the mercury hovering around ten above zero... A shivering group of newspaper men gathers on the snow-crusted beach to report the strange activities of the Arctic Club. Okay, okay, just a few more minutes, folks. I'll look around some more pictures. Oh, here. Hey, will a couple of you club members grab up some of that snow and make like they're having a snowball? Are you? Hey, Joe, get a shot at that. You know what, Chris? You make snowballs? Yes, just throw the snow, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Glenn. Run it over, Glenn. Who is who in? Yeah, just throw the snow, Mr. Glenn. Come on, smile like they're enjoying it. We are enjoying it. This is the healthiest sport in the world. If more people... Oh, right. Okay, Squire. Uh, you want the guys for this set? Have the one in the red suit to face the camera. Uh, Mr. Uh, 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 face the camera, Mr. Okay. Uh, I look, I'm going to say something about the club. Hold the mic close up to him, Summer, will you? Okay. Yeah, give it over, Joe. You've got fur clothes on, let's give it a cut. Okay. Uh, just talk into this microphone, Mr. Bigley. Well, no, Bigley. With two ends. Hi, everybody. Go ahead, Mr. Bigley. Okay. Well, my friends and me started the Arctic Club in 1910. Now, the 50th of every month, we have a shame, we meet and take a dip in the health-given waters of the ocean. Uh, it's easy in the summertime, but in the winter, like now, when it's below freezing, we can take plenty of intentional fortitude. A daily swim in the winter is the best way to fight off cold, flu, grip, pneumonia, and... <laughs> All right, all right, I got something. Let's get the swimming job started. Mr. Uh, Bigley. Yes, I know. With two ends. Yes. Well, if your club is ready for the dip, we can get started now. Okay. Come on, boys. Last one in the run, Nate. Right, Minnie. you look at them idiots heading for the water? I'll have to break through the ice before they can get in. Are you going to shout at that old goat looking at the thermometer? Yeah. Hey, Joe. Joe. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to have them guys run into the water all over again. The camera wasn't ready. Okay, okay. Hey, don't call them back yet. They got to break through that ice first anyway. When they get it clear, we'll get it. Holy shit, what's happening now? I don't know. They're going to see. Come on. Because you don't think one of them's strong. Trap them around in the ice. Oh, I don't know. I was just hoping for a story. Hey, hey, you were in water. You better put it in the car with the car. And hurry it up. Hey, what's the matter? We just found something in the ice. We found something in the ice. Yeah, yeah, look. Holy jumping. Would you look at that? Hey, just sorry, Joe. Frozen solid in that thick hunk of ice. It's a big body. <laughs> Carter's office has to go in speaking. Oh, where are you, Waldo? You were supposed to report early this morning. Let me talk to you, Nick. Well, just a minute. It's Waldo, Miss. He wants to talk to you. All right. Yes, Waldo? Nick, boy, you got to get out here right away. Come on, where? It's in the Turkish Beach. Why? Right. It's a clear of my character. Not that I'm here to declare that after 30 years of honorable death. <laughs> Now let's get this straight, Waldo. Well, who's throwing mud on your character? Sergeant Matheson. Matty? Yeah, and he... Waldo, are you mixed up a homicide? It's all circumstantial. It's all circumstantial. We were going in for a morning swim. When? This weather? Sure, it was an Arctic club. Oh, yeah. And when we cleared away the ice, we found a car with some victims in the ice. A body in the ice? Yeah, that's right. And when Matty got here, he accused me of gladness here for publicity. Because you know how I'm better than the Arctic club. All right, the owner says. Sit tight and wait. That's the I'll drive right over. It sounds like a practical joke to you. Me too. One of the reasons why I came out. And that he's accusing Waldo of landing a body. It doesn't make sense. Another reason for it, Mr. 
Look at all those men in bathing suits. Oh, that's all. Don't come back. Hey, close that door. You want to give us all the warning? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I know we've got to turn around. You're not... Nick, boy, you, you, you don't know how glad I am to see you. Hello, Waldo. Hello, Eddie. Hello, Nick. Hiya, Patsy. Hello. Hey, what's all this about Waldo finding a corpse? You're not serious about using Waldo's guy. Uh, it's ridiculous. It's a demonstration of Waldo's stupidity of the mind and heart. I'm being framed to solve a case which, if I were not a guy, I couldn't solve. Well, that's what I'm going to do. 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 You're in the clear. Yeah, you're in the clear, Buffalo Bill. Why? You, you think I'd keep you hanging around here making phone calls if I really thought you were mixed up in this? Huh? I just wanted to get Nick out here. Why, you talking? I don't about... mind, never mind. I was afraid of that. Why, Sergeant? That's practically blackmail. Look, Patsy, I'd blackmail my old grandmother to get Nick out of this case. It's a stinker. Come on out to the beach and take a look at the body. Nick? Are we going to let Maddie push us into the cave? Oh, now, Pat, please. Well, Maddie, since we're out here, might as well take a look. We'll be on our credit list the next time we have a run-in with Maddie's red tape. <laughs> This is it, Nick. We just hauled it a little way up onto the beach. That's at the body right now. Frozen solid in a chunk of ground ice. What kind of ice? Ground ice. Also known as anchor ice. You can tell because it's granular of course. Oh. See, in especially cold weather, ice sometimes forms in the bottom of the sea. Become thick enough to float large objects to the surface. For instance, sometimes ships that have an anchor that have their anchors float to the surface and have drifted for miles. Y- y- you mean that's what happened to this guy? I do. His body was lying on the ocean bottom. Held down by that weight around his waist. What's Nick? That means he was murdered. Yes, of course it does. Finally was on the bottom, ground ice formed, and finally buoyed him up. What do you know? Now let's have that big case, Matty. Yes. We'll crack all the ice we can off the body, melt the rest off, so we can just see what happens. All right, here, here. Nick. Thanks. It'll be a long job, but it's going to be done. <laughs> Clear enough now what happened. Yeah, I'll say. Hey, would you look at the right side of that guy's head? It's smashed in. Yeah. Death must have been instantaneous. <laughs> Entire temporal lobe smashed. <laughs> Y'all broken too. Yeah, it must have been quite a fight. I don't know like that. Now, what's this? What is it? Bruise in the side of his chin. Oh, naturally, he must have been slugged there if his jaw was broken. And to take a close look at that bruise. Huh? Yeah, it's a swastika. That's what it is. Why? Having to the impression of a ring. Matty, would you tell me who wears a Nazi ring in this country? Uh, well, well, may, uh, maybe an ex-soldier, uh, uh, civilian. Yeah, possibly. That's right. Just touching it. Oh, yes. Doesn't seem to be any identification on him. Now, what? Here's something caught in his coat sleeve. Huh? A piece of rotten wood with a nail in it. Probably came off the ocean bottom with him. Looks like the flat of a lobster pot to me. Ah, this is luck. Hmm? Hey, there's letters on it. Yeah, it's burned down pretty crudely. I think the fisherman is marking his lobster pot. Let's see. That's an E. E. That's an L. L, Z. Last two letters of the name. Then, Z, E, L. Hmm. Z, Z. Yeah, Z. R. Uh, yeah, they got the rest. No. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Belgrade, small town about 30 miles up the coast. You mean this cross trip is 30 miles? I do. All right, Matty. There are your facts. An unidentified man was killed in the fight by someone wearing a Nazi ring. He waded down and dumped into the sea near Belgrade. Ground ice floated him up and down here. Now, your case? Come on, Patsy. Yeah. Oh, now, look, Nick, you're, you're not walking out on me. Uh, leave me with this mess. I certainly am. But, but it's murder, Nick. You can't just go home and forget Who said anything about going home? Patsy and I are going up to Belgrade to find out who wears Nazi rings. <laughs> In the flesh, monsieur. I'm Nick Carter. This is Miss Patsy Bowen, my secretary. Carter? I don't know as how I recollect the name. We've never met. I'm a detective. I'd like to ask you some questions. About what? I think someone may be missing from Belgrade, and I think I've found him. I'm listening. Short man, blonde. Weighed about 130. Blue eyes, ankle and nose, large ears, heavy lips. You found him? Charlie Howell. Already. And the police, more dead. Dead, eh? Murder. 
murdered, eh? <laughs> Too bad. I wondered what happened to him. Who was he, Mr. Glenn? The assistant in my store, at Glennon's grocery store. You can't support yourself on a sheriff's pay in Belgrade. How long has Howell been missing, Mr. Glenn? About two weeks. I thought he was out on a binge. I sent him out Friday night to make deliveries in the truck. He never showed up Saturday. Did the truck? Yeah. I guess he brought it back to the garage before he went, well, wherever he went. Did it ever occur to you that the killer might have brought it back? No. It never occurred to me Charlie was killed. He's been on fast before. Anyone complain about non delivery of groceries that day? No. Hmm. Well, there's a chance Howell was killed after he finished work. There's an equal chance he was killed on the job. I have a list of Howell's delivery schedule for that Friday. Don't see why you should. But, Mr. Glennon, this is a murder case. Sure you want to now, have... Now, look here, ma'am, and you too, Mr. Parker. My I... name is Carter, Nick Carter. Carter. Well, as far as I'm... Say, would you be any relation to old Sim Carter who broke the New England bank case? He was my father. Your father, eh? Well, but why didn't you say so before? Oh, I'm glad to meet you, Carter. Shake. <laughs> Your father was a great detective. You want Charlie's delivery schedule? Well, you get it. You get anything we got in this town. Oh. Well, thanks. For a while, I thought all I was going to get was a cold shoulder. It's getting dark, Nick. Yeah? I think it's time to snow. Maybe. How many more stops do we have to make? Oh, the schedule for 11 deliveries last Friday. We've covered nine. Well, what's left? I went by the name of Kane and that shooting club. Oh, you think Belgrade would have a shooting club? But the tiny little town doesn't look like a resort. I should have said X shooting club. Our business is X, just hanging out. Oh. Glennon said he very rarely sent anything out there. You think Howell might have been killed at one of these last two places? I don't know. We found out he made the other two, the other nine deliveries in prison. Made the last two out of blind alley. Someone might be lying. And the question is who? Mm. We don't know what route Howell took. Killer was mine, I've been the last. That name Kane sounds suspicious. Wasn't Kane the original murderer? Uh, pretty far fetched reason, Kathy. Wait a minute, Leslie. We're going into a crash. <laughs> Please, gentlemen, 
If this is a joke, we're not having any. Will you please answer? Will you at least indicate that you're alive? Will you say something? Anything? Oh, madam, don't shout. Oh, you are the boys in the silence. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you come in. I was in the rear of the club. But my name is Adam, Secretary of the Organization. You're the famous Nick Carter, aren't you? Yes, from my two pictures. And this lady, that's wrong, my secretary. What kind of a club is this, Mr. Adams? Why does everyone ignore us? It's something of a paradox, Mr. Thorne. It's a new idea, recently formulated. This is a club for anti-social men. Anti-social? Huh? It's wrong, a club, precisely. All our members are men who desire the sporting advantages of the club, but hated the social drawbacks. They formed this organization for that purpose. There's a strict club rule against all conversation, laughter, entertainment, women. Well, I object to that. And I'm sorry to say against citizens. What? I shall have to ask you to leave, Mr. Carter. But dear Adams, I came here to ask you some questions. You will make an appointment for tomorrow. I shall be happy to meet you in Desiree. You must leave now. But can you at least lend us a car? Or is it smashed? Sorry. There is a telephone for help? There is no telephone. This way out, Mr. Carter. What a mean thing. I'm sure you understand my decision. Good night, Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen. This doesn't mean anything I've ever heard of. Oh. What do we do now? Walk. Walk. We have to dance. No, we won't. Look up there. Up where? At the corner of the clubhouse. Hey, are those telephone wires? They are. And Hunch Adam was lying about the phone. I know he was lying about the rest. Quick now. Better up around the back of the house. Oh, Nick, what are you talking about? Harold's murder. He was killed here. Oh. How do you know? One of those so-called anti-social club members was wearing a swastika ring. Are you sure? There's a man in the shooting jacket who passed that. Ah, yes. Careful now. This looks like the back door that leads into the clubhouse now. Try to keep my attention. Why that story about anti-social men? To cover the fact that the man we saw can't speak English. Marshal. Yes. The back door. Hold the door. Uh-huh. Why? Yes. Why can't they speak English? Because they're Nazis. Probably escaped D.W. threatened to the war. I congratulate you, Mr. Carter. Take that, Adam. Don't go. Please raise your hands. I assume you're on, Mr. Carter. If you reach the gun, I shall shoot the girl. Our hands are up, Adam. Take that flashlight out of our eyes. Your so deductions were correct. I had very little hope that my hastily concocted story would fool you. That's why I waited here for your second visit. Thanks for the hospitality. I had hoped you would be killed in the crash when I shut out your tires. It's unfortunate you are not. I don't think so. But I do, Miss Bowen. You see, I'm afraid I shall have to kill both of you all over again. <laughs> it's getting right out, Nick. What time is it? Six o'clock. We've been locked up here all night. The idea. Adam said he was going to kill us, didn't he? Yes. So why wait? What is this? For fine Nazi torture? I don't know. Oh, Nick. Isn't there some way out of this mess? Probably. Just got to find it. Close the door. I think there's a dead thing. Please remain seated. Many years of experience has taught me how to carry a loaded tray in one hand. So convenient when one would carry a loaded gun in the other. There we are. Breakfast. Thanks. We're not hungry. I assure you, the food is not poison. Look here, Adams. What's the game you're playing? You must threatening murder. Why delay? We're in an extraordinary position, Mr. Carter. As you've already guessed, this is a depot for escape prisoners of war. Go on. An intense debate is in progress downstairs. The city is invited. One school of thought advocates your death immediately. Yes. A spirited opposition wishes to use you as hostages to ensure safe transport back to the mother country. You haven't made up your minds yet? Not yet. I'm going down now. I shall presently return with a final verdict. In the meantime, I would suggest you have breakfast. Thanks. There's only one thing wrong with this meal, Adams. No cigarettes. <laughs> Very well. You may have my back. Yes. Thank you. Uh, be sure to save the last two for the execution. <laughs> Right, if you say so, I'll try. 
sorry you won't borrow a car to get home, Mr. Carter. It don't seem right letting old Sim Carter's son take the train. Well, that's quite all right, Leno. Thanks, anyway, for the offer. Mighty nice of you giving me all the credit for grabbing that gang of PWs. Oh, you deserve it. And you've got your whole case cold. Charlie Howell evidently heard some of the Nazi gab when he was making his last delivery to the club. Got suspicious and smooth before he drove away. Then was discovered, put up a fight, and was killed. Adams dumped his body in Belgrade Bay when he drove the truck back to the garage. But what about Adams shooting at our contact? How do you know we were coming? Well, Betsy Adams must have been in Mr. Glennon's grocery store when we were going over Howell's delivery schedule. Uh-huh. Realized we were on the trail and tried to stop us. Well, he sure didn't, Mr. Carter. And you sure put the sheriff of Belgrade on the map. Well, as far as that goes, Patsy and I might have been off the map permanently. You hadn't answered my SOS the instant the phone company reported it. Well, what happened back at the country club? How did you leave Adams? Oh, that. Why, Patsy was the one who put Adams out of the way. By smoking 11 cigarettes in half an hour. <laughs> oh, well, that don't make sense, Nick. Well, it was an old trick my father taught me. I took the ashes from the cigarettes Patsy smoked and packed them into an empty paper cigarette tube. And then when I pretended to start smoking my last execution cigarette, I simply blew the ashes directly into Adam's eyes. That blinded him so I could take his gun away and knock him out. So that was it. What a boss to work for, Sheriff Glennon. A trick in every pocket and a hundred up his sleeve. Mr. Carter, I got an apology to make to you. I once said you were the son of a famous Sim Carter. Well, I take it back. Jim Carter's the father of the famous Nick Carter. Well, Nick, how about a little preview of next week's story? This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting adventure, the life and death search for a man who didn't see a murder that was not yet discovered. The witness saw nothing. Jefferson Heights is a suburb of the city that's still half country. Only a few houses are sprinkled over the winding roads, and Lundy Lane is the lonesomest of all. There is a small white cottage at the end of Lundy Lane, and in it, Mrs. Peter Grogan, a small white-haired lady, is entertaining her first visitor in many days. Another cup of tea, Mrs. Dennis? No, no, I thank you kindly, Mrs. Grogan. Another crumpet, maybe? Oh, no, thank you. I've had five already. You've had six, Mrs. Dennis? What? Ah, but then who counts? Oh. Mrs. Dennis, would you believe you're the first visitor I've had in two weeks and three days? Oh. Ah, but not the last, Mrs. Dennis. Oh, no, indeed. This house will be that full of visitors before another week's out. Why, whatever do you mean, Mrs. Grogan? Why, all me old friends will be suddenly remembering me, the same way you did, Mrs. Dennis. Hmm. Ah, sure. Time was when the trip out to Lundy Lane was too much trouble. It isn't now, eh, Mrs. Dennis? I don't know to what you're referring, Mrs. Grogan. Oh, why, to the story in the newspaper yesterday about me. They called me Lady Miser of Lundy Lane, all about how I don't trust that. And how I have $50,000 hidden in pots and pans and other similar places around the house. If you think for one moment I believe that story, Mrs. Grogan. <laughs> them that reads it will. Ah, uh, just like you, Mrs. Dennis. Then I'll be visiting me now. Why, Mrs. Grogan, I never so much as thought of your money And when there I ain't came. a word of it true, Mrs. Dennis. I made it all up. What? It was only a trick of mine to relieve the looseness. Ah, sure, I got that tired of looking at the four walls with never a new face. Ah. Now there'll be plenty of faces coming to visit old Mrs. Grogan, the lazy miser of Lundy Lane. <laughs> well, I never. I'm kicking myself out of this house of Now, Mrs. Dennis, oh, sure you do not begrudge your old Leading friend. your friends to believe you were rich and all the time it's a lie. You'll not be seeing me again, Mrs. Grogan, I assure oh, you. Yes. And them that do visit will be nothing better than low fortune hunters. <laughs> I wish you well of them, Mrs. Grogan. Goodbye. <laughs> Now, I wonder how many others saw the story in the paper. Ah, they'll all be coming sooner or later. Now, don't 
Don't act nervous, Wilson. Just make like we're a couple of businessmen with a little proposition. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay, okay, okay. Ring the bell. Afternoon, ma'am. Could we speak to Mrs. Grogan? Ah, uh, you've got your wish, young man. Mrs. Grogan, me and my friend got a little business proposition we want to talk over with you. Could we come in? Yes, yes, sir. Is are always welcome, young man. Sure. Come in. Come in. Yes. Now, maybe you'll be having a cup of tea while we talk business, eh? No doubt it's regarding the money of mine you read about in the newspaper. Yes, please. ma'am. It's about the dough. But we can't stay for tea. <laughs> Quick, Wilson. <laughs> Nice work, Wilson. You got that wire in your pocket? Yeah. Get her tied up. Stick a gag in her mouth. I'll start looking for the dough. Shouldn't take us more than ten minutes to locate it and get out of here. Ten minutes, he said. Ten minutes. Cash, we've been looking through this place for half an hour. I know. The dough ain't here. It's got to be here. You heard her talking about it when we came in. Well, if it's here, we can't find it. This is no good cash. We're wasting our time. Come on back to the living room. Look, we already been through it four times. I know. This time, we're going to ask Mrs. Grogan to find the dough for us. She ought to come, too, by now. Yeah, her eyes are open. Give me a sap. Yeah, here. Listen, Mrs. Grogan. My friend's going to take the gag out of your mouth. You see this sap in my hand? a leather bag full of steel shot. You try to yell, you get slugged in the head with it. Got that? Take the gag out, Wilson. Okay. Uh, what do you want? Why did we you... We want the dough, Mrs. Brogan. The 50 grand you got stashed away in this house. Where is it? Uh, there isn't any money. Ah, don't give me that. I've been lied to by experts. Where's the dough? Where you got it hid? But I, I tell you, I haven't any money. It, that's all a mistake. It's you. Uh, you're crazy. There isn't any money. There never was any $50,000 fast. It's just a new story. It's all a joke. Hey, there's somebody at the door. Uh, you biddy, I'll shut you up. Yeah, that'll keep you quiet for now. Gee, Cash, you stubbed it too hard. I think you killed her. Yeah, she's dead, ain't she? Well, she must have been pretty feeble at that little tap I gave her, croaked her. There's the doorbell again. What do we do? Keep quiet. Whoever it is will go away. Yeah, but maybe whoever's at the door heard her yelling. Look, I don't want to get caught in here with that call. Shut your mouth and keep quiet. Hello? Mrs. Grogan? Are you home? I see the door's open. Ah, you didn't shut the door, you dope. What do we do, Cash? That guy might come in here. Hello? Anyone home? I'll take care of this. Stay back here, Wilson. I'm coming. Who is it? Hey, Jack Blackham, Mr. Salesman. Are you right with you? Ah, good afternoon, Mr. Gogan, I presume. Uh, the lady of the house, then? Uh, no, I'm sorry, mister. Well, I'm Albert Higgins, salesman for the Ajax vacuum cleaner. Oh, here's my card, Mr. Gogan. Mm-hmm. We're conducting a door-to-door demonstration campaign to acquaint the public with our sensational new post-war vacuum cleaner. Now, get hey, me to come in. Excuse me, I'm... Mr. Higgins, I'm just a little busy right now. I wonder if you'd come back tomorrow at the same time. My wife will be glad to see your machine. Why, certainly, Mr. Gogan. Tomorrow at, uh, say, four o'clock? Uh-huh. Five. Give it up. Yeah. But he saw you, Cash. He he got a good look at your face. Yeah, I never thought of that. Okay, Wilson, after we finish locating the dough in this house, we'll spend tomorrow locating Mr. Albert Higgins. He ain't gonna sell many more vacuum cleaners. removed from the wound was a 255 .45 automatic slug of the type known as... All right, get back in here, folks. Oh, it's all right. There's, there's nothing to be afraid of. Oh, no. Oh, hello, Nick. Hello, Patty. Uh, I, I want you to meet Mr. Albert Higgins and his sister Barbara. Nick, this here's a serious problem you've got to apply your brains to. But, Walter, we've got so much work to finish. All right, just a couple of minutes, Nick, you please. All right, all right. Place it down, Miss Higgins. You too, Mr. Higgins. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Now, what's the problem? Albert's haunted. What? He is, Mr. Carter. Now, look, Barbara, this is ridiculous. He, he's haunted, Nick. Haunted by death. I heard him arguing about it out in the street, and I brought him in. Mr. Carter, I, I think my sister's crazy. I don't want to bother you with... All right, now, wait a minute. 
Let's start at the beginning. Albert was almost killed three times today. But, Barbara, they were natural accidents. They could happen to anyone. Who would you tell me the whole story, Mr. Higgins? Well, Mr. Carter, I... I was nearly killed three times today. Once in the morning, I was jostled on the subway platform and almost thrown in front of the train. A second time, as I left my office at noon, I was standing at the curb waiting for the light to change. Somebody bumped into me and almost knocked me in front of a passing coal truck. And the third time after lunch, when I was crossing the street, I was almost run over by a cab, that's all. And I say that three accidents like that are impossible in one day, Mr. Carter. Why should anyone want to kill you? There isn't any reason for anyone to murder me. I haven't got any enemies. I, I lead a calm, peaceful life selling vacuum cleaners. It, it's just that Barbara's got too much imagination, she may be. Did you notice anything funny about those accidents? No, not a thing. The subway platform was crowded. It could happen to anyone. The cab driver was just as scared as I was. Did he stop? No, he just kept on driving. Get a look at him? He was just an ordinary hacky. Gray hat, gray coat, gray cap. No, gray hat, a felt hat. Hmm. Very interesting. Oh, Mr. Carter, now that we've bothered you enough for the day, I'll be going. I've got an appointment at 4 o'clock. Higgins, what? so happens your sister was right. These weren't accidents. They were attempted murders. What? But why, for Pete's sake, why? I don't know. Maybe you've got enemies you don't know about. Or maybe you saw something you shouldn't have seen. Maybe you heard something. Where were you yesterday? I was making the rounds up in Jefferson Heights. I, I sell vacuum cleaners. Nick Albert, he saw something in Jefferson Heights. Oh, the only thing I saw was custom. All right, we won't argue about that now. Higgins, I want you to go home. Your sister will go with you. So will Waldo. Waldo, you're the bodyguard. Nick, why do I always get the dull jobs? You brought this case in, you work on it. Guard Higgins. But, Mr. Carter... Higgins, you must know something that someone doesn't want you to tell. That something may cost you your life unless I can prevent it. So go home and try to remember what it is. I'm going down to headquarters to see if I can find anything that might help your memory. Hello, Matty. Oh, hi, Nick. What's up? Tell me, Matty, what's the news from Jefferson Heights? Uh, why are you interested in Jefferson Heights? Read off the crime sheet first, then I'll explain. Okay. You want yesterday's report, sir? Yes. Now, let me see. Inwood... Washington Heights, Harlem, Astoria. They've yeah, been pretty quiet all around. Nope, nothing for Jefferson Heights. Nothing, huh? No. Hmm, that makes it tough. What makes what tough? Matty, I'm involved in a peculiar case. A young man named Albert Higgins was up in Jefferson Heights yesterday. He must have seen or heard something he wasn't supposed to. Someone's trying to kill him. Yeah? Who? I don't know. It's kind of a reverse murder, Matty. I know the intended victim in advance, but I don't know the killer or the motivation. Hope maybe I could get a lead through the crime sheet. No crime in Jefferson. No crime reported from Jefferson. Ah, oh, beat it, Nick. If you think that I... Oh. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Hello, Sergeant. Is Nick there? Yeah, just a minute. It's for you, Nick. Buffalo Bill on the phone. Thanks. Yes, Waldo? Nick, Nick you got to come over to Higgins' place right away. Why? Albert Higgins is gone. He, he's disappeared. <laughs> I tell you, it, it happened like a thunderbolt. Like, like, oh, I don't know how it happened. All right, all right. Take it easy. Now let's have the story. We took a cab home, Mr. Carter. Albert was pretty angry, but Mr. McGlynn here insisted he follow your orders. That I did, Nick Boy. And when we got out of the taxi and started up to the apartment, Albert said he wanted to get some cigarettes. So you let him go alone, huh? Well, he was just in the corner, Nick. Now I thought... Yes, he... yes, I know. You and Miss Higgins started up the stairs to this apartment. You didn't realize anything was wrong until you got up here. Albert wasn't following, so you ran back to the corner store, right? Right, Nick, and he was gone. Did you ask the store man what happened to him? There wasn't a soul in the store. No one in the store. Let me have that phone. Here you are. Waldo, you've been pretty stupid. Today. But, Nick, I... How many stores have you ever seen with no one in them in the middle of the day? Nick Carter's office. Patsy, Nick. Get this and get it fast. Uh-huh. Call the Ajax Vacuum Cleaner Company. Tell them you must have a record of the calls Albert Higgins made yesterday. He was a door-to-door salesman. He must have filed a list of those calls this morning. Right. I'll call you back in ten minutes. Now, let's get moving, Waldo. We're going down to that store. But, but you need to realize Higgins has probably been hijacked by the men who've been trying to kill him. If we want to keep him alive, we've got to do it in minutes. <laughs> Yeah. 
You see, Nick, this place is empty. Never thought to look in the back of the store, huh? I did, so help me. There's not a soul there. All right, I'll take your word for it. How about behind the soda fountain? Behind? Yes, behind. Take a look. Nick! There's a body here. Yes, not cold. See the bruise behind his ear? Nothing worse. Help him up. Now listen to me, please. I'm Nick Carter. I can't take the time to be gentle with you because a man's life may depend on minutes. What? A man was kidnapped from this store by someone who came in and slugged you. Did you see who it was? No. My back was turned. I saw him. That's too bad. Wait a minute. Look here at the floor, Walter. Hey, you mean them BBs? They're not BBs. They're chill steel shot. Dollars to a penny, the killers bought the shot and fixed up a homemade blackjack and used that to knock this man cold. See, that's right, Nicky. It must have broken off. Walter, pick up some of that shot. Yeah. Go down to the wholesale munitions district on Fulton Street. Take that shot to every manufacturer. Find out who made it and to what retail stores it was sold. Nick, you're turning me into an errand boy. Me, a fine surgical instrument. Walter, we're fighting for a man's life with no ammunition for our guns. We don't know who wants to kill him or why. The smallest clue may turn the balance. I'll get moving. All right, Nick. I'll see you later. Oh, oh, my head. Now, look, my friend. You want to make a phone call, and I'll have to leave you. But I'll send a policeman in to you on my way out. Thanks. Nick Carter's office. Patsy? Nick, what about that report? Oh, Higgins made 11 calls yesterday in the Gibson Heights suburbs. Read them off backwards. Last call's first. Uh, Mrs. John A. Gerst of Alton Road. Demonstrated vacuum cleaner from 4.30 to 5 p.m. Right. Next. This is Peter Brogan, Lundy Lane. Not at home. Her husband made appointment for her for following day at 4. That must have been the date he wanted to keep today. Next. Mrs. Allen B. Oh, wait, wait, hold it, hold it. Huh? Well, was that Mrs. Peter Grogan? Yes. thought the name was familiar. That's the old lady who was written up in the paper two days ago. That's right, Nick. The lady miser of Lundy Lane. You say her husband talked to Higgins? Well, that's what the report says. There's something fishy right there, Patsy. I'm going up to Mrs. Grogan's house. Stand by for a report from Waldo. Well, what's fishy, Nick? Mrs. Grogan is a widow. There isn't any husband. <laughs> Papers still on the front step. No sense ringing the bell. Better not waste any time getting inside. So. Homicide. Sergeant Matterson. Matty, this is Nick. Yeah? You better hustle up to Lundy Lane in Jefferson Heights, home of Mrs. Peter Grogan. What for? I found that unreported Jefferson Heights crime. It's murder. Nick, I swear I'll never doubt your word again, even if you tell me I'm a murderer. This is fantastic. One of the nastiest, roughness murders I've seen in a long time. Yeah, some cheap ginsel must have read about Mrs. Grogan's doll and tried to grab it. Then slugged her to death in the process. Well, look, Nick, uh, where does Higgins come into the picture? Mary, I figure it this way. Higgins came to the house while the killer was here. Yeah? In some way or other, he got in. I get it. The killer thought fast and played he was Mr. Grogan. Gave Higgins the brush off. Right. And then the killer was afraid Higgins might be able to identify him, so he tried to murder him. Yeah, probably has by this time. No, Matty, I don't think so. No, why not? Because if he'd wanted to kill Higgins, he wouldn't have kidnapped him. Why the kidnapping? The killer was probably following him all day. So he must have seen Waldo bring him to my office. I get it, Nick. The killer wants to know how much you know. He's got Higgins someplace, and he's trying to sweat it out of him. And sooner or later, the killer's going to get tired of asking questions that Higgins don't know how to answer. So he'll knock him off. Right. Now, do you have an idea how we can gain a little more time? What? In the meanwhile, get your department working on that wire that was used to tie up Mrs. Grogan. See if you can trace it. Right, Nick. I'll meet you down at headquarters in the stolen car department in one hour. For heaven's sake, how long are you going to keep me here like this? Until you're ready to talk, Higgins. You... Got the right to treat me like this. Keep me blindfolded, tied up, 
beating me. Now, what did you tell Carter about the murder? What murder? I tell you, I don't know anything about it. I told you not to hand me that line of guff anymore, Higgins. You know plenty. You told Carter. I want to know what you told him. Oh, I swear I never told him anything. How could I? I don't know anything. I'm getting a little tired of smacking you around, Higgins. You better spill it. What'd you tell Carter? Ah, so now you're playing dumb, huh? Okay, Higgins. I guess maybe I'm finished asking questions. Maybe I better fix it so you can play dumb forever. Ah, is that you, Wilson? Yes, yes. Come on out of here, quick. Okay. Well, what's the matter with you? Yeah, take a candle at these headlines tonight. Huh? Lady Miser of Lundy Lane murdered. Albert Higgins, key witness to murder, disappears. Yeah, and he's going to disappear for good. I made up my mind. We bump him, Wilson. We don't take chances. No, no, you, you, you don't understand, Cash. Read the rest. In an interview today, Nick Carter revealed that Albert Higgins had identified the murderer as George Spelvin, small-time crook and racketeer. A police dragnet has been set for Spelvin and also for his accuser. Ah, so that's what he told Carter. You see? We're in the clear, Cash. They can't put their finger on us. They're looking for this Spelvin character. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you're right, Wilson. Uh, maybe we'd better not knock off Higgins' cash. Maybe if we bump him, we'll be killing our alibi. Let's just sit tight and see what happens. <laughs> How'd your department do that wire trace, Matty? Well, not so good, not so bad. Here's a list of 21 retailers that sell the kind of wire used on Mrs. Grogan. Thanks. Waldo? Uh, finish the trace on the steel shot. Patsy's got it. Right here, Nick. 17 stores sell that type of shot. Thanks. And I've got the list of the 14 cars reported stolen for today. What stolen cars got to do with Higgins? It was almost killed by a taxi, Matty. And I know that taxi was stolen by the killer that was after it. Oh. Well, I'm going to read this list of stolen cars out loud. If I mention any neighborhood... It's on any of the other lists. Let me hear it. You ready? Right. Yeah, go ahead. Checker cab, stolen from corner of 70th and Broadway. Uh-uh. Packard cab, stolen from Bayon Park District. Bayon. Uh-uh. Checker cab, stolen from Nelson Square District. Nelson Square? I've got a Nelson Square here, Nick. Yeah, i got one, Nick, right here. Galvanized iron wire. Two reels sold to Hanley's hardware store, Nelson Square. Ten pounds of number seven chill steel shot. So to Adam Sporting goes Nelson Square. Hmm. Cab stolen from Nelson Square. Shot bought at Nelson Square. Wire that bound Mrs. Grogan from Nelson Square. Maddie, I think we've got our first break in this case. Gosh, Nick, you're right. Now, the connections are too obvious to miss. Killers evidently using Nelson Square as a base of operations. Let's get up there fast. I think that's where we'll find Albert Higgins. I want to hope we find him alive. <laughs> Nelson Square, Nick. Now one. Let's see. About 12 small apartment houses on the square. Say about 10 apartments in each. Uh, making 120. I figure the killer is hiding out in one of them and he's got Higgins there. Okay, the question is which? I don't know. We'll have to cover every one. Hope we have enough time. But look, how are you going to know it's the killer when you see him, Nick? I'm going to make him give himself away with Waldo's help. Oh, what do I do, Nick? Take this business card. It's one of Higgins. Uh huh. They're to go from door to door as Albert Higgins, vacuum cleaner salesman. Ah, I get you, Nick. When he hits the killer, the crook will be so surprised, he'll give himself away. Right. Especially in view of the fact that he's probably seen Waldo already. You ready, Wobble? Uh, I'm ready, Nick. But, but I prefer action. Now, my old 44. Forget the 44. You sell vacuum cleaners. Leave the action to us. <laughs> Good evening, sir. I'm Albert Higgins of the Ajax Vacuum Cleaner Company. He's the lady of the house in... Wait a uh, uh, 99 wrong numbers. I'm beginning to get discouraged. Good evening, madam. I'm Albert Higgins of the Ajax Vacuum Cleaner Company. My card, madam, I... Wait a minute, I'm Glory be... 
That makes a hundred dead in. And it must be crazy, but what is his order? And swings Nick. Good evening, sir. He is the lady of the house here, and Albert Higgins of the Ajax Vacuum Cleaner Company. Oh, you're saying you was? Oh, me card, sir. I'm Albert Higgins of the Ajax Vacuum Why, Cleaner Company. You're caught as like man. I've seen that mug of yours. No, really, sir. I Mr. Rod Wilson, this is a plant. Get yes. inside, you, before oh, I plant you. You're going to drop that gun? What? You're covered on both sides, mister. Reach. Fast. No tricks. Step aside, and we'll come in. I think I know the gentleman, Matty. His name's Cash Hagan. Yeah. That's Wally Wilson inside. A fine pair of thugs. You got nothing on us, Carter. This is an invasion of privacy. If you ain't got a search warrant... Did you bring a search warrant, Patsy? Uh, no, Nick. How unfortunate. And that means we'll have to find Albert Higgins here to justify this illegal entry. Where is he, Cash? Never heard of Albert Higgins. In the bedroom, Eddie? No. Nowhere in sight, Nick. Must be in the kitchen or the bath. How about it, Waldo? No, he's not here, Nick. You killers murdered Higgins. Me and Wilson never heard of this guy. He's got to be someplace in here. Hey, look, Nick. They might have bumped him off and got rid of him already. I hate to believe it, Matty. We'll never have a case against these mugs if they did. Yeah, they must have got rid of him, Nick. There's, there's nobody else here in the apartment. You're going to be stymied like this at the last minute. Nick, minutes. there's something wrong with this living room. Now, Patsy... Well, look at it. It's lopsided. There's more wall on one side of the window than on the other. And there's more floor showing on one side of the rug than on the other. Patsy, this is no time for interior decoration. Even the chandelier is off center. Patsy! Wait a minute, wait a minute, Maddie. Patsy's right. Huh? Come over to the wall, quick. Listen here, if you... Shut up! Shut up. Oh, wait a minute. This bookcase is high enough to conceal the door. Help me swing it away from the wall, Waldo. Yeah. All right. By heavens, you are right, Nick. It is a door. In a false plaster wall, making a partition just big enough to conceal a man. I'm only hoping that... I tell you, I didn't tell the child or anything. I didn't tell him anything. All right, Higgins, all right. Take it easy. You don't have to lie anymore. You told Nick Carter plenty. Enough to execute Cash Hagen and Wally Wilson for murder. There's just one thing about this case that I don't understand. What's that, Patsy? When Alba told the story about those so-called accidents, how did you know they were attempted murders? Oh, that. Well, remember Higgins said the cab driver looked like an ordinary hacky? Uh-huh, in gray hat and gray coat. When I said gray cap, Albert said, no, gray hat, a felt hat. That was the tip-off. But how? Because no genuine cab driver wears a hat. All cab drivers in this city are required by law to wear caps. So obviously the driver was a phony. Well... You certainly put the lid on those thugs with that felt hat. Mr. Carter, I take my hat off to you. Now, Nick, can you tell us something about next week's story? Well, Ken, next week I'm going to tell you about a brand new post-war racket that's robbing Americans of thousands of dollars and driving hundreds of Europeans to death. Nick found out about it when my janitor went to check a grocery order and disappeared. He was found murdered with his shoes full of rice. What's rice got to do with murder and racketeering? You'll find out when you hear the case of the wholesale killer. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, master detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Carter, that I've quite accidentally stumbled upon evidence that a horrible murder has been committed. But, Mr. Field, why come to me? That sort of thing should be reported to the police. But to what police? Where was this murder committed? I don't know. Well, then how can you be sure there was a murder if you don't even know where it was done? That's what makes this particular crime different from any other. Somewhere, sometime, a woman has been brutally murdered. Yet I don't know when or where. As a matter of fact, I doubt if anyone in the world knows of it except those who did it and me. Really? Well, how does it happen that you alone know all this? Because the victim has told me so in her own words. I heard the horrible story from her own lips. Ah, then you talked to her. No, no, never. But you just said But she has talked to me. See here, Mr. Field, do you think... Mr. Carter, here's the story. About a month ago, at one of those sales of unclaimed packages that the express company holds twice a year, I I bought a box. 
Uh, about uh, one-third the size of a steamer trunk. When I took it home and opened it, I found it contained a blood-stained dress, a photograph of a beautiful woman, and eight phonograph records. What kind of records? Well, they were the small record blanks you buy when you want to make your own recordings at home. And it was from these records that I learned about the crime. Hmm. Well, Mr. Field, if you wanted to arouse my curiosity, you've certainly succeeded. How soon can I hear these records? Immediately. They're in my rooms. If you care to, we can go there right now. Excellent. Patsy? Yes, Nick? Get your hat. We're leaving at once to listen to a murder. That was the start of one of the strangest cases that ever came into the office of Nick Carter, Master Detective. A murder which came to light only because a man bought a box at an auction sale. Eight records which told the amazing story of the brutal killing of an innocent victim. Eight records of death. This is the box, Mr. Carter. How long ago did you say you bought it, Mr. Field? Oh, about a month ago. And the express company holds things for a year before selling, which means the murder's at least a year old. Were the wrappings on the box when you bought it? Yes, but I'm sorry to say they were destroyed before I knew they might give me a valuable clue to the mystery. Oh, too bad. You recall the name to which the box was addressed? Oh, yes, yes, I do. It was addressed to Alex Delanor, New York City, no street address. The rest of the label was obliterated. I've searched every city directory, every telephone book, every place where names are listed, but no such name anywhere. When are we going to get to the records, Nick? Right now, Patsy, I hope. How about it, Mr. Field? Uh, right away. I'm very curious to get your reaction to them. Are they numbered? No, but I've played them so often, I'm sure I have them in order. Uh, here's the first one. I don't suppose anyone will ever hear this record. But it's the only way I can think of to tell my terrible story to the outside world. I'm being held a prisoner in my own house. Held prisoner without any hope of rescue, except death. And I know that will be the end for me. All I ask of you who are listening is to avenge my death by putting my murderers where they belong. My name... It sounds as if she really meant it, doesn't she? I thought he was coming in then, but he didn't. My name is Nancy Deering. You will undoubtedly recognize it. As you know, I'm very rich, but all my money is no good to me now. I've tried to escape, but it keeps too close a watch on me. I only hope they don't kill me. Oh. That's all on that. He apparently came back unexpectedly. Well, she certainly had trouble getting a story on the record, didn't she? Yes, she was interrupted many times, generally in the wrong places. Oh, what a terrible feeling. To expect to be killed any minute. Here's the next one. I don't know where I left off last time. I don't dare play it back. If they should ever hear what I'm trying to do, they'd take the machine away from me. From the way they talk, the end is very near. They may... I'm sure Ralph was listening outside the door, so I switched on the radio till he went away. Ralph is the one who will kill me when the time comes bad as Olive is, I don't believe she could kill her own cousin. But her husband is different. When I refused to sign the deed last night, he hit me several times. But he can't make me sign because I'm positive that would be the end of me. He can do anything he... And that's all there is on that. I wish he'd planned what she was going to say a little better. How to make her tail of it this way. Well, she manages to get most of the story on the records one way or another. The only thing she missed out on was telling us who she was or where she lived. All we have is her name. And she said she thought we'd recognize the name. Maybe she lived a long way from here. Maybe. Here's the third one. She apparently knew Ralph was coming to see her, and she prepared for his visit in advance. This is what she got. Come in. Well, my beautiful cousin... Have you decided to sign that deed? I told you I'd never do it. Never. All we want, my cousin, is your money. As soon as you've made it over to us, we'll set you free, just as we promised. You don't fool me for one minute. The minute I put my name on that paper, you'd kill me. Get me free. Oh, that's funny. I haven't had a free minute since that cousin of mine moved into this house. I thought she was going to be company for me after Leonard died. But I'd have been better off living here alone. It was very sweet of you to invite her to come and live with you, Nancy. It is even nicer of you to let her bring me along. We've had such fun here. I wish I'd known men what I know now. <laughs> A little late to worry about that, dear cousin. 
Well, for the last time. Will you sign? No, no, no. Very well. But it won't be long before you wish you had. Oh, oh. oh, oh I wish this were all over. I'd rather be dead than living like this. Not a friendly face anywhere since they got rid of my old servant. Nobody left but Alex. He's too busy with his road bushes to know what's going on. Oh, I wish I was dead. And well, that's all there is on that one. Oh, the poor woman. But it's too bad she didn't use more of those records than she did. She only uses a small portion of each blank. It's probably hard enough to get as much as she did in the way she was watched. Me? Where do you suppose she got the blanks in the first place? Probably had a radio phonograph in the room where she was shut up. They must have had the record blanks in with the other records where they didn't notice them. I've never been able to make much of this next one. Maybe you'll have better luck. The whole first part is just scratch. Here, I'll start it where the voices begin. Nancy! <laughs> What's the idea of bolting? Nancy. Isn't she in here? Why, of course she is. Nancy, come out here. Hiding, is she? Well, we'll drag her out. I'll find her, the little Let's she. Look around here, little fool. Aha! Uh -huh. Look there! Ah, come out of there! No, no, don't wait! Come Let me alone! There, I tell you, will you? Come on, come on! Oh. Try to kill me, will you? Oh, no, 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 Nancy locked her door and started the recorder. For some reason, she waited before saying anything. Then Ralph and Olive came to the door, found it bolted, and broke in. Nancy hid, and they dragged her out. She grabbed Ralph's gun and took a fast shot at him. That's too bad she missed. That's clear enough when you tell it. Well, here's the next one. I must hurry, as I may be interrupted any minute. They seldom leave me alone anymore. Maybe they're afraid I'll kill myself. But to get on with the story. When my husband was killed in Italy, I invited Olive, a distant cousin, to come and live with me. She asked if she could bring her husband. I foolishly consented. Everything went well for about two months. Then one after another, my servants left. I know now that Olive and Ralph drove them out. Then Ralph suggested that I put him in charge of my estate. I refused, of course. The next day, I was shut up in my room. He told me that when I made my fortune over to him, he'd let me go anywhere I wished. But I could tell he was lying. I knew... Someone is listening outside the door. Yesterday, I wrote a letter to Alex, the only one of my servants left, and threw it out the window. If he finds it, maybe he can... And that's that. We didn't get much out of that except a few background details. Now oh, it all pieces together, Patsy. A little at a time. This next record is more interesting, you'll find. Good. Let's have it. Well, Nancy, how do you feel today? You're not interested, so why ask me? I'm extremely interested in the state of your health, always. If you had your way, I'd be dead. Now, why don't you stop being so stubborn, Nancy? It's not getting you anywhere. Why don't you stop torturing me? Or do you enjoy seeing me suffer? I don't particularly mind. Why, you... <coughs> you she-devil! You ever throw anything at me again, I'll tie you hand and foot so you can't move. Why don't you kill me and be done with it? That's what you're going to do anyway. Why, Nancy. What an unpleasant thought for such a beautiful woman. You know, I could go for you. You'd only say the word. Please. You dirty sneak! I told you that I could oh, you. No, 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 I please! Oh. Next time I will kill you. Oh. I'm almost tempted to do it now. Ralph, will you get me a glass of water, please? I don't see why I shouldn't. Oh, all right. But no tricks, or I'll... Gosh, wish I could have heard more of that. I thought he was going to make a pass at her. You will hear more. Nancy must have known the record was about ended, so she sent Ralph after the water so that she could change the record. She's clever, that woman. Or should I say, she was clever. I'm afraid it's past tense for sure, Mr. Carter. What a terrible thing. Why, Fabby, please. Thank you, Ralph. 
I, uh, I think I should tell you, Nancy, that Olive and I have decided that we'll give you one more day to do just as we want. Just one. Do you think death frightens me? That's the only way I'll ever get away from you two. At least that way my fortune will go to my sister and not to you two murderers. Are you sure? Of course. My will leaves everything to her. Ah, but we have a new will leaving everything to us. <laughs> Properly signed, sealed, and with. No, you, you can't get away with it. Oh, yes, we can. Of course, we'd rather not have to use it, but if we must, we must. And I assure you, it's a masterpiece of fortune. I can't believe two such inhuman creatures as you and Olive actually exist. Well, we do. And we shall continue to exist long after you've gone. Look forward to tomorrow, Nancy, dear. You, you heard what he said. It was practically a full confession of everything. Oh, I beg you, whoever you are who may hear these words, see that those two monsters get their just desserts for what they've done to me. I shall feel... Huh. If you didn't know she was in deadly earnest, you'd think she was putting on an act. Truth is generally more effective than fiction, Bessie. There's one more, the eighth and last. How she managed to get it, I'll never know. But here it is. The first two-thirds are blank. It starts about here. Keep away from me, both of you. As you see, I have a gun, and you both know I can shoot. I'll kill the first one of you who comes near me. That's my gun. Where'd you get it? Olive gave it to me so I could defend myself. That's a lie, and you know it. What if it is? Nancy. <laughs> Give me that gun. Give me that gun, Nancy. Hey, give it to me. I say, oh, great sure is. Now, come on. Give it to me. Oh. Uh, well, that takes care of you, you stubborn fool. You all right, Olive? Uh, uh, yes, uh, I guess so, Ralph. The bullet just grazed my head. Good. Is she dead? Uh, she's dead, all right. Even Nancy Deering can't live with a bullet through her heart. Well, I'm glad it's over at last. You say you've arranged with a doctor to... Poor Nancy. What a tough break she got. I truly believe that's the most remarkably told murder story in the history of crime. Well, Mr. Carter, do you have any ideas? I think so. But I'm not ready to talk about them yet. What's your first step going to be, Nick? First, I want to take these records back to the office and play them over and over until I know them by heart. Then, I'll be ready to go to work. sandwich in your pocket, Patsy? Oh, Nick, I thought you'd never finish listening to those records. I wanted to be sure I didn't miss anything that could possibly be helpful to me. Did you find anything worthwhile? Yes, indeed, Patsy. There are several clues plainly marked out for us. Certainly enough for us to get started, huh? Well, tell me, Nick. Don't keep me waiting. Of course, the most obvious clue we have is the blood-stained dress that came in the box with the records. You mean the label in it? Yes. We know the girl's name was Nancy Deering. That the dress was bought at Shipstead's dress shop in Albany. Uh-huh. And as the picture that was in the box had an Albany photographer's name on it, she must have lived in or near Albany. Right. So we'll start our search there. But, Nick, if it was all done as secretly as the records would seem to indicate, chances are that nobody up there knows anything about it. Yes, except for one thing, Patsy. It's obvious from the quality of the dress and from what she said in one of the records that Nancy Deering was a well-to-do woman. Uh -huh. And I find it difficult to believe that any rich woman can disappear without the newspapers or the police or somebody knowing something about it, even if they don't know there was any foul play connected with it. I see. And when they give you the facts as they have them, you can give them the inside story you got from the records. That's what I hope will happen. So pack your bag and order a taxi. We're flying to Albany immediately. to be able to get us on this plane. Well, this business demands a certain amount of priority. Now, Patsy, here's what I plan to do. Hmm. As soon as we get there, you take the photograph to the address shown. See if it really is a picture of Nancy Deering, and also how recent it is. Uh-huh. I'm going to the newspaper office and see what they can tell me. Meet me there. You're, you're not going to the police first? No, not unless we can't find anything anywhere else. I want to keep this unofficial as long as I can. I think I'll get further that way. We've got to be careful. We don't know what we may be stirring up when we start asking questions. Huh? 
Machine's office? Oh, right over there. Thanks. Come in. Yes? What can I do for you? Mr. Brown, I'm Nick Carter. I hope you can give me some information. Oh, sure, Carter. Glad to help you if I can. What's on your mind? Well, as the editor of a big paper, you must run into things every now and then. Would your files have any dope on a woman called Nancy Deering? Well, what sort of dope are you looking for and why? I'd like particularly to know when and how she died. And I'd rather not tell you why just yet. Carter, I smell a story here. If I give you the information you want, I want that story. I don't know that there is any story, but in return for your help, I'll promise to give you first crack at anything I may find that's worth your attention. Okay. If that's the way you want it, I'll play along with you. Nancy Deering, you say? Yes. How and when she died? Well, Nancy Deering and her husband, Leonard Deering, were pretty prominent people here in town, so I can answer your question offhand. Deering, a colonel in the engineers, was killed in the big push through Italy. His wife died of pneumonia a little over a year ago. Pneumonia, huh? You're sure of that? I am, but I'll check it for you. Give me the morgue. Now, Bill, when did Nancy Deering die and what was the matter with her? I'll wait. Get the name of the attending physician, too, will you? Now, look here, Carter. You got any reason to think that... Yes? December 14th, 1944. Right. Pneumonia, yeah. Um, who was the doctor? Fred Windsor. Hey... Wasn't he the guy whose license was taken away a while back for malpractice? Uh-huh. I thought so. Well, okay, thanks. So this Fred Windsor was disqualified. Any idea where he is now? No. Uh, wait, a, wait a minute. I'll have a look in the directory. Let's see. Yep. Here he is. Fred Windsor, 57 Telfer Road. That's up in the western section of the city, a small suburb. Thanks very much, Mr. Brown. I won't bother you anymore. And if I get any red-hot tips, I'll pass them on to you when I'm ready. I wish you'd tell me what this is all about. Later, Mr. Brown. Well, so long. Thanks again. So long. Oh, there you are. I was just coming to find you. What did you find out? The photographer says there's a picture of Nancy Deering, all right, taken about a year and a half ago, just before her husband left for the war. And that's your husband with her in the picture. They had a big house out on Lincoln Avenue in the West End. Good. I found what I wanted, too. We going out to the Deering house now, Nick? Not just yet, Bessie. Huh? What she said in the records is true. The ones living there now, her murderers. May not be likely to tell us anything we'd want to know. Oh. No, we'll wait till we have more definite information before we tackle them. Then what do we do now? We're going to call on a doctor. Or rather, an ex-doctor. I hope he'll tell us something he never told anybody before. <laughs> What do you want? And make it brief. Mr. Windsor, I'll come directly to the point. A little over a year ago, a woman named Nancy Deering died. You, as attending physician, signed the death warrant. All right? Yes, I signed it. What about it? I have reason to believe she didn't die of pneumonia. You're crazy. Of course she did. If you think you can come now here and start a... I said I had reason to think she died of something else. I might have said I have proof that she did. Well, you haven't. Mr. Windsor, you'll save yourself and me a lot of trouble if you... Get out of here, both of you. You're a pair of men. Hold it, Windsor. For... It won't help you any to get rough. I've got nothing to say to you. You might just as well get out. I'd like you to do just one thing for me before I go. I've got nothing to say. You won't have to talk. Just listen to a record. A record? Yes. You have a player here? Yes, right here. What's the record? Let me play it for you, and you'll see. I can promise you, you'll be greatly interested. Well, go ahead, play it. But be quick about it. Put it on, Pessy. You mean the last one of the series? Yes. Okay. Keep away from me, both of you. No. Oh. As you see, I have a gun. You both know I can shoot. I'll kill the first one of you who comes near me. That's my gun. Where'd you get it? And that's how. Carl gave it to me so I could defend myself. That's a lie, and you know it. What if it is? <laughs> Can't be possible. Yeah. What do you think? That takes care of you, you stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I won't hear anymore. I won't hear anymore. Wait, wait, wait. Stop. Wait. Nick, did he? Did he? Yes, right through the temple. Oh, what a tragedy. 
But he practically confessed before he died. We can't prove he did, Patsy. No matter how much we know ourselves, we're right back where we started, as far as legal proof goes. Then we'll have to find some other way to prove what we know. We can't stop here. I have no intention of stopping. Well, what now? I'm going to put an ad in the paper for Alex Delano, the man who sent the box to New York originally. He isn't listed in the city directory of the phone book, so we'll have to try it this way. Won't that be dangerous, Nick? How do you mean, dangerous? Well, suppose this Ralph should see it. Mightn't he get suspicious? That's one reason I'm using the ad, Patsy. I hope Ralph does see it, and I hope he does something about it. I want to smoke him right out into the open. And this may be one way to do it. <laughs> Pardon me, do you uh, have any answers in box 415? 415. Yeah, uh, yeah, one. Here. Uh... Well, our results. Well, what is it, Nick? Let me get it open and I'll tell you. <laughs> ah, from Alex himself. Hmm. We'll be looking for you at my residence at 84 Green Court about 8 tonight. Alex Donor. You going, Nick? Of course I'm going. But you're going to stay in your hotel oh. room and wait for me to call if I need your help. Oh, Nick, I want to go, too. Nothing doing, Patsy. Do yourself said. This may be a trap, and I'd rather deal with it myself. Who is it? You, Alex Delano? Yes. May I come in? I'd like some information, if you can give it to me. Oh, but of course. Come in. Thanks. Uh, sit there, please. <clears throat> Delano, you used to work for Mrs. Nancy Deering, didn't you? Oh, Mrs. Deering. Oh, yes, I worked for her for many years. It was only after she died that Mr. Morgan fired me. Uh, Mr. Morgan. Yes, yes. Tell me, Delano, after she died... Did you pack up a box of records and send them to New York? Oh, you have found the records? Oh, I've waited so long for that. Yes, we found them. And why did you send them to New York like that? Well, her letter asked me to, to prove she was murdered. Her letter? Yes. It says she is being kept prisoner, and she is afraid she will be killed at any time. She says if she die quick, I must pack the records I find in her radio cabinet and take them to the police. It will prove what she say. And why didn't you go to the police with that letter? Uh, she have died the day before I find the letter. It is too late. She throw the letter out of the window to me a few days before, but I find it behind a rose bush too late to help. So I, I do what she say. And you didn't take the records to the police? Oh, me, uh, I am afraid of police. Hmm. So I put them in a box and send box to New York. And then I write police to get it and find out what has happened. Do you have her letter now? Oh, yes. I, I keep it in my pocket always. Here it is. Thank you, Delano. With that letter and the records, I'll I think I... will take that letter, Mr. But... Carter. No, I have a gun here covering you. Put your hands up over your head. That's it. So it was you who arranged this meeting. Yeah, I was curious to know what you wanted with Alex. And I find he knows much more than I thought he did. I should have got rid of him before this. And what do you intend to do now? Dispose of you and Alex. The records are still in existence. They'll prove you murdered Mrs. Deering. With this letter in my possession and the doctor dead? Oh, yes, I know about that, too. The records will prove nothing. Now, come on. I have my car outside. You and Alex and I will take a ride to my house where you will stay until I decide how best to get rid of you. And I say kill him, Ralph. He's too dangerous to be allowed to live. Well, do as I say, Olive. If Carter were to disappear, every cop in this section of the country would be searching for him. But, Ralph... No, he... we'll clean out the safe deposit boxes, withdraw the money we have in the bank, and go to Mexico, South America. We'll leave Carter and Alex tied up there. If they starve to death before they're found, well, that's just too bad. I think you're a fool, Ralph, to let him live. I'm running this, Olive. And if you don't want me to go away alone, do as I say. I hate him. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have to run away like this. I could kill him myself. Well, you won't. I don't leave the house until I get back. Pack all your things, be ready to leave. All right, Ralph. I'll get back as quick as I can. Let him live. I won't. I'll fix him. A knife in his heart is what he deserves. That's what he's going to get right now. Yes. 
carving knife will do. Tied up his ears, he, he can't do anything to stop me from killing him. Are you in there, Mr. Nick Carter? I'm coming to kill you, Nick Carter. I hate you. I'm going to... Now, now, if I can reach that knife you dropped. Oh, if I can only see behind my back. What happened, Mr. Carter? I tripped her up as she came in and knocked her head on the floor and stunned her. Now, if I can get to that knife... Now, where is it? I want to be... Now, cut the ropes on my arms. Have you free in a minute, too, Alex? Oh, look out, Mr. Carter. She's coming, too. It's all right. I'm free now. I'll take care of her. What? What happened? Quiet. Don't make a sound. But I... You try to cry out, I'll fix you so you can't. Ralph isn't here anyway. Wouldn't do any good. Where is he? He's gone to town. You're lying to me. That's he calling. He must have come back for something. Alden, why don't you answer me? Call him. Tell him to come in here. But you don't think my ropes are tight enough. I won't do it. Ouch! That's the carving knife you feel between your ribs. Now call to him carefully. Ralph. Yes? Ralph, I'm in here. Please come in. Oh, what are you doing in there? Get I your hands in the air. Why, what? Get him up high. That's it. Alan, how did Carter get that gun? Did you? You overlooked this little pistol I always carry in my shoulder holster, Ralph. But it's deadly even if it is small. What? What are you going to do with us now? Round up whatever existence I can find in this house, including Alex's letter, and hand you both over to the police. With what Alex and I can tell them, and the evidence I can turn over to them, you'll both of you pay for Nancy Deering's life by forfeiting your own. Well, Nick, how about a few hints about next week's show? Next week, Ken, I'm going to tell you about a suicide that turned out to be a murder then disappeared entirely. Hold on a minute now. That's too fast for me. Well, it's true, Ken. If it hadn't been that my woman's intuition told me that what Scubby and I saw wasn't what we ought to have seen, the entire story might have been different. Yes, Patsy, that was one time when you really put the finger on the answer to a very tricky problem. This I gotta hear. What do you call it, Nick? I call it the case of the disappearing corpse. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics magazine. In the adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places, is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability of solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. My station, you see? Oh. 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 
thunderstorm rages outside. A shot. A man falls dead. So begins a strange adventure for Nick Carter, master detective. An adventure in which a murder seemed to be no murder at all. And the dead body vanished into thin air. The case of the disappearing corpse. Morning, Matty. Oh, how are you, Nick? What brings you down here to headquarters so early in the morning? It's only just 10 o'clock. Well, I've been out in the country for the past couple of weeks writing an article on crime detection methods. Finished it last night. Huh? Just stopped in on my way back to my office. That's the time of day. That's what's doing. Yeah, it's pretty quiet, Nick. Nothing exciting's happened in the past ten days. Oh, Matty, haven't you even got one simple little murder just to keep me in practice? I'm bored. Uh, well, would you be interested in checking up on a suicide? Now, what's there to investigate about a suicide? Well, you never can tell, Nick. I just got a report that a guy bumped himself off in an uptown apartment house. I was going up to take a look at it myself, but the commissioner just called and must see him in his office right away. Uh, you want to go up in my place? Oh, I don't know, Matty. Well, if it's just the usual routine, you can lay off after you make the call. Anybody else going up? Medical examiners going along. Well, I called my office a few minutes ago, and Patsy had nothing for me, so I might as well run up and see what it's all about. What's the address? Hmm? No, there's no see, uh... Oh, yeah, it's uh, 717 West Hampton Street, apartment 4. Okay, Matty. See you when we get back. Well, this is West Hampton Street. What was that number, Doc? 717. Ought to be just ahead, Nick. Oh, yeah, 695, 701, 709. There it is, 717. Oh, that's a pretty swanky place, Nick. You can't live here on a white-collar salary. <clears throat> oh, here's the elevator. Waiting for us. Apartment four, wasn't it? Yeah. Get in and push the button. Suicide? Oh, yes, sir. Won't you come in, please? Thank you. He... Uh, the body's right in the living room there, to your left. Oh, yes. I see it. Well, doesn't seem to be much of a question about it being suicide. You're the butler? Yes, sir. My name is Jordan. What do you know about this, Jordan? Very little, sir. Mr. Warner, uh, he's Mr. Miller's nephew, came in about an hour ago and found his uncle lying there in the middle of the floor. I hadn't come down, but he called me and I reported it to the police. I've touched nothing since. Where's Mr. Warner now? Is he here? Yes, sir. He's upstairs in the library. He'll be down in a moment. I see. This dead man? Mr. Miller? Yes, sir. Mr. Anthony Miller. This is his apartment. His niece and I live here with him. Where's his niece now? She's dressing, sir. She'll be down with you shortly. This is a duplex apartment, isn't it? Yes, sir. Reception hall, living room, dining room, and kitchen on this floor. Library and three bedrooms on the second floor. Oh, mm, pretty swank, I'd say. Pretty stuffy, I'd say. Well, thank you, Jordan. Well, as soon as the others come down, bring them in here, will you? Yes, at once, sir. Well, Doc, how's it look? Oh, pretty cut and dried. Pistol in his hand, a hole in his head with powder stains around it. Uh, looks like suicide, all right. How long has he been dead? Must have been killed about two, three o'clock. Uh, beg your pardon, sir. Here's Mr. Warner, Mr. Miller's nephew. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Warner? I'm Nick Carter. Uh, Nick Carter? Yes. I'm acting for Sergeant Matheson of the Metropolitan Police. Oh, by the way, Jordan, yes. I left word for my two assistants to meet me here as soon as they could. When they arrive, will you let me know, please? Of course. At once, sir. Mr. Warner, I understand you found your uncle's body. That's right, Mr. Carter, I did. Will you tell us about it? Well, of course. When I was here last week, I left my camera here. I wanted to take some pictures this morning, so I dropped in here about 9.30 to pick it up. Who let you in? No one, Mr. Carter. I have my own key to the apartment. I came into the living room here, saw my uncle lying there on the floor... Obviously dead, so I called Jordan, who came down immediately and informed the police. And that's about all. Was the outer apartment door locked when you came in? Yes. Both the regular safety lock and the regular lock were on. Mm-hmm. 
There are windows opening under the fire escapes. They were all fastened securely, sir. I checked them myself to make sure. Then no one could have come in from the outside. No, hardly. Not with the door and windows all locked as they were. I uh, see. Mr. Carter, what's the idea of all these questions? It was suicide, wasn't it? Just purely routine, that's all. Has anything in this room been touched since the body was found? No, nothing. Good. Is that your uncle's pistol in his hand? Uh, it looks like it, yes. Yeah. Let me take it. You recognize it? Well, no, don't touch it. There may be fingerprints on it. That's why I'm holding it with my handkerchief. Yes. Yes, that's my Uncle Gunn, all right. There's no question about that. Yes, sir. It's Mr. Miller's gun, Mr. Carter. I've seen it often. Mm-hmm. And one of the shells is empty. And one shot has been fired. Well, that's all it took to kill him. Hey. Wait a minute. Well, what is it? This is unusual, to say the least. It's an empty shell in the chamber, but the pistol barrel is clean. What's that, Nick? You see? Either the barrel has been cleaned since the shot was fired, or the shot wasn't fired from this gun. Then this can't be suicide. Can't be suicide? No. Definitely not suicide. It's murder. Murder, sir? But Where's the old man's niece? Say she lives here? Yes, sir. She, she'd be down directly, sir. Mr. Carter, she knows nothing about this. She was still asleep when we phoned the police. Jordan called her afterward. That's right, sir. I did. She knows nothing of this. Maybe and maybe not. I'd like to talk to her anyway, because from what you tell me about the door and windows all being locked, and from the condition of the murder weapon, this must have been an inside job. One of you three is guilty. Well, now look here, Mr. Carter. All right, Mr. Warner, this is now in the hands of the police. May I use your phone, please? There's one on the desk, sir. Oh, that, that one's not working, Mr. Carter. If you come with me, I'll show you the one in the library upstairs. Huh? I, I know that one's all right. This, this one has a short circuit or something. Thanks. Be right back, Doc. Right, Nick. Sorry to trouble you. No, no, not at all. You better call Sergeant Matheson, have him send his homicide experts up here, as well as the cops stand guard. Now, well, you probably want you all to go down to headquarters for a talk. I see. Murder has to be treated very differently from suicide. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's the library right ahead of you. You'll find the phone in there. Thanks. Apartment four, Patsy, right here. Uh huh. Yes. What is it, Jean? Is Mr. Carter here? Mr. Carter? Yes, Mr. Nick Carter, the detective. You must have the wrong number, Miss. What number were you looking for? Look, is this seven seventeen West Hampton Street, or isn't it? That's correct, sir. And is this apartment four, or isn't it? It's quite right, sir. Okay, then where's Nick Carter? I'm very sorry, sir, but there must be some mistake. Mr. Anthony Miller lives here. There's no Mr. Carter. Well, didn't the man kill himself here last night? Oh, my goodness, no, miss. You're all mixed up. Well, Mr. Scubby, did Sergeant Matheson tell you the name of the dead man? No, said whoever phoned didn't give it to him. Oh, we must have the address wrong, Patsy. Maybe. Uh, could, could we use your phone? Why, of course, miss, if you'll step into the living room. There's your left. There's a tool in there. Ah, uh, thanks. Come on, Scubby. You okay. can give the sergeant a buzz and see what's wrong. <coughs> Right there, sir, on the desk. Right on. Thanks. If you'll pardon me for a moment, please. Well, sure, go ahead. Police headquarters. Now, uh, let me speak to Sergeant Matheson. One moment, please. Oh, I wonder how it would be to live in a place. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Oh, Maddie, this is Scubby. Yeah, what's on your mind, Scubby? Oh, Nick must have given us the wrong address when he told us to follow him uptown to the suicide place. What is the address? Uh, uh, just a minute. Mm. Uh, here it is. It's 717 West Hampton Street, apartment 4. But that's where we are, Maddie. They don't know anything about it here. What's that? No, the butler tells us there's been no suicide here. Well, uh, hey, that's the address they gave us this morning when they phoned. Well, have you heard from Nick or the medical examiner? Hey, come to think of it, I have it. And that's a funny thing, too. It's over two hours since they left here. They ought to be back by now. Hey, why didn't they call and say they got the wrong address? There's something mighty funny going on, Scubby. Yeah, looks like it. Well, we'll see what we can find. Maybe it's an address that sounds like this one. We'll call you in a little while if we don't find anything. Okay, I'll tell the boys to watch out for Nick and Doc. Right. So long. You know any more than we do? 
No. He hasn't heard from Nick or the doc since they left headquarters about two hours ago. What are you looking at? I was just thinking. Whoever lives here has pretty poor taste, even if they do have money. How do you mean? Well, look at the rug in this room. Yeah? It's the wrong color. It's definitely too small for the size of the floor. And the rug in the next room, which must be the dining room, was entirely the wrong color for the decorative effect in that room. And that one's much too big for the size of the floor. Yeah. You're right, Tessie. It's funny that people live in such swell places should furnish their rooms so badly. Yeah. It almost looks as if these two rugs have been switched around, doesn't it? Patsy, maybe that's just what did happen. Maybe... It... Here, let me get a look at the rug under that dining table. Uh-huh. I'll shove the table over to one side and have a good look. Okay. Oh, are you looking for something, sir? Uh, you're darn right I'm looking for something. You better hope I don't find it. I have to ask you to stop moving that dining table. If you try to stop me, I'll put a gun between your ribs. I'll call the police. Go ahead, call them if you dare. <clears throat> There. Gabby, look, right in the center of the rug, a big blood stain. That's what I thought. And I'll bet my last dollar that you'll find a blood stain that same size and shape in the center of the living room floor. Then someone was killed here. Yes, Patsy, and Nick and the doctor were here, too. This whole business about there being no killing here is a frame-up. Now you talk, and talk fast. What have you done with Nick Carter? <clears throat> Every man in every squad car is to be on the lookout for him. Now repeat that description I gave you. Right. Right. No, 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 it's Gerald Warner. Yeah, he was the old man's nephew. Okay, let me know as soon as you hear anything. Now, Jordan, look here. You're in a pretty tight spot. If you don't want this murder rap pinned on you, you better talk and you better say plenty. But I tell you, I know nothing about it. And you still say you don't know where the old man's niece went either, huh? Miss Hammond? No, sir. She put on her hat and coat and went out carrying a small overnight bag. Where'd she go? I don't know, sir. Ah, look, don't be a sap. The butler always knows everything about a killing. And most of the time, the butler done the murder himself. But I assure you... Now, look, I... we've proved that the bloodstained Scubby and Patsy found was human blood. We found Nick Carter's fingerprints on the desk, the table, and the upstairs phone. We found the old man's body stuffed in that upstairs closet in your apartment. <laughs> and you don't know nothing about nothing. Well, Sergeant, this huh? is bullet they just took out of Miller's body. Let me see it. Ah. Well, that's an ordinary thirty-two caliber slug. Yeah, but it was big enough to kill him. I know that. What I mean was... I've been here to take the squad is back and searching Gerald Warner's apartment. Oh, yeah? They find anything? Mm, nothing very valuable. Oh, they did find a telephone number for the niece, Frances Hammond. Uh-oh. There were two numbers in Warner's small directory. One was her home and the other, according to the chief operator, is at 62 East Pine Street. Now, what the deuce would that be? Well, maybe she's got a girlfriend there. That's it, Scubby. Patsy, this is a job for you. Uh-huh. Go to this address and see if Frances Hammond is there. If she is, tell her you're a reporter. Find out how much she knows. Get as much of the story out of her as you can. And if she's not there? All right, maybe you can find out where she is. But go on, get going and hurry. Right. Maybe you can dig up something that'll tell us where Nick is. <laughs> idea where we are, Doc? No. Well, looks sort of like somebody's hunting shack. Yes, I can see that. That doesn't help much. Well, as long as we're tied up to these two chairs like we are, it doesn't make much difference what part of the world we're in. We're no good to anybody this way. Oh, the thing that makes me mad is the way they fooled me so completely. I never did see who hit me. Well, considering that there were only two men in the place and that the butler was with me, it isn't very hard to figure out who tapped you for the count. I was out cold from the time I was knocked out until I came to in this place. My wrist was so relaxed when they tied me that I can't work them loose. No, I don't think I got into this mess because I was bored. Well, I, I don't understand how you found out where I was staying, Miss Bowen. Your cousin told me, Miss Hammond, but it was he who suggested that I come here. He knew reporters would be pestering me for interviews after... after Uncle Anthony killed himself. And he said if I came here, they wouldn't be able to find me. He promised me he wouldn't tell anyone. But he only gave me your address because he knew I wouldn't pass to you. He and I have been friends for years. Oh, I hope he doesn't tell anyone else. I'm sure he won't. And now, may I ask you a question or two? I suppose so. 
I, I really don't feel much like talking about it. I know, Miss Hammond. You loved your uncle, didn't you? Very much. He was always so good to me. Were you and your cousin engaged? Oh, not quite. Uncle wanted us to get married. In fact, he, he made a will leaving me all his money because, well, he, he thought that would keep Gerald more interested in me. Was Gerald, uh, Mr. Warner, interested in anyone else? Oh, no, it wasn't that. Uncle Anthony knew that Gerald wasn't ready to settle down yet. He was trying to persuade him it would be the best thing for him. Do you know where your cousin is now? I, no, I don't. Why do you ask me where he is? Don't you know? What? Uh, wait, well, you see, he um, asked me to send him a copy of whatever I wrote in my interview with you. But he's left town and didn't leave me his address. Can you tell me? Why, I don't know. When he wants to get out of town, he generally goes to Atlantic City. The Hotel Marquise. Or it was Hunting Shack up in Norris County. He might be in either place, I suppose. Uh-huh. Well, I'll send a copy of the interview to each of these addresses. One of them ought to reach him. Uh, tell me, Miss Hammond, did you know where your uncle kept his pistol? Why, of course. We all knew it. It was no secret. I'd seen it often. But I, I never thought he'd use it to, to do this. Oh, dear, now, Miss Hammond, I'm sorry I mentioned it. Oh, please don't let it upset you. I'll just run along now. Goodbye. And thanks. Oh, trying to get across the room by moving your chair like this when you're tied up in it this way. Isn't the simplest thing in the world, huh? I can't make my chair move at all. But you're doing fine. Am I getting anywhere near that table yet? You're doing great, Nick. Just a little more. I'm moving backwards this way. It's hard to tell where I'm going. Uh, to your left. Uh, just a hair. That, that, that's it. Now you got it. Ah, so far, so good. Now, that's where's the bottle, Doc. With my back to it this way, I can't see where it is. It's almost directly in back of you. Uh, about a foot from the edge of the table. All right. I'll pull the tablecloth toward me. And that'll bring the bottle near the edge where I can get hold of it. Oh, watch it while I pull it now. Is it coming? Uh, careful now. It's almost there. Hold it. It's right at the edge. You ought to be able to get it now. Well, I can if I can get my hands up that height. Yeah. Whoever tied my arms and back of this chair did too good a job. There's no slack at all. Uh, that's it. There. I got it. <sighs> now... If I can break this bottle against the fireplace, I should have a sharp edge that'll cut these ropes in short order. But when you could only move an inch at a time this way, it's no work getting anywhere. Keep me going in the right direction, Doc. Oh, you're doing fine, Nick. Only a little more now. Uh, to your left a bit. Now that's it. You ought to be able to reach it now. You can hit it all right. Yeah. All right, here goes that. Uh, you did it, Nick. Now edge your chair over toward me. You can cut my ropes first, and I'll cut yours. Gosh, Nick. You're the eighth wonder of the world. Thanks, Doc. Well, look out. Here I come. <laughs> Sergeant Matheson. Oh, yes, yeah, Chief. You say Gerald Warner isn't at the Hotel Marquise and hasn't been there for several months, huh? Okay, thanks very much, Chief. Yeah, that's what we wanted to know. We know where to look for him now. Yeah, thanks. So long. Well, that wasn't so bad, Nick. But it took longer to cut through the ropes for that piece of glass than I thought it would. Well, we're free, and that's the main thing. Have you found anything around the shack here that looks like a clue? I'm not sure, Doc, but I rather think so. I found these two pistols in the back of one of the cupboards. They're a very unusual pair of guns. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. This gun has one empty shell in it. The barrel is clean. It has not been fired. Well, that's the gun that was in the old man's hand when we found him, isn't it? I'm pretty sure it is. Now, look at this other gun. Uh -huh. This one has no empty shells in it. The barrel is dirty, and from the smell of it, it has been fired very recently. I see what you mean. 
Say, that does make them a little queer, doesn't it? Well, Doc, as I see it, Warner killed Miller with his own gun. Then he tried to make it look like suicide, but he couldn't leave his own gun there. So he got his uncle's gun, which hadn't been fired. Took the empty shell out of his gun and exchanged it for a full shell from his uncle's gun and put that gun in his uncle's hand. And he was just excited enough not to realize that the barrel of his uncle's gun was still clean. Of course. But, well, why didn't he fire the other gun instead of going through all that rigmarole about changing the empty shell for the full one? Probably afraid that a second shot would wake up somebody who might have been partly aroused by the first shot. The one that killed his uncle. Well, I have to admit that it makes sense the way you tell it. And you still think that it'll pay us to wait here for somebody to show up? Yes, Doc, I do. Because if anyone was planning to get rid of us, they'd have done it tonight. And they'd have to do it tonight. They wouldn't dare wait until tomorrow. Someone might find us in the meantime. So if we wait, someone is sure to show up. Okay, you're the doctor. As far as catching murderers goes, you say wait, we wait. <laughs> Again, on a stiff a dose than I thought I did. Ah, it won't hurt him. Makes it easier for us. Yeah, you're quite right, Mike. What are we going to do next, Warner? I still think our best plan is to dump them in the old quarry. It's close by and it's full of water. We'll wait the bodies. They'll never be fun. Ah, that's an awful lot of killing just to get hold of an old will. Not at all, Mike. If I could have taken the will without killing anyone, I would have been glad to do it that way. But since I couldn't, I'm not going to worry about it. And it's worth every bit of my trouble, believe me. A will I destroyed left everything to my cousin. Now that that's out of the way, I am the old man's only living relative. Sole heir to everything he owns. And that's plenty. Uh, what about that niece of his, your cousin? Ah, but she's not really his niece. She's just a girl he sort of unofficially adopted. He always planned to adopt her legally, but he... will never got around to it. So, she gets nothing. You gonna marry her? Marry her? Mm. <laughs> oh, no, indeed, Mike. She's not my type at all. I just kidded around with her to keep in right with the old man. But that's all over now. Well, I hope it works out like you wanted to. Well, I've certainly had bad breaks so far. First, the old man catches me at the safe. Then headquarters sends up Nick Carter instead of a regular cop. Then with a the butler and, and the plan that I had the apartment all fixed up so you'd never know there'd been a killing, Carter's two assistants show up. And the girl notices the rugs have been switched. That tips off the whole frame-up. Ah, uh, your troubles are over now. They will be as soon as we get rid of these two middlers. Yeah, uh, better do it pretty quick now. Uh, take it easy just as soon as it gets a little darker, Mike. Uh, uh, you got any old burlap bags we can put them in? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's some out back. I'll show you where they are. Okay, better have them ready when we want them. That was our chance, Doc. Come on. Let me have one of those shotguns we loaded before. Are you on it? Thanks. Now you take the other one. Get behind the cupboard there. I'll hide over here. All right, Nick. You say when. Let me do the talking. Quiet now. Mike! Mike, what's going on? That ain't possible. I just... Get oh. your hands up high, yes. both of you. Carter! How did you... We'll talk about that later. All right, Doc. I'll hold the gun on them while you tie their hands. And tie them tight the way they tied ours. It'll be a pleasure, Nick. A positive pleasure. Oh, wait till I tie them. Well, Mr. Not. Warner... It isn't coming out just the way you planned it, is it? You've got no proof against me, Connor. You're wrong, Warner. When you knocked me out in your uncle's apartment, you proved you killed him. Tell that to a jury and see how far you get. Oh, that's not legal evidence. It's true. But I have some other evidence that is legal. Why? Warner, between the time Doc and I got free and the time you and Mike got here, we searched this shack of yours. And hidden in one of the cupboards, we found these two guns. Well, so you found two guns in a hunting shack. That's really remarkable. One of these guns is the one that was in your uncle's hand when I first saw his body. The other one, I feel sure, is the one that actually killed him. And if I'm not mistaken, it'll be registered in your name, have your fingerprints on it, and will fire a bullet that'll match the bullet that killed your uncle. Would you call those things legal proof? All right, all right. Yes, that's the gun I killed him with. You know, Carter... I should have killed you when I had the chance. Yes, it would have been wiser than to. Nick? Nick, are you there? Nick, Nick! Come in, Pat. 
Patsy. Oh. What's all the excitement? Oh, Nick, Nick, I've been so afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid for you. Well, Patsy, I... Patsy, you should know me better than that. So how did you get down here anyway? Well, when Sergeant Madison got word from Atlantic City that Warner wasn't there, why... I, I made Scubby drive me down here as fast as he could. Yeah, she wouldn't let me stop and pass anywhere. I never have any luck when I'm out with her. Well, you got here just in time to drive back with us. I was just going to take Mr. Warner and his friend here back to town to meet Maddie. Oh, gosh, Nick. After that... That thug tried to tell me that you'd never been in the apartment when we knew you had. Why, oh, I was ready for anything. But she got even with him. I sure <laughs> did. He thought I wouldn't notice that they'd switch the rugs around, but I did. <laughs> That'll teach him. Yes, Patsy. This is one time when a woman's instinct for interior decoration really solved a murder. <laughs> Well, Nick, how about a glimpse into next week's story of intrigue and adventure? You used the right word that time, Ken. Because next week, I'm going to tell you a story in which intrigue is the keynote. A man in the death house with only nine hours to live asked me to prove him innocent to the charge in which he'd been convicted. He claimed he was a victim of a frame-up. And when Nick really got into the case, he found that the whole thing was a frame-up, but not quite the way we expected. You mean you investigated the case and found a solution in only nine hours? That's right, Ken. They were a very busy nine hours, and a man's life hung in the balance. What do you call your story, Nick? I call it Nine Hours to Live. Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of The Shadow Comic. In The Adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Scubby by John Kane. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. is the Mutual Broadcasting System. of all manhunters, the detective's ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... Nine hours to live. For Nick Carter and the Death House Mystery. And now, a late news bulletin. Nine hours from now, at the stroke of midnight... Johnny Waldron, the blonde-faced killer convicted of the murder of Mrs. Cornelius Fielding, will go to the chair. Just 30 minutes ago, the condemned man made a last request. But Johnny Waldron did not ask for a sumptuous last meal in the tradition of the condemned. Nor did he ask to see his nearest and dearest relative, his wife, Laura. No, Johnny Waldron's request was for something much more dramatic. He asked to see the great detective, Nick Carter. Now, just what this last-minute conference means is anybody's guess. Perhaps a reprieve for Waldron. Perhaps a clue as to what happened to the fielding jewels, which up to now have not even been found. At any rate, the master detective, Nick Carter, has consented to talk with Waldron and is probably at this very moment entering Death House Row. Keep tuned to this station for further dramatic developments. He's in number one. We moved him to number one this morning. You see, it's a shorter ways to walk to the chair. Number one. 
Are you all ready to go? Yeah, the barber was in and shaved his head and legs about an hour ago. How are you taking it? Oh, there ain't been a peep out of him. Don't want nothing to eat. Don't want a chaplain. Nothing at all. The only request he's made is to see you. <laughs> Funny time to ask to see a detective, huh? And if you don't mind my asking, Mr. Carter, what made a big shot like you decide to see him? Well, maybe I'm curious to you know what's in his mind. Or maybe I'm just a softy about a fellow who's going to die in a few hours. Well, I don't believe that you've got any sympathy for a criminal. Uh, not you. Not when a man's a killer. Well, here we are. Here's your company, Weldon. Oh, hi. Hello, Weldon. Oh, Mr. Carter. You got five minutes. All right, guys. Well, Johnny? Oh, so you did come. Gosh, I was afraid you wouldn't. Well, I must admit, I was surprised when the warden called me and said you wanted to see me. You know, I, I imagine you were. Gee, it was sure nice of you to come. Let's skip the formalities, Johnny. Time's too short for chit-chat. Come to the point. What's on your mind? Mr. Carter, you think I'm guilty, don't you? Well, didn't follow your case too closely. But you had a fair trial. You were found guilty. What would you have me believe? I'd like to have you believe that, that I'm innocent. Pretty late in the game to convince anybody of that, Johnny. Oh, I'm not looking for a last-minute reprieve. That isn't what I asked you to come out here for. When I got word a little while ago that the governor refused my last request for a reprieve, I, oh, I just made up my mind that I'd only be kidding myself if I hoped any longer. Why did you want to see me, Johnny? Mr. Carter, I, I know I haven't got a chance. I'm, I'm going to be gone in, in just a few hours now. But I could go a lot easier if, if I thought that, that maybe someday the world would know the truth. They'd know that, that Johnny Waldron was innocent. Johnny, if I thought you were innocent, I'd start the wheels turning right now to get your reprieve. Oh, wait. Let, let me finish, Mr. Carter. I know you don't believe me. Nobody does. I guess I couldn't expect you to believe me after the way things went at the trial. But sitting here in death row, waiting, the idea came to me that that maybe Nick Carter would show him someday. Of course, I'd be gone, but... Well, you see, there's, there's Laura, my wife. She's going to keep on living, and and it'll be hard for her. I suppose she believes you're innocent. Oh, she, she's stuck by me swell. She's, she's a wonderful woman, and I don't want the world to look on her as, as the widow of a murderer. Mr. Carter, all I'm asking is that, that after I'm gone... It, in your spare time, will you try to prove that they executed the wrong man? J just for my wife's sake. Johnny, if you're innocent, who do you think did rob the Fielding safe and kill Mrs. Fielding? I don't know, Mr. Carter. What? There's nobody you even suspect? Well, the only one that... that... No. No, I, I, I'm not going to accuse somebody I'm not sure of. I've only got a few more hours to live and I, I don't... If you want... want me to do anything for you, Johnny, you better tell me everything you can about this. No. No. You'll find it for yourself once you start looking. <laughs> well, I've got to have some kind of evidence to go on it. I don't have any. Cards were stacked so well against me, but... Go see Laura. She's never stopped working for me. Maybe she knows more by now. Look here. If that's the case, why haven't you had a lawyer working for you right up to the last minute? Uh, lawyers. I never had that kind of dough. Oh, a couple of shysters came around thinking maybe I had the feeling jewels tucked away someplace. When they found out they weren't going to get a cut, they faded pretty fast. Even if you decide to do anything for me, Mr. Carter, I, I wouldn't be able to pay you for your trouble. You, you'd have to do it just just as a favor to a dying man. You don't know where the jewels are? Why, no, Mr. Carter. How could I know? I didn't do that job. Look, you, you go see Laura. She'll tell you whatever she can. All right. Time's up, Mr. Carter. All right, Garrett. Well, Johnny, I'll look into your case. I I don't suppose you believe me. <laughs> I bet he's been telling you an innocent man is being sent to the chair, huh? He tells that to everybody. Did it ever occur to you, Garrett, that he might be telling the truth? No. Why? Well, so long, no. Johnny. Good luck. Oh, thanks for coming, Mr. Carter. And, and, and thanks for whatever you can do for me, sir. I'd very much like to know what happened to those fielding jewels. Huh? Oh, 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 yes. Well, maybe they'll turn up while you're investigating. Think so? 
I wonder. Say, guard. Uh, how, how long is it until I... Eight hours, Johnny. Just eight hours more. <laughs> Nick Carter's office. Oh, Bassie, this is Nick. Oh, Nick, thank heaven you called. This place is a madhouse. The office is filled with reporters. The newspaper and broadcasting companies have been telephoning. And the district attorney has been trying to reach you. And well, what's the trouble? They want to know if you're going to try to get a reprieve for Johnny Waldron. Hmm? The DA said he'd stick around his office all evening. And he's contacted the governor, and he'll be on tap ready. Reprieve? Oh, great heaven, I just talked to the fellow. I don't have any evidence, none whatsoever. What's the matter with the DA? Well, when Nick Carter goes to work on a case, even at the zero hour, something usually pops. Well, tell him to hang on to the hats a while. And you, Patsy, go up to the courthouse and get a transcript in the Walden trial. Dig up what you can out of our files about Walden. I'm heading back from state's prison right away. Meet you in front of the office. All right, Nick. But we're going to have to work fast. They throw the switch in exactly seven hours and 40 minutes. Waldron was really hired as a chauffeur. It was brought out of the trial that he ingratiated himself with the old lady every chance he got. Oh? You know, Mrs. Sealing was an invalid. Waldron used to carry her up and down stairs and waited on her and all that sort of thing. He was inside the house a great deal. Then, um, let's see now. Oh, the gun was traced to Mrs. Sealing's stepson, Tom Fielding. But the prints on the gun were Waldron's. Her stepson lived there with her? Yes, just the two of them. Mm -hmm. Walden and all the other servants slept out and reported for work in the mornings at 8. When was the body found? On a Thursday night at 10 o'clock, the library of the house. Tom Fielding came home from his club and found her. The safe was open and the jewels and money gone. Of course, any of the servants, as well as Tom Fielding, might have known the combination of the safe. Mrs. Fielding often opened it in front of all of them. The defense harked on that at the trial, but Waldron's prints on the gun and his alibi being so flimsy cooked his goose. I see. I see. How did Waldron strike you, Nick? Guilty? It's the evidence that tells the tale in any case, Patsy. If we could find the party who has the missing fielding jewels... It would look pretty grim for that party. Yes, it wouldn't look good, that's sure. Oh, Nick, look at the time. Ah, oh, 5.50. In six hours and ten minutes, an innocent man may be electrocuted. Oh, no, Patsy. No innocent man will be electrocuted for a crime he didn't do while my name's Nick Carter. And here's our first stop, Patsy. His old tenement house. Laura Waldron lives here. <laughs> You're very nice to come to see me, especially today. Mrs. Waldron, this is my assistant, Patsy Bourne. How do you do, Miss Bourne? Hello, Mrs. Waldron. Won't you two sit down? Here, let me dust the chair. Oh, no, no, don't. It's perfectly all right. Since Johnny's been away, I haven't been as good a housekeeper as I used to be. I'm no heart for it anymore. Mrs. Waldron, I came to see you because... I know you went to see my husband. I heard on the radio. Yes, that's right. But it's too late to get Johnny off, isn't it? Besides, we don't have any money to pay a famous detective. Mrs. Waldron, the only thing Nick Carter ever asks is that justice be done. Now, Mrs. Waldron, tell me about Johnny. His habits, what he likes, what he doesn't like. Johnny's good, Mr. Carter. You see, I know he's innocent. But have you proof, Mrs. Waldron? Proof? No. Just my heart tells me he wouldn't kill anybody. But more than that... I know, because he was with me at the time the police say she was killed. The prosecution tore his alibi to shred. Yes, a wife's testimony doesn't count for much in court. Oh, yet how thankful I am that he was with me that night. But I know he's innocent. You understand what I mean, don't you, Miss Bourne? You understand when I say the world can stand against your man if you know he's right and good and true to you. <laughs> Mrs. Waldron, isn't there any way at all it can be proved that your husband was home with you that night? No. No. You don't think of providing alibis for staying in your own home. It isn't much, I know, but it's ours. Tom Fielding has offered to help me. Now Johnny's going to be... Tom Fielding? You mean the stepson of the woman your husband's convicted of murdering? Yes. In what way is he offered to help you? Money. He knows Johnny isn't a murderer. His testimony in court didn't follow that line, Mrs. Waldron. Of course not. Mr. Fielding had himself to protect. That's right, Nick. 
Feeling was under suspicion. Just this afternoon, he called me again. And where's the jewels, I said to him. If my Johnny did it, where's the jewels and the money? Would I be begging for work if Johnny had done it? You're working now, Mrs. Walden? Day work. Scrubbing up places where they don't ask too many questions. Oh, but I'd mop the streets of this town from one end to the other every day. If Johnny didn't have to die. <laughs> Oh, don't, Mrs. Waldron. Don't cry, please. Please don't cry. You have to excuse me. Just, uh, I can't stand to think. I, I'm counting the minutes and seconds now. Only a few more hours. Johnny will be gone. <coughs> Mrs. Waldron, I'd like to ask you another question. All right. Maybe Nick can save your husband yet, you know. Oh, if he only could. There isn't time left for me to chase down every witness and question them. <laughs> Tell me, Mrs. Walton, whom do you suspect of robbing and murdering your husband's late employer? Who? Oh, Mr. Carter, I have no proof against anyone. I didn't ask if you knew who murdered Mrs. Fielding. I only said, whom do you suspect? But I have no right to suspect him. Right? What do you mean? Well, he's been so kind and offered to help. Tom Fielding. That's who you think did it. Oh, I never dared think it out loud before. <laughs> he was her stepson, you know, but she loved him like her own. Oh, they had their quarrels. Oh, they were just money spent. I'm not saying he did it, only... Only what? You talk to him, Mr. Carter. All right, I will. We'll go right over to the feeling house now. Oh, but you won't find him at home at this hour, Mr. Carter. He's always at the club at this time. I know from when Johnny used to drive for him. That's the old hunt club, isn't it? Yes. Tenth and fifth. Come on, Patsy. Let's hurry. Time's precious. Okay. Goodbye and thank you. I'll be right here waiting and praying you find the guilty man in time to save Johnny. <laughs> There's something puzzling you. What is it? Didn't you think Mrs. Walden's story made sense? Well, it did, and it didn't. But, Nick, doesn't it seem a bit odd for Tom Feeling to offer her money? Yes, if that's true. Well, then her story does make sense. Patsy, it's not what Mrs. Walden said that's bothering me. Something else. Something else? Well, what is it, Nick? I wish I knew. But there's something about her. Something that doesn't fit into the picture in the back of my mind somewhere, but I can't quite get the key to it. And if you ask me, Tom Fielding is the one who could straighten out a lot of things. And he's the man we're going to tackle right now. Well, this hunt club's pretty swanky, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, sir. Can I park your car for you? Fancy place. Still has dawned and important. Oh, I beg your pardon, miss. Our ladies are permitted in the old hunt club. I'm sorry. Well, that lets you out, Patsy. <laughs> I guess it does. You better wait for me here. Yes, I guess I'll have to. Oh, Nick. Hmm? It's 8.15. Only three hours and 45 minutes to go until midnight. Ring again, Nick. Feeling wasn't at his club, so he's got to be home here. Uh-uh. Your womanly intuition isn't working right tonight, Betsy. Not a light in the whole house. I don't think anybody's home. Oh, Mr. Fielding, if you only knew how much time we've wasted looking for you. Well, Patsy, maybe we can uncover enough evidence without seeing Mr. Fielding face to face. What are you going to do? A little high-class lockpicking in the interest of Johnny Waldron and his wife, Laura. There we are. All right, come on in. Stay behind me. Gee, it's dark in here. Shut the door and I'll use my flash. Where are we headed for? The library. Oh. That's the room Mrs. Fielding was killed in, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Let's see. These old houses, the library is usually back this way, off the center hall. Come on. All right. You think there's anybody beside us in the house? I hope not. Ah, here we are. This is the door. This must be it. Mm hmm. Yeah. This is the library. What are we looking for? Well, right now, I'm looking for Mrs. Fielding's safe. Safe? Mm hmm. 
Oh, oh, it, it's behind that portrait of her. That oh. was in the testimony. Yeah, you're right. Thanks, Betsy. Oh, turn on that small lamp, will you? Take a glance at the papers on the desk while I open this safe. Say, Mrs. Fielding held her son and heir down while she was living. He's certainly making up for it now. Look at that wine cabinet. It's filled to the hill with pre-war stuff. Oh, and look at this black market stuff. Half a gold tip cigarette you're throwing. Yes, thank you. I will. That's a shame on you. How'd you feel if Tom Fielding walked in here right now and caught you swiping his expensive cigarettes? Only one, Nick. And for that matter, how would you feel if Mr. Fielding saw you about to open his safe? Oh, Nick! Yes. You okay? Hey, yes, I, I guess so. They shot through that window there. And the bullet went right in the side of the desk here. Oh, we better get out of here, Nick. Now, one minute, Betsy. I have to see what's in this safe. It's almost open now. Well, who do you think shot at us, Mr. Fielding? Oh, Patsy, will you pick that bullet out of the desk? It'll be a handy piece of evidence. All right. So you're taking this attempt to murder us awful lightly, Nick. I don't think it was murder, Betsy. Not murder? No. You were standing by the wine cabinet, not four feet from the window. And I was a perfect target standing here. No, Betsy, I think you'll find somebody was just trying to scare us away. Oh. Well, I got the bullet out. Looks like a thirty-two. Ah, there we are. Patsy. Yes? Look here. The missing jewels. Oh, Nick. Yes, right here in the safe. Oh, Nick, that's wonderful. Hey, Patsy, what are you doing? Oh, I'm getting the DA on the phone for you. You've got the evidence for Johnny Walden's reprieve. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know he wasn't guilty, Nick. Mrs. Walden was telling the truth. Patsy, put down that phone. Yes, Nick. Now, get me police headquarters first. I want a general alarm sent out for Tom Fielding. But Johnny Waldron... I still have two hours, Patsy. If Waldron's innocent, I'll prove it in time to save him from the chair. Nick, why should you want to talk to Mrs. Waldron again when you haven't asked for the reprieve? Only make her feel worse. There's something about her that doesn't add up, Patsy. And I've got to know what it is before I go any further. This is her door, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Nick Carter, your thinking on this case is beyond me. Oh, Patsy, it's hard to explain. And when I don't know myself what the missing link is, how can I explain it to you? But you found the jewels. Tom Fielding had them in his safe. Why, it's obvious, Nick. He didn't get along with his stepmother, and he... Nick, what are you doing? Going to open Mrs. Walden's door? Oh, no, don't do that, Nick. I'm sure she's here. She, she's probably been crying and doesn't want to see anybody. Let me call her first. Mrs. Waldron? Mrs. Waldron? Oh, sorry, Betsy. We haven't any time to waste. Now, let's see. Where's the light switch? Yeah, it's here by the door. Oh, she isn't here. So it seems. Nick. Hmm? Look here. There's a gold tip cigarette in this ashtray, the same kind we saw at Fielding's house. Let's have it. Hmm, no lipstick on it. Kind of pinched in near at the end. He's been here. I never would have believed it of him. Believe what? What well, that a man like Fielding would come to a place like this. Why, a man like that wouldn't get his hands dirty putting them on the doorknob of a hovel like this. Say that again, Patsy. What? Well, a man like Fielding wouldn't dirty his hands on the doorknob of a place like this. I got it. Patsy, you just gave me the key I've been looking for. Come on. We've got to get back to Fielding's library. It'll be another murder. <laughs> Well, Patsy, there are times when having a siren on this car comes in handy. And tonight's one of them. Hope we're in time. Do you think the police have picked feeling up here, or do you think you'd be at his home? He's at home. I'll bet my bottom dollar on that. Nick, do you know what time it is? Stop worrying about the time and come on. I'm right with you. The place is still dark. There's a little light shining in the hallway. Now, he's here, all right. Why don't you step, Patsy? Don't worry about me. I slipped the latch in the front door when we left. Let's see if it's been bolted. No, still open. All right, come on. Where do you think he is? The library, probably. Oh, I hear someone there. Yeah, they're both here. Oh, that's Mrs. Walton's voice. Open the door, Nick. The door's locked. I'll try to pick it. Oh, Nick, hurry. I am hurrying. Oh, thank heaven you came. He was just going to shoot me. I got the gun away from him and... 
Oh, you shot him. Yes, Mr. Carter. But it was self-defense. Anyone can see that. Oh, I'm so sorry to you, Mrs. Walton. It was worth it. It was worth it. Now Johnny will be safe. He won't have to die in the chair. Oh, Nick, you've only got seven minutes to call it. Seven minutes to twelve. Hurry, Mr. Carter. Just a minute. Now. Calm yourself, Mrs. Walton. Here, have a cigarette. A cigarette? All right. May I light it for you? Thanks. Wait a minute till I get my cigarette holder out of my bag. So, you do use a cigarette holder. I thought so. Nick, the time is getting awfully short for your call to the DA. I'm not going to make that call. Why, Nick, not going to make it. No, Mrs. Waldron. It was a nice frame-up you and your husband tried against Tom Fielding, but it didn't work. Frame-up? Yes, frame-up. You and Johnny staged this whole thing to get him a last-minute reprieve. It was pretty clever, but you made a couple of mistakes. For example, this gold tip cigarette butt I found in your apartment tonight. What about it? When I found this butt in your apartment, all pinched in at the end from having been smoked in a holder, I knew you'd lied about not having seen Tom Fielding. These particular cigarettes are made to order for him. I didn't leave it there. I couldn't be sure of that until I found that you used a cigarette holder. Then I knew I was right. You did leave it here. Go on, prove it. Another thing. Patsy. Hmm? Take a look at Mrs. Walden's hands. My hands? Why, they're beautiful. Beautifully manicured. Exactly. Mrs. Walden, with hands like yours, you don't scrub floors for a living. That dingy apartment of yours is merely a front. Look out, Nick. Gun, huh? Yes, and I know how to use this gun, too, and I'm going to. Oh! So sorry to hate you, Mrs. Walden. Betsy. Yes? Take a look at Tom Fielding. See if he's still alive. Right, Nick. You haven't got anything on me. You can't get he's me. He's breathing, Nick. Good. Phone for an ambulance, quick. Okay. Oh, but Nick, can you prove this charge against Mrs. Walden? Can you be positive she and her husband framed Fielding? Not yet, Patsy, but I'm so sure I'm right that I'll risk my reputation on it. But Nick, as long as there's the slightest doubt about it, shouldn't you call the DA and give Johnny Walden the benefit of the doubt? No, Patsy. As far as I'm concerned, there's no doubt whatsoever. I'm so sure I'll even risk Johnny's life on it. <laughs> Nick Carter's office. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Yes. Yes. It was. He is. Oh, I see. Well, thank you, Lieutenant. Yes, I'll tell Nick. Goodbye. Was that the report from police headquarters, Spencer? Yes, it was Lieutenant Riley. And you were right, Nick. That gun you took from Mrs. Walden was registered in Johnny's name. And she lied about taking the gun away from Fielding and shooting him in self-defense. Fielding's fingerprints weren't on the gun anywhere, but hers were all over it. Did they check with the bullet when you picked out of that desk? The one that was fired at us? Yes, and it came from the same gun. Fine. And what about Fielding? Did Riley say? He's going to live. What's more, he regained consciousness long enough to make a statement. Good. Oh, Nick, that Mrs. Walden was certainly clever. She was planning the jewels and Fielding's safe when he came in the room and caught her. So she... She held him at the point of her gun... And knocked him out, bound his wrists and ankles, gagged him, and hid him away in another room. What? How did you know that? Very simple, Betsy. The marks we'd been tied were still in his wrists when I examined him, and oh. also there was a bump on his head. Nick, you're always holding out on me. And one other thing. What made you think Fielding's life would be in danger way back when we were in Mrs. Walden's apartment the second time? Curious, huh? Well, Patsy, after your inspired remark about hands, I suddenly realized what it was about Mrs. Walden that puzzled me. It was her hands. I knew that with hands like hers, she couldn't be earning her living scrubbing floors. Oh, I see. And if she were lying about that, it was very probable she was lying about everything. And the whole thing was a plot to make Fielding look guilty. But why should that make you suddenly afraid that something might be going to happen to Fielding? Patsy, if she and Johnny were so anxious to get Johnny a reprieve that they were willing to give up the jewels to make it look as if Fielding were really the guilty man, it was entirely possible that she might go further and kill Fielding and try to make it look as if he killed himself. But how would that help Johnny Waldron? Well, if it was done right, it would look as if he were remorseful at having let Johnny take the blame. Well, she almost got away with it. But she didn't, because Nick arrived in the nick of time. You're a wonderful detective, Mr. Carter. And so, ladies and gentlemen, at midnight last night, Johnny Waldron went to the electric chair to pay for the crime of having murdered Mrs. Cornelius Fielding. His dramatic last-minute attempt to get a reprieve failed, thanks to the quick action of that master detective, Nick Carter. In those few short hours that Carter was actually on the case, he found the missing jewels, uncovered a well-laid plot between Johnny and his wife to pin the murder on Tom Fielding and save Fielding's life. Tom Fielding and the entire community owe a debt of gratitude to Nick Carter. This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at this time by WOR Mutual. Well, Nick, what happens in your next week's story? I want to tell you the story of the time that I quite accidentally stumbled onto a terrible crime. Or to be more correct, 
I stumbled onto evidence that a terrible crime had been committed. That doesn't sound like a very unusual thing for you to do. Except for one little fact, Mr. Ripley. We didn't know where or when the crime had been committed. In spite of the fact that we heard the story of the murder from the victim's own lips. As a matter of fact, we even heard the murder committed. And we were powerless to do anything about it. If you're trying to make me curious about it... We are. You're certainly succeeding. Well, it's as unusual a tale as I've had the pleasure of telling in a long while, I assure you. So, until next week, so long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Conray. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week, at this same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled Records of Death. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Unclaimed Box. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Saturday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern Wartime. And don't forget that the adventures of Nick's adopted son, Chick Carter, are broadcast over most of these stations Mondays through Fridays at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. of all manhunters, the detective's ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... Nine Hours to Live. For Nick Carter and the Death House Mystery. And now, a late news bulletin. Nine hours from now, at the stroke of midnight... Johnny Waldron, the blonde-faced killer convicted of the murder of Mrs. Cornelius Fielding, will go to the chair. Just 30 minutes ago, the condemned man made a last request. But Johnny Waldron did not ask for a sumptuous last meal in the tradition of the condemned. Nor did he ask to see his nearest and dearest relative, his wife, Laura. No, Johnny Waldron's request was for something much more dramatic. He asked to see the great detective, Nick Carter. Now, just what this last-minute conference means is anybody's guess. Perhaps a reprieve for Waldron. Perhaps a clue as to what happened to the fielding jewels, which up to now have not even been found. At any rate, the master detective, Nick Carter, has consented to talk with Waldron and is probably at this very moment entering Death House Row. Keep tuned to this station for further dramatic developments. He's in number one. We moved him to number one this morning. You see, it's a shorter ways to walk to the chair of number one. Is he all ready to go? Yeah, the barber was in and shaved his head and legs about an hour ago. How are you taking him? Oh, there ain't been a peep out of him. Don't want nothing to eat. Don't want a chaplain. Nothing at all. The only request he's made is to see you. <laughs> Funny time to ask to see a detective, huh? And if you don't mind my asking, Mr. Carter... What made a big shot like you decide to see him? Well, maybe I'm curious to you know what's in his mind. Or maybe I'm just a softy about a fellow who's going to die in a few hours. Well, I don't believe that you've got any sympathy for a criminal. Uh, not you. Not when a man's a killer. Well, here we are. Here's your company, Waldron. Oh, hi. Hello, Waldron. Oh, Mr. Carter. you got five minutes. All right, guys. Well, Johnny? Oh, so you did come. Gosh, I was afraid you wouldn't. Well, I must admit, I was surprised when the warden called me and said you wanted to see me. Yeah, I, I imagine you were. 
see, it was sure nice of you to come. Let's skip the formalities, Johnny. Time's too short for chit-chat. Come to the point. What's on your mind? Mr. Carter, you think I'm guilty, don't you? Well, didn't follow your case too closely. But you had a fair trial. You were found guilty. What would you have me believe? I'd like to have you believe that, that I'm innocent. Pretty late in the game to convince anybody of that, Johnny. Oh, I'm not looking for a last-minute reprieve. That isn't what I asked you to come out here for. When I got word a little while ago that the governor refused my last request for a reprieve, I oh, I just made up my mind that I'd only be kidding myself if I hoped any longer. Why did you want to see me, Johnny? Mr. Carter, I, I know I haven't got a chance. I'm, I'm going to be gone in, in just a few hours now. But I could go a lot easier if, if I thought that... That maybe someday the world would know the truth. They'd know that, that Johnny Waldron was innocent. Johnny, if I thought you were innocent, I'd start the wheels turning right now to get your reprieve. Oh, wait. Let, let me finish, Mr. Carter. I know you don't believe me. Nobody does. I guess I couldn't expect you to believe me after the way things went at the trial. But sitting here in death row, waiting, the idea came to me that, that maybe Nick Carter would show him someday. Of course, I'd be gone, but... Well, you see, there's there's Laura, my wife. She's going to keep on living, and and it'll be hard for her. I suppose she believes you're innocent. Oh, she, she's stuck by me swell. She's she's a wonderful woman, and I don't want the world to look on her as, as the widow of a murderer. Mr. Carter, all I'm asking is that, that after I'm gone, in your spare time, will you try to prove that they executed the wrong man? Just for my wife's sake. Johnny, if you're innocent, who do you think did rob the Fielding safe and kill Mrs. Fielding? I don't know, Mr. Carter. What? There's nobody you even suspect? Well, the only one that... that... No. No, I, I, I'm not going to accuse somebody I'm not sure of. I've only got a few more hours to live, and I, I don't... If you want... want me to do anything for you, Johnny, you better tell me everything you can about this. No. No. You'll find it for yourself once you start looking. <laughs> Well, I've got to have some kind of evidence to go on it. I don't have any. Cards were stacked so well against me, but... Go see Laura. She's never stopped working for me. Maybe she knows more by now. Look here. If that's the case, why haven't you had a lawyer working for you right up to the last minute? Uh, lawyers. I never had that kind of do. Oh, a couple of shysters came around thinking maybe I had the feeling jewels tucked away someplace. When they found out they weren't going to get a cut, they faded pretty fast. Even if you decide to do anything for me, Mr. Carter, I, I wouldn't be able to pay you for your trouble. You, you'd have to do it just just as a favor to a dying man. You don't know where the jewels are? I, no, Mr. Carter. How could I know? I, I didn't do that job. Look, you, you go see Laura. She'll tell you whatever she can. All right. Time's up, Mr. Carter. All right, Garrett. Well, Johnny, I'll look into your case. I I don't suppose you believe me. <laughs> I bet he's been telling you an innocent man is being sent to the chair, huh? He tells that to everybody. Did it ever occur to you, guard, that he might be telling the truth? No. Why? Well, so long, no. Johnny. Good luck. Oh, thanks for coming, Mr. Carter. And, and, and thanks for whatever you can do for me, sir. I'd very much like to know what happened to those fielding jewels. Huh? Oh, 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 yes. Well... Maybe they'll turn up while you're investigating. Think so? I wonder. Say, guard, uh, how, how long is it until I... Eight hours, Johnny. Just eight hours more. Nick Carter's office. Oh, Patsy, this is Nick. Oh, Nick, thank heaven you called. This place is a madhouse. The office is filled with reporters. The newspaper and broadcasting companies have been telephoning. And the district attorney has been trying to reach you. And what's the trouble? They want to know if you're going to try to get a reprieve for Johnny Waldron. Hmm? The DA said he'd stick around his office all evening. And he's contacted the governor, and he'll be on tap ready. Reprieve? Oh, great heaven, I just talked to the fellow. I don't have any evidence, none whatsoever. What's the matter with the DA? Well, when Nick Carter goes to work on a case, even at the zero hour, something usually pops. I'll tell him to hang on to the hats a while. And you, Patsy, go up to the courthouse and get a transcript from the Walden trial. Dig up what you can out of our files about Walden. I'm heading back from state's prison right away. Meet you in front of the office. All right, Nick. But we're going to have to work fast. They throw the switch in exactly seven hours and 40 minutes. Walter.
Cameron was really hired as a chauffeur. It was brought out of the trial that he ingratiated himself with the old lady every chance he got. Oh? You know, Mrs. Sealing was an invalid. Aldrin used to carry her up and down stairs and waited on her and all that sort of thing. He was inside the house a great deal. Then, um, let's see now. Oh, the gun was traced to Mrs. Sealing's stepson, Tom Fielding. But the prints on the gun were Waldron's. Her stepson lived there with her? Yes, just the two of them. Mm-hmm. Waldron and all the other servants slept out and reported for work in the mornings at 8. When was the body found? On a Thursday night at 10 o'clock, the library of the house. Tom Fielding came home from his club and found her. The safe was open and the jewels and money gone. Of course, any of the servants, as well as Tom Fielding, might have known the combination of the safe. Mrs. Fielding often opened it in front of all of them. The defense harked on that at the trial, but Waldron's prints on the gun and his alibi being so flimsy cooked his goose. I see. I see. How did Waldron strike you, Nick? Guilty? It's the evidence that tells the tale in any case, Patsy. If we could find the party who has the missing fielding jewels... It would look pretty grim for that party. Yes, it wouldn't look good, that's sure. Oh, Nick, look at the time. Yeah, 5.50. In six hours and ten minutes, an innocent man may be electrocuted. Oh, no, Patsy. No innocent man will be electrocuted for a crime he didn't do while my name's Nick Carter. And here's our first stop, Patsy. His old tenement house. Laura Waldron lives here. You're very nice to come to see me, especially today. Mrs. Waldron, this is my assistant, Patsy Bourne. How do you do, Miss Bourne? Hello, Mrs. Waldron. Won't you two sit down? Here, let me dust the chair. Oh, no, no, don't. It's perfectly all right. Since Johnny's been away, I haven't been as good a housekeeper as I used to be. I'm no heart for it anymore. Mrs. Waldron, I came to see you because... I know you went to see my husband. I heard on the radio. Yes, that's right. But it's too late to get Johnny off, isn't it? Besides, we don't have any money to pay a famous detective. Mrs. Waldron, the only thing Nick Carter ever asks is that justice be done. Now, Mrs. Waldron, tell me about Johnny. His habits, what he likes, what he doesn't like. Johnny's good, Mr. Carter. You see, I know he's innocent. But have you proof, Mrs. Waldron? Proof? No. Just my heart tells me he wouldn't kill anybody. But more than that... I know, because he was with me at the time the police say she was killed. The prosecution tore his alibi to shreds. Yes, a wife's testimony doesn't count for much in court. Oh, yet how thankful I am that he was with me that night. But I know he's innocent. You understand what I mean, don't you, Miss Bourne? You understand when I say the world can stand against your man if you know he's right and good and true to you. <laughs> Mrs. Waldron, isn't there any way at all it can be proved that your husband was home with you that night? No. No. You don't think of providing alibis for staying in your own home. It isn't much, I know, but it's ours. Tom Fielding has offered to help me. Now Johnny's going to be... Tom Fielding? You mean the stepson of the woman your husband's convicted of murdering? Yes. In what way is he offered to help you? Money. He knows Johnny isn't a murderer. His testimony in court didn't follow that line, Mrs. Waldron. Of course not. Mr. Feeling had himself to protect. That's right, Nick. Feeling was under suspicion. Just this afternoon he called me again. And where's the jewels, I said to him. If my Johnny did it, where's the jewels and the money? Would I be begging for work if Johnny had done it? You're working now, Mrs. Waldron? Day work. Scrubbing up places where they don't ask too many questions. Oh, but I'd mop the streets of this town from one end to the other every day. Johnny didn't have to die. Oh, don't, Mrs. Waldron. Don't cry, please. Please don't cry. You have to excuse me. Just, uh, I can't stand to think. I'm counting the minutes and seconds now. Only a few more hours, Johnny will be gone. <laughs> Mrs. Waldron, I'd like to ask you another question. All right. Maybe Nick can save your husband yet, you know. Oh, if he only could. There isn't time left for me to chase down every witness and question them. <laughs> Tell me, Mrs. Waldron, whom do you suspect of robbing and murdering your husband's late employer? Who? Oh, Mr. Carter, 
I have no proof against anyone. I didn't ask if you knew who murdered Mrs. Fielding. I only said, whom do you suspect? But I have no right to suspect him. Right? What do you mean? Well, he's been so kind and offered to help. Tom Fielding. That's who you think did it. Oh, I never dared think it out loud before. <laughs> he was her stepson, you know, but she loved him like her own. Oh, they had their quarrels. Oh, they were just money spent. I'm not saying he did it, only... Only what? You talk to him, Mr. Carter. All right, I will. We'll go right over to the feeling house now. Oh, but you won't find him at home at this hour, Mr. Carter. He's always at the club at this time. I know from when Johnny used to drive for him. That's the old hunt club, isn't it? Yes. Tenth and fifth. Come on, Patsy. Let's hurry. Time's precious. Okay. Goodbye and thank you. I'll be right here waiting and praying you find the guilty man in time to save Johnny. There's something puzzling you. What is it? Didn't you think Mrs. Walden's story made sense? Well, it did, and it didn't. But, Nick, doesn't it seem a bit odd for Tom Feeling to offer her money? Yes, if that's true. Well, then her story does make sense. Patsy, it's not what Mrs. Walden said that's bothering me. Something else. Something else? Well, what is it, Nick? I wish I knew. But there's something about her Something that doesn't fit into the picture in the back of my mind somewhere, but I can't quite get the key to it. And if you ask me, Tom Fielding is the one who could straighten out a lot of things. And he's the man we're going to tackle right now. Well, this hunt club's pretty swanky, isn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Can I park your car for you? Fancy place. Still has door and portals. Oh, I beg your pardon, miss. Our ladies are permitted in the old hunt club. I'm sorry. Well, that lets you out, Patsy. <laughs> I guess it does. You better wait for me here. Yes, I guess I'll have to. Oh, Nick. Hmm? It's 8.15. Only three hours and 45 minutes to go until midnight. Ring again, Nick. Feeling wasn't at his club, so he's got to be home here. Uh Uh-uh. Your womanly intuition isn't working right tonight, Betsy. Not a light in the whole house. I don't think anybody's home. Oh, Mr. Fielding, if you only knew how much time we've wasted looking for you. Well, Patsy, maybe we can uncover enough evidence without seeing Mr. Fielding face to face. What are you going to do? A little high-class lockpicking in the interest of Johnny Waldron and his wife, Laura. There we are. All right, come on in. Stay behind me. Gee, it's dark in here. Shut the door and I'll use my flash. Where are we headed for? The library. Oh. That's the room Mrs. Fielding was killed in, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Let's see. These old houses, the library is usually back this way, off the center hall. Come on. All right. You think there's anybody beside us in the house? I hope not. Ah, here we are. This is the door. This must be it. Mm hmm. Yeah. This is the library. What are we looking for? Well, right now, I'm looking for Mrs. Fielding's safe. Safe? Mm hmm. Safe. Oh, oh, it's, it's behind that portrait up here. That oh. was in the testimony. Yeah, you're right. Thanks, Betsy. Oh, turn on that small lamp, will you? Take a glance at the papers on the desk while I open this safe. Say, Mrs. Fielding held her son and heir down while she was living. He's certainly making up for it now. Look at that wine cabinet. It's filled to the hill with pre-war stuff. Oh, and look at this black market stuff. Half a gold-tip cigarette was going. Yes, thank you. I will. That's a shame on you. How'd you feel if Tom Fielding walked in here right now and caught you swiping his expensive cigarettes? Only one, Nick. And for that matter, how would you feel if Mr. Fielding saw you about to open his safe? Oh, Nick! You okay? Yes, I I guess so. They shot through that window there. The bullet went right in the side of the desk here. Oh, we better get out of here, Nick. Now, one minute, Betsy. Got to see what's in this safe. It's almost open now. Well, who do you think shot at us, Mr. Fielding? Oh, Patsy, will you pick that bullet out of the desk? It'll be a handy piece of evidence. All right. Say, you're taking this attempt to murder us awful lightly, Nick. I don't think it was murder, Patsy. Not murder? No. You were standing by the wine cabinet, not four feet from the window. And I was a perfect target standing here. 
No, Betsy, I think you'll find somebody was just trying to scare us away. Oh. Well, I got the bullet out. Looks like a thirty-two. Ah, there we are. Betsy. Yes? Look here. The missing jewels. Oh, Nick. Yes, right here in the safe. Oh, Nick, that's wonderful. Hey, Patsy, what are you doing? Oh, I'm getting the DA on the phone for you. You've got the evidence for Johnny Walden's reprieve. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know he wasn't guilty, Nick. Mrs. Walden was telling the truth. Patsy, put down that phone. Yes, Nick. Now, get me police headquarters first. I want a general alarm sent out for Tom Fielding. But Johnny Waldron. I still have two hours, Patsy. If Waldron's innocent, I'll prove it in time to save him from the chair. Why should you want to talk to Mrs. Waldron again when you haven't asked for the reprieve? Only make her feel worse. There's something about her that doesn't add up, Patsy. And I've got to know what it is before I go any further. This is her door, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Nick Carter, your thinking on this case is beyond me. Well, Patsy, it's hard to explain. And when I don't know myself what the missing link is, how can I explain it to you? But you found the jewels. Tom Feeling had them in his safe. Why, it's obvious, Nick. He didn't get along with his stepmother, and he... Nick, what are you doing? Going to open Mrs. Walden's door? Oh, no, don't do that, Nick. I'm sure she's here. She, she's probably been crying and doesn't want to see anybody. Let me call her first. Mrs. Walden? Mrs. Walden? Oh, sorry, Betty. We haven't any time to waste. Now, let's see. Where's the light switch? Yeah, it's here by the door. Oh, she isn't here. So it seems. Nick. Hmm? Look here. There's a gold tip cigarette in this ashtray, the same kind we saw at Fielding's house. Let's have it. Hmm. No lipstick on it. Kind of pinched in near at the end. He's been here. I never would have believed it of him. Believe what? Well, that a man like Fielding would come to a place like this. Why, a man like that wouldn't get his hands dirty putting them on the doorknob of a hovel like this. Say that again, Patsy. What? Well, a man like Fielding wouldn't dirty his hands on the doorknob of a place like this. I got it. Patsy, you just gave me the key I've been looking for. Come on. We've got to get back to Feeling's Library. There'll be another murder. You know, Patsy, there are times when having a siren on this car comes in handy. And tonight's one of them. Hope we're in time. Do you think the police have picked Feeling up yet, or do you think you'd be at his home? He's at home. I'll bet my bottom dollar on that. Nick, do you know what time it is? Stop worrying about the time and come on. I'm right with you. The place is still dark. There's a little light shining in the hallway. Now, he's here, all right. Why don't you step, Betsy? Don't worry about me. I slipped the latch in the front door when we left. Let's see if it's been bolted. No, still open. All right, come on. Where do you think he is? The library, probably. Why, oh, here's someone, Nick. Yeah, they're both here. Oh, that's Mrs. Walton's voice. Open the door, Nick. The door's locked. I'll try to pick it. I am hurrying. Oh, he's killed her. There. Oh, Mrs. Walden. Oh, thank heaven you came. He was just going to shoot me. I got the gun away from him. And... Oh, oh, you I... shot him. Yes, Mr. Carter. But it was self-defense. Anyone can see that. Oh, I'm so sorry for you, Mrs. Walden. It was worth it. It was worth it. Now Johnny will be safe. He won't have to die in the chair. Oh, Nick, you've only got seven minutes to call it. Seven minutes to twelve. Hurry, Mr. Carter. Just a minute. Now. Calm yourself, Mrs. Walden. Here, have a cigarette. A cigarette? All right. Let's... May I light it for you? Thanks. Wait a minute till I get my cigarette holder out of my bag. So, you do use a cigarette holder. I thought so. Nick, the time is getting awfully short for your call to the DA. I'm not going to make that call. Why, Nick, not going to make it. No, Mrs. Waldron. It was a nice frame-up you and your husband tried against Tom Fielding, but it didn't work. Frame-up? Yes, frame-up. You and Johnny staged this whole thing to get him a last-minute reprieve. It was pretty clever, but you made a couple of mistakes. For example, this gold-tipped cigarette butt I found in your apartment tonight. What about it? When I found this butt in your apartment, all pinched in at the end from having been smoked in a holder, I knew you'd lied about not having seen Tom Fielding. These particular cigarettes are made to order for him. I didn't leave it there. I couldn't be sure of that until I found that you used a cigarette holder. Then I knew I was right. You did leave it here. Go on, prove it. Another thing. Patsy. Hmm? Take a look at Mrs. Walden's hands. My hands? Why, they're beautiful. Beautifully manicured. Exactly. Mrs. Walden, with hands like yours, you don't scrub floors for a living. That dingy apartment of yours is merely a front. Look out, Nick. Gun. Huh? Yes, and I know how to use this gun, too, and I'm going to. Oh! 
So sorry to hit you, Mrs. Walden. Bessie. Yes? Take a look at Tom Fielding. See if he's still alive. Right, Nick. You haven't got anything on me. You can't get he's me for anything, Nick. Good. Go on for an ambulance, quick. Okay. Oh, but Nick, can you prove this charge against Mrs. Walden? Can you be positive she and her husband framed Fielding? Not yet, Patsy, but I'm so sure I'm right that I'll risk my reputation on it. But Nick, as long as there's the slightest doubt about it, shouldn't you call the DA and give Johnny Walden the benefit of the doubt? No, Patsy. As far as I'm concerned, there's no doubt whatsoever. I'm so sure I'll even risk Johnny's life on it. <laughs> Nick Carter's office. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Yes. Yes. It was. He is. Well, I see. Well, thank you, Lieutenant. Yes, I'll tell Nick. Goodbye. Was that the report from police headquarters, Spencer? Yes, it was Lieutenant Riley. And you were right, Nick. That gun you took from Mrs. Walden was registered in Johnny's name. And she lied about taking the gun away from Fielding and shooting him in self-defense. Fielding's fingerprints weren't on the gun anywhere, but hers were all over it. Did they check with the bullet when you picked out of that desk? The one that was fired at us? Yes, and it came from the same gun. Fine. And what about Fielding? Did Riley say? He's going to live. What's more, he regained consciousness long enough to make a statement. Good. Oh, Nick, that Mrs. Walden was certainly clever. She was planning the jewels and Fielding's safe when he came in the room and caught her. So she... She held him at the point of her gun... And knocked him out, bound his wrists and ankles, gagged him, and hid him away in another room. What? How did you know that? Very simple, Betsy. The marks we'd been tied were still in his wrists when I examined him, and oh. also there was a bump on his head. Nick, you're always holding out on me. And one other thing. What made you think Fielding's life would be in danger way back when we were in Mrs. Walden's apartment the second time? Curious, huh? Well, Patsy, after your inspired remark about hands, I suddenly realized what it was about Mrs. Walden that puzzled me. It was her hands. I knew that with hands like hers, she couldn't be earning her living scrubbing floors. Oh, I see. And if she were lying about that, it was very probable she was lying about everything. And the whole thing was a plot to make Fielding look guilty. But why should that make you suddenly afraid that something might be going to happen to Fielding? Patsy, if she and Johnny were so anxious to get Johnny a reprieve that they were willing to give up the jewels to make it look as if Fielding were really the guilty man, it was entirely possible that she might go further and kill Fielding and try to make it look as if he killed himself. But how would that help Johnny Waldron? Well, if it was done right, it would look as if he were remorseful at having let Johnny take the blame. Well, she almost got away with it. But she didn't, because Nick arrived in the nick of time. You're a wonderful detective, Mr. Carter. And so, ladies and gentlemen, at midnight last night, Johnny Waldron went to the electric chair to pay for the crime of having murdered Mrs. Cornelius Fielding. His dramatic last-minute attempt to get a reprieve failed, thanks to the quick action of that master detective, Nick Carter. In those few short hours that Carter was actually on the case, he found the missing jewels, uncovered a well-laid plot between Johnny and his wife to pin the murder on Tom Fielding and save Fielding's life. Tom Fielding and the entire community owe a debt of gratitude to Nick Carter. This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at this time by WOR Mutual. Well, Nick, what happens in your next week's story? I want to tell you the story of the time that I quite accidentally stumbled onto a terrible crime. Or to be more correct, I stumbled onto evidence that a terrible crime had been committed. That doesn't sound like a very unusual thing for you to do. Except for one little fact, Mr. Ripley. We didn't know where or when the crime had been committed. In spite of the fact that we heard the story of the murder from the victim's own lips. As a matter of fact, we even heard the murder committed. And we were powerless to do anything about it. If you're trying to make me curious about it... We are. You're certainly succeeding. Well, it's as unusual a tale as I've had the pleasure of telling in a long while, I assure you. So, until next week, so long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Conray. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week, at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled Records of Death. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Unclaimed Box.
This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Saturday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern Wartime. And don't forget that the adventures of Nick's adopted son, Chick Carter, are broadcast over most of these stations Mondays through Fridays at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Mr. Sweet, that sort of thing is entirely out of my line. Yes, I suppose it is, Mr. Carter, but after all, you are our official investigator. All right, all right. I'll have one of my men take care of it. Now tell me again what you want me to do. One of our clients is being sued as a result of an automobile accident in which a woman was very severely injured. Our client got the name of one witness, but another witness got away before he could find out who he was. Now, our client says he was a very tall, thin chap with red hair, probably in his late 20s. A bystander told him that he thought this man lived just a couple of blocks away. That's all we know about him. But his testimony is extremely important to us in our defense of the case. We must find him at once. All right, Mr. Sweet, we'll find him. Where was the collision? Corner of Boylston Avenue and second place on the north side. And this red-haired young man lives a couple of blocks from there in some unknown direction? That's what we believe, Mr. Carter. All right, all right. I'll send Mr. McGlynn out at once. Thank you. As soon as we have something definite, I'll let you know. So began a case the like of which had never been encountered by Nick Carter, Master Detective. A search for a missing witness seemed like a simple routine job. But Nick didn't know about the two old ladies who lived in the little house on the edge of town. You'll learn all about it in The Case of the Little Old Ladies. You say you don't know nobody was right here? No, I don't. Uh, keep on trying. Of all the jobs for a great detective like me, going from door to door looking for a guy who probably don't even exist. I never knew Nick to fall for such a dumb stunt before, and he had to wish it on me. I don't know why I don't quit. Forty-seven houses I've been to. Nobody ever seen a guy like I'm looking for. But I heard about every kind of fellow, but the kind I want. If yes? I could... Who is it, please? Good morning. I wonder if you can tell me anything about a tall, thin young man, about 26, 28 years old, with red hair. Well, now, let me see. I know almost everybody in this neighborhood. We've lived here a great many years. Mm. If you'll come in, I'll ask my sister if she recalls such a person. Oh, now, ma'am, I don't want to put you to no trouble. No trouble at all. We'll be glad to help you if we can. Do come in, please. Well, all right. Of course, I want to find this fellow, so if you can help... Of course you do. It is. Yes? Will you come here a minute, dear? What is it, Mary? Can I... Oh, Edith, this is Mr... Uh, Mr. Waldo McGlynn, ma'am. Uh, Chief Assistant to Nick Carter. <laughs> Mr. McGlynn. How do you do, Mr. McGlynn? How are you, ma'am? Mr. McGlynn says he's looking for a tall, thin young man with red hair, about 26 or 28 years old. Do we know such a man? Well, now let me see. Uh, there was James Bond. He used to live down the block next to Moshe's. But he moved away last year. His hair was really almost blonde, dear. Do you suppose he could mean Walter Castle? Oh, dear sister, he must be near at 35. I suppose you're right, Edith. Uh, how about young Ed Terrence? He lives over on the next street. 
Oh, no, sister. He's short. Almost as short as Cousin Elmer is. Mm, so he is. Oh, look, ladies. It's awful good of you to take all this trouble just to help me find this young man, but I don't no, know what to... trouble at all, Mr. McGlynn. We just don't seem to be able to... Mary, know. Uh, maybe Mr. McGlynn would like a cigar while he's waiting. Of course. I'll get him one. They're in the box on the table behind him. Oh, no, but... don't get up, Mr. McGlynn. I'll get it for you. <laughs> I, I hate to have you doing all this for me, ladies. If you'll Mr. just... Mr. McGlynn. Don't move. Just sit where you are. What in the name this of... This is a gun you feel on the back of your neck. And if you don't stay very quiet, it'll go off. Well, and I... you'll never find this young man you're not looking for. Not looking for? Uh, shall I tie him up now, Mary? Yes, Edith. Tie him up right in his chair so he won't have to move at all. Oh. And tight enough so he can't move. <laughs> very well, Mary. I brought the rope as we planned. Oh, but look, look here, ladies. I just want to find a fellow You who... can't fool. Us, Mr. McGlynn, we know why you're here. You came here to try to trap us into a confession. But we were too smart for you. Now that you've found out where we live, we'll have to go away, of course. That's why we have to tie you up so you can't follow us. Oh, Mary, Bill isn't going to like this. He trusted us and now look what has happened. We've failed him. I know it. I can't imagine how this man found out, but I'm afraid Bill will never forgive us, sister. What in the name of all the Tony are you dames talking about? You know well enough, Mr. McGlynn. You don't have to ask us what we've done. If you didn't know, why are you here? There, now, there. He can't get out of that, I'm sure. Oh, look, ladies. Nick Carter ain't going to like this. Not at all. He says I always get things balled up, and now he's... Oh, don't you, get... you worry, Mr. McGlynn. He can't blame you. We're just too clever for you and your Mr. Carter. Uh, come, sister. We must pack in the... Is it that all good thieves say, oh, yes, we must pack and scram. There you are, Waldo, free as a bird. Oh, thanks, Cubby Boy. Oh, dear, can't move. I'm as stiff as a board. Ah, oh, you'll be all right in a minute or two. <laughs> Now, listen, Waldo. You say these two old ladies tied you up so as to give them time to move out? Yeah, that's what they said, Nick. They thought I had the goods on them for something I didn't know nothing about. Well, couldn't you guess what that something was from what they said? Yeah, uh, not a single guess could I give, Nick. Why, they was altogether too cagey for me. Oh. One of them said something about thieves, but uh, that was all. Oh, by the way, Nick, I forgot to ask you, how did you happen to find me here? That was easy. Patsy told us what route you were planning to follow, we followed you. Oh. You had called at the house on the left, but you never got to the one on the right. This house being empty, it was a good bet that you were here. Nick unlocked the door, and here you were, waiting for us. Waiting for you? And what else could I be doing but wait? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you and your bum jokes. Now listen, brother, you listen. There's something going on here that's bigger than a lost witness, and I'm going to find out what it is. But what can we do, Nick? Waldo doesn't know what it's all about, and the old ladies have gone. So what do we have to go on? Nothing. We've got to find something. And the best place to start looking is right here in this house. So search every room thoroughly. Don't miss a thing. I'll get busy, both of you. And all you found was that burned paper? That's all, Patsy. Uh, and what good that is, I'm darned if I can see. When a piece of paper is burned as bad as that was, so you can't even see if it had writing on it or not, I give up. Oh, that's where science comes in, Waldo. Uh, if science can tell Nick what was on that paper, I'll take me hat off to it. Even old Sim Carter couldn't do that. The use of infrared light and reading the writing on a burned paper is one of the new developments that oh, have come Nick, in. Oh, Nick, did you find anything worthwhile? Maybe yes and maybe no. Fortunately, that burned paper we found on the ashtray was a good grade of paper and didn't crumble before I could look it over. Well, what'd you find, Nick? That piece of paper was really two separate pieces of paper. One was a wrapper off a bundle of bills, showing that the package was put up by the first mutual bank on Canal Street and had contained $100, probably in small bills. The other was part of a letter. Oh, well, what did it say? All I could make out was, another month, dear aunts, it'll be safe to use the money. So we... And that's all. Mm, fat lot of help that is. 
Patsy, do we have any record of the first mutual bank being robbed in the last year or so? Oh, I'll, I'll see, Nick. The money this wrapper was on obviously came straight from the bank. No, nothing on the first mutual at all. But the records show there was a payroll robbery about six months ago, hmm. in which the payroll messenger was robbed of $153,000 that came from that bank. What was the firm that was robbed? It was the Brownson Industrial Corporation, just across the river. You know that big plant on Market Street? All right. Let's call on the Brownson Industrial Corporation. I'm going to see this thing through to the end. You want to see me, mister? I do. You're the payroll messenger? It was robbed about six months ago? Who are you? This is Nick Carter. Tell him what you know about it. Oh, okay, yeah. The guards that came with me from the bank left me at the side door of the office building as usual, and I came along inside. There's a short corridor there, about ten feet long, with a turn at the end, leads into the general office. Well, I was just coming to the turn when a couple of old ladies stopped me, and they... Later, Walter, later. You say two old ladies? Yeah. This couple of old ladies stopped me and asked me how to get to the metal shop. I stopped to tell them, when all of a sudden, I got a sack on the back of the head. Knocked me cold. Then what happened? How do I know? I was out cold. And when I came to, the assistant cashier was bending over me, trying to wake me up. My money bag was cut open. The money was gone, every nickel of it. Did anyone else see these two old ladies around? Yeah, yeah, the gate man who let them in. They said they was coming to see their nephew, Walter Bascom, a clerk in the office here. So he let them go by without waiting for an okay. But Bascom never saw him. He says he ain't even got an aunt. And he didn't leave his desk all afternoon. Were they seen after the robbery? Oh, they was out of the gate before the alarm was give out. The gate man saw them go. Can you describe them? Well, they looked like a couple of sweet little old ladies. Maybe like your pet grandma. One was short and chubby. The other was about middle-sized, kind of kind of slender-like. The same, Nick. The very same. You're sure of that, Walter? There couldn't be no mistake, Nick. Look, you didn't find any clues as to who slugged you. No suspects at all? Nah, not a one. But it must have been somebody who works in here. Couldn't have happened like it did no other way. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, so long. Well, Nick, looks as if this is as far as we go. No, Matty, there's just one more chance. Huh? I have the photograph I made of the piece of burned letter we found at the old lady's place. Yeah? If the writer was the thief, it seems very probable. And if he does work here, as that messenger seemed to think... We might compare the writing on the letter with samples of the writing of the employees in the plant. Oh, but, Nick, that would take forever. There are several thousand employees here. Uh, yeah, them two dames would die of old age before we got that job done, like as not. Nick. Yes, Waldo? I just happened to remember. When them two old dames was tying me up, they kept talking about somebody named Bill. Huh? Uh, you sure of that? Sure, I'm sure. They said this Bill was going to be pretty sore at them for getting found out. Oh, Nick, this makes the search for the thief a whole lot easier. Why, sure. We just look at the handwriting of every guy in the plant named William. There may be a lot of them, but it'll be a whole lot easier than checking up on everybody who works it. Well, Waldo, it looks as if you remember that name just in time. Come on. The personnel manager ought to be able to dig up a specimen of this bill's handwriting for us. <laughs> As I regret to say it, it isn't this William either. You mean to say that out of 347 guys named William who signed these employment cards the personnel manager gave us, there ain't one that writes like the sample in the photograph? To the trained eye, there's not one of them that's the same. Oh, oh, Nick, that means the whole theory that an employee stole the money is out the window. Yeah, that leaves us exactly nowhere. Nick! Maybe the guy's name ain't William at all. Uh, Bill could stand for some other name. Why, of course, Walter. That's the answer. It must be. His name was Wilbur or Wilford. Well, come on. Uh, Let's get busy. We only have a few hundred more names to look through. Yes. This is it, all right. Who is it, sure? Wilfred Bergen. Works in the stock room. Mr. Brown, where's the stock room? I'd like to talk to this, Bergen. Uh, it's in the next building, back of this one. You'll probably find him at his desk. It's just to the right of the door. Uh, would you like to have me call him and tell him you want to see him? No, thanks. We don't want to warn him we're coming. We don't want him to get away before we have a talk with him. Boy, that job sure was a neat setup. 
This Bergen watches the messenger, sees how he goes through this little corridor every time he comes back with the payroll, tells the old dames that they're, what they're to do, and it all works out just as slick as grease. Yes, the old lady stopped him in the right place, and Bergen socked him. And they shielded him while he cut open the money bag. And they calmly went home, taking their money with them, probably in one of those shopping bags women carry. And Bergen went back to work, and that was that. Yeah, and they're waiting until the money cools off so they can spend it. Uh-huh. I wonder where they hid it while they're waiting. I hope Bergen will answer that for us. There he is, Nick. Uh-oh. Yeah. Are you Wilfred Bergen? That's right. Bergen, this is Nick Carter. He wants to ask you a few questions. Questions? About what? Bergen? Where did you hide the money you got from the payroll robbery six months ago? Why, I... I don't know what you're talking about. No? I think you're Jew. You and your aunts knocked out the messenger and stole the payroll amounting to $153,000. Now, what did you do with it? You're crazy. I had nothing to do with that. Better come clean, Bergen. We got you dead to rights. You think you can make me confess something I didn't do? You're nuts. Bergen? Is this your employment card? Yes, it is. What about it? Does this photograph show part of a letter you wrote to your aunts recently? Let me see it. It's... Hey, come back here. Stop or I'll shoot. Oh! I think he's falling down the stairs. Oh, and maybe he isn't hurt bad. Oh. Oh. You won't die, Bergen. You only got shot in the leg. My neck. My neck. I can't move. Let me see. Huh? Huh. You shot him in the leg all right, Matty. Been falling downstairs. He broke his neck. Oh, Nick, oh, no. Smooth. Now, Bergen, see here. I'm afraid you haven't long to live. Before you go, tell me, where's the money? Uh, isn't there something we can do for me? Uh, I'm afraid not, Patsy. Bergen, where did you hide the money? Uh, I buried it. Where? Where you'll never find it. You might as well tell us where you buried it, Bergen. We can get your ranch to tell. Yeah, I'll never tell you. I did it alone. Find it if you can. I stole it. I can't have it. No one. Ah. Is he gone, Nick? Yes, Matty. He's dead. And the secret of where he hid the money died with him. Well, look, I ain't given up yet. If he buried it like he said, it's probably buried somewhere around that house where his aunts live. Now, I'm going to have a gang start digging there bright and early tomorrow morning. Good luck to you, Matty. I'll drop in on you later to see how you make out. Hello, Sergeant. Having fun? Hi, Matty. How are you making out? As if I couldn't see for myself. <laughs> oh, I ain't making out, Nick. We've been over this whole doggone lot and not a sign of the money. Well, apparently Bergen must have buried it outside the limits of the property. Well, if he did, he can stay there for all of me. Do you realize, Nick, that this is the last street in this section? From here out, it's open country. And the darn stuff could be buried anywhere for the next five miles. Matty, if I can tell you right where to dig for the money, will you try it once more? Nick Carter, you've been holding out on me again, so help no, me no, out. No, no, I haven't been holding out on you. Just answer my question. Yeah, I'll try it once more. But look, if it don't work, keep away from me next time I see you. Okay, Matty. Meet me here in the morning about 10 o'clock. I may have something for you. So long. So long, Sergeant. Uh, Nick, hmm? do you really have an idea? I do. I believe I can come back here tonight and locate the exact spot for him. Well, tell me, Nick, what's your plan? I'm going to get hold of an army officer I know and have him help me. Help you what? Locate the money. Is that all you're going to tell me? That's all for now. I like to surprise you, Patsy. Oh, someday you'll tell me something and I'll surprise you. I'll probably drop dead at your feet. Sorry this is such a blind search, Lieutenant, but as I said, we have no idea where the money was buried. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Carter. I'm used to working like this. Not too dark for you, is it? Oh, no, indeed. I've worked this gadget on darker nights than this and got results. I suppose we swing over this way for a change. We pretty well covered the ground on that side. Okay, Mr. Carter, whatever you say. Over here, maybe? Yes. If we don't find anything in this trip, I'm afraid we'll... Hey, wait a minute. You found something? I think so. Yes. Yes, this is it, I'm sure. No question about it? None at all. I'm certain that if you dig here, you'll find the money. Well, if the money's there, 
Mattie will find it. But we don't want your Mattie to find it. Who are you? We want to find it ourselves. Of course we do. The money belongs to us. Now. I have cross. You're the two old ladies who tied Waldo up and left him in the house the other night. Now, what brings you back here now? The money, of course. I mean, how did you know we were out here? We didn't, but we read in the late evening paper last night that the killing of our nephew Bill had solved the payroll robbery and that the case was closed. And so we feel that it would be perfectly safe to come back here and get our money. And when we did, we found you here. We've been watching you for a long time from behind the trees. Oh, yes. And now that you're here, how do you propose to go about digging it up? Oh, I'm sure we can persuade you to do that for us, Mr. Carter. Oh, really? What makes you think so? This? Hey! I've got a gun, Mr. Carter. We have two guns. One for each of us. And we both know how to shoot very straight. Our dear departed father taught us when we were girls. Now, look, ladies, you better let me have those guns. Uh, somebody might get hurt. Nobody's going to get hurt, Mr. Carter, if you start digging. Now, look here. A joke's a joke. This is getting Mr. too... Mr. Carter, put your hands up over your hands. No. You too, soldier. You put your hands up, too. What do we do, Mr. Carter? We don't do anything. We just... Hey! It went right past my ear. Are you putting your hands above your head now, Mr. Carter? Well, see here, this is all very silly. I guess we better do it. I'd rather be silly than dead. That's very wise of you. Okay, okay, my hands are up. You'd better see if either of them is carrying a pistol, sister. I read in a book that that's always the first thing to do in such cases. Oh, my... Excuse me, please. The soldier doesn't have one. Oh, Oh, look, Edith. Mr. Carter has two pistols. Oh. Aren't they beautiful? Oh, put them over by that stump, Mary, where they'll be safe. Now, will you start digging, Mr. Carter? I can't. I haven't a shovel. I'll get you one. I remember seeing one in the cellar of our house. It isn't a very good one, but you can use it. You wait right there. I'll be back. He'll wait for you, sister. Won't you, Mr. Carter? It looks that way. But now look here. It's no good. The police will be here before I can possibly get the hole deep enough to find the money. It's three o'clock already. Oh, then I'm afraid that will mean you'll have to hurry, Mr. Carter. We must have the money before the police come back. So you'd better take your coat off and get ready to dig real fast. <laughs> Soldier has gone to sleep. Yes, poor dear. He must be all worn out watching Mr. Carter work. Oh, what time is it? 7.30. Oh, dear, I do hope we can find the money before the police arrive. Uh, Mr. Carter? Yes? Please dig a little faster. It's getting late. Oh, That's it, all right. Well, at least I have the satisfaction of knowing we found the right place. <laughs> I'd like to ten. Matter you ought to be here by now. Are you two still up there? Yes, we are. So don't stop digging. We must get that box before the police arrive. I don't have to dig anymore. I found it. You found it? Sister, sister, we come. Mr. Carter found the money for us. Isn't he nice? He found it. Oh, what a lovely man he is. Uh, Soldier. Soldier. Yes, yes. Uh, Will you help Mr. Carter get the box out of the hole, please? You mean he's found it? Yes, yes, I found it. Oh, here it is. Can you reach it? Just a little higher. Yep, that's it. I've got it. My, that isn't a very big box to hold all that money, is it? Why, I believe I could carry that myself. Of course we can. Here, soldier, I'll take it. Here you are. Thank you. Now, please jump down into the hole with Mr. Carter. What? Do what? Jump into the hole with Mr. Carter. It's big enough to hold you both. And I think we'll be gone by the time you get out. The hole is over eight feet deep. You better do as she says, Lieutenant. You know how loudly that gun of hers can speak. Okay. Watch out. 
How do you do? Oh, thank you both very much. Yes, thank you so much. I hope we meet again sometime. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, I hope this story never gets around. Nick Carter and the lieutenant and the U.S. engineers made prisoner by two little old ladies. And two little old guns. You can't forget those. Well, come on, let's get out of here. Give me a boost, will you? Yeah. And I'll haul you out. I rather think they won't get very far. Oh, I'm so glad we found this money before those horrid policemen got here. Oh, yes. We can go in the house and wrap it up so no one will know what it is. Yes. Then we can go back to our old home and live comfortably for the rest of our days. Yes, dear. Oh, watch out for that first step. Uh, that'll be far enough for oh, this. Stand right where you are. But where, where did you come from? Watch out for the matter. They're dangerous, I know. What, uh, what do you want with us, officer? I want you and I want that box of money you got there. Where? And don't try reaching for your guns. It won't be healthy for you. Oh, look, Sergeant. There comes Nick and that army man. What? Oh, dear. They must have gotten out of the hole. You, you mean Nick and the other guy was in the hole where that box was? Yes. We hoped they wouldn't get out till after we'd gone. That nice Mr. Carter dug the money up for us all by himself. Nick dug it up? Well, I never... Hey, hey, Mary, have you got the money? Yeah, the money and the dames both, and they won't get away from me, I can tell you. Well, I gotta say one thing for old Sim Carter. He never let a couple of old dames get him in a hole. <laughs> he knew how to handle women, he did. Uh, <laughs> what happened to all your science, Nick? The science was on their side this time, in the form of a couple of guns. And they could shoot them, too, believe me. <laughs> now, you, you both stopped razzing Nick. He did the best he could, didn't you, Nick? Yes, Patsy, I did the best I could. I stalled around with the digging until time for Matty to show up. Of course, if they hadn't been two old ladies, I could have... Yeah, them. sure, sure, we know... They hadn't been so weak, you could overpower them both, single hand. Hey, Nick, uh, tell me, how'd you ever find where that money was buried? Patsy said you were using some kind of a trick device. Well, just a mine detector, Waldo, same as they use in the war to find hidden mines. Oh. The detector can find hidden metal even when it's buried as deep as this box was. How deep was it, Nick? Eight feet. And if you don't believe me, look at these blisters. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Nick, look. See that chap standing there watching us? Certainly I see him. What about him? Red hair, tall, thin... Must live in this neighborhood or he wouldn't be standing there kibitzing. Isn't that the witness Waldo started out to find? Oh, you're right, Patsy. And as Maddie has the thieves and the money, and we have our witness, we can consider the case closed. Except for these blisters of mine. <laughs> Nick boy, your old father used to say, never be ashamed of honest toil. Remember that, Nick. Never be ashamed of honest toil, even if you do happen to be doing it at the point of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Nick, how about a few highlights on next week's show just to whet our appetite? Good idea, Ken. My story next week is about a man who was killed by a rifle shot, but the bullet came from the wrong gun. And the ladder was too long. The which was what? The ladder was too long. So what? That's the story, together with the fact that the boys' club met very late that night. That's enough. That's enough. What do you call this weird combination of clues? I call it the case of the wrong clue. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of The Shadow Comics. In The Return of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, Waldo by Humphrey Davis, and Scubby by John Kane. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places, is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
Yes, it's the case of the poker murders. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters, a detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Deep in the waterfront section of the city, there lies a condemned slum area. The streets, dark and deserted, lined with empty, crumbling tenements. Deep in a grimy tenement deep within, a masked man sits in a hidden room and plays solitaire. This is the sinister master of crime known as the Ace of State. Yes? The six and seven are close to see you, Ace. Send them in. Well, here we are, Chief. Yeah. You're five minutes late. Oh, sorry, Ace. The cops are watching this area. We had trouble slipping in. Since when have I accepted excuses? <laughs> yeah, boss, we know. What about the other three? Are they waiting at the rendezvous? Yes, sir. You both memorized my instructions? We've got them down cold, Chief, but suppose there's a hitch. There won't be a hitch. The Ace of Spades doesn't make mistakes. Of course, if you make one... No, uh, we won't, Ace. You can depend on us. All right. Now, you two had better get going. Okay. One thing. What is it, Chief? Don't forget to leave your calling cards. I don't want to disappoint my dear friend, Sergeant Matheson. Extra, extra, ace of space strikes again. First storage warehouse robbed. Quarter million dollars in furs looted. God killed us. Poker gang makes clean getaway. Ralph Williams? Special investigator for Acme Underwriters. Oh, oh. Show him in, Patsy. Whether the retainer they're paying me, I have to see him. This way, Mr. Williams. Mr. Carter, my company's in trouble. Yes? Well, sit down, Mr. Williams. Tell me about it. As you know, we're the biggest underwriters in the business. But this first storage robbery yesterday, well, we can't take any more of those. Oh, the ace of spades, huh? Yes. Whoever he is, he's hit us five times in the last two weeks. We're paying out a fortune in claims. You're working with the police on this? The police? They're helpless. The ace of spades has been too smart for them. Take that fur warehouse job last night, for instance. Yes? Every burglar alarm was cut or disconnected. The vault combinations were known beforehand. And the locations of the most valuable furs. What about the guard? Was he one of your own operatives? Yes. One of our best men, too. They locked him into one of the refrigerated vaults. Mm Mm-hmm. The Ace of Spades men leave the usual calling cards? Yes. It was a five-man job, apparently. They left the six, seven, eight, nine, and ten of clubs. Oh, that's great flush. It's a pretty high poker hand. Among his other accomplishments, our friend seems to have a perverted sense of humor. Well, it's a brand of humor I can't say I relish. Mr. Carter, will you help us with the case? I will. Tell you the truth, Mr. Williams, I was just about to drop down and discuss it with my old friend, Sergeant Matheson, in the Homicide Division. You see, the gentleman who calls himself the Ace of Spades interests me no end. I'm looking forward to meeting him personally. Put her on. I thought I told you never to come down here. I just heard some news. Nick Carter... I know. He's been called in by Acme Underwriters. How did you know? I make it my business to know everything, my dear. But, Ace, Nick Carter's clever, dangerous. Yes, I know. It will be intriguing to match wits with him. Now then, my dear, you'd better run along. You've work to do tonight. Aren't you even going to see me? I'm sorry, but I'm busy. I know. You're playing solitaire. Sometimes I think you love that game more than you love me. Come, come, my dear. There's no basis for comparison. Solitaire, like every other card game, is relaxing. Women, when they're as lovely as you, are exciting. Ace, please. Good night, my dear. Nick 
Dick, you won't be late for Elder Stanley's birthday party, will you? No, Patsy. You drop me at headquarters and go right on. I'll join you later. Uh huh. Oh, it's funny the way I bumped into Rhoda after all these years. I hadn't seen her since college, and then all of a sudden I was standing in a nylon line of Trimbo's, and there she was. Yes, and now we're going to a birthday party. Uh huh. The minute she found out I worked with you, she insisted on our coming. She's dying to meet you, and, well, I promise to produce. You sure you don't mind me? No, no, of course not, Bessie. Oh, it ought to be something. She's married to John Stanley. The banker? Uh huh, that's right. Oh. <laughs> Which is the same thing as saying she's married to ten million dollars. <laughs> And I was the girl in my graduating class voted most likely to succeed. Well, Patsy, it's a funny thing. Hmm? What's funny? Stanley's bank, the Marine Trust, is putting up the capital to tear down that slum area where the Ace of Spades is supposed to be hiding. Oh, do you really think that's where the Ace of Spades' hideout is? Could be. There are more than 200 abandoned tenements down there. And the two patrolmen murdered in that section seem to point to it. I won't forget those two homicides in a hurry. Each of them had a playing card pinned right over the bullet holes. Yes, a pair of jacks. A fair sample of the ace's grisly humor. What kind of a man can he be anyway? Infernally clever, Betsy. We know that much. A brilliant planner with a mind that doesn't overlook the minutest details that might trap him. But why all those poker hands whenever he's pulled a job? He's an egotist. Type of criminal who glorifies his crimes. Enjoys leaving his signatures at each one of them. Oh. This close enough, Nick? Yes, I can walk the other half block to headquarters. Nick, I... Please be careful. Don't take any chances. Now, don't worry. The ace of spades may play his cards according to Hoyle, but I'll play him any way I can to win. Hi, Matty. Oh, Nick. <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, for once I'm glad to see you. This ace of spades has really got me on the merry-go-round. First, he knocks over two of our best cops. Then he kills this watchman on that warehouse job last night, and he leaves nothing, no evidence, except those blasted playing cards. Yes, I know. Nick, I tell you, this ace of spades is like a ghost. This whole case like a nightmare. Matty, have you got the cards his men left? Yeah, here they are. Hmm. Common pattern. They sell hundreds of decks like this all over town. Uh, what about the... Fingerprints? Yes. No, none. We powdered every card. Even used the iodine test. Nothing to it. Suppose you searched that abandoned slum area. Look, are you kidding, Nick? Of course we did. The night Burke and Finnegan were killed, we went through it with a fine-tooth comb. A devil of a job it was, too. As I can imagine. And as much as that place has been blacked out ever since the city decided to dismantle their street lamps in the area to save electricity. Yeah. With all these hundreds of empty tenements, the Ace could change his headquarters at will. Why, you could drive a car through there with the headlights turned off and never be seen. Yeah, I know. That's what makes it tough. The place is as black as, uh, well, the ace of spades. I got a couple of men down there now nosing around. Not that I expect to find anything. Uh, homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Nolan's calling in from a call box down in that cinema area, Sergeant. Yeah? Shall I switch you on? Yeah, yeah, I'll talk to him. Hello? Hello, is that you, Sarge? Yeah. What is it, Nolan? Well, Connors and myself saw a light in one of these here tenements. What? Are you sure? Yeah, positive. The light's gone now, but we got the place spotted. Shall we go in and investigate? No, no, no. Now, now listen, Nolan. You and Connors stay there and keep your eyes peeled on that tenement. Yeah? I'll be right down with the squad. Okay, Sarge. We'll be on the corner of the place, I'd say. Nolan! 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 <laughs> You say that call box was located at the corner of 16th Street and Avenue F, Matty? Yeah, that's right, Nick. A couple more blocks and we'll be there. From the looks of things, you must have every cruise car on the force in this area now. Yeah. But judging by what's gone before, I don't think it's going to do us any good. Matty, just look at this area. Nothing but rows and rows of dark tenements and boarded up stores. Yeah, now, look, there isn't a whole pane of glass in the place. The streets and the sidewalks are certainly littered with this flat. Hey, hey, Nick, I heard a shot. Take it easy, Matty, take it easy. One of your boys up ahead just blew a tire, picked up a piece of broken glass, probably. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, this place gives me the creeps, I guess. Uh, uh-oh. There's the call box that Nolan called from. I don't see anything. You, Matty? No. Nolan and Connors must be somewhere around, one way or the other. Better hug the walls, Matty. Yeah. 
Right now, we're out in the open like a couple of sitting pigeons. The ace. Matty. Here in this doorway. <gasps> Nolan and Connors. Dead. Yes, riddled by bullets. Now look, Matty. The ace left his usual calling cards. The jack of hearts on Nolan and the jack of diamonds on Connors. And Burke and Finnegan drew a pair of jacks, too, and they were murdered down here. Four jacks. Four of a kind. Well, whatever the ace of spades is, Matty, he's consistent. He's still killing. And according to Hoyle... What's happened to the master detective you promised to produce tonight? Well, I can't understand what's keeping Nick Rudder. He was supposed to be here long ago. Well, we won't worry about it. Let's just have another cocktail, huh? After all, it is my wife's birthday. <laughs> As you know, Patsy, I'm a lucky woman to be Mrs. John Stanley. Look at the birthday present John gave me. This necklace. Oh, I've been noticing that, Rhoda. Matched diamonds, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's a magnificent thing. Oh, that must be Nick now. I'll get it. Uh, what the devil? All right, Stanley, get those hands up. Yeah, and fast. Hey, now, wait a minute. What does this mean? We're playing cops and robbers. That's why we're wearing these masks. But you... Shut up, Stanley. I'll do all the talking around here. All right, Joe, get to work on that wall safe. It's behind that picture. You know the combination. Right. John, all my jewelry's in there. Yes, I know, my dear. I'm afraid there's nothing we can do now. Or any other time. Pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Yeah, lady, I sure am. How you doing, Joe? Okay. Just got the safe open. Swell. Now, Mrs. Stanley, I'll take that necklace. Oh, John, my birthday present. Will you give it to me, or do I have to tear it off your neck? Rhoda, I'm afraid you'll have to do as he says. No, no, I won't. Oh, Rhoda, your husband's right. We're helpless now. These no, are... they're not going to take my necklace. All right, lady, looks like I'll have to oh. rip it off that pretty white neck of yours. Take your hands oh. off my wife. Shut up, Stanley. Stay where you are. I said let her alone, you hear? Take your hands off. Oh, John! John! Nice work, pal. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to use that blackjack in a long time. You killed him. He isn't breathing. He... Naturally, lady. That was no love tap I gave him. Oh. You got all that stuff out of the safe, Joe? Yeah. Everything's worked like clockwork. As the chief would say, according to plan. You'll pay for this. Both of you. That's what you think, lady. Oh, um, here's a couple of calling cards. Just to, uh, remember us by. <laughs> The ace of hearts and the ace of clubs, huh, Patsy? Yes, Nick, and both of the men were masked. We couldn't tell who they were. They hit John. They killed him. He tried to protect me. Oh, now, Rhoda, don't try to talk. You've had a terrible shock. Just lie back on the couch and try to rest. The doctor will be here soon. John! John! I'm sorry, Mr. Stanley. But someday you'll have the satisfaction of seeing those killers go to the chair. Nick, one of those crooks said everything went according to plan. Do you think the Ace of Spades planned John's murder? Yes, Patsy, I do. But it was so wanton. Whenever the Ace of Spades kills, he kills for a reason. He isn't the type to kill just for the pleasure of it. Now, Patsy, did you notice anything about these thugs? Anything unusual that might give us a clue? No, they were both masked, about medium height, wore black gloves. Wait a minute, Nick. Yes? I do remember something now. When the man who hit John with the blackjack raised his arm, I saw his cufflinks. And what about them? They were little black aces of clubs. Hmm. Unusual. Do they look expensive? Oh, yes, very. And not the usual kind of thing you pick up in a jewelry store. Probably made to order. Patsy, you're magnificent. I am, Nick? You are. You've stumbled on something we've badly needed in this case. A good lead. From now on, we're going to play a little game. A little game? Mm -hmm. Of what? A little game of poker. Mind if I use your phone, Sergeant Matheson? No, oh, not at all, Mr. Williams. Sergeant, my company is demanding action from you and Mr. Carter here. Yes. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Williams. Frankly, we I can't just... wait for anything much longer. <clears throat> you realize the losses act me underwriters are taking? Hello. Hello, Boulevard Garage. This is Mr. Williams. Is my car ready? What? Two new tires. I see the old ones are pretty badly cut up, eh? Well, that makes three new tires in all. Uh-huh. All right, go ahead. I suppose it can't be helped. Car trouble, huh? Yes. 
But that's the least of my worries, Mr. Carter. My firm's insured the Stanley Jewels along with that diamond necklace for almost $100,000. Unless you nail down the ace of spades pretty quickly. Ah, well, might as well try to nail down a ghost. We'll do what we can, Mr. Williams. I've got a lead on him now, I think. What lead? Well, I'd rather not say until I'm sure it'll be of value. Very well. I don't care how you get the ace of spades as long as you get him. And soon. Good day, gentlemen. Goodbye. Hey, Nick. What's this lead you're talking about? I'll let you know, Mary. When and if it pays dividends. Oh, by the way, did... Yeah. Now, wait a minute. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Sergeant, is Nick there? Oh, yeah, sure, Patsy. Yeah, Nick, it's for you. Hello, Patsy. Did you find anything? Plenty. I canvassed the big jewelry store just as you told me to do. And? After walking my feet off and talking to about a hundred supercilious jewelry clerks, I finally made a strike at Rutledge's. They make up those cufflinks? Yes. Did they have a carbon of the sales slip? Yes, Nick, they did. Ah. The man who ordered those cufflinks was Frankie Morello. Morello, huh? Good work, Patsy. Go home now. Soak your feet in hot water. I'll let you know when I need you again. <laughs> Yes? The Ace of Clubs is here to see you. Send him in. Hello, Chief. You sent for me? Yes, Frankie. Sit down. Thanks. Well, Chief, how'd you like the way Joe and me pulled off that Stanley job, huh? That's an interesting pair of cufflinks you're wearing, Frankie. Little aces of clubs, eh? Yeah, pretty neat if I do say so. Had them made to order. That was very careless of you, Frankie. Ace, what do you mean by that? You wore them on the Stanley job. You gave Nick Carter a clue. You'll find out who you are sooner or later. Yeah, but Chief, Nick I... Carter's a dangerous man with a clue, Frankie. Now he hopes to get at me through you. It's going to be embarrassing to have you around. Hey, Chief, I, I didn't wear these cufflinks at the Stanley's. I swear I didn't. Oh, didn't you, Frankie? No, no, you got to believe me. Yes. Send in the Queen of Hearts. Right. What? Meet the Queen of Hearts, Frankie. You. Yes, Frankie. It's I. Sorry, Frankie. Chief, no. No! <laughs> of affairs, Nick. Frankie Morello, our only clue wiped out. Yes. But only you and I knew about that cufflinks clue, Nick. What is this ace of spades, a mind reader? That's who you forget. Huh? When you and I were discussing it at John Stanley's house, someone else was there who could have overheard us. Oh, Nick, you're not suggesting that Rhoda... She was in the room with us when we talked it over. Well, I know, but she was in a severe state of shock. Why, she? Nick, you don't mean... I mean that things are beginning to add up. Look, Patsy... Those crooks knew where the wall safe was, even at the combination. Oh, yes, that's right. The Ace of Spades could have received that valuable information direct from Rhoda. Yes, but we can't be sure of that, Nick. No, but there's one thing we can be sure of. Neither you nor I tipped off the Ace of Spades about that cufflinks clue. And somebody did. And the Ace felt it was important enough to force him to destroy the evidence, his own henchman. And it must have been Rhoda who tipped him off. She was the only other person who knew about the cufflinks. Exactly. I... Oh, I can't believe it. Well, I, I knew Rhoda Stanley well. Of course, I haven't seen her for... Oh, Nick, how could Rhoda be an accomplice to the murder of her husband right before her own eyes? Patsy, those jewels in the safe were insured for $100,000. That's a lot of money. Not to mention the millions that John Stanley probably left her in his will. But if Rhoda's mixed up in this, then who is the ace of spades? I've got a hunch, but I'm not positive yet. Whoever he is, he has an intimate knowledge of the jobs he tackles. And all these jobs have been pulled off against Acme underwriters. Patsy, suppose someone had easy access to the files of the company. Files? Yes, on banks, storage, first storage vaults, and other properties, giving their floor layouts, burglar alarm setups, and so forth. A clever crook could pull off a nice, clean job with this information, couldn't he? Yes. Well, but there might be any number of men who'd have access to this information. Adjusters, executives, insurance actuaries... Any number of people on the inside. True, but we can narrow it down further. This man, this ace of spades, would not only have to be an inside man, he'd have to be someone who got around on the outside, too. 
knew all these places by actual experience because he'd visited them. That's the only way he could operate the way he's doing. Wait a minute, Nick. You mean... I'm not sure, Patsy. And I hope to know within an hour. Come on. Get your hat. Let's go. Go? Go where? To the Boulevard Garage. That's where Ralph Williams keeps his car. Nick, that garage attendant looked a little suspicious when you told him you were a dealer and that Mr. Williams sent you down to make an estimate on his car. Uh, I'm going to make an estimate, all right. Now, here we are. Nick, you still haven't told me why you're interested in Mr. Williams' car. Not interested in the car itself. Just the tires. Uh, the tires? Yes. I understand three of his tires were cut up so badly he had to have new ones. I think I know what cut his tires that way. And I want to be sure. Well, hurry up. That, that attendant is keeping his eye on us. Patsy, ah, I've found what I've been looking for. Nick, I just don't get it. Here, take a good look at all four of these tires. Huh? See the glass particles and the treads? There's old tires, full of them. Yes, but what do they mean? I mean that Mr. Williams has been driving this car over roads littered with broken glass. And the only place in town where there are roads like that is in the abandoned slum section. Then, Nick, what you're saying is that Ralph Williams is the ace of spades. Yes, and I bet every poker chip in the pot on it. Investigation, Williams speaking. Who? Claims Department. Oh, yes, Mr. Redden. Funny, I was just talking to Mrs. Stanley. She's right here in my office now. No, we haven't been able to break that Stanley case. The Ace of Spades got clean away with those jewels. Huh? I know it's a lot of money, but we're licked and we'll have to pay the claim. Yes, I know, and you're perfectly right. But even Nick Carter's fallen down on this one. All right, Mr. Redden. Goodbye. Well, my dear, it looks as though you're in. They're going to okay the claim. When will it come through? The cash, I mean. Sometime next week. And after that, my dear, I suggest you go away for a long vacation trip. In fact, I think I'll join you myself. It's, uh, getting pretty warm in town. Yes, come in. A messenger broke this letter for you, Mr. Williams. Oh, thank you, Miss Hamilton. Mm. From Nick Carter. Nick Carter? I wonder what he wants. Oh, now, my dear, nothing to be nervous about. Let's see. There, there's nothing in it but a playing card. Yes. But look at that card. It's the Joker. <laughs> Nick, the messenger left Williams' office five minutes ago. I know. It's almost dark. He'll be out soon. When he does, Patsy, we'll tail him. Nick, why did you send him that joker? Just having a little fun. In the ace's own way. But isn't that dangerous? Shouldn't we have just gone up and got him? What if he gets away? He won't. You forget one thing, Patsy. What? The loot. The ace is almost half a million dollars sold away somewhere. And he's certainly not going to leave town without picking it up. That's the big reason why I sent him the Joker. He knows around with him now. It'll flush him out. Of course. And he'll lead us right to the hideaway. If everything goes according to Hoyle. Nick, do you think it's in one of those slum tenements somewhere? I'd bet on it. Can't think of a better place to hide anything. Here, wait a minute. Hmm? Yes. Here comes Williams out of his building now. Yes, and... Rhoda Stanley's with him. Hmm. They're getting into a taxi. All right, Betsy. Here we go. Nick, look. They've stopped at the Riverview Boathouse. Yes. They're getting into a launch. But I don't understand. This means they're not going to the tenement area. On the contrary, Patsy. You forgot one thing. The river fronts that area, and the boat running quietly with its lights out might get in a lot easier than a car, especially when all the streets are being watched. We can't let them get away, Nick. What now? I'm going on to the tenement area. You get Maddie on the phone. Uh-huh. Have him throw a cordon around this entire area. And tell him to notify the harbor police, too. All right, Nick. I fancy make it plain to Maddie that the harbor police are not to stop the boat. 
I just keep them under surveillance. We want the ace to pick up that money before he tries a final getaway. Well, Nick, it worked out just as you figured. The ace of spades came off that boat and went into that five-story tenement right across the street there. Yes, lucky your men were posted under those docks, Matty. Otherwise, we might have missed him. Well, the Stanley woman's waiting in the boat. We can pick her up later just as soon as we... Uh... Hey, Nick. Huh? The ace of spades is coming out. Get back into the doorway. He went in empty-handed and came out with a suitcase. Yeah, that's the swag, all right. Nope. Oh, here goes. Just a minute, Ace. What? No! Drop that gun! Drop it, I say! Nice shot, Matty. Winged him in the arm. Yes, sir. You trumped the ace of spades neatly. Well, Nick, they're starting to tear down these tenements today. Oh, what a place. Even in daylight, it gives me the creeps. Yes, but someday they tell me this is going to be a beautiful housing development with parks and playgrounds for the kids. Maybe, but right now it looks like a kind of death house. And speaking of the death house, I wonder what the ace of spades is thinking about now. About black on red or red on black. Uh, Nick, what on earth do you mean? I just spoke to Maddie on the phone a few moments ago. He tells me the ace of spades sits in the death cell all day and all night playing solitaire. Say, Nick, uh, how about giving us a few of the ingredients that make up your story for next week? Why, sure, Hugh. Take a beautiful young girl who's positive she's going crazy, just as her mother did before her. Then add her boyfriend, who refused to believe she was losing her mind in spite of the evidence to the contrary. Mix them together, and add a country doctor who alone knew the secret behind it all. And you have the tense and unbelievable situation with which Nick was faced. And uh, what do you call this witch's brew, Nick? I call it the case of the demented daughter. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of The Shadow Comics. In the broadcast of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Matthew is played by Ed Latimer, original music is played by George Wright, script is by Max Ehrlich. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at this same time. This is Hugh Sanders saying so long until next week. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. But, Dylan, it's true. I know it's true. But it's not true, June, darling. <laughs> Don't you suppose I'd know it if you were going crazy? But why do I hear these noises all the time? Why am I so cold when it's, it's really warm in here? Why Listen, do I... June, you're just working yourself up over nothing. Now, why don't you Holly know told me my mother acted the same way, Phyllis. My husband didn't mean that. But said mother heard noises like thunder in her ears. He told me that she was cold and shivering no matter what the temperature was. Alex told me that. Well, even if that's true, it doesn't prove... It does, it does. 
I'll kill myself before I let them take me away. I won't go to an asylum. I won't. I won't. <laughs> A young girl convinced that she is going insane. A fiancé who is not convinced, who doubts that it can be true in spite of the evidence. An appeal to Nick Carter, Master Detective. The uncovering of a strange and unnatural plot. Not for money, not for power, but for hate. This is the story unfolded in The Case of the Demented Daughter. That must be Randy Wyatt. I made a date for him to see you at 10.30. Is Mr. Carter here yet? Yes, he is. Won't you come in? Thank you. Mr. Carter? Yes? I'm Randy Wyatt. Your father and mine used to be pretty good friends. That's why I'm taking the liberty of asking you to help me now. Why, no liberty at all. Come in, sit down. Thank you, sir. What seems to be the trouble? Well, last night I got this note from the girl I'm engaged to. She sent my ring back with it. May I see it? It's no use, Randy, darling. I'm doomed. And I won't have you burdened with an insane wife. So this is goodbye. Your heartbroken June. I tried to call her as soon as I got the note, but the housekeeper wouldn't let me talk to her. Said she was too ill to come to the phone. Well, have you seen any signs of this insanity she speaks of? I know, and I don't believe it. There's been something funny going on somewhere. She's been a little more nervous than usual when we've been out together this past month, but that isn't insanity. You say when we've been out together. Does that mean that you don't see her at home much? Well, for the past month, she seemed to prefer to get out of the house. Doesn't want to stay home anymore. Well, have you seen her at home at all? Well, I was there one night about a week ago. Her sister Phyllis and her brother-in-law, Alex Benson, were out, and we spent the evening there alone. Did she seem to be the same as usual? Why, except for one little thing, yes. She complained that she felt cold, almost shivery. The house was cold even for me. The thermometer said 78, but it wasn't as warm as that in there. But the fact that she was cold when the thermometer said 78 seemed to prey on her mind. I tried to tell her the thermometer was wrong and that I was chilly, too, but she insisted I was just being nice to her. I see. Well, is she any reason to be afraid of going out of her mind? When I was waiting for June the other night, Alex, her brother-in-law, warned me that she was acting queer. Said he felt I ought to know. Told me her mother died in the Harrow Hill Sanitarium. I tried to laugh at him, but he insisted he and Phyllis had seen definite symptoms. Mm Mm-hmm. Anyone else live there with June beside Phyllis and her husband? The housekeeper, Miss Everett, a cook and a maid. Mm, they must have plenty of money. Oh, yes. June's father was a rich man. And he left his entire estate to be divided between the two girls. How long ago did her mother go to the sanitarium? Oh, let me see. June was six then, so it must have been 1932. She died there in 1940. I see. What does this Alex Benson do? He has a very good business, I understand. Doing very well. And this housekeeper you spoke of, has she been with them long? Since a couple of years after Miss Kemper was taken away. She's a peppery old lady, but an excellent housekeeper. She and Phyllis brought June up. I'd like to talk to your fiancé, Wyatt. Can you arrange it? Oh, that's what I'd hoped you'd say, Mr. Carter. June isn't crazy, I know that. Just as sure as I know my own name. Well, when can we see her? Around five this afternoon, perhaps? We can try. Where shall I meet you? You better be here at the office about 4.30. We'll go up together. I'll be here. Oh, Mr. Carter, I do hope you can straighten this out. I'll certainly do what I can, Wyatt. You're swell, Mr. Carter. Well, see you at 4.30. Goodbye. So long. Goodbye, Mr. Wyatt. Oh, the poor kid. Losing her mind at her age. I'm not at all sure she is, Patsy. Huh? Look at this note she sent Wyatt. Well, what about it? Writing looks awkward, but she was probably upset. Well, look closely. See how the pencil bears down much harder in some places than in others? Yes. And it's not always in the places where the lines would naturally be heavier. Which means? One explanation would be that somebody was guiding her hand, forcing her to write this. Oh. Patsy, I think we'll do some checking up. Okay. What'll we do? Uh, call Scuppy the paper. Ask him for a full report on both Phyllis and Alex Benson. Uh Uh-huh. Society doings and any other information you may find in the morgue. Yeah. Also tell him to check up on Alex's business and financial ratings. All right. Anything else? Yes, I want you to call on the housekeeper. Give her some excuse. Find out all you can about it. I'll tell you what. I'll pretend I'm making a checkup of the conditions under which housekeepers work for some magazine say. That'll do it. Good. And while you do that, I'm going down to the surrogate's office and take a look at the father's will. If there's any conspiracy going on, there's very likely to be money involved. Okay, Nick. See you here as soon as I get the dope on Mrs. Everett.
As I told you, when you call, young lady, I can give you only a few minutes. Well, I'm glad you could see me at all, Mrs. Everett. We can sit here in the breakfast room. Thank you. Now, <laughs> ask your questions and I'll answer them, if they're not personal. Well, they are personal, but only in a general way. How long have you been here? Since uh, 1936, the year after Mrs. Kemple died. Uh-huh. Had you worked previously? I had. Fourteen years. Two jobs. In each case, I left because I was offered more money. If somebody offered me more money than I'm getting here, I'd leave tomorrow. Uh, are you married, Mrs. Everett? I was. My husband died. Any children? I have not. I hate them. How do you find working conditions here? I've seen better and I've seen worse. How do you get along with your employers? Mr. Kemple was a fine man. We got along well. Oh. Do you mean you're having trouble with Mr. and Mrs. Benson? No, Phyllis and Alex are all right. We get along well enough, but that June, I can't stand her. I never could. Oh, do you have any special reason to feel that way? Or is it because you don't like children? She's a brat. Always was. She used to play tricks on me when I first came here. Left a toy wagon for me to stumble over when she was little, and I fell and broke my ankle. I'd have left here then, but Mr. Kemper offered me so much money I couldn't afford to go. But I made that June pay for what she did. Why, I've... I'm talking too much. What else do you want to know? You wouldn't want to tell me what they pay you here, would you? I wouldn't. I told you not to get personal. Now, i got to go. Good day. Goodbye, and thank you, Mrs. Everett. <laughs> Scubby, I'll tell him. Thanks. Goodbye. Oh, hi, Patsy. Hello. How'd you make out? Here's a typewritten report of my interview. I didn't like that Mrs. Everett at all. Oh, well, she doesn't like June, huh? Mm-mm. Well, good work, Patsy. That covers it. You, you really like it, Nick? I do. Get your hat. We're taking you right out to Harrow Hill Sanitarium where Mrs. Kemple died. I want to talk to the doctor out there. Right with you, Nick. Walter went out after your phone, but he'll be back pretty soon. Well, have you heard from Scubby yet? Oh, yes. He says he found plenty of stuff about Phyllis and Alex, but nothing you'd want. Hmm. Except that Alex's business is in a pretty bad shape. He needs to expand and has been having trouble getting capital to do it. Yes? Scubby says he couldn't find out whether he'd put any of his wife's money into it or not. I see. What'd you find out at the Farragate's office? I found that Mr. Kemble left a large fortune, divided equally between the two girls. There were two interesting clauses in the will. Hmm? One was that should either daughter develop a mental weakness of any kind, the other daughter was to have control of the money and administer it for the other's benefit. Hey, Nick, that's something. As for the other, peculiar. It's a statement that since the circumstances surrounding the birth of the two sisters were fully taken into account in drawing the will, no claims on that basis were to be allowed under penalty of forfeiture of all rights under the will. What in the world does that mean? I wish I knew. I called the lawyer who drew it, but he refused to talk about it. So I'm having Walter look up the birth certificates of both girls. Might be some help there. Uh Uh-huh. You think the doctor at the sanitarium could help you? I don't know. I hope so. That's one reason I want to have a talk with him. I'm sorry I can't be of more help to you, Mr. Carter, but my knowledge of the Kempel family is limited to Mrs. Kempel herself, as I said. Doctor, tell me, did Mrs. Kempel know what was happening to her? Oh, yes. Some years before it actually happened, it became evident that sooner or later she would have trouble. Hers, as I said, was a case of schizophrenia, split personality. And in her case, the other side of her was homicidal. But... You say it can be inherited, Doctor. It can be, but fortunately, it rarely is. Well, thank you for your time, Dr. Lennox, and for your information. I think it'll help us to get to the bottom of this. Turn left here, Mr. Carter. The Kemple place is halfway down the next block. Nick... Did I hear Walter telling you he could find only Phyllis's birth certificate? That's right, Patsy. No record of June's birth at all. Huh. Why? Do you know where June is born? No, I don't. Oh, by the way, Mr. Carter, I tried to get in touch with June to tell her we were coming, but the housekeeper wouldn't let me speak to her. Said she was asleep. Darn that woman, I don't trust her at all. Is this the house? Yeah, that's it. All right. You'll have to wait in the car, Patsy. Mrs. Everett knows you. Right, Nick. I hope we can get in. Oh, I think we'll manage somehow.
If Phyllis is here, she'll let me in. Maybe there's nobody here. I think I hear someone coming. When there's somebody sick in the house, you ought to know better than to make so much noise. Mrs. Everett, I'm sorry, but we must see June Kemple at once. She's in her room and in no condition to see anyone at once. Who are you? This is Mr. Nick Carter, Miss Everett. Please let us see June. Hmm. What's a detective doing here? I'm not here as a detective. Rather as a friend. May we see June? Very well. She's in her room. You can go up, but make it as short as you can. She's sick. Thank you. Come on, Mr. Carter. I can't understand Miss Everett's dislike for June. She never has a good word for her. Some people are like that, wife. Some people just don't see... Randy! Randy, help! Help! That's June. Come on. Oh, Randy. What, June, honey, what's wrong? I, I couldn't open the door. I, I couldn't make my hands open the door. It was probably stuck. No, no, it wasn't the door. It was me. My hands... Why, what do you mean by that, Miss Campbell? It's just the way my mother acted when she was sick. Alex told me about it last night. She couldn't make her hands do what she wanted. I tried to open my door and I couldn't. I just couldn't. I had to try and try before I could get it open. Oh, Randy. It was like a nightmare. A horrible nightmare. Come now, honey. Don't cry like that. I just can't stand it. Please, honey. What? Look here. Oh, what is it, sir? You notice this? Why, it... Well, that's wax, isn't it? It is. Wax that someone stuffed in the latch of a door to make it difficult to open. Not impossible, just difficult. Then there is a plot to drive her insane. I knew it. Either that or a plot to make her think she's insane. Nothing very mental about a piece of wax in a door lock. Listen, June, honey, marry me right now. Let me get you out of this house. You'll be safe once I get you away from here. Oh, no, Randy, I can't. It wouldn't be fair to you. Listen. Someone just came in. Someone tells you about that. Randy Wyatt and a detective are not talking to June. And she shouldn't be seen anyone. She's sick. I tried to keep them out, but I couldn't. I'll go up and see what they're doing. Is everything all right, June? Yes, Miss Benson. There's nothing wrong with June. I'm surprised you felt you had to see her when she's so ill. Miss Benson, this is Mr. Carter, a friend of mine. How do you do? And I wanted him to see June. Well, now that you've seen her, you better go. Come, June. I'll take you back to your room. You better lie down and be quiet. All right, sir. But it's no use. It's no use. Well, Mr. Carter, I guess we... Yes. Come on, Wyatt. I'm sorry that Phyllis seems a little abrupt, but we're really very much worried about June. As I told you, Randy, she's exhibiting all the symptoms her mother had just before she was taken away. Alex, this is Mr. Carter. He knew my father years ago. How are you, Mr. Benson? How do you do, sir? Mr. Benson, do you happen to know where June was born? June? Yes. Uh, no, I don't think I do. Oh, wait a minute. It seems to me I've heard Phyllis say that she was born in Barnstable. And where's that? It's about an hour out of the city, I believe, on the River Turnpike. Uh, uh, Phyllis, wasn't June born in Barnstable? Yes, she was. Oh, Alex, I don't know what we're going to do with that girl. She's possessed with that one idea. And since Mother... Oh, I don't know what to do. Oh, no, no. Come on, Mr. Carter. We'd better get out of here. Yes. Our work is finished here for now. But, Nick, aren't you going to eat anything before you go? Uh, we'll grab a sandwich and a cup of coffee on the way. Why, old Sim Carter, you ought to go... What are you out. expecting to find a Barnstable? June was born there. If her birth certificate doesn't give us a clue to that clause in Campbell's will, I'll find somebody there who can. That's a you wait here at the office for me. But what do you expect from me, Mr. Carter? You say you found the birth certificate in good order. Uh, after we finally got that guy to open up town hall so we could have a look. <laughs> Boy, was he hopping mad at being called away from his supper. Dr. Jessup, you signed the birth certificate, so you should be able to answer my question. What is there about June's birth that would cause her father to put that strange clause in his will? I couldn't tell you, Mr. Carter. Mrs. Kemper came up here for a rest, and June was born while she was here. Uh. Dr. Jessup. Suppose I should tell you that I think someone is trying to make June think she's losing her mind because her mother did. 
Would that stir your memory? Losing her mind because her mother... Oh, no, that's impossible. Why, she... Uh, pardon me, I must see who's at the door. Certainly, we'll wait. It's strange that they should come to the back door. Mickey knows something. Sure as you're a foot high, he knows something. Yes, Waldo, well, I think he does. And I think he's going to talk. Oh, no! Mick, sounds as if he's in... Oh, Dr. Oh, Dr. Jessup, what's wrong? Dr. Jessup. You're right. Uh, see Leona Perkins. She, she... Uh, uh, look at Nick. He was shot twice, right through the chest. So I see. But we didn't hear no shots. Silence, sir, apparently. Waldo, see if you can spot anyone out there. Right, Nick. I'll get him. Oh, poor guy. If I hadn't come here, well... Waldo! Waldo! Did you... Uh, it's no good, Nick. I thought I saw a guy hiding in the trees there, so I took a couple of shots at him. Yeah, I guess it was just shadows. You ought to know better than to go shooting off that old forty-four of yours blindly that way. But, Nick, I want to... you stay here. Call the sheriff. Tell him what happened. I'm going to find Leona Perkins before someone tries to eliminate her, too. Now, you got that, Patsy? Tell Matty to have his man keep constant watch on the Kempel house. And tell me just who goes in or out. Uh-huh. And he's to wait until you come and report to you. Right. I'll pick you up at the office on my way back. Oh, and have Randy Wyatt there, too, so he can go with us. Oh, where did you say you are now? In Barnstable, at the home of Leona Perkins. She was June's nurse after she was born. She knows the answers if anyone does. All right, I'll see you at the office, Betsy. Sorry, Mrs. Perkins, but I had to get that call through without delay. Now, you know Dr. Jessup, of course. Yes, of course. I worked with him for 15 years. He sent you to me? Yes. I'm... I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but Dr. Jessup has just been killed. Dr. Jessup? Killed? Yes, shot. By someone who wanted to keep him from telling me what I came to Barnstable to find out. Dr. Jessup dead. I can't believe it. Before he died, he told me to come to you. But you would tell me what the mystery is about June Kemple's birth. Why are you asking these questions, Mr. Carter? Because June's sanity is in danger. June insane. She can't be. Why not? Her mother was, I understand. Died in the sanitarium. Then you understand wrongly, Mr. Carter. Her mother is perfectly sane and she is still alive. Alive and well. What's that you say? Do I look insane to you? You? Why, why no, no, of course not. Mr. Carter, I am June's mother. You? You are June's mother? I am. June is really my daughter. Miss Perkins, I'm afraid I don't understand. Why was she brought up as the Kemple's child? Mrs. Kemple had one daughter, and she wanted another, desperately. But she knew she was gradually going out of her mind. And she was afraid if she bore another child, it too might be susceptible to the same dread disease. So she decided to adopt a baby, but secretly, to prevent any possible discrimination against it. She made inquiries in several places. Dr. Jessup heard of her search and came to me. How did he happen to come to you? He was my doctor. My husband had just been killed in an accident. And my baby was to be born in three days. We were very poor, and I was frantic with worry. I had no money, Mr. Carter, no relatives. I'd never worked a day in my life. I could see no way to provide for the child who was coming. And you agreed to give up your baby? Yes. In a moment of weakness, I did. When June was born, Dr. Jessup registered her as being born to Mrs. Kemple instead of to me. Oh, perhaps it was wrong of him, but he felt it was the wisest thing to do. You've never seen her since? No, Mr. Carter. Bitterly as I've regretted my decision, I'd sworn I'd never try to see her again. And I never have. Did anyone else beside you, the doctor, and the Kempels know of this? No, not a soul. Even Phyllis was never told. She believes June to be her own natural sister. Ah, I doubt that she does now. Mrs. Perkins, you must go back to the city with me at once. Not only June's sanity, but her life may be in danger at this very moment. Say you found some real evidence, Nick? The best in the world, Patsy. I found Mrs. Perkins here. Well, 
I understand, Nick. You'll know the whole story in a few minutes. That's as soon as we get to the Campbell's house. Is it a plot against June, Mr. Carter? Is she really all right? Yes, Wyatt, I believe so. It'll take time to get her back on her feet, but basically she's as sane as you or I. But who would want to do a thing like this? It could only be one person. And how she found out about it, I don't know. But she did, obviously. Uh, Mr. Carter, how much further? I promised once I'd never see June again, but now I... That's one I... promise that is better broken than kept. Well, here we are. Oh, that must be Maddie's man across the street. You three go in. I'll be with you as soon as I get his report. Miss protest, Mr. Carter. This is outrageous. Sorry, this Mrs. Time Everett. Night. It has to be done this way. Everybody's here, Nick. All except Phyllis. She's been in bed with a migraine headache ever since dinner. Ah. Uh, well, we'll go ahead without her. Okay. June? Yes? You say various things happen to you that seem to indicate that you're losing your mind. Yes, Mr. Carter. Just like my poor mother when, when she was losing her mind. How do you know about your mother? Oh, I... I Alex told me. Alex told you. Huh? Mr. Benson, may I ask if you knew Mrs. Kemple? Why, no, I didn't. She died before I met Phyllis. And how do you know how she acted while she was going to pieces? Well, I've heard the story from Phyllis. Complete with details? Why, well, yes. Recently? Why, well, I guess she has told me more in the last few weeks than she ever did before, but... What are you getting at? I won't let them take me away. I'll kill myself first. I will. I will. Steady, June. Steady. That won't be necessary. There's nothing wrong with you mentally, and there never has been. But, but all those queer things. Every single one of those things is a trick, suggestion, planted in your mind. But my mother died in that place. No, June, you're wrong. She didn't. Why, me? June's mother is alive and well today. I'd like to introduce her to you. Mrs. Leona Perkins. This is the most fantastic story I ever heard. Are you sure? I am. I have positive proof. Dr. Jessup's story and Mrs. Perkins' story, which can be backed up with documentary proof. And if you want something you can see for yourself, look at June's little finger. I've just now noticed how she has the same peculiar little crook at the end of it that Mrs. Perkins has. By golly, Nick, you're right. It's just the same. You're my mother... My real mother? Yes, June, darling. Your real mother. Oh. Oh, mother. <laughs> Mr. Carter, who in heaven's name would want to do this to June? A person who was afraid that she might be susceptible to the thing that killed her mother, and consequently hated the person who wasn't. A person who wanted to prove that it was someone else, not her, who was the weak one. Carter, do you realize what you're saying? Unfortunately, Benson, I do. But you mean that Phyllis... Phyllis? Oh, of course he doesn't, Alex. That's sheer nonsense. Mrs. Benson, didn't you help June write the note that broke her engagement to Randy Wyatt? Yes, at her request. After you talked me into doing it. And didn't you suggest that June heard things and felt things, and then when you got her believing she did, didn't you suggest to Alex that those things were a sign of mental weakness? She did. I can tell now. She was always asking me if I didn't feel this or hear that. I thought she was trying to help me, but I was trying to help. Where have you been the last two, three hours? In my room with a headache. No, you weren't. You drove to Barnstable, shot Dr. Jessup so he couldn't tell me the secret and came back here. My man saw you come in. You sneaked in the back door and up to your room, changed your shoes because they got muddy in the doctor's backyard, and then you came down here to brazen it out. Randy, if you look, I'm sure you'll find the muddy shoes in her room, and you'll find the motor of her car still hot. And probably you'll find a gun in her car, too. I'll take a look right now. Stay where you are, all of you. You may find the muddy shoes, but I've got the pistol right here, and I'm going to kill you all. You're a pack of sneaking... Better take something. her away, officer, before she hurts someone. Officer? I'll what take her. Oh, I'll sit, I'll take her. Yeah. All right, all right. No harm done. Alex, take her upstairs. Keep her in her room. Yes, Mr. Carter. Come on, Phyllis. Sure. Lock me up. Just the way they locked my mother up. You think I'm crazy, but I'm not. I'm as sane as any of you. I'll show you. I'll show you. How could you do such a thing, Phyllis? Why should you hate me so? Why shouldn't I hate you? I've hated you from the moment I found those old letters of father's after he died. Those letters from Dr. Jessup, which gave away the whole story. Dr. Jessup said he hoped I'd never suffer as my mother did. Said he could understand how pleased father was to know that there was no possibility of you having inherited any tendency to a mental weakness. I knew what he meant. 
and I hated you for it. I wish I'd killed you long ago. Oh, come, Phyllis. You'll feel better in your own room. Uh, Mrs. Everett, will you come with us, please? Of course, Mr. Benjamin. Take I'll your hands off. Oh, no, 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 what a no, terrible no. thing. Yes. If she never found those letters, this whole thing might never have happened. They not only turned her against June, they planted the fear of insanity in her own mind. And the hate and the fear together grew into a phobia that was too strong for her. Mr. Carter, I, I don't know what to say. If there's any way I can repay you, you have only to name it. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. I feel as if a load had been lifted off my heart. This is a wonderful thing you've done, Mr. Carter. A wonderful thing. God bless you for doing it. Nick? Hmm? In the excitement, I forgot. Forgot what? Waldo. Well, what about Waldo? Waldo is being held in Barnstable on charge of killing Dr. Jessup. What? Yes. He called us before you got back. Said he'd try to explain what happened... But the sheriff didn't believe him. <laughs> Especially since two shots have been fired from his pistol and two shots killed Dr. Jessup. Oh, poor Waldo. I suppose the more they questioned him, the more excited he got that he finally talked himself right into his cell. Well, you better do something about it, Nick, before Waldo goes crazy. <laughs> uh, b- 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 before he... Okay, okay, Patsy. May I use your phone, June? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> poor Waldo. Oh, operator, I want the sheriff's office in Barnstable. Yes, the sheriff's office, that's right. Yeah, I want to talk to the sheriff himself. Sheriff. Well, Nick, how about a little look into next week's story? No sooner said than done, Hugh. It all started with a man being strangled in his hotel room in the very early hours of the morning. And then went on to include a piece of silk torn from a shirt, a dictaphone record, and a missing wife. Who was missing because her husband wanted it that way but refused to stay missing when she received a letter containing a railroad ticket. It was really the hotel Uh, maid. uh, uh, Patsy, Uh save something for next week. Uh, What do you call your story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Dictaphone Murder. Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of The Shadow Comics. In the broadcast of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor and Peggy Mayer. Any resemblance of these programs to actual persons living or dead or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at this same time. This is Hugh Sanders saying so long until next week. of the dictaphone murder. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick should be here any minute, Mr. Buckley. He told me on the phone that he'd be here at 9 o'clock. That's why I came so early. It's only a few minutes after 9. Now it won't be long. You see, I've got a great... Oh. Good morning, Patsy. Hello, Nick. Oh, good morning, Mr. Buckley, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Carter. When I met you after your lecture at the club the other evening, I said to myself, that's the man I'll go to when I need help. (laughs) And you need it now? Very much. I want you to thoroughly investigate Roger Denham, the man who's going to marry my daughter. Well, what's he done? I don't know that he's done anything. I simply want to be sure that he's the right kind of man to be my son-in-law. Well, really, Mr. Buckley, I don't go in for that sort of thing at all. Oh, that's not the only reason. The Buckley Corporation is going to build a large new office building, and Roger Denham has been awarded the contract for the work. I want to know that he can carry it out successfully. Mr. Buckley, I deal for the most part in crime. It interests me, and I've made it my life work. What you're asking me to do does not interest me. Furthermore, I don't have the time for it. I see. Well, perhaps this will interest you. It's an anonymous letter I received in the mail this morning. I don't put much stock in such things, but 
Well, here it is. Roger Denham is married, has been for six years. His wife is now on her way to the Royal Arms Hotel. Better warn your daughter. Does that interest you, Mr. Carter? Not very much. Information like that can be checked too easily to offer any problem as far as I'm concerned. Nothing very mysterious about this note. It's typed on a decent grade of paper by a fairly good typewriter. Half of the letter L is missing because of a defective type bar, and there's no threat in it, except one fact. I'm sorry you won't act for me, Mr. Carter, but I suppose you have your reasons. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Oh, morning, Patsy. Nick there? Oh, yes, he is. Just a minute. For you, Nick, Sergeant Matheson. What got you down to your office early, Matty? What do you mean, office? I've been there, and now I'm up here at the Royal Arms. If you're not busy, you might take a run over here. What's up? Murder. Guy named Roger Denham. Did you say Roger Denham? I did. Why? Friend of yours? No, just a coincidence, that's all. What about Denham, Mr. Carter? What's the story, Matty? He's been strangled to death. If uh, you're not busy... I'll be right over. What room? 312. I'll wait for you, Nick, but make it snappy. I will. So long. Mr. Carter, has something happened to Denham? Buckley, when did you see him last? Mm, Yesterday evening. I called on him at the hotel to see if I could find out something about him personally. Why? He's just been murdered. Murdered? Denham? Yes. Police are there in his room now. Let me have that letter again. Yes, of course. Here. Thanks. Well, top of the morning to you, Patsy. Nick. Hello, Walter. Don't bother to sit down, Walter. You and I are going out immediately. I'm going to look into a murder. Hi, Matty. Well, Nick, you made good time. It's only 9.30. Uh, yep. Oh, hello, Buffalo Bill. Well, if it ain't the terror of the police force himself. Uh, stuck, are you? No, I'm not stuck. Just thought Nick might like to have a look-see. Right, Matty. What have you found so far? Well, there's the body, Nick, right on the floor where we found it. He was strangled by some guy with an enormous pair of hands. You can still see the marks on his throat. Mm. Must have been a struggle the way the room was upset, but it wasn't robbery. Nothing is missing, as far as we can tell. Any fingerprints? No, nope, not a one. Maid found the body when she came in to clean about 9 o'clock. Coroner says death occurred about 8.30 this morning. All night party or an early morning blowout? I checked with a room clerk, and he says he saw no visitors this morning. But the telephone operator says a guy named Johnny Casper called about 7.45 this morning. She said she knew his voice because he'd called so often before. He came here. He'd know the way without asking at the desk. Yeah. Said she wasn't listening, but she uh, <laughs> gathered from what she just happened to hear that Casper wanted to see Denham right away. Well, we can look into that when we... Go in. Room 312. Is Mr. Denham there? Who's calling? Mr. Allen of the Buckley Corporation. I'd like to talk to Mr. Denham. What do you want to talk to Denham about? Uh, who are you? This I'm... is Nick Carter. I'm sorry to say you can't talk to Denham. He's just been murdered. Uh, Denham? Murdered? Did you say murdered? I did. What do you want to talk to him about? Why, I'm the chairman of the board for the Buckley Corporation. We have just awarded a contract to Mr. Denham for the construction of the Buckley Building, and I wanted to make an appointment with him to settle a number of details. Uh, And you say he's... Unfortunately, yes, Mr. Allen. Uh, It's terribly unfortunate. Uh, Well, goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, Some friend of Denham's, Nick? Business acquaintance, apparently. Wanted to make a date with him. Uh, It's a little late for that, I'm thinking. Hey, Nick, here's something. Yes, what is it, Matty? It's a piece of silk. Pocket off a shirt, I'd say. Found it clenched in Denham's fist. Ah. Must have been ripped off in the struggle. A clue, by golly. Now we can start investigating, Nick. Looks like it. Matty, will you let me have this? Oh, now, look, Nick. That's the only real piece of evidence we got. I know it. I'll take care of it. Just want to find out what Mills made it and what they did with it. Oh, but, Nick, look, why Now, look, I can do it faster than you can, Matty. You know that. Oh, I suppose so, but I still... Thanks. Waldo, suppose you dig around and find out what mills this piece of silk came from. Shouldn't be difficult because there's a flaw here in the weave. Should make identification easy. You better get going. Legwork. Always legwork for Waldo. A good detective like me, and I ain't allowed to detect. A good detective follows orders, too. Don't forget that. Oh, sure, Nick, sure. I was just... So long, Waldo. I'll see you at the office later. Okay, Nick, okay. Well, Nick, I guess there isn't much else here we can see. I'll just take a look around while I'm here. Yeah. Huh? The room looks as if somebody had been through it, looking for something. The way it's all upside down. Yeah, that's what I thought. What do you suppose he was looking for? I wouldn't know, Matty. I... Yeah. You see this? Huh? This piece of wire sticking out under the closet door? No, what is it? Well, let's see. Hey, it goes up the closet wall and through the ceiling. The maid's still here? Yeah, right outside. 
Hey, May. Yes, sir? Who lives in the room over this? Nobody, sir. It's empty. Or it was yesterday afternoon when I cleaned it up about half past four. That sounds suspicious in itself, an empty hotel room these days. Royal on. Desk clerk, please. Desk clerk. This is Nick Carter on the murder of Denham. Who has room 412? Uh, Mrs. Denham has it now, sir. Mrs. Denham? Yes, sir. When did she come in? Uh, just a few minutes ago. Denham reserved the room yesterday for friends, he said. When Mrs. Denham came in, I supposed he meant it for her, so I gave it to her. I called Denham to check, but got no answer. What time was that? Uh, about five minutes to nine. Do you know anything about a wire in the closet of 312? <laughs> a wire? I know, Mr. Carter, I don't. That's all, thanks. Matty, I believe this wire is a part of the answer to this murder. Yeah? Let's go up and have a... Hey, that came from upstairs, Mr. Mr. Denham. Come on, Matty, hurry. No good, Nick. He disappeared somewhere. Went down the fire escape and either got to the bottom or slipped into a room on the way down. Mm, too bad. Now, Mrs. Denham, suppose you tell me the whole story right from the beginning. Well, I got here this morning just before 9 o'clock. The clerk said Roger had engaged this room for me, so I came up. I was too tired to unpack, so I just lay down on the bed for a few minutes. I didn't sleep because I had a queer feeling someone was watching me. Then about 15 minutes ago, I got up, washed, and started down to get some breakfast. But after I'd gone a few steps, I found I'd forgotten my lipstick, so I came back for it. As I opened the door, I saw a man in the room, just starting to climb out the window. I screamed, and he, he disappeared. Did you get a good look at him? No, I didn't. But he looked like a large man with, with big hands. I saw those. Mrs. Denham, how does it happen you arrived here just this time? Why, I got an anonymous letter yesterday. Here it is. Thank you. Your husband has been out of the army for six weeks. He is staying here at the Royal Arms. Pretends he's not married and is making big play for daughter of head of Buckley Corporation. And close his ticket from your town here. Better come if you want to avoid trouble. And the letter L, only half prints. Same typewriter and move notes. What was that, Mr. Carter? Oh, uh, nothing. Go on with your story, please. I didn't even know Roger was out of the army. The last I heard was two months ago... When he wrote that he and his buddy, Johnny Casper... Nick, Johnny Casper again. Yes. Go ahead, Mrs. Denham. He said they were getting out any minute, and he let me know as soon as they did. But when this letter came, I thought I... Yes, well... I know. And that's all? Well, yes, I think so. You mind if I have a look in your closet? My closet? Why, no, not at all. Anything here, Nick? There certainly is. A dictaphone machine. What? Uh... There's the wire that comes up from downstairs. This is what I rather expected, Matty. Denham was making a record of an interview we had with someone, but the record is gone. Uh -huh. That's what the guy Mrs. Denham saw was after. Maybe he got it, Nick. Mrs. Denham, how long were you out of this room? Just a few seconds, no longer. I went out and then came back almost at once. Then the man didn't get it, Matty. Wouldn't have had time. But someone got it. That's the clue we ought to have, Nick. I bet it would tell the whole story. Yes, there must have been something pretty incriminating on it to make him kill Denham. Kill? Did you say kill Denham? Oh, no. I'm sorry, Mrs. Denham. I didn't realize you heard me. I'm very sorry, but it's true. Oh. Your husband was killed about an hour ago. Roger, dead. Matty, better take this machine to headquarters. See if there are any prints on it will help. Okay, you can get Mrs. Denham's, too, just in case. Well, Nicky, don't make I don't know. Better take no chances. Let me get the serial number on the machine so I can have Patsy check on it, and I'll be on my way. Get on your way where, Nicky? See Johnny Casper. He looks like a good starting point. You see, Mr. Carter, we were buddies in the service. I liked Roger, so when we got out, I brought him back here with me. He'd been a contractor in a small town about 100 miles north of here, and I thought perhaps we could go in business together. I'm a contractor, too, you know. No, I didn't. Oh, yes, I've done some pretty big things for a young fellow. Well, anyway, I introduced Roger to Mr. Allen, the chairman of the board of the Buckley Corporation, and to Buckley himself. Then I took him up to Olive's house one night. She's Buckley's daughter. I was engaged to her at the time. Well, I introduced him to her. <laughs> what a heel that guy turned out to be. That's how do you mean, Casper? Well, instead of bidding on the Buckley building with me as partners... He submitted a separate bit of his own. And he entertained Alan and every member of the board at parties. And he made a big play for my girl behind my back. 
Knifed me every way he could. My pal. You say you were engaged to Miss Buckley. You're not now? Oh, I'll say I'm not. Two days ago, when I called her to make a date, she told me we were through. She was now engaged to Denham. So you have little reason to like Denham. I've never hated anybody in my life the way I hated that man. Where were you this morning about 8 o'clock? This morning? Why, why, I was right here in bed. You're sure? You weren't at the Royal Arms talking to Denham. What in heaven's name makes you think Answer my question, Casper. Were you at the Royal Arms? Why, no, I... Well, yes, I was, too. Why should I deny it? I went down to tell Roger to lay off my girl. I'd tell his wife what was going on. And what did he say to that? He told me to go as far as I liked. He was on top and he was going to stay there in spite of the devil and me. Did you two have a fight? With words, yes, but that's all. Got so mad I left him and came back here to think. I see you have a typewriter. You mind if I try it? Why, no, go right ahead. Thanks. Uh. So it was you who wrote those anonymous letters to Buckley and to Mrs. Denham? Yes, I did. I'm not ashamed of doing it. I hated Denham. Enough to kill him? Yes, but I didn't. I saw too much killing in the war. It's funny, isn't it? I bring my buddy back here to help him out, and he cheats me out of everything I want. Underbids me on the Buckley job and even steals my girl. <laughs> what a laugh. No, I didn't kill him. But I wish I had long ago. <laughs> But I was referred to you to... And am I glad you were. We don't get many in here like you, baby. I, I want to find out something about... I'm the boy that can tell you, baby. Anything you want to know. I have here the serial number. Now, of... look, let's not talk about numbers. Let's talk about you. You're the number I'm interested in right now. Oh, well, look, will you please listen? Am I listening to every word you say, gorgeous? Go ahead, talk. I want to find out about dictaphone machine number 24874-9AY. Hey, look. What are you doing tonight, Slick Chick? Working. Number 248749AY, please. I bet you do a mean rumba. How's about giving me a whirl tonight, hmm? Oh, look. I want to find out about this. Yeah, baby. I'm trying to find out, too. How late are you working tonight? Huh? Uh, I don't know. No, I bet you're not working at all. Just stalling me along to see how far I'll go. Uh, well, I'll go a long way for you, good looking. Oh, will you please? Oh, listen, Reb, how's about letting me call you when I get through tonight? Uh, together, uh, Come on, what do you say? All right, you win. Call me at Pennsylvania 68601. Ask for Patsy. a baby, now you're cooking on all four. Now, what do you want to know? Where this machine, 248749AY, has been for the last 48 hours. Well, leave me look. <laughs> 248749AY. Leased to a guy named Roger Denham yesterday afternoon. Not back yet. That make you happy, baby? Getting the information does. Thank you. Uh, hey, you can't go like this. It's almost my lunch hour. I was about putting on a pair of bibs together down at my place, hmm? You've got my phone number and my name, and that's all you're going to get from me. Goodbye. Oh, don't be like that, gorgeous. I just want... Oh, there you are, Patsy. We've been waiting for you. Find anything? Nick, do I look fascinating to you? Hey, hey look, Patsy, this is police headquarters, remember? Other men find me irresistible. Do you? Snap out of it, Patsy. Did you find out about the dictaphone? Huh? Oh, yes. Um, at least to Roger Denon yesterday afternoon for 48 hours. That checks, Matty. Huh? He expected a visitor and one of the interview recorded. Oh, I wish I knew what was on that record. Oh, I was starting to tell you when Patsy came in, Nick. There were two sets of fingerprints on that dictaphone. Denon's and somebody else's. The others don't check with any we got. They must be the murderers when he got the record. Are they extra large? They're... Hey, they aren't, Nick. They're they're small. So they couldn't have been his. Maybe they don't mean anything. Could have been on the machine when Denham got it. 
Anyway, uh, oh, Waldo, uh, how'd you make out? Uh, you asked me to find out about that there piece of silk, now, didn't you? I did. Well, when you give old Jedi McGlynn a job, he does it. Yes, sir. And I had some job, too, believe me, but I came through. For the love of Mike, Waldo, stop talking and say something. I'm trying to, but you keep interrupting me. Waldo, what did you find out? Well... The silk was woven by the seasoned mills. Now, they made up about a dozen shirts out of it, and then they discovered there was a flaw in the stuff. So they junked the rest, and they sold them shirts to the Lionel Men's Shop right here in town. Did you go there? No, I didn't. I thought maybe you would like to do some of the detecting yourself. Okay, okay. That's my next visit. The Lionel Men's Shop. Come on, Patsy. Come on. This is Nick Carter, Mr. Buckley. I find that you bought a dozen white silk shirts from the Lionel shop a few months ago. Yes, I did. They offered me a special price, I recall. Why? Did you keep them all yourself? Why, no, I didn't. I got them just before Christmas, and I gave several of them away as presents. Could you tell me to whom you gave them? Well, now, uh, let me see. Uh, I remember giving Alan three of them, and I kept five for myself, I think. And the others... Oh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, my daughter, Olive, gave the rest to Johnny Casper so he'd have some when he got out of the army. Uh, they were going around together at that time. Nobody else got any? I believe not. Couldn't swear to it, of course. All right, thanks. Sorry to bother you. Goodbye. What do you say, Nick? He kept some, gave some to Alan, and some to Casper. Casper? We keep coming back to him, don't we? Same so. He certainly had a motive. But if he did it, where does the dictaphone come in? Oh, yes, I, I see what you mean. But who else is there? Alan? Well, I suppose we better check on his whereabouts at the time of the killing this morning. Mustn't leave any stone unturned. Come on. No, Mr. Allen isn't at home just now, Mr. Carter. Can I do anything for you? Perhaps. What time did Mr. Allen get up this morning? At his usual hour, sir. About 9.30. Are you sure of that? Oh, absolutely, sir. He came downstairs in his pajamas and dressing gown to ask me about a suit he couldn't find. It was at the cleaners. What time were you up this morning? I start work at 8 o'clock regularly, sir. It's my habit. And you didn't see Mr. Allen until 9.30? Why, no, sir. Uh, may I inquire why you're asking all these questions? You may, but I'm not going to answer just now. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Come on, Patsy. Let's try something else. Maybe we'll have more luck there. <laughs> You going to check up on Mr. Buckley? Buckley? Well, yes. You've investigated two of the three men who got the silk shirts. You can't omit Buckley, can you? I suppose you're right, Patsy. We can't afford to... Oh, I wish I had that record Denim made. Mm. That would probably tell us the motive. Just now, we are completely missing a motive. Well, Casper had one. But as you've said, that doesn't account for the record. No, it doesn't. I wonder... Huh? What is it, Nick? Wait. I want to call Maddie. I'm going to the drugstore here. Okay. I'll be right back. All right. <clears throat> Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Oh, Maddie, Nick, tell me. When you examined the prints in the dictaphone, did you find any of the smaller prints lapping over Denham's prints? Uh, why... Come to think of it, yeah, Nick. Some of the little prints were on top of Dunham's. Why? Thanks. I'll see you later. Bye. What's going on, Nick? I think I know now where the missing dictaphone record is, Patsy. And when I get that, I should have the motive. And the murderer. Let's go, Nick. For goodness sake. Why did you ask to speak to the chambermaid? Because I think she has the answer. Well, what answer could she have? You'll see. You're the chambermaid who found Mr. Denham's body this morning in room 312? Yes, sir. I found him when I went in to clean the room. Did you go to room 412 this morning? Well, I did and I didn't. Yes, how do you mean? Well, you see, I clean the rooms that's vacant in the afternoon. The deadline's 5 o'clock, so I got to get them clean before then. So I cleaned up 412 yesterday, like always. That's a transient room. So this morning I opened 412 to see if somebody's been in. But when I seen it like I left it, I didn't go in. I see. 
You weren't in the room at all this morning. Like I told you, I just looked in and see nobody's been in, so I locked it up again. You won't mind letting me take your fingerprints, will you? Fingerprints? What do you want them for? Just for the record. You're not scared, are you? Scared? Why should I be scared? Then you won't mind if I take your prints? No, I... I don't guess so. How, uh... How do you do it? Just press your fingers on this little ink pad. Like this. Yeah. Then press them on this pad. Like this. Yeah. Yeah. Do they match, Nick? Match? Match what? So you didn't go in room 412 this morning. I told you, I... I I know what you told me. Now tell me the truth. You went to the door and you went in. And you took a record off a dictaphone machine you found in the closet. Why? Golly, mister. Can you tell all that from my fingerprints? I can. So you better tell me the truth. All right. Well, here's what happened, and it's the gospel truth. I opened the door like I said. Then, just as I started to close it again, I heard a funny noise. I listened, and it came from the closet. I looked, and there was a funny machine there with one of them trick kind of records on it. And you took it? Yeah. I didn't think it was stealing. I just wanted to see what was on it. So I, I brought it down here, and when I got a chance, I was going to play it on one of the machines in the office. But I, I've been too busy. Do you know that Denham was killed for that record? Honest, mister. And if the murderer finds you've got it now, you're next. Gee, I wouldn't like that. I don't want to be killed. Then you better get me the record right now. Sure. Sure, mister. I, I got it hidden in one of the cleaning closets. I'll get it for you, honest. You wait right here. We'll wait. And then we'll play the record, Patsy. I've got to know what's on it. <laughs> Buckley, Nick. Sorry to be late, Mr. Carter, but I got held up in traffic. It's quite all right, Mr. Buckley. Now that you're all here, Buckley, Alan Casper, and Sergeant Matheson, I'll tell you why I called you together. As you know, Roger Denham was murdered this morning in his hotel room, strangled. The only real clues we had were the prints of an unusually large hand on Denham's throat and a silk shirt pocket, evidently torn off during the struggle. We traced the shirts and found that each of you three men had one or more of those shirts. Casper has no alibi for the time of the killing. Alan, according to his butler, has. And Buckley, we don't know about. If you'd asked me, I could have told you where I was. I'm sure you could, Mr. Buckley, right to the very minute, no doubt. So any one of you might have owned the shirt with a torn pocket. We had to get at it another way. Motive. Which of you had the strongest motive to kill Denham? Buckley and Alan don't seem to have any reason. But Casper did. Now, look here, Carter. Are you trying to pin this on me? Sit down, Casper, and wait until I finish. I won't pin murder on anyone unless it belongs there. As I said, we needed a motive. But it was only late this afternoon that chance, plus a rational and logical elimination of other possibilities, gave me the answer. I now have the motive, and with it, the murderer. And what is it, Mr. Carter? Yes, don't keep us waiting this way. Here it is. Listen. All right, Patsy. Right. Hello, Alan. What brings you out so early in the morning? I think you know, Denham. You stop that machine. Yeah. Give me that record. What's the trouble, Mr. Well, Allen? Stop that machine. Oh, I owe you Take that record and now. I want these gentlemen to hear what it says. Confound you, Carter. I'll put a bullet right in you. Put a bullet nowhere, murderer. Give me that gun. Come on. Better. All right, gentlemen. Now that Mr. Allen is quiet again, I'd like you to hear the rest of this record. Start it again, Patsy. All right. Hello, Allen. What brings you out so early in the morning? I think you know, Denham. A little matter of money. Money? What money? Do I owe you something? Hey, what is this? You trying to kid me? No, no, indeed. I uh, just don't understand. You know? You bid on the contract for the construction of the new Buckley building, remember? That's right. You are not the low bidder. You came in second. You were over $50,000 higher than the low bid. Right again. I reported to the board that I was convinced that the low bidder was not equipped to do this job and recommended giving it to you in spite of your price. That's very decent of you, Al. Decent? You promised me $10,000 if I got you that contract. That's why I'm here. I want half of that $10,000 now before the contract is signed. Hey, Alan, I never promised to pay you to get me that contract. I don't do business that way. Why, you double-crossing gip artist! You'll pay me what you promised or that contract will never be signed, I promise you. But the board awarded it to me. On my recommendation, 
And they'll award it to someone else if I don't get what's coming to me. I boss that board, and don't forget it. They do what I say. And you're going to do what you said you would, or else. That's the end, Nick. That's the most incredible thing I ever heard. So Alan killed Mr. Allen, would you care to tell us what happened after the record was shut off? Nothing. I left at once. May I see your shirt? No. Yes. Uh, open your vest. <clears throat> That's a good boy. Nicky he hasn't changed his shirt. His pocket's missing. Very probably. He didn't even know it was gone on all the excitement of the murder. And if further proof is needed, I believe his hands will correspond to the marks on Denham's throat. I see you have unusually large hands, Mr. Allen. Denham was a louse. He shut the machine off and told me he'd been making a record of our conversation. Said if I tried to collect what he'd promised me, he'd take the record to Buckley. I knew that would ruin me, and so I... You killed him so you could find the record, so you could destroy it. I wouldn't have believed it possible. Well, you're right about one thing. You're through, finished, as far as I'm concerned. And as far as the state is concerned, too. The chair will finish him. That's the case, gentlemen. Oh, that's for me, Nick. Well, you, Patsy... Who is it, you know? Oh, I'll say I do. Wait till he hears what I'm going to tell him. Oh, but I do wish somebody else would talk to me that way. Just once in a while. Hello! Well, Nick, isn't it about time for you to give us a glimpse into next week's story? Why, I shouldn't be surprised if you were right, Ken. Well, suppose you take over, then. Right. The ingredients of my story next week are, first, a man who died of heart failure, but who was really murdered. A will, which was the will the old man wrote, but which proved to be not the will he wrote. And a signature, which was forced by a person who wanted it known it had been forged. Sounds like a fine collection of contradictions to me. What do you call it, Nick? I call it the case of the clumsy forgeries. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In the broadcasts of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, Waldo by Humphrey Davis. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor and Peggy Mayer. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's the case of the clumsy forgeries. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. much more to do on this report? Not much, Patsy. Why? Well, uh, it's after five and I have an appointment with my hairdresser at six. Well, you'll make it all right. I'll see that you do. Far be it for me to prevent you from making yourself as beautiful as you can. Oh, Nick, what a thing to say. No, I was only joking, Patsy. Really, you're a fine-looking girl. Oh, Nick. Do you mean that? Well, yes, of course I do. Oh, that's the first personal compliment you've paid me in all the years I've been working for you. I didn't know you ever noticed me. Except as your assistant. Oh, I notice a good many things I don't mention, Patsy. Oh, don't I know that by now? Why, I can... Oh, darn it. I bet I don't keep that date with a hairdresser after all. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Uh, is Nick there, Miss Bowen? This is Dr. Bradford. Oh, yes, just a minute, Doctor. Here, Nick, Dr. Bradford. Oh, thanks. Oh, Doc, where have you been keeping yourself all these months? I haven't seen you in a dog's age. I know it, Nick. That's the old story. A shortage of doctors makes double work for the rest of us. Especially good ones like you. Well, what's new? Well, Nick, I've just run into a very peculiar thing. 
and I think you can help me. I'm glad to if I can. Let's have it. Well, I've been treating old Gerald Gould for years. Mm -hmm. He's been in bed with a very bad heart for some time now, due to pop off almost any minute. Well, this afternoon, when I dropped in for my regular visit at 5 o'clock, I, I found him dead. Heart failure? To the best of my ability to determine so quickly, yes. But when I started to straighten out the body so it wasn't as twisted as it was when he died, I found a piece of paper under him, on which was scribbled, he killed me, he gave me. That's all. Looks as if he started to write something and died before he could finish it. Could he have been having hallucinations? I wouldn't say so, but I'd like your opinion before I do anything. Maybe you can find something that I've missed that'll show whether it was murder or not. You at the Gould house now? Yes. Could you take a run over here? Certainly, Doc, if you really think it'll help. Oh, I'm sure it will. But, uh, just in case, suppose you come as my assistant. Say, uh, Mr. Mr. Oh, Mr. Nicholas, how's that? Oh, fine, fine. All right, Doc, I'll be there in ten minutes. <laughs> You see, Nick, this note was under his shoulder, just as if he'd rolled over on it in his last moments. This pencil was there, too. How long had he been dead when you arrived? Only a few minutes at most. Uh-huh. Tell me, Doc, isn't it perfectly possible to kill a man with a bad heart in such a way as to make it look like heart failure? Well, yes, easily. Any stimulant that acted on his heart would do it in pretty short order. But does he show any signs of such a stimulant? No, but that wouldn't prove anything. An autopsy is the only way to be sure. Yes, of course. Well, let's see if we can find any evidence here to point in one direction or the other. Ah, if anything was given him, it could have been in this glass. The only one near enough for him to have reached it. Hmm. Ah, only one person's fingerprints on it. See the old man's thumb. Yes, same all right. That little scar makes it definite. That's peculiar, to say the least. What do you mean, Nick? Well, if you give a person a drink, do you wipe your own prints off the glass first? Of course not. Oh, I see what you're getting at. Somebody did give him something deliberately. That would be my guess. Just take this along. Have the contents analyzed. I can wrap it in this wax paper. Oh, by the way, have you told the family yet? That he's dead, yes. Not that he was killed. Huh. I asked them to wait downstairs until I was ready for them. Let's see. There are two sons, if I recall. Yes, Raymond is the elder and Peter. What are they like? Well, Raymond is pretty much of a sport, but Peter is a quiet, stay-at-home type. They're both nice fellows, so far as I know. Uh-huh. Did Gould have a nurse? Yes. Would you like to see her? She's in the next room. Yes, please. Oh, I'll get her. Uh, Miss Waters? Yes? Miss Waters, would you come in, please? Yes, Doctor. Miss Waters, this is Mr. Carter. Nick Carter. How do you is do? Is he detective? Yes. I regret to tell you that Mr. Gould did not die naturally. He was murdered. <gasps> murdered? But, Doctor, you said he died of heart failure. He did, Miss Waters. But somebody induced that heart failure. I want to know. Where were you when Mr. Gould died? Why, um, in the kitchen, I suppose. You see, every day Dr. Bradford comes to see Mr. Gould around 5 o'clock. So about 4.30, I go down to the kitchen to get his supper ready. He likes to eat right after the doctor goes. And I was there till Dr. Bradford called me to tell me Mr. Gould was dead. Was anyone there with you? The cook was, same as always. You don't think I did it, do you? Just checking up, that's all. Hmm. Did you give him anything except his regular medicine today? No. You ever use the glass that was here in the corner of this table? Well, that was Mr. Gould's water glass. Anybody could have used it to give him a drink. He drank lots of water. Mm-hmm. Mr. Gould keep any valuables here in this room? The well, only thing I know about is that box of his on the shelf under the table over there. He used to... Well, I declare, it's open. Was it usually kept locked? Oh, yeah. Never saw it open before unless he was using it. And look at the keys there on the table. They was always kept under his pillow. So look at that. No, no, don't touch it. Maybe prints on it that we'll need. Now look at it carefully like this. Uh, yes, this copper surface shows up the prints excellently. Well, what is it, Nick? This is strange. Only one set of prints on this, too. Are they Mr. Gould's? No, I don't think so. I can't be sure. Well, let's see what's inside. Sorted papers, letter from his lawyer, few notes. Oh, and a will. Signed and witnessed by Amelia Waters and Delphina Hayes. That's cooking me. Hmm. Leaves a thousand a year to Peter, and the rest to Raymond. 
Oh, you must be mistaken, Nick. He'd never leave everything to Raymond. Well, that's what it says here. That's queer. That's very queer indeed. Does Raymond know about this will? Oh, no, sir, he doesn't. Cook and I were told to keep it a secret, and we have. I see. Are both the boys here now, Doctor? Well, yes, downstairs in the living room. Good. I'll take the dead man's prints, and then we'll have a talk with the two sons. <laughs> to report a murder as soon as it's discovered. Why ask me a fool question like that? I just wanted to be sure, Matty. Oh, for the love of Pete. Very uh, well, here's the report. Yeah. Uh, Gerald Gould has just been found dead in his bed. Apparently died of heart failure. But that ain't murder, Nick. That's a... Uh, well, that... Uh, oh, fooey. But it is murder. Even though the only real proof at the moment is my own hunch. Well, why didn't you say so? I'll have a man up there right away. No use, Matty. You won't find anything. But... Won't find anything. Why not? Because I've got all the clues with me, so don't bother sending anyone up here. But, Nick, if there's a murder, I can Not this it. time, Matty. Leave everything to me. We'll see you in a little while. Goodbye. Now, wait, Nick. I'm a... Did you say well, father was murdered? Father. Boys, this isn't really my assistant. It's Nick Carter, the private investigator. Nick Carter? Now, boys, it seems to be a little questioned but what your father died of heart failure. Induced by someone who wanted him dead now rather than later. And that's murder. I well, can't believe it. Do either of you know the terms of your father's will? No, I don't. I've always understood he was planning to leave most of his money to Peter. He didn't exactly approve of me. Where have you two been this afternoon? I've been right here in the living room since after lunch. I came home about three o'clock, and I've been in my room ever since. Did either of you go to the sick room this afternoon at any time? I didn't. I didn't leave my room. I haven't been near it. Have there been any visitors? No, if there had been, I'd have seen them come in. Mr. Carter, what makes you think father was murdered? He left a note which said so. And also, there's additional evidence to support that fact in the fingerprints and the glass he used and on the strong box he kept in his room. Could you explain what you mean, Mr. Carter? Not just now. Then I suppose that if no one came in from outside, all of us here in the house, the cook, the nurse, Raymond and I, are all suspects? You are. I'd like to take your fingerprints, if I may. Why? I'll need them as evidence. Just put your fingers on this ink pad. So. And on this paper. Like this. Good. All right, Peter. You don't mind? Not at all. That's right. All right, thank you, both of you. Now, neither of you will leave town until I say so. All right, sir. But how do you go about finding a killer in a case like this? Routine investigation to start with. Look into the backgrounds and personal lives of everyone concerned. That brings out the motives and frequently gives us information that will help determine guilt or innocence. Together with actual clues present at the scene of the crime, of course. Sounds pretty complicated to me. Sounds complicated to me, too, but... There's one thing about Nick Carter. He has a reputation for always uncovering the guilty party once he gets on a case. Nothing gets away from him. Well, I wish you luck, Mr. Carter. You better let me wish you luck. Because it won't be lucky for whoever killed Mr. Gould. All right, Doc, you ready? Right with you, Nick. Good day, boys. Goodbye, Dr. Bradford. Well, Nick, where do you start this uh, investigation of yours? Well, I think that before I do anything else, I better turn these documents I found in the strong box over to Mr. Lind, Gould's lawyer. Oh, I can take them down for you. I'm going that way. Oh, would you? Thanks. I'm glad to do it. That'll let me get to police headquarters a little sooner. <laughs> Matthew must be ready to hang me by now. <laughs> It's darn near time you got here. You tell me there's been a murder, and then you tell me to stay away. Well, I sent a couple of men up there anyway. Well, that is, I told you on the phone, they won't find anything. I've got huh? the only clues with me right here in the bag. I'm saving you time. Save me time? Yeah. Give me heart failure. Oh, what a pal. All right, here we are. Here's a drinking glass. Contents unknown, with only the dead man's prints on it. <sighs> Have it analyzed to see what was in it, will you? Yeah, all right, Mr. Carter. Whatever you say. Thank you. Yes, sir. Come in here. Yes, sir. Now, what else, Nick? Here's a copper box with some fingerprints on it. Gould kept his will and some other papers in it. Yeah? And here, for comparison, are the prints of the dead man and his two sons. See if the prints in the box can be identified. Yes, Sergeant. Here. Take this glass to the chemist. Tell him I want to know what was in it. And have the fingerprint boys look this box over. Right, Sergeant. And here, Matty, is a note found under the dead man's body. Here, let me see that. He killed me. He gave me... 
Well, I suppose he just had time to write this before he passed out. That's what I thought, too. But then when I found this pencil under the body, I wasn't so sure. How do you mean? The note was written with a soft pencil. But the pencil I found is a hard one. So the whole thing is a put-up job. Murder. I told you that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you did. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking. Uh, I can think, too, can I? I hope so. Uh, why, you... Uh, okay, okay. Oh. Now, look, Nick, would you mind telling me about the murder? Very simple, Matty. Gerald Gould had a very bad heart. Somebody gave him a stimulant. Started his heart racing, overtaxed it, and it stopped. He died. Huh. So, and without the clues you picked up, it would have looked like a natural death. Not bad, not bad. Here's the report, Sergeant. Oh, let's see. Glass contained benzedrine and water. <laughs> it's an awful deadly combination. Certainly is, if the victim had a bad heart, as Mr. Gould did. How about the prints in the box? The only prints on the box are Raymond's. And that means what? Considering that the will, which was in the box, leaves practically everything to Raymond, it's interesting, to say the least. You, you mean he did it? I do not. But I'm going to start finding out who did it if I can. Where are you starting? Going to do some research work on the two ghoul boys. Well, good night, Matty. I'll see you soon. Okay. Hey, now look, Nick. Will you keep in touch with me? Oh, by the way, Matty, is Demler Street open again? Yeah, they finished it up yesterday. Why? It's a shortcut for me on my way back to the office. Less traffic saves time. Okay. Okay, so long. I'll be seeing you. Uh, even less traffic here than usual. I wonder if Patsy's back yet. I'd be just like her to wait for me when there's no need of it. Calling Patsy Bowen, private investigator. Calling Patsy Bowen. Patsy Bowen. Patsy. Are you in trouble? No, indeed. Just wanted to tell you to go on home. Oh, did you get your hair fixed? No, I've been waiting here. I never know when you're going to need me. Oh, sorry, Patsy. Go on home, go to bed. I'll tell you all about it in the morning. Okay, Nick. Good night. Huh. Poor Patsy. Always gets done on a moment. Hey! Hey, you... Hey, what are you doing? Driving through a red light like that. Who's driving through a red light? Well, you big palooka, are you? What's the matter? You colorblind? Look at the radiator of my car and the fender while you smash the whole front end. I don't see nothing. Show me where I hit you. Show you? Now, look here, man. See the way they... Oh. Oh. Uh. Oh. oh, is that you, Patsy? Hello? Hello, yourself. Oh, gosh, Nick, am I glad to hear you're talking sense again. Huh? Talking sense? Yes. You've been lying here in the hospital for almost two days now, muttering and making no sense at all. Two days? Did you say two days? Practically. That sock you got when you hit your head against the windshield almost gave you a concussion of the brain. Why, now, what? Say that again, Patsy. I said that sock you got when you hit your head against the windshield. Is that what you think happened? Why, of course. One of the prowl cars found you lying on the wheel of your smashed car with your forehead all cut and bloody. Patsy, it's a plot. I wasn't hurt when the smash-up occurred. Oh, I was... Oh, Nick. Does your head hurt you? Yes, it does, but I'm not out of my mind. After the accident, I got out and started to argue with a mug who ran into me when he suddenly socked me in the head when I wasn't looking. Huh? Is the car that ran into me still there? Oh, no. That was a funny thing. The other car was gone. Uh, somebody wanted to get rid of me and apparently thought they had. So they towed the other wreck away. But, Nick, who, who would want to kill you? For a guess, I'd say the same person who killed Gerald Gould. I was afraid I'd find out too much when I started investigating him. Well, he failed this time, and he won't get the chance again. And I'll find out what he was afraid I'd find out just as soon as I get out of this bed. Well, the doctor says you'll have to stay here at least another three or four days. Nonsense. I'll be out of here tomorrow at the latest. Oh, by the way, have you heard anything more about the Gould case? Uh-uh. Sergeant Matheson called this morning to ask how you were. Said he was getting nowhere rapidly. Oh, what? Uh... He said he heard the gold will was to be read tomorrow afternoon at the lawyer's office. Now I know I'll be out of here tomorrow. I've got to be present when that will is read. Oh, but Nick, you can't. And why do you have to be there? I don't know, Patsy. I just know I've got to be present when Mr. Lind reads that will. But the doctor... Doctor said... or no doctor, I'm going to be at Lind's office tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> Now, 
Now that Mr. Carter has arrived, I shall proceed to the reading of the will. What's the idea of having a detective and a cop here? This is a family affair. Uh, Raymond, Mr. Carter and Sergeant Matheson are here at my invitation. And now, if you're ready... Yes, All right, set, right. Mr. Lincoln. I shall be brief. This will, drawn up by Mr. Gould six days ago, directs that his funeral expenses and all other outstanding debts be paid first. He then directs that $1,000 a year for life be paid from his estate to his youngest son, Peter. What's that? I said he leaves you $1,000 a year for life. That's a dirty chip. He always said I was to have it all. Please, Peter, this is no time for an argument. Well, I can't live on that. Who gets the rest of the money? To his elder son, Raymond, Mr. Gould leaves the balance of his estate. Father never wrote that will. This is amazing. Father always said I'd get practically nothing. I'll bet you had a hand in this, Ray. Father would never do a thing like that to me. Not unless he'd been influenced. Peter, how can you think that? You had much more influence with Father than I ever did. Let me see that will. Uh, certainly. Here it is. See? I told you something was wrong. That's not Father's signature. Hey, no, wait a minute. What was that? I tell you, Father never signed that will. That signature is a forgery. Are you sure, Peter? Of course I'm sure. Get an expert. He'll tell you. Now that I look at it closely, it does look wrong. Uh, excuse me a moment. I know. Father would never do anything like that to me. Is this why you wanted to hear the will read? Did you expect this? Well, I expected something, Patsy, but I wasn't sure what. Nick, this changes the whole case around. Yeah, it certainly puts a new light on things, doesn't it? I think I begin to see where we're headed. Oh, for goodness sake, Nick. Oh, why? Here's Lind again. There's no question about it, gentlemen. This will is a forgery. I see it now. Ray forged the You're will crazy. and forged the will and then killed father to get the money. I did no such thing. It was you who killed father. I? Why should I kill him? I don't get anything out of the will. The boy's right. And it was Raymond's fingerprints on the strong box. Raymond Gould, I arrest you. You don't arrest me. Hey, come back here. Stop. Aren't you going to help catch him, Nick? No, no, Matty will get him. He's got the whole police force at his command. I'm more interested in something else. Well, don't you think Raymond is guilty? It certainly looks that way, doesn't it? Oh, Mr. Lind. Oh, Mr. Carter, this is terrible. Never before has such a thing happened in my office. Oh, Mr. Lind, did you ever see this will before? Yes, and that's why I can't understand it. I stopped in to see Mr. Gould the other afternoon, and he showed me the will he had just drawn up by himself. He bragged about saving a lawyer's fee by using his own typewriter and copying a will I had drawn for him some time ago. He said he'd changed the names of the heirs around, but... Otherwise, it was just the same. Was it this will you now have? To the best of my knowledge, it was and is. And get the signature... Did he say why he'd changed the will? Simply said he'd learned something about his son he never knew before, and that he'd be darned if he was going to leave his money to a cheap like that. So this fake will is a copy of Mr. Gould's own will as he drew it up? I think so. As far as I can remember. Oh, it's incredible. Well, Patsy, let's go back and talk to Miss Waters again. Mr. Gould's nurse? Right situation has changed somewhat since I last saw her. Oh, by the way, Mr. Lynn, you mind if I take this phony will along with me? Well, not at all. If it'll do any good in finding out what's happened, I think maybe it will. Thanks. I'll see you as soon as I learn something. Now, Miss Waters, you said you and the cook witnessed the will which Mr. Gould drew up himself. Yeah, we did. Is this your signature? Why, yes, that... No, it ain't either. I thought not. Why, for pity's sake? Because this will is a forgery, signatures and all. Well. Did either of the sons ever borrow their father's typewriter? Yeah, they did. Both of them. Every little while. Patsy, go upstairs and get me a sample of typing from that machine, will you? Of course, Nick. Bring you back every letter there is on it. Good girl. Now, Miss Waters, tell me. Was there any friction between Mr. Gould and either of the boys? Him and Raymond used to argue all the time. Mr. Gould didn't like the way Raymond carried on. But him and Peter got along all right. Mm hmm. Did Mr. Gould have an argument with anyone shortly before he drew up the new will? Do you know? Yep, yeah, he did. I was going by his room the evening before, and I could hear him giving somebody what for. To whom was he talking? Well, now, I, I couldn't tell you. The other voice was so low, I don't know who it was. But Mr. Gould got a letter that afternoon made him all excited. Maybe that was what he was talking about. Yes, maybe it was. And that reminds me, Mr. Carter, another letter come today from that same party. You mean the one that got him so excited before? Yeah. Recognize the fancy handwriting. Want to see it? Yes, I think I better. Why, it is. Dear Mr. Gould, why haven't you answered my last letter? I can't wait any longer. If you don't do what I ask you to, in three days, I'm going to start something. And you don't want that, do you? Your friend, Alice Fenwick. 
her an address, then find Gladstone Place. Here's your typing sample, Nick. Uh, oh, thanks. Yes. That's the typewriter that was used to type the phone will beyond any question. Good. Well, Patsy, if you'll come along with me, I'd like to introduce you to Miss Alice Fenwick. Huh? Who in the world is Alice Fenwick? Well, after I introduce her to you, you can introduce her to me. I don't know her either, but I expect to shortly. <laughs> section out here. Yeah, it's pretty well out in the suburbs. We're nearly there now. <laughs> hey, Patsy. Hmm? You see that car parked in the dark shadows under that tree? Yes, why? Well, that's the car that ran into me the night I was hurt. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I recognize that patch of light-colored paint on the rear fender. Well, what's it doing out here? I wonder. And maybe there's some connection between that car and the Fenwick girl. She lives in the next house. Oh, Nick, hurry. Let's find out. Maybe it's more trouble. I hope we're not too late to prevent it if there is. Mug who knocked me out plays altogether too rough. All right, this is close enough. Okay. Don't make any more noise than is necessary, that's it. I won't. Somebody's having a fight in there, Nate. That yeah, sounds that way. Let's look there, through the kitchen window. Nick, he's threatening her. I better get in, man, fast. Nick, he's choking her. He's going to kill her. All right, you take your hands off that girl. Up with your hands, fast. Where'd you come from? Keep your hands up and your mouth shut. Patsy, see how she is. Sure, Nick. Now, you. What are you doing here? None of your business. Who sent you? We've got you cold, so your only chance is to tell what you know. Jack sent me. Told me to scare her so she'd shut up about it. Jack who? Jack Gould. Who's Jack Gould? Old man Gould's son, the, the guy who killed the old man. You sure his name is Jack? Well, how should I know? That's what they call him. How's the girl, Patsy? She'll be all right, Nick. More scared than hurt, I think. Okay, I'll call Mary and tell him we're coming down. If he's picked up Raymond, if he can get Peter to join us, our car party will be complete, and we can settle this case. So you caught Raymond, eh, Mary? Yeah. Excellent. Didn't get far, did he? I'll say he didn't. I'm glad you didn't let him get away. He has to pay for what he did. I didn't do it, I tell you, no matter what you think. All right, all right. You know what, Nick? Raymond here says he only ran away because the evidence looked so black against him that he was afraid he'd be convicted. And that's just the way the murderer wanted it to look, Matty. What? You mean he didn't do it, Nick? He did not. Peter killed his father. No, I better sit right where you are, Peter. I want to check my story for me. You haven't got anything against me, not a thing. There's a cop outside the door, son, so I wouldn't try nothing. Are you uh, sure you don't want those other two brought in, Nick? Not yet, Matty. Now, here's the story. About a week ago, Mr. Gould got a letter from a girl named Alice Fenwick telling him Peter had promised to marry her and that on the strength of that promise, she had loaned him almost every cent she had. Several thousand, she says. Yeah? Peter gambled it away and then told her he was through with her. He told him there was a baby coming and insisted he marry her. He laughed at her, so she wrote his father. After a row with Peter, which Miss Waters overheard, Gould changed his will. Somehow, Peter found out about it and got the idea that if he copied the will, which left everything to Raymond, copied it just as it was and forged the signatures, he could claim just what he later did, that Raymond had forged the will and killed his father to get the money. Nick, that's just what he said in the lawyer's office. That was part of his plan, too. Raymond's running away was the action of an innocent man who was scared. So Peter faked the will, then killed Father. Correct. And if the plan had gone as Peter had expected it to, I would have been executed for Father's death. And Peter would have inherited all the money. You can't prove a word of what you said, Carter. I can or I wouldn't be saying it. It was you, not your father, who wrote the note saying he'd been murdered. You did that to be sure nobody thought he had died a natural death. And you might have gotten away with it, but you left the wrong pencil with a note. Do you call that proof? And after my interview with you two boys that afternoon, you hired a thug to kill me. And it was just pure luck that he failed. That's a lie. And then this afternoon, when you saw me up and around again, you got panicky that Alice Spenwick might be found to tell her story. So you sent this same thug to kill her, too. Peter did all that? He did. The thug didn't know your correct name, so I asked him to come down here and identify you. All right, get him, will you, Patsy? Of course, sir. Will you come in, please? Okay. All right, you... Is this man sitting here the one who hired you to bump me off and kill the Fenwick girl? Yeah, that's the guy. You lie. I never saw you before. Oh, so that's the way it is. You're going to leave me to take the rap alone, huh? Nothing doing, Jack. You're in this as deep as me. Now, wait a minute, you. Nick, 
You're a wonder. But there's one thing that bothers me. Why were the only fingerprints we found on the strong box diamonds? That's easy, Matty. If you were a criminal and wanted to be sure you didn't leave any prints on a shiny copper surface, would you wipe off the box before or after you handled it? Oh, that's a silly question. Why, after, naturally. Well? Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. It was the guy who handled the box ahead of Raymond who was really the guilty one. <laughs> no one ever wiped the box off before he handled it. Raymond, as a matter of curiosity, when did you touch that box? Right after Father's death, while the doctor was phoning. Mm -hmm. I looked in the room and saw the box was unlocked. So I sneaked a quick look at the will. That was all. Well, all I gotta say is, son, that your curiosity almost got you executed. If it hadn't been for Nick here. Suppose you watch out next time you feel nosy. You may not get off so easy. <laughs> Nick, it's about time to hear something about next week's story, I think. How about it? Well, next week, Ken, we're going to hear about a moving picture in which Waldo took an active part. But not an active enough part. Other clues were a few yellow hairs, a pair of Hollywood sunglasses. And a movie director whose looks in 15 years didn't change at all. And what do you call this mixed-up mess? I call it the case of the make-believe robbery. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jack McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of The Shadow Comics. In the broadcasts of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, original music is played by George Wright, script is by Jack McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting... Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.